This horror began on March 4, 1424, according to the Nars calendar. The continent of Nars became the place where one of the bloodiest wars called Sonma began. This land was engulfed in a torrent of fierce flames, turning absolutely everything around it into solid ash. No one was able to stop the powerful demon king, and there was nothing left but despair for a happy future. However, in the midst of this pitch black and thick darkness, a brave warrior appeared who was ready to give a worthy rebuff to the evil that had swept the earth. This was the plot and rules of the game Paradise, the name of which was displayed on the big screen of the TV. In this role-playing game, the protagonist must confront the sinister demon king, after which he becomes king and leads his kingdom forward. Every evening after a hard day's work and all other free time, he devoted to the fact that he gets incredible and genuine joy in this game. The development of the protagonist, kingdom management, game bugs, dungeon attacks, finding items and all that. This man knew the game through and through. His blog about the game Paradise was in the first place for 10 years, but one day the guy couldn't and just rotted away. This job was really hard and stressful, especially since he spent all his time on it, and the gamer died from overworking his main job in gaming. But it scared him. In all his 34 years, he had never dated anyone, so he didn't want to die so easily. However, after a moment, in a cold sweat and with heavy breathing, he sat down on the bed, and next to him stood the maid, who was frightened by his sudden movements. She stepped back a little and addressed him as if he were a king, saying that he had just had a bad dream and that everything was fine now. The guy silently looked her up and down and turned his gaze to the room he was currently in. The interior was quite elegant. Realizing that he had no idea where he was, he looked at the girl again and asked her who she was, since it was the first time he had seen her. She was genuinely surprised to hear such words and at first thought it was a joke. For a while, they both looked at each other in silence. She was shocked, and the guy himself did not understand anything and had no idea how he got to such a place. After a few minutes of thinking, he got up from the large and soft bed and walked over to the mirror hanging in the spacious room. When he looked at himself, he refused to believe it. His body was in a terrible state. It took a lot to get fat to the point where his life was shortened by 20 years, but now he was no better than garbage. Unable to bear all that he saw in the mirror, the guy decided to calm down first and sat down in a large chair that stood nearby. The blonde man's name was Shin Tai Poon, but it was a name from his past life. He had died of overwork and was reborn in the body of a fat king named Jared. Judging only by the graphics and the presence of Nars, he had entered the Paradise game, but now it was no longer a game, but a real reality. If all these theories turn out to be true, then this life will soon come to an end. It was from 1414 to 1424 that the Great War of Sonma took place, and five years later, in 1419, there was to be a great drought and famine, a volcanic eruption and an earthquake, an epidemic and everything else. A whole catastrophe and the Great War of Nars would begin due to the lack of food. If a war broke out in Nars, all the kingdoms would be involved, including this kingdom, and he was afraid to imagine what would happen to a fat man like him. Shin, and in his present life, Jared started to get very angry with himself, because he was literally a living encyclopedia about the game Paradise, but now he didn't know what to do to avoid such a disaster. In novels about rebirth, it was always written that the hero is reborn as a nice guy who lives a very decent life, but with him, it was the other way around. He was not as handsome as described and very fat, so much so that at that moment even the legs of the chair could not stand and cracked under his weight. He fell loudly to the ground and hit his head on the floor. Without getting up from the ground, he remembered Jared as a child, and then it was already clear that this little boy would grow up to be a handsome man, but then something went wrong. But the boy did not give up. He knew that there was still a chance to fix everything. He could lose weight, although it would not be easy, because it was worth the effort. This time, the guy did get up. He also had memories from his past life, 
There were too many glitches, and since he was alone in this world, he could take advantage of everything. He really had more opportunities because of his knowledge of the game, and thanks to it, he could secure a great future for himself and get things that others could not even imagine. He thought that in this way he could become the strongest warrior and be famous as a great king who united the whole world, and now this became his main goal. Meanwhile, the maid was calmly dusting and cleaning the castle, humming a tune to herself. She was in a very good mood. She wanted to clean the palace as well as possible today so that their king could use his study and feel comfortable. Suddenly, Jared burst into the room where the girl was and called out loudly to her. She immediately stopped cleaning and looked at the king, expecting him to ask her something. But the fat boy didn't say anything, and quickly, at least as fast as his body would allow him to do, he ran to look for something. He looked in every drawer, but he couldn't find what he came for. Jared was already sweating because he wasn't used to moving at such a pace, but he needed to find the thing his father had left him after his death, and he was getting angry because he had left something so important in the rubble, and now it was nowhere to be found. The girl went to one of the drawers and opened it, then took out a large pendant and called out to the king, showing it to him. He calmly walked over to her and took the pendant from her hands, thanking her for helping him find it. The maid was also happy to have helped her favorite king find a valuable thing and asked if there was anything else she could do for him now. The boy smiled and asked her to leave the room for a while, and the maid silently walked to the door, not knowing what he was up to. The girl noticed that Jared was not the same as he used to be, too active and kind, which was a little alarming, but she put it down to the fact that he was in a good mood. Compared to his usual state, he was too energetic. The girl was fascinated by the king's behavior and decided to follow his example and do her work and clean the palace with the same energy. When the boy was alone in the room, he picked up the pendant and carefully examined it from all sides. It was an heirloom of his father's that Barrett had made especially for him, an artifact that enhanced magic. Jared stood with this thing in his hands and thought about what he should do with it now to prevent a catastrophe and live happily ever after. In the end, the boy decided to destroy his father's pendant. He was going to just break it. He remembered that, in the game Paradise, the only achievement of the Fat King was the title of a fourth-class magician. But no matter how hard he tried, he could not summon it with his own magic. And sacrificing this artifact was now the only way to succeed and live in peace without war. In any case, in order to become even stronger, he was ready to do everything in his power, and Jared believed that his father would understand this decision. Eventually, the boy started to get it right and his magic began to work, even though he could barely stand up from the gust of wind. After a while, out of this strange brown smoke, he saw a strange monster appear in front of him, wearing a long, dark cloak with no arms and red eyes. The creature asked in a creepy voice who the person was who summoned it and why they disturbed it, and Jared was a little scared at that moment looking towards this monster. It was something that could be summoned only once in his life. Isabella's demon now turned into a long-haired creature with the same red, furious eyes and approached the guy, who was sweating with fear and a crucial moment. Isabella was not at all happy to be disturbed and summoned to the human world, but then the boy said that he wanted her to make the best of him. He also knew very well about her, that you shouldn't show your fear in front of Isabella, because this creature quickly lost interest in those who were afraid, and you shouldn't worry either, because she is attracted to open-minded people. Jared realized that this was his first and only chance, because if he sent Isabella back now, he would never get another such opportunity. So he said what he needed, loudly and decisively, namely, he needed a spiritual eye. The powerful demon laughed, for what the boy wished for was indeed a very powerful ability that would allow him to see through people. He said firmly that this was exactly what he was missing, because only one person in the Paradise game could have the spiritual eye, so he wanted it for himself. The spiritual eye allowed you to scan the performance and character of any person, and depending on the user's level and abilities, you could see even more accurate information. 
Jared needed this ability to manage the kingdom and find promising players, and Isabella was ready to agree, but she needed to give something for it, to sacrifice something. So the creature looked at the boy closely and asked him what was the most important thing in his life. Isabella, who was much bigger than the boy, approached him and ominously said that he would have to pay for everything, that he would not get anything for free. Isabella kept laughing and clearly laid out all the necessary conditions for the boy to receive the desired spiritual eye. He would only have to give away what he considered most valuable. If the most important thing in his life was wealth, she would make him poor. If it was fame, she would turn him into a slave in the next moment. And if it's family, the evil demon would be happy to eat them right now. The boy froze in his tracks as Isabella read all the memories that came to his mind. It was the worst demon curse he had ever heard. But suddenly, something very strange began to happen to her lips. Then Jared laughed and told her his plan. He had been keeping something valuable in mind all along, but not as much as he had thought, because he had already known about her cunning plan and its terms. He succeeded in deceiving her, even though it was difficult to keep the same thing in mind and not get caught up in other thoughts. He was thinking about something he had kept in his mind for the past 34 years, his first kiss, but the demon hesitated. Isabella was against it. It was strange, because what kind of idiot would think about his first kiss in such a situation? But she began to be literally pulled into him like a funnel, no matter how hard she tried to hold on to something. Isabella was almost at his face, even though she didn't want to be. And Jared certainly wasn't too happy either because it was his first kiss with a demon and he was disgusted by the thought. Later, he succeeded, and then he felt light and proud that he had saved the whole country with this sacrifice. Meanwhile, the two maids were approaching the study. They were talking about Jared, who used to sit in one place all the time, but now he was like a completely different person. His energy seemed endless. They kept comparing their king to his previous life, when he didn't care about anything and was too lazy to even get up from his chair. There was only one occasion when he looked like a normal person, his face taking on a lively look only when he was eating. Now Jared was even able to go down to the basement where no one ever goes, and the maid had no idea why he was there. She ran as fast as she could through the corridors of the palace, and when she came across the others she immediately yelled at them to part and let her through, Hayes was running as fast as she could, and two others asked if she needed help, but she ran past them and said she could manage on her own. Hayes was very hard-working and always did her best, but then she cried at night that the king didn't like everything and was always fighting with her, and the girls felt a little sorry for their friend. The maid took the documents and all the information about the royal family, as Jared had asked, and went to his office. But when she was about to go on to show everything to the desk, Jared stopped her and told her to stop at the door. He was already over his new powers that Isabella had given him. He had seen right through Hayes and was surprised that her loyalty was as high as S and that she had so many other characteristics. Now he even felt sorry to leave her as a mere maid, so he decided that he would definitely make her a healer. She also had unrequited love in her readings which meant that she had been in love with someone for at least ten years. Jared ran through his mind that he was too busy to have time to date anyone else right now, so he simply told her to give him the papers that Hayes was holding. As he leaned on the table and began to read the papers, she began to apologize to him, but he had no idea what she was apologizing for. She looked down at him guiltily and said that every time something like this happened to him, she had to work even harder. Jared's memories of Hayes gradually surfaced because he had assigned most of the important tasks to her, and if something didn't go according to plan, he would take it out on her like a madman. He realized that it wasn't really him, but he still felt guilty towards the girl. He reached out to her, and the girl was already afraid that she would be punished once again for a poorly performed task. She expected the worst, closing her eyes. To Hayes's great surprise, instead of mocking her again, Jared hugged her tightly and sincerely apologized for the past. He apologized for hurting her and thanked her for never complaining about him and always trusting his words. He promised that he would never stoop to such a level again and that everything would be much better in the future. 
He pulled away a little and looked her in the eye and asked if she could believe him for the last time. She was very surprised that Jared was acting like this. He was usually more cruel and didn't apologize for his actions anymore. Hayes was touched to tears and couldn't stop herself from crying. She hugged him again and assured him that she would be with him for the rest of her life, and Jared gratefully said that he was very glad that she could forgive him again. He was Jared now, and he had to take responsibility for everything he had done, and there were a lot of bad things he had done. When Hayes had pulled away and was holding back her tears, she spoke to him again and told him that things couldn't go on like this. Since Jared had decided to lose weight quickly, he was going to eat only grass, but if he really ate only vegetables, he would lose his strength and get sick before he got the figure he wanted. But the boy said with certainty that he was a fat pig and would not eat anything else until he became slim, which would be good for him. The guy knew that in the game Paradise there was one herb that had a negative effect on satiety. On the other hand, this herb promotes a good diet. However, this herb tasted so bad that no one wanted to eat it at all. It was as if spoiled milk had been added to soybean paste, as if the armpits had been rubbed with cheese. But he ate it because he knew that consuming Merlin grass helps to break down fat, consuming aspa leaves helps to increase metabolism because there was an increased calorie consumption, about two times more than usual. Because of this, he activated active stimulation and burned 450 grams of fat. Still, his weight was gradually coming off, even though it might not have come in the best way because the green still tasted terrible. Jared put his hands over his mouth, realizing that he might throw up right now from the nasty taste in his mouth. Hayes, who had been away for a while, brought another dish that looked quite appetizing. She invited the king to try the soy meat she had prepared. She blushed a little and told him that she had learned to cook this dish from a chef for him. She also added that he had always thrown this dish away before, but she would like him to try at least a piece this time. At that moment, the boy realized how terrible his character had been in the past, because he had abused such an angel. The king tasted the soybean meat and the taste lifted him to heaven. It was incredibly delicious. No wonder Hayes had A-level cooking skills. There was no trace of Merlin's disgusting taste. So Jared was going to eat everything Hayes had prepared. At the same time, he was looking at the documents and judging by them. He was now in the northern part of the country, and he remembered what kind of kingdom it was. The land was very cold, so it was impossible to grow anything. A Class F desert land, home to poisonous insects, wild beasts, and robbers. It may not have been the best place to live at first glance, but it had many charms. The problem was, however, that he was still too weak to take advantage of all these advantages. First he had to change himself, and then he could take on the rest. As Jared contemplated his next steps, Isabella appeared before him, demanding that he give her the spiritual eye right now. He was surprised to see that the demon was still there, but she wasn't going to leave until he did as she said. She wanted the spiritual eye back because Jared had dared to mock her like that when he kissed her. She began to threaten him and said she would follow him for the rest of his life and torture him until he died of it and gave her the spiritual eye back. And that's when Jared realized that resolving this difficult situation would not be as easy as he thought. Ten years ago, someone began knocking on his castle door, asking him to open it. The young man with the small cloak on his shoulders knocked hard. Of course, it was sad to hear about the king's death, but now they all had to forget the past, stay calm, and think about what would happen to them in the future. Although no one opened the door, the boy kept knocking and assuring him that he would help him through such a difficult and sad period. Then a young boy, Jared, who had just recently lost his father, sat in a dark room by his bed and cried, not wanting to hear or see anyone. It was still a fresh trauma, and all he could think about was his beloved father, who had passed away when he was so young. No one thought that anyone was summoned here for no reason. No one thought that anyone was called here for nothing. A young man with red hair stood next to the door with a bottle of alcohol, hoping to be invited to the New Year's Eve party. He opened the bottle and took a few sips. After that, he decided to go inside the palace and saw Hayes and another maid standing outside the king's room. 
He immediately rushed to hug them, especially happy to see Hayes, but she tried to pull away from him because he smelled of alcohol and behaved badly. She closed her eyes, hoping that he would not touch her too much, and greeted Mr. Glagas, who in turn remarked that he liked her politeness. But her hopes were dashed when he once again began to emphasize that she was too beautiful to love a fat pig like Jared. Glagas always focused his attention on her when he came and made a promise to himself that when Hayes was with him, he would. But luckily for her, Mr. Lacus soon entered the palace, and he was always arguing with Glagas when he flirted with girls and telling him not to do it again. But he didn't care and continued to behave in a very uncivilized manner. The elder always said that a servant of his majesty should not behave like that. Hayes looked around happily. She was really happy to see him. Glagas, on the other hand, hadn't expected Lacus to come here and start bothering him. The boy got nervous when he started to lecture him, the head of public order, on manners. Glagas turned away and said that he was always whispering something to the king, but he was always left with nothing and never came to his senses. These words really hurt Lacus, and he approached the boy with a stern face and ordered him to repeat what he had said to him, but Glagas only laughed at him, saying that he was so old that he could not even hear well. However, while they were settling their differences, an old man with gray hair came to them and ordered them to stop quarreling immediately, because the king was coming soon and it was unacceptable for him to see such things. Obrin managed to stop them, but Glagas was not particularly happy to see the old man. With that toothless dog and the old pensioner still hanging around and ruining the kingdom, Glagas wanted them to leave the castle as soon as possible. Lachis didn't understand how this rascal had been entrusted with such an important position, and Obrin understood his feelings perfectly, but it would not be easy to change it. In the end, they all gathered at one big table and everyone was eager to find out what really happened. They whispered among themselves and no one believed that the king himself had initiated the meeting, since he had always been passive in such a role. Jared was also reading the documents and his second chin disappeared, which was very surprising to the audience. The king was changing before our eyes. But Glagas continued to drink and became convinced that the rumors he had heard were true. When he had drunk enough, the man with the eye patch slammed his bottle on the table and said that it was not good for the king to be doing this routine. He suggested that they end this meeting as soon as possible and go out and have a drink with the king. Glagas told him that he had brought another bottle of very good liquor with him and that Jared would like the taste of it very much. Finally, after he said that, Jared looked at Glagas and thought for a while, but he kept his eyes on the documents he was holding. The man suggested a good time with alcohol and inviting beautiful ladies, a method Glagas always used to delay the meeting, for the king liked such suggestions. Lacus, on the other hand, was determined to put a stop to this outrage this time. Whatever happened, he was determined to put the man in his place for the sake of Crivius and the people of the country. But before the man could say anything, the king uttered a very strange phrase for his person, pointing his finger at Glagas and asking him why he had come to the meeting so drunk. These words shocked everyone in the room, and Lacus had forgotten what he wanted to talk about because it was not like the king they knew so well. Glagas was panicking. He didn't understand anything at all because not long ago he and Jared had been drinking together and everything was fine, and now it was as if the king had been replaced. These words made Jared even more angry, and he used his magic to smash the bottle of alcohol that the boy was holding. If it hadn't been for the importance of this meeting, he wouldn't have been so lenient. He would have dealt with Glagas's unacceptable appearance in a different way. This hurt the ego of this lover of alcohol, and even if he is a king, how can he use his own magic like this? Since there was no time for idle chatter, Jared put the documents on the table in front of everyone and continued his story. He asked if the chief of public order, Mr. Glagas, was satisfied that he could use his power to take money from ordinary merchants and use it to satisfy his needs. The boy was silenced by the truth that was put to his face. The king expressed his displeasure because it was because of him that the population of the country became poor and the crisis began. 
People stopped trusting their king after such actions, because everything they had gained with such hard work was taken away from them, and they were also illegally charged. Through Glagas, there was human trafficking, which was beyond the pale, and before that, there was illegal mercenary training in the territory of Krivia. Jared clearly told the whole truth about the chief of public order, who was completely unfit for the position, and the king then called down a fireball. The way Glagas was behaving now in front of everyone, the king was willing to forgive within the confines of this broken bottle, but the way he had sinned in front of the entire nation was not so easily forgiven. Jared stepped closer and decided how the boy would be punished. He would simply burn his face gently and be done with it. And when Jared threw the fireball directly at Glagas's face, he immediately backed away, trying to get away from it. He was lucky, though, and the sphere didn't burn his face, but it did hit his back, and there were severe burns. Jared would have been ready to kill him for that, but he wanted to follow the law of the land, and that was what was saving Glagas. Jared decided that starting today he would remove this scoundrel from such an important position, because such a person cannot remain at the top of the country. He also said that an investigation would be conducted into all the corruption operations that had taken place in the kingdom. After these words, many people fell to their knees before the king and began to beg for forgiveness, apologizing for this discrepancy. Lachis watched in fascination. Jared was able to extinguish Glagas, who was a significant character in Krivia, with a single blow. It was the power of a fourth-class mage from the Eucalys clan with deep, magical roots, and such accomplishments were very reminiscent of his predecessor, Lord Barrett. While Lachis was thinking about all this, Jared called out to him. Before he knew it, Jared had appointed him the new chief of public safety. He was so shocked that he could not speak. However, he was honored to be appointed and promised to carry this important title on his shoulders with dignity. After the announcement, the king asked if there were any questions about the new instructions, but no one spoke up. Everyone was in agreement with the decision. At least Jared had managed to do something to raise the king's status, which was already below par. But there was still a problem with the distribution of personnel. There was not a single person in the right place. The minister of trade was appointed by accident. He had very little experience. The person responsible for trade was a skilled warrior, and the person responsible for agricultural development had a talent for storytelling. Suddenly, King Jared noticed Aubrey in front of him, looking at him in surprise. The king decided to fix everything immediately, and it was possible because he now had the spiritual eye. After this important meeting, one month passed, and Jared continued to solve matters concerning the future of the country and try to raise his kingdom from its knees. A miserable and beaten merchant came to a small house, begging for at least some money, because without it he could not even trade. He begged to be pitied. However, the man to whom he came with his request refused and even threatened him that so far he had been good to him, so he should not annoy him. All he needed from this trader was to pay for the place and he would be allowed to trade, but his pockets were empty. These local bandits thought that Mr. Glagas hadn't been coming for a bribe lately, which he never missed, so they assumed he had just gone on a trip to warmer climes. The money Glagas had given him, he had told him not to spend it here and to keep it for himself, but the man was salivating to spend it on his own whims. Suddenly the bell rang in their small pantry and they were deciding who would go to open the door, because no one showed up. Finally, one of them quietly walked to the door and peered through the crack to see who had come to visit. And it was King Jared himself, standing outside the door smiling and waving. The bandit was even a little scared when he saw such a fat guy standing in front of him. But a moment later he got a painful punch to the chin. Lachis was hiding behind the sweet king, ready to beat them and leave no living spot on their bodies. Jared said with the same joyful face that he didn't care that they were yelling at him. This blow was for the fact that they were illegally receiving money for space from merchants and residents of the entire kingdom. Jared ordered everyone to capture absolutely all the bandits who were here. Lachis was happy to fulfill this order from his king. Since he was the new head of public order, Lachis decided to start the trial right then and there. The two criminals opened their mouths, realizing that they had nowhere to go. 
Meanwhile, while the king and his ward were dealing with these scoundrels, another criminal was gently trying to leave the room, carrying a large sack on his shoulder. However, Jared noticed him as soon as he was closing the door, so he approached him and did not let him escape. The criminal was about to run away, letting go of the sack, but Jared wasted no time in using his magic to stop him. When the people saw this, they immediately began to applaud and loudly thank the king and the head of the guard, Lachis, because now they would no longer be deceived by these criminals. The knight in armor kept the three of them chained and handcuffed. They had been hunting for this dastardly company for a long time, but could not catch them, so they were very grateful to the king for his help. Lachis also said that His Majesty Jared had frankly confessed to his past misdeeds and promised to put the lives of his citizens first. And the fact that they caught these criminals was just the beginning of a new life. Such actions of the king should not be forgotten, because they proved that his people were important to him. On Jared's orders, bread was distributed to the hungry in the streets. At every step, the people emphasized that they should be grateful to the king for such decisions. Street musicians appeared on the streets, humming melodies to light instrumentals, and a new bright sun rose over Crivia. After a while, Jared called everyone back together to discuss what had been done, and the community began to feel a little better about the top of their kingdom. This was indeed a great success, because now Jared even had fans. People gradually began to admire him, and then he realized that he had not worked in vain. Jared asked how Lachis was feeling in his new position, and the man was very pleased to be promoted to this status. He felt that this kingdom really needed him. The king sipped his tea quietly, and Lachis thanked him once again for finally being promoted to a position he was really comfortable with and well-versed in. And since his charges were happy, he was happy too. Jared hoped that Lachis would lead his charges to the end and stay in this position. There were also statistics that could not but rejoice over the past month. All the criminals who were in the kingdom were caught. Security and public opinion was improving every day. Lakisu was given skillful soldiers who had been selected by the king himself with the help of the spiritual eye, and all these soldiers were united under the king's name. This was all due to the spiritual eye, but Isabella was still not far behind and persistently tried to take it back. The horde of Obrin, in turn, developed a new method of cultivation. He was engaged in agriculture, but things were not going well in this area because of the long and cold winter, and there were many harmful plants. Abila promoted the magic stone of Crivia to the masses as a special product, but it took even longer for good results. In the absence of special talents, there was no point in the spiritual eye, so Jared had to put in a little effort. While Lachis was sitting with the king at the table, he noticed something. Jared was repeating the same action very often, so he wondered what it meant. Jared told him that it was a very popular exercise in other countries and that it was used to lose weight. Lachis smiled and signed him up for it because without being so overweight, Jared was looking more and more like a real king. However, this move had nothing to do with dieting. It was a way to increase the performance of killing magic. To begin with, it was necessary to channel magic into both hands and then back into the body, so you could cause a magic glitch that would strengthen it. Although the developers claimed that there are no Yuan in the game paradise, this was far from the case. Jared noticed the same effect of raising his level by 12 points within a month using this method. With this method, he would be able to use grade 4 magic once or twice more. While he was quietly practicing, one of his students burst into the room, urgently hurrying to tell him about something. The thing is, the search party Jared had sent out had finally found a group of thieves who had found a hiding place in a mine. The king was very surprised to hear that there were slaves in there too. A year ago, two young boys were fighting with each other, both very skilled with their weapons. The boys were very absorbed in the fight and did not notice anything else around them while they were fighting. The blonde girl watched them in a dreamy and impressed way, admiring how well they were able to use their weapons. However, their colleagues did not like it much, and they turned to the young girl with complaints, asking why she came here so often and watched them. At this rate, there could be trouble. But the girl smiled happily. 
she had no idea that the two of them would be here. The two men told her that she would face a serious punishment if she continued to play hooky. She immediately ran to do her work, starting to carry the water barrels, knowing that she could easily catch up with the others because she was the fastest of them all. Lena was already 14 years old and there were rumors that she would soon become a maid in a prestigious castle. She was happy to hear this because the headmaster himself had found this house for her, an orphan, so Lena was sure it was a great place. Her eldest was not so happy about this because she wanted to recruit Lena into their army. But suddenly the girl turned to them both and they looked at each other. The girl wanted to ask if she would ever be able to become a powerful warrior. Maybe not now, but she promised to try hard to reach that level. The fact that she was going to the palace made her happy, because there she could have a better life. But she did not want to be a servant. Her small and young heart was on the way to fight. Her eldest asked her if she knew why there were so few women warriors in the whole world, and she pulled her sword out of its sheath. The world was too dangerous and courage, desire, and effort were not enough. Most of them simply gave up realizing the reality of the matter, or lost their lives before they could leave the battlefield in time. But here, no one was an exception. Everyone was afraid for their lives. It was the abilities, talent for this work, perseverance and will that played the key role here, and that's all that was needed to become an ideal warrior. And Lena's abilities exceeded both of them, so they could say with certainty that she would succeed in reaching her dream if she did not give up halfway. If she had nowhere else to go, she could always come back here. This was her home, and her eldest would hire her right away because she was the commander of the army. The girl was even more excited. Her mood improved and she was ready to work even harder. However, when it came time to go to the castle, something happened that she did not expect. She was thrown into a dark dungeon and handcuffed. Memories of her first months at the orphanage flashed through her mind, where the head of the orphanage loved her very much, or so it seemed. He called her an angel sent from heaven. At that time, their teacher said hopefully that he would hope that the girl would continue to support them and be friends with everyone, and she was only too happy to do so. However, everything turned out to be not so happy in the end. The director of the orphanage simply sold her. He needed money and they were ready to pay a lot for such an angel. Lena didn't want to believe it to the last, remembering how everyone in her previous home treated her. She thought it was a misunderstanding because she was supposed to be sent to work as a maid for a rich family. However, here she was taken out of the sky and the veil of reality was lifted. She was not just a maid but a slave, and no one in this family cared about her. She shouldn't expect any favors from these people. They were cruel, and it made no difference to them whether she was a slave or an orphan. The only thing was that slaves should speak more politely and behave more quietly in the presence of important people. She clutched her head. Her brain did not want to accept the information that this had really happened. She knew that the director was a completely different person who was not even close to being capable of such a thing. But all of this turned out to be a bitter and terrible truth. A month had already passed since the girl was sold into slavery. She was in a cell with other unfortunate children. During these weeks, she was subjected to physical violence more than once and spent almost all the rest of her time in a prison cell. There she met a girl with whom she could sometimes talk, and they talked many times when they were in the cell together. The girl with red hair, when she found out where she was from, said that slavery was her destiny but Lena did not understand what she was talking about. She said that most orphans from Mahorka ended up in slavery because that was the law in that country, and her director, in whose orphanage she found herself, was of the same opinion and had signed this law, so it was worth putting aside these thoughts and accepting reality. But 14-year-old Lena refused to believe it and sincerely believed that no matter what happened, she would get out of here and be free. Her friend had already given up trying to convince her that it was almost impossible because the girl stubbornly believed in her own, but Lena then asked if she wanted to be free herself. But Mani replied that she hadn't thought about it. She had lived here longer than Lena, so all they had to do was live together in this hell until they died in agony. Lena pulled away from her, 
her colleagues' words making her mood depressing. But Mani was realistic and soberly assessed the situation she was in. A whole month passed and she and Mani became fast friends. There were not too many child slaves in this place. They had no personal freedom in space. They were treated like garbage. So most of them were like soulless dolls, doing whatever their owners wanted them to do. Slaves with a broken will were much less problematic and it was not difficult to sell them. It might have been just plain luck, but she and Monty might not have worried at all until they were 15 because they were the most expensive slaves, but Lena knew she would never give up. Six months passed and they became quite accustomed to the constant hard work. During these months, she also realized that Krivia was a more backward country than Mallorca. The girl was grateful to Mani because she taught her a lot. Lena knew little about this world before, and Mani told her the reality that it was a desert land, ruled by a king who had no real talents. So Krivian was gradually sinking deeper and deeper with each passing month. At some point, Lena became very curious about how her peer learned about all these subtleties of life in this world. Mani always gave the same answer. She just heard everything from those who put her here, because she had very good and sharp ears. Also, there were a lot of monster hunters in Krivia, but there was no work for hired soldiers, so her appa and the ogres about whom she often talked would definitely not come here. However, she still wasn't going to give up. No matter what she knew, Shock would get out of here someday and start her life anew. Mani shook her head. She was amused by the whole thing. She had never seen anyone more stubborn than this girl, and she really liked that about Lena. Eventually, the whole year passed, which was more like one long and horrible day. They turned 15. Mani was sleeping that night. They didn't have a bed. The children slept on a simple cloth spread on the cold and hard floor, and they didn't even have a single blanket to cover themselves and stay warm. And it so happened that Mani got sick because of all this. Her body was literally on fire. Lena noticed it and she tried to wake the girl up because if left like that, it would not end well. One of the bosses of this terrible dungeon, which consisted of several prisons, was very evil. Glagus shouted so hard for them to trust him but he himself fell so easily into the clutches of this fat King Jared. The man was drinking something hot and complaining about his hard life, because because of Glagus, they couldn't even sell these dirty slaves, and they had to hide in some dungeons. She demanded that only one cup of warm broth be brought to the cell, because her friend had a very high fever and was about to lose consciousness and die there. She fell to her knees and promised that she would obey orders and not say anything against it. But she needed that cup of broth, at least half of it. Perhaps he took pity on her, or maybe he was sick of hearing all these requests. In any case, Lena got her way and Mani was given some broth. Her friend covered her with a piece of cloth because she was running a fever, and eventually Mani sat down to eat. Lena took care of her and told her to eat until it was cold and she was given something to eat and something hot to drink. The man took her by the arm and said that Mani had eaten by herself while she was here, and she had business with him. So the man was about to take her out of the cell, and Mani was not happy about it. But her friend assured her that she would be fine. The man took her face in his hand and turned it towards him, and with a strange smile he said that the patient should rest in silence, so they should leave her alone. But before he could take her away, Something very hot flew into his eyes. Manny reacted quickly and poured the soup on his face. Taking Lena's hand, she exclaimed that now was the time to get out of here. The girl ran after her by inertia, but she didn't understand what was happening because they had just asked for soup. She just couldn't let Lena do that. The other slaves were ready to do anything because they had no incentive to get out, but Lena was eager to get out. It was all she ever talked about, getting out so there was no time to stop, this man was coming towards them. And no matter how hard they tried to get out and run fast, the guard caught Lena by the hair and pulled her to him. But this time he was very angry. Although she was shocked, the girl immediately turned to him and slapped him across the face, telling him to let her go immediately. When the man fell down, Lena turned to Mani, tears streaming from her eyes. Seeing that her friend was almost unconscious, 
Lena sincerely did not understand why she had sacrificed her own life for her. However, Monty barely audibly replied that her life was already too bad. There was nothing left to save and she could not imagine herself different in the new world. And she knew about Lena that this girl could not stay here. Manny grew up among bandits. All she saw were murders and brutal showdowns, so she was not capable of anything else. And Lena had a good dream, even though she was an orphan. That's why Monty wanted to protect the girl, realizing that she needed this chance much more than she did. She believed that with such a passion, the girl could do anything, so she finally told her to never give up in the face of difficulties. Lena promised in tears that she would get out of here for the sake of herself and her protector by any means necessary, but she did not want to stay here. But the same guard who had recovered from the blow had already come for her head. Lena wiped away her tears as she continued to sit over the girl's helpless body, but she was ready to do anything to get out, even kill anyone who got in her way. Vichilovsov did not let her move and quickly pressed her head to the cold and hard ground, holding his sword. He was furious that her friend had burned half of his face, and the two of them had been giving him a headache since the morning. But just as he was about to finish her off, a voice came from the other end distracting him from his task. And before he knew it, a wave of flames poured out on the man, burning his entire body. It was King Jared, and he showed him what a real burn was all about. Indeed, this small mine was Chad's real hideout, and Lachis asked Jared how he had found out. But the boy had figured out Glagus and the company's plans. They must have thought that after Glagus disappeared, the lazy king would make a little noise. But in a few days, everything would die down. That's why they came here. And Lachis asked with a smile if the king knew of any other hiding places for criminals. Jared, however, said that this was too much and that he shouldn't be pushed too hard. The king turned around and ordered everyone to go inside the dungeon and he prepared himself and drew his sword. His great and powerful army of the best warriors had come to kill all those who dared to make slaves of ordinary people. For the sake of justice and by order of the king, they had to free all the mutilated people who were here, and the main rule they had to remember was always, no pity. These bastards must be punished for their actions. So, led by King Jared, the whole army went to the dungeon to win back the freedom of the citizens of Krivia. The king ordered all the people who had been held hostage to gather in one place. The criminals started a battle and ordered the others to bring their leader to face the army of the kingdom of Krivia. However, the one who decided to go in search of Chad never made it, because as soon as he set foot in the place, he was pierced through the back with a sharp sword. Lachis was serious about winning and was not going to let any of the criminals leave the scene. And when part of this group was finished, the army was about to move on, but a new problem arose. There were too many passages, and they did not know where to go. So the king ordered them to split up and search absolutely all the passages. Now the soldiers of Krivia had a great advantage, because the level of weaponry of these robbers was no better than that of an ordinary person. And at that moment their leader was ready to kill the girl for what she had done. The man held Lena tightly by the hair to prevent her from escaping but someone's voice came from the distance and stopped him. Jared and his army quickly found the orphan and the brazen man who wanted to hurt her, and the king used fire magic to guide him away. After he released the fire sphere at him, Jared walked closer to the girl. He remembered playing games and often coming across slave holds, but in real life, it was very gross. The newly minted king approached Lena, who was on her knees in despair, and asked if she was okay. The girl quietly and timidly replied that she felt fine, since others had come in time to save the child. But if Lena was a miracle and her health was not complete, Mani, her friend, could not say a word. She had died saving Lena, protecting her, even though she knew it could have ended that way. The little orphan turned her face away from her to stifle the tears that were coming to her eyes in waves. Jared could have used magic to save Manny, but by now it was too late. Nothing would have saved her. The boy felt guilty for not being there in time and hugged Lena, who was covering her face with her hands and couldn't stop crying. She and Monty had become very close during this time, and losing someone like that was a big blow to her. Jared noticed that the girl's body was very tired. 
She was thin, unhealthily pale, and the skin of her hands was very dry even in appearance. She had been through a lot. While the king was trying to calm Lena down and somehow reassure her, Chad came into the dungeon and heard the noise and decided to check what was going on. He looked around and saw the fat king, and then he got angry because he was not expecting such a person in his prison. Chad stepped toward him even though he was shielded in different directions, but he said that this lazy king would rather stay at home and eat fatty meat than go to places like this. Jared was angry that his life was extremely worthless. If even the last alcoholic knows him as a lazy fatty, the guy swore to himself that he would definitely catch him, or even better, personally send him to hell. Chad laughed again, calling the king a fat pig, saying that people like him could not use magic. Jared was even more angry with himself when they made eye contact. And then Chad unleashed his own magic. Using the magic of lightning, he wanted to kill the King of Curve and free his mind from the intruders. But the lightning hit the wrong target. It hit the ground and did not touch Jared, who was about to use the magic of speed. Chad was astonished by this decision. He couldn't remember the last time he had seen any magician use such a spell. But Jared knew what he was doing. He thought out his plan and began to quickly wind circles around Chad, who was confused by this and he was drunk and could not perceive everything adequately, so he soon backed up and almost fell. But he decided to get a grip on himself, knowing that speed magic was the type of magic that was at the elemental level and gave the human body super speed. But this spell was not so easy to control, and therefore many people avoided it. Chad still hoped that because of his overweight, it would be difficult for Jared to change his direction. Wasting no time, the criminal decided to use everything around him and summon magic again. However, this move played a very cruel joke with Chad. He began to break and twist in different directions. This was not a very smart decision because he decided to use super powerful magic, which requires a lot of control when drunk, and that's why there were so many bad moments. Chad was so exhausted that he couldn't even use magic anymore. He didn't even have the strength to get angry. Now Jared had an announcement that he had completed the War on Crime task, which raised the level of loyalty of the people of Krivia to 23, and he also completed the task of destroying the cave company, which raised the level of loyalty even higher, to 34. Thanks to this, the level of trust of the kingdom's inhabitants reached the mark of 100, after which the Lesser Golden Age began. As a result, Chad died quickly, and the mine case was soon resolved. And all those who followed Chad and engaged in murder and kidnapping were ordered to be severely punished and were going to be put to death. The people who had been captured and were slaves were to be taken to their families, accompanied by guards. Lena, who was sitting with Jared in the same carriage, asked in amazement and surprise if she could really go to his kingdom. The king smilingly replied that he would gladly accept her, because even if she returned to her shelter in Majorca, the director would still want to sell her again, so it was dangerous. And Jared was always looking for young and talented people to work with him, so he would be very happy and grateful to her if she decided to move to this kingdom. He was ready to take responsibility for her and make Lena a first-class knight, as she had dreamed of since childhood, and she was overjoyed to hear the king's offer. Lena promised that she would do her best and would definitely become the best knight in the kingdom of Krivia, and she had a dream of living up to Jared's expectations, and he would be happy to watch her grow. In his mind, he was very surprised even then, because he did not expect to see Lena Giselle Ellis here at all. Actually, Lena would be at the forefront of the Demon King's army ten years later during the Great Sanma War. She would easily deflect all the attacks of hundreds of players. She was the strongest tank that was impossible to lose against. She was even called the Weeping Cheese because it was impossible to pass through her. No one could take the fortress if it was guarded by Lena. The girl was a great defender of the Demon King's army. But it was even better that she had come to him in this story, because he could try to prevent her from joining the Demon King's army. It went without saying that she would be actively and intensely preparing for the Great War of Sonma, 
So Jared had already planned to make her a young star who would rise above the horizon of his army, not his enemy. The only problem remained with their not-so-best neighbor, Mahorka, since illegal slave trade was allowed there. It was easy to assume that all other laws of the civilized world were being violated there, which meant that they did not have the best influence on their territory. Meanwhile, night had already fallen in Mallorca, and they had many problems of their own, especially with money. Lately, the head of this state had often heard how much people praised the Crivius, and such words about his competitors made him feel bad. The man sitting in the chair with the pipe knew that Frua had once been a friend of Glagas, so that was a good lead for them. It would be worth taking revenge for the fact that this fat man had dared to insult their colleague. It was supposed to be a quiet and peaceful night in the kingdom of Crivia, guarded by the army of the state. The soldiers stood outside the palace and watched closely to make sure that no one would cause trouble. However, they did miss someone who was deftly jumping from one roof to another and went unnoticed by the castle guards. The mysterious figure, huddled under a dark cloak with a hood on his head, was already standing next to his target. The guy carefully examined everything he needed and scouted the situation for his men, and then returned home just as unnoticed. It was already morning, and Jared's new day started with a hard workout. He was so tired that his eyes were starting to get dark, but he kept running. Lena trained with him, but it was very easy for her to run a few dozen big laps around the palace, unlike Jared, but he had to train even harder if he wanted to live up to his dreams of a handsome and slim king. He was doing his best, asking Lena if she was in a good mood after her morning run, and Lena was indeed very happy, because the air in the mine was terrible, there was very little space and no opportunity to do the sport she loved so much. Jared ran up to her, dripping with sweat, and suggested that they train together for now and they would find a teacher for her later, and she agreed and liked it even better. In the meantime, they sat down to eat, but the cook overdid it a bit this time. And while the king of Crivia was chewing on his newly prepared meal with relish, a message from Lord Auburn and Avil was delivered to his hands. Hayes had brought a letter that had arrived this morning after they had gone for a run with Lena. Jared opened the letter and read what was written, and it turned out that everything was very simple, and Lena, who was sitting next to him and also eating breakfast, asked him to tell her what was in it, because she was also curious. He read the whole magazine and decided to briefly tell what it was about. The bottom line is that Lord Auburn is engaged in the cultivation of crops called Retria, so there was some success in this area. Their kingdom was mostly importing food, so at least by doing so they could reduce costs. Avil was able to attract the attention of monster hunters. There were now much more of them than usual, and they could now sell the crystals they got during the hunt. Compared to last month, the revenue almost doubled. Lena said that her friend had told her about Kriviri and that she was afraid to go underwater, but in fact it turned out to be different she liked living here. The boy was pleased to hear this, because it was his great merit. Everything began to improve only when he took the throne, and very soon all the continents would know about Crivia. Meanwhile, while the king was telling Lena about the affairs of the kingdom, Lachis entered the hall. The thing was that he had something urgent to report to him. Lachis had discovered something very strange near the castle this morning, and decided to bring Jared there to show him. Jared was furious and excited at the same time, wondering what dared to do such a thing in the kingdom. When the door opened, they saw the corpse of a monster in a small storeroom and several more in other places. Lycus was at a loss for words, feeling guilty that he had not been able to follow up on this, that he should have spent more time and attention on guarding the castle grounds. However, Jared assured him that he shouldn't blame himself so much, the main thing was that none of the residents were injured. Crivia was a very small kingdom that didn't even have its own fortress, so it was not surprising that they were vulnerable in such a situation. Now the level of citizen satisfaction is at an all-time high, so it's likely that someone from the outside is involved. Jared continued to ponder whose hand it might be, when suddenly he and Lachis heard a call for help. Some child was screaming that she was ready to sell herself and give all the money, 
but she really needed to help her mom. A little girl clung to a man's arm, demanding that he give her medicine for her mother, but he just said he had nothing. Jared decided to take care of it personally, so he approached the child and asked her name and what was wrong. The man stared in awe at the king who appeared before his eyes. The king asked what kind of medicine the girl was looking for for her mother, and the people around him began to look in his direction, not believing their eyes. The girl stood next to Jared and introduced herself as Mia, telling him that her mother had Rennell's disease and she could not find the medicine she needed to cure her. Jared was very shocked when he heard the name of this particular disease. He knelt down in front of the king and began to make excuses, saying that he had been told what medicine was needed to cure this serious disease, but no pharmacy wanted to sell him the medicine, and without the right dose of pills, the disease was incurable. Jared thought about it. He knew that this disease could only be cured with the blessing of a great priest or with a precious medicine that could cure literally anything, and that medicine was made in the country of Ethema. Ranella's disease was a lung disease that was similar to tuberculosis, which could be caught in dungeons or from wild monsters in the kingdom of Ranella, and that's where the name came from. Jared sat down next to Mia and asked her to take him to her mother. At her surprised look, he said that he knew how to cure the disease. Hearing this, the girl did not hesitate to take Jared to their home, hoping that he was telling the truth and that his method could really help cure her mother. Mia started to climb up to the second floor because her mother was there, but Jared wondered if these shaky and old stairs would be able to support his weight. The girl ran into her mother's arms as soon as she entered the room. Her mother was very tired and lying in bed. It was not the first time the girl had brought people who promised to help, so her mother did not believe it was possible. Mary looked up at Jared, mistaking him for a doctor. She immediately said that she had no money for treatment, so she asked him to leave, as the woman was now expected to die in seven days. Seeing that time was running out, the guy realized that he had to act immediately and he assured her that he didn't need any payment. She just had to trust him. Mia looked at her mother with joy, saying that this was not a doctor but a real king who had come to save her. The woman turned her gaze back to Jared and greeted him, letting him know that she knew him, which he was very surprised to hear. Mary covered her eyes and told him that eight years ago she had been invited to work as a cook in his palace. Jared had already realized that nothing good could have happened there, so he immediately apologized, but he hadn't thought about his actions and was ashamed of them now. The king sat down next to her, to which the woman replied that it was better not to get so close to her, because this disease can be easily transmitted and is extremely difficult to cure, but the boy reassured her that everything was fine. He asked Mia to bring him a wet towel, so she quickly ran to the bathroom to get it. Meanwhile, while she was gone, Jared opened the window and looked out. The corpse of the monster Jared had seen near his castle was lying under the house where the small family lived, and he wondered how long Mary had been noticing these creatures. It was indeed not the first time she had encountered them. She had long worked as a cook for a group that sold crystals extracted from these monsters. Jared realized that Rennell's disease is not transmissible between people, but everyone who came into contact with these beasts got sick. The only problem was that the disease had no symptoms until the last, so most of those infected lived unaware of their condition. Mary held on to the last, but when she saw the corpse of an animal near her house, her condition deteriorated sharply. She already knew what end awaited her. The only question for her was when it would happen. Before he could even answer her questions, Hayes and Lena entered the room, bringing all the medicines Jared had asked for. The king happily told Mary to trust him. Everything should be fine, and he promised that he would not leave until her condition improved. Mary was sincerely grateful to him. She almost cried with happiness, but she still did not know how she could thank the king for such kindness. Lena and Hayes had already begun to prepare everything they needed to help Mary, but Jared told her that she needed to get well first, and then she would think about how to repay him. And on the roof of that house was the same guy who had been involved in all the recent events, and he laughed when he heard that Jared wanted to make a medicine that didn't exist. 
But he didn't laugh so much when Lachis appeared behind him and confidently declared that their king had never been wrong before. He cited the fact that the criminal had shown up at the scene of the crime. Just as Jared had said earlier, Lachis was unhinged when he saw this scoundrel who had dumped all those monster corpses in their kingdom, and now the inhabitants were at risk of contracting Renella disease because of him. The masked guy said almost nothing, hoping to go unnoticed, but something went wrong. Meanwhile, Hayes and Jared began to prepare the medicine, and Lena and Mia sat down next to them and watched as they mixed the different herbs. Hayes was in a good mood and calmly mixed all the necessary ingredients. It was not difficult to find all the necessary components, but she did not suspect that all this fancy stuff was going to make a cure for Ronell's disease. Jared knew all about this game, so he remembered that while playing Paradise, people who were involved in pharmacy had developed a cure for this disease while they were arguing about the right to income. Someone leaked all the information to the website, and that's how he got the recipe. Thanks to this moment now, ten years later, he is sitting and preparing this medicine to save a person's life. Mary was lying in bed. She could hardly speak, but she still wanted to ask something. Even though she wanted to live, Mary sincerely did not understand why a man like him would work so hard for some poor person who was worth almost nothing to this world. Jared, however, only replied that anyone who has been constipated knows what it is and how unpleasant it is. It was surprising to hear that Jared, the king of Crivia, had also once suffered from Rennell's disease. However, he denied it, saying that he grew up in a loving family that always surrounded him with support. Jared took her hand and looked into her eyes, saying that there was something else besides his mother's sincere and devoted love. It was a very old story. They used to live very poorly, and they were not in a position to have their mother examined in a hospital. But when they finally managed to get to the hospital, it turned out that it was too late. His mother had the last stage of cancer, which was incurable. As he sat next to her in the ward, holding her hand, he felt more anger at himself than sadness. He felt so helpless in a situation he could not change. Fifteen years had passed since then, but he continued to blame himself for her death. Jared understood exactly how Mia was feeling right now, and that's why he had come to help. He didn't want to let her feel the same way he had felt a few years ago, so he was willing to do anything to make sure that this little girl lost her mom. Jared was saving her, and in the meantime, Lycus had to deal with the perpetrator. They got into a fight on the roof of the building, and both were very good with their weapons. However, Lacus was using brute force to his advantage. He should have used his speed to his advantage, and this fight could have been over long ago with one well-aimed blow to the target. The criminal moved closer and barely touched Lacus, continuing to stand in a fighting stance. However, this light blow did not shake Lacus at all, but instead he arrogantly asked if this was all his opponent was capable of. The fact that this offender was so weak pissed Lacus off even more, because with such abilities he had no right to attack Crivia. It was then that the boy realized that Lacus was much stronger than he seemed. He was not prepared for this, because no one had warned him that the head of the guard was so powerful. The boy pushed off the roof and flew into the air, buying himself some time, but he still wondered how Lacus had gotten so much strength. And the reason was simple, for the fact that Lacus was much stronger than his opponent was hidden in his sucking abilities, which Jared could see with the help of the spiritual eye. And during the fight with the thieves, his full order and the embodiment of justice bring his physical capabilities to the maximum. The criminal landed on the roof, unlucky to be on the same battlefield with such a strong opponent. There was no pity in his eyes at such moments. It was impossible to defeat Lacus. At the beginning, the guy did not want to give up until the end. His plan was to kill his boss if he was caught. However, he had to abandon this idea. He had had enough adrenaline and excitement for the day so he quickly turned around and intended to leave, but no one said he would be released. He called the man who assured him not to worry because very soon they would definitely meet again. And then the battle will definitely come to the very end, until one of them drops his sword and falls down beside him, spilling his blood all over the ground. A thick smoke appeared around them both, making it almost impossible for Lacus to see his opponent. And soon he was alone on the roof of the building, which upset him 
because he had missed his prey, and that was unacceptable to him. Jared was almost finishing the session, and Mia was sitting there with hope in her little heart, watching his every move, thinking that her mom would be okay soon. Jared showed the little girl a small blob of manna that was created by his imagination, and in his other hand was manna that was created by a difficult method and with strong concentration. Maria wondered why there was such a difficult method if it was so easy to solve the problem, but Jared wanted to explain it to her. He told her that evil wizards burn all the manna that is nearby, and that those who use only the first method turn into fools who are incapable of doing anything. For Mia, it was hard to imagine a magician who couldn't cast magic. It was horrible in her mind. That's why Jared wanted to tell her that she needed to practice the method with strong concentration, even if it was very difficult and Mia understood, but she was still interested in something else. She didn't understand why he wore such strange clothes and a mustache. But Jared only wanted to create a complete atmosphere, since he had already become her magic mentor. But she was distracted again when there was a knock at the door. It was time for the meal, which could not be postponed, and Mia was only too happy, because she was also hungry and did not care about some magic lesson that had not yet ended. Mia's mom came into the room thinking that she had interrupted the lesson, but Jared didn't mind eating especially since he was curious to try her food. Mary was wearing her professional clothes and was beckoning for food, and she was feeling much better and no longer bedridden. However, Jared was worried about her. She had started working too quickly after such a long and serious illness. It would be better for her to rest in bed for a while longer and then start working, but Mary assured him that she had recovered completely thanks to the medicine the king had prepared for her. So as a token of gratitude, she tried to prepare breakfast according to his diet, and the main dish was soy meat, which Jared loved so much and was ready to eat several times a day. Isabella, who was never on time, suddenly reappeared, but she noticed that Jared had indeed changed a lot. In any case, a person will try to find the shortest way for themselves. For example, the same method of training that was constantly glitching Thanks to this bank, you could raise your mana level by two, three points in one day. However, such masters had little real experience and practice because of such dubious methods, which put them at a disadvantage to others. And only a few managed to fully customize this shortcut for themselves. A method of magic control that combines training and bugging methods with the mage's mana to increase the power of magic by as much as six points. Now the guy needed to name this training. This method should become its basis, so he decided that it would be symbolic to come up with a name that would reflect him. And that's how the name Single Player Bogeyman came about. Isabella was watching him, and she did this often. During this time, the demon noticed that his methods were quite different from other magicians. Isabella asked the boy if he could see certain flows that ordinary people could not notice. Although he was not playing by the rules, his mana level was more than acceptable. Isabella moved closer to the blonde man and took him by the shoulder, beginning to suspect that he was not of this world. He panicked a little, and when he turned around, he began to deny her assumption. Isabella replied thoughtfully that she thought this boy had come to them from another continent. She wasn't sure, but she had heard that people from the Eastern Empire were said to have great absorption powers. Jared only replied that if you believe all the stories of their ancestors, you will hear a lot of mystical things there, and these are just legends. The Eastern Empire was a project that the Paradise Game Development Team had been working on for five years, and the guy was looking forward to the release of this empire, but he died before it happened and never had a chance to try it out in the game. As Jared recalled all this and remained silent, Isabella noticed that he looked a little disappointed. The demon touched him again, saying that while she was flying somewhere near him, something very interesting was always happening. Isabella suggested that they talk openly since he was the only person who could see and hear her. When Jared heard this, the first thing he said was that he would not give her the spiritual eye, maybe not even hope to, but she was already ready to forgive him for this spiritual eye. She was not going to fight much over it, so she replied that he could take it as a wedding gift for her future husband, 
which shocked Jared. Isabella said with a smile that she used to be disgusted to look at him when he was so fat, but now that he had lost some weight, he looked pretty good. Jared felt a little embarrassed, especially since she watched him sleep from the ceiling almost every night. Then she immediately snuck over his shoulder. Isabella was sure that someone like him would be perfect for an innocent ghost like her. Besides, she reminded him that he had given her his first kiss in years, which put him to shame. At this point, Jared couldn't take it anymore and ran away from her as fast as he could, saying that he had to go to Ranella, to which Isabella offered to go with him. And although he was against it, she didn't really care. Lena was developing very quickly. She picked up everything on the fly, and he was surprised that he could see such abilities in this child at first glance, for this also required a good sense, but he already thought that in a month or two his lessons would lose their meaning for her. As they rode in the carriage, Hayes pulled out a letter that Lachis had asked her to deliver to the king. He read the letter and turned his eyes to the girl, saying that the most talented warrior in Crivia would last only another month. Jared realized that it was time to find a good teacher for her, so he promised to start looking for one soon. He already had a few candidates in mind, as he had recently come across someone he could trust to teach her. Suddenly, the carriage window shattered and Hayes, who was sitting next to him, immediately jumped away. The king had already prepared to defend himself with magic. It was necessary to immediately protect the head of the kingdom from those who had ambushed him. While Hayes was recovering, Jared created a shield to protect them. At first it was easy because the arrows the robbers were shooting were too weak, but soon the shield began to crack and Hayes rushed to protect it with her life. Jared didn't want to let her go. If she had been hit by an arrow, she would have died immediately. But it was her duty to protect him. Even though she was only a maid in the palace, Hayes decided to take the hit. However, Jared grabbed her and put her in her seat. He forbade her to go outside, and if she did, he would kill her himself. So after saying that, she agreed to stay put. It was too dangerous to go out. If an arrow hit the target, she could die the same minute. Isabella came to the rescue, but Jared immediately rejected her idea to help. The robbers determined that a mage was riding in the carriage, which complicated the situation a bit. Tog, who was a mage assassin and robber for hire, began to suspect that their client had a lot of reasons to get rid of this guy. When Jared heard that it was about some mysterious guy in a mask, he remembered what Lachis had told him, and all the lines started to converge. But the assassin shouted that nothing would help him, and began to advance from all sides, surrounding the carriages of King Crivia. This time they had a newcomer with them. So the leader of the group was going to show his skills to the highest level so that he could see how to perform the task. He walked a few more steps closer to the carriage and was about to slash everything with his powerful magic. Jared wasn't at a loss either. Like a king, he realized that he needed to protect his people, so he decided to try to confuse Tog with speed magic again. But for the hired killer, it was just childish tricks, which he laughed at and took out a magic arrow. Jared used the shield that appeared next to his head. The current battle was not easy because Mage Killer is not just a nice name. They learned certain techniques to avoid falling into their traps. However, it was not easy for Tog either, as the king was changing spells quite quickly to defend himself, so he realized that he was dealing with a mage with at least fourth-class magic. Jared, meanwhile, had to think of something quickly, because if he stopped for even a moment, he would be counterattacked, so he had to act ahead of his opponent. The king's knight stood next to the carriage, watching this difficult battle, but Tog's team was completely confident in the victory of their leader. Suddenly, Tog noticed the staff, and he immediately realized what it was. It was a magical artifact for mages, and he was in need of one, so Tog immediately launched another attack. But Jared caught the stick, pulling the enemy before him and using magic that increased his physical strength many times over. The assassin staggered back, almost dropping the staff from his hands, and he noticed that something had changed. The mage had become too strong in his last blows. And at that moment, he stopped moving at all. Jared had blocked all his physical abilities, which he had boasted about so much. Just one spell of paralysis magic was enough. 
Now, it was very important for Jared to find out more about the strange masked man who had assigned this task to the assassins. But he suspected that Tog would keep quiet and tell him nothing. But to his surprise, the mage killer exclaimed that he would tell him anything he asked if he was spared and left alive. Jared stood beside him, the king holding a magic wand in one hand and a large hammer in the other, ready to listen to whatever Tog had to say. But there was one problem. He didn't trust criminals at all, so without waiting, Jared swung the hammer at the murderer. The little boy sitting in the cave next to the robber's lair listened intently to everything that was happening outside. He remembered the old saying that a trader without money can't buy luck. He was talking about himself, because he hadn't been lucky at all lately. He began to knock on the door, already knowing that all the guards that had been hired were dead because of Tog. Suddenly, he heard someone talking about a drug dealer saying that he had good merchandise and probably a lot of guards. However, any guard would have fallen before Tog's hammer. He was too strong, so it was an easy task for him to deal with a few people, even armed ones. Tog was negotiating with this stranger about the task and had already said that he could prepare the full amount because he had never returned in defeat. But the masked man said that he would give the other two-thirds of the amount after the task was completed. He realized that this king was no ordinary man, because he was able to cure all the sick very quickly with his potions, and he had obtained all the ingredients very easily. Also, the young man in the black mask was sure that Jared would go to Ranella to get a lot of money from the sale of this precious medicine for a serious disease that was common there. They both set out to wait for the king's carriage to pass by on this road. The information from Tog's servants was always reliable, so he didn't even worry about whether they had chosen the right place to ambush him. The boy listened with horror to all this talk. He knew that these fierce killers had killed 11 people in the last seven days alone. He wondered why there were no brave men who would dare to catch such a monster and stop all these horrors. But it seems he had found one Jared who had the strength and courage to end it all. The boy was amazed at Jared's skills, defeating a boss who never left a fight unscathed. Meanwhile, the king rose into the sky and created a large sphere of fire, looking at his opponent, who was also paralyzed in one place. The boy was very happy when he saw Jared fighting so bravely against this monster, who had terrified many people in the territory of Krivia. He had hope and even some confidence that this boy would be the warrior who would save him and take him out of this dark place. The boy was very happy and smiling, and he thanked Jared very much when he rescued him from this terrible place. Jared was of course happy to have saved him and to hear the gratitude and praise. However, he wished there had been some distance between them because the boy was hugging him and keeping up with him. The younger man blushed and pulled away from him, beginning to apologize. He was so overwhelmed with happiness that he didn't even notice. He told Jared that he had come to the land to make a deal about the crystals, but that he had been attacked by Tog and his gang. The king apologized, because there was no good security at all in this area, and outlaw laws were rampant, and Jared was really uncomfortable in front of him. But the boy reassured him because he had survived thanks to him. He had thought that he would stay in this dark cellar until he died of hunger. From his past life, the boy remembered that Arcanes was the most powerful NPC ruler who bought a kingdom in the east for a gastronomic price. Using his special powers of foresight and fashion analysis, he identifies trends and takes over all the popular products, and users who are startup merchants follow him and thus expand. Jared was surprised that Arkeen was in the vicinity of their kingdom at such a time, and he was curious to know what exactly brought the boy who would become the most popular and powerful ruler in the east to these lands. Nevertheless, Jared decided to help him a little more and offer him something, because it would be very difficult for Arkeen's now, both psychologically and because he had lost everything he had. The king offered to give him 15% of the profits, and in return asked that he sell all the medicines in Ranella that he had prepared and was going to sell there. Arkeens thought it would be much better to sign a contract with him first, get him interested, and then hire him, which would be much more profitable. 
So after a while, the kid told him that he would refuse the prophet Jared had promised him, but he wanted him to fulfill two requests. Hayes sat silently next to Arkeens and listened to their conversation, and the boy suggested that he could find a very good place to sell drugs and he should just trust him. Jared immediately agreed, but said that depending on the situation, he could refuse. But Arkeens relied on his feelings, which had never failed him, and now he was sure that everything would go according to his plan and the king would listen to his request. So, the boy made his first request, which sounded very strange and simple. He wanted Jared to call him Aki, and the boy blushed a little at these words. Isabella, who was standing next to Jared, could not get a word out of her mouth when she heard such a request. She could not understand how he could give up a good profit and exchange it for this. But anyway, the king agreed. But Aki had to tell his next request later. Later they reached the kingdom of Ranella, and to their great surprise it was very different from what they had heard about this place. It was not gloomy and dull. The kingdom was full of life, despite the decline. Arkinis and Hayes began to carry boxes to the carriage that they had bought from local merchants, and they contained bundles of paper. Ranella was doing well indeed, and if only the problem with the disease was solved, the kingdom's potential would immediately be maximized. Jared turned to Aki. He was grateful to him for helping them open their business in a good place, but it was just a thank you for everything the king had done, even though it seemed to him that it was not enough. Later, they put everything in its place and took out a large barrel that Aki thought was supposed to contain the cure for the disease, but it was not ready yet, as Jared had said. He took a small bottle and turned the faucet so that a red liquid began to pour into it, and when he closed it with a click, the preparation of the rare magic herb was complete, and the skill in making healing herbs rose to level two. Thus, Jared managed to achieve the highest scores of the day. However, there was a downside, as he thought. Certain limitations were immediately triggered, which was why it took several months to complete the process when he didn't know about the glitch and had just started making the medicine. Jared went to Aki and handed him a small bottle of medicine to sell, and the king told him to tell him a few features of the medicine to a customer who wanted to buy it. And he didn't have to wait long. Talon came to the counter, and with the help of his spiritual eye, Jared immediately saw that the man was infected with Rennell's disease. Talon was amazed to see such a low price for a medicine that was so important for this kingdom. It cost only one gold. Aki smiled sweetly and said that this favorable offer was especially for him, because he saw that Talon was a very good person. But then the man began to suspect that this was just a trick and that there might not be anything good in this medicine, but Arkeen still convinced him to buy the bottle. Talon didn't really feel sorry for the one gold piece, because he was going to die soon anyway because of Rennell's disease, so the man gave him the money. All that was left was to sign the contract that Arkenes handed him. It all sounded very strange, because... He was just going to buy the medicine, so the contract confused him, especially since it said that he would have the rights to the medicine. But he had nothing to lose, so he signed the paper with a pen and opened the bottle, drinking it all down on the street. Jared kindly said that it would take at least 30 minutes after taking the medication to feel its effects, and he added that he would be here all the time, so the man could go rest and come back as soon as he needed. Talon, of course, believed the little boy and bought the medicine, but he still had his doubts that it was just a scam. But Jared could vouch for the medicine, saying that if no action was taken, he would refund his 1,000 gold pieces. Talon said nothing to this and simply walked away from the counter. While Hayes and Jared continued to carry everything they needed for their small shop, Arkeen said he had to prepare something else for the trade and Jared had a new dose of medication to prepare, and he had another achievement to reach for the highest score in 24 hours. And he succeeded, the crafting bug was working perfectly. In the game Paradise, the skill of making medicines is given depending on the products from which they are made, and the penalty that could limit the skill level is 24 hours, according to the criteria of his potion. 
However, he is thinking about transferring the rights to make the potion to another user, and all the data except the skill level that has already been applied in his information can be transferred to the next user. In this way, the penalty of a 24-hour restriction would also be transferred to tolling. Two hours had passed in this speculation, and Arkeens was still nowhere to be seen, and Jared was beginning to wonder where he was. However, he continued to believe that he would be back soon and that everything would be fine. Indeed, he and Hayes didn't have to wait long as they heard a very loud noise coming their way. It was something incredible, a crowd of people with Arkeens chasing them at breakneck speed. Hayes didn't know where to go, and yet she hoped that all these people were not running toward them and would bypass the small island of Oak with the medicine. However, when they caught a glimpse of Aki and their first customer up ahead, they realized that they were all heading towards them. This crowd of people literally pounced on Jared, but Hayes stood in front of him, trying to protect him. They all demanded that they be sold the cure for Rennell's disease immediately. There was no empty space near the island. Everyone who stood there wanted to get ahead of the others to be the first to receive the healing medicine. It was a real chaos that could not be stopped. However, they both liked to hear the joyful comments and praise. Now, the status of Crivia was rising in the eyes of other people because they had developed such a valuable remedy. But these comments were followed by quite the opposite ones, where people remembered the past of Crivia. When everything was very bad there, they again called the king a fat pig who had only recently taken up his mind and started to change something in the kingdom. Here Aki decided to take matters into his own hands and loudly announced to everyone that he would sell this medicine here and only today, and if they wanted to buy it on any other day, they could come to Kriviri on their own. There were rumors that the nightmare forest of Krivia was almost untouched by hunters, and there were still many monsters there, which would definitely bring hunters there one day. The guy went on to say that in the territory of the kingdom of Ithama, such a thing can be found with great difficulty and will cost twice as much. Aki, thus encouraging even more visitors, said that everyone should stand in line and not push, as there was enough medicine for everyone. In the end, when night fell, they gave away the last jar of medicine and all the customers went home. Hayes was so tired that she slept like a log, and Jared was happy to see how much he had earned under the starry sky and the amount was really big, as much as 12,250 gold pieces. If you converted this money into the currency from his past life, it would be 12.2 billion won, which would be enough money to live on for years. Suddenly, Jared heard a voice behind him asking if the king was pleased with this income. The boy turned around to see Aki, who didn't seem to be exhausted after such a hard day's work. The boy approached him holding a coin in his hand, and said that he had come for the next reward, that is, the request he had left. At first, Jared did not mention their agreement about the two wishes, but then he calmly told him to ask for whatever he wanted. Aki gathered his thoughts and took a deep breath. His next request was to become Jared's servant and be in charge of the merchant's union in the kingdom of Krivia. Aki got down on one knee, bowing his head before him. He had too little experience yet, he was only 20 years old, but he promised to try his best to make the merchant union the best in this part of the continent if Jared trusted him. Jared appreciated Aki's courage, because even though he had been robbed by bandits and had no money left, he had not given up and kept going. The king smiled and said that he himself wanted to make Aki his servant when he saw his abilities, but the position of head of the merchant's union, which is the core of all trade, would not be available immediately. Aki was a little worried, although he had expected this answer. He hoped that he would have a chance to continue his work with the King of Krivia. But the request had to be honored, and he was also confident in the boy's abilities. So Jared agreed and decided to give Aki a chance to prove himself. The insight that made him see the potential for Krivia's development. The desire to get high and the courage to speak about it directly were all great advantages of Arkeens. But luck played the most important role here, because the place was currently free. Jared liked Aki and knew that the trade union headed by him had a great future. 
Aki could not believe his good fortune. He was immensely grateful to the king who was already very sleepy, so he said goodbye and told him that tomorrow they would return to the kingdom. To tell the truth, Jared was happy that they would finally return to the cold lands of Krivia. As he walked to his room, he again admired the starry sky as the warm spring breeze enveloped him. This time, thanks to the herb-mixing bug, his crafting skill grew to level 35, and as a reward for passing level 30, they were able to gain knowledge of the automation of the production process and the technology of producing medium concentration potions. Using 5,000 gold and 10 curvature crystals, 24 test tubes of potions are produced per day, so if you take 39 gold for each, the net earnings will be equal to 900 gold. The medicine could be bought only in their kingdom, so monster hunters can safely hunt in the nightmare forest, so the number of crystals in Krivia will increase, and the damage from monsters will be less and less. In addition, traders from other kingdoms also knew well what the territory of Krivia was famous for. Therefore, they did not miss this opportunity to improve their earnings and began to come to the kingdom often for additional benefits. In the present day, only good things kept happening in Krivia, even beyond Jared's expectations. The potions they made became a starting point, and the king's achievements began to accumulate, so the mainland gradually began to recognize the name Krivia. On one of those days, Jared went to a very cold place where there was not a single soul, and Isabella did not waste the opportunity and came to him again. She thought he was going to this horrible place to kill himself, so she couldn't let that happen. They weren't married yet. He looked better now than he had in years. So Jared couldn't possibly be a ghost, but that wasn't why he was going there at all. He was going after the monster DeLuca to catch him. And Isabella had told him not to throw around such words and to stop making up stuff. But his idea frightened the demon even more, and she absolutely refused to let Jared go on such a dangerous mission. Lich is a powerful dark wizard who has been cursed, and if Jared is caught, his soul will be taken from him. Despite all Isabella's warnings, the boy was very calm, confident in his own abilities, knowing everything about DeLuca's methods of attack and further actions. DeLuc is a Lyshi who lives in a hiding place he created himself and never shows himself to the world. He only waits for his victim and then steals his soul. In the game Paradise, he was chosen by the Demon King himself and freed from his hiding place during the Great Sonma War, thus gaining eternal life. During the main story of the game, all users had to go to a special part called the Wrath of DeLuca. If DeLuca became even stronger, he would no longer be affected by swords and magic, which is why there was no time to delay in destroying him, and only divine power could kill him. Isabella had already realized that she could not convince him to go back and forget about this idea. He seemed very strange to her now if he was taking such a risk. In general, Jared knew too much for an ordinary person, so she thought he was some kind of god pretending to be a simple guy, but he shouted at her to stop making noise and coming up with such ridiculous things. It was driving him crazy. After a while, Jared reached the hideout of DeLuca himself, the most powerful lich in the game of paradise. He went inside the cave and began to explore it, remembering where the events in the game took place. Jared was trying to find a small crevice, and it was very difficult. He had already thought that it had disappeared when the game turned into reality. Isabella was flying around the whole time and noticed that he now looked like a very cute dog looking for a bone. Realizing that it would really be better to stop talking such nonsense, Isabella flew closer and asked him what he was looking for, if Jared had come here for DeLuca but the boy explained that he first needed to find the passage to the high mountain, because without it, he would not find the left. He remembered, however, that there were a lot of traps there that were almost impossible to deal with. At the entrance, they were met by the frozen corpses of people who had also tried to get there, but this attempt was unsuccessful. But still, his desire to catch DeLuca was greater, and soon he found a passage that could lead him to the desired place. He began to fall through the wall through the secret passage, which frightened Isabella. 
He only now realized Isabella's shock because this magic passage was another bug he had found himself. Most likely this will cause an invisible passage to appear on the map, which will make it possible to destroy DeLuca. The two of them made their way to the Lich's secret room, which was full of gold coins, precious jewelry, and valuable weapons. Actually, it was a reward room for those who could defeat DeLuca. These treasures were designed for a large number of people, so it was no wonder there were so many of them. There were also more than ten artifacts in this room that the winners could take away. Jared wanted to find some of them, and as he approached one of the shelves, he noticed what he was looking for. It was a ring that had belonged to a greedy man named Melt. And it wasn't just any ring, it had something magical about it. So when Jared put it on his finger, gold coins fell from the jewelry, almost flooding them. It was a spatial bag that could expand to unknown limits. Isabella had advised him against stealing the Lich's things. She was a powerful evil spirit herself, but she could not defeat DeLuca. But Jared didn't consider it stealing. All those precious things and money were taken from the unfortunate people who had been in trouble here. The forest had killed her on the spot, and so much had been gathered here over the years. The guy wasn't going to just take everything for himself. He wanted to punish this Deluke on behalf of all the people he had killed in his lair. And now they were almost at the very place where the mighty evil in the form of the Lich was sitting. He was chained with thick chains to his own throne, because many years ago, a woman had lost a vein of vital energy, and after that, DeLuca had never been able to rise from this place. All he dreamed of was freedom, freedom after which he would take ruthless revenge on all the people on the mainland, making them suffer for eternity and feel the same way he had been living for decades. Suddenly, Jared approached the Lich's throne. He heard everything the old man was saying, and he should have thought about his behavior, not continued to spin vile thoughts of revenge in his head. The guy put his hand on his head, and at that time Deluxe could not turn to him and look into his eyes. After that, without answering the question, Jared used magic. He used a flame that could burn any dead person in a few seconds. Jared wanted to be the only hero in this world who would defeat the evil that rages in the universe. The flame that the boy used showed the true figure of Lich DeLuca, in the form of a skeleton without any living space. His dark cloak continued to burn while it was on his bones, and then, looking at Jared, he asked in a low voice how the boy managed to get around all the traps set. While the throne was burning and the flames were not extinguished, Jared quickly jumped away from the main evil of the continent. Before him was a cursed magician who had gained a terrifying amount of power that he had exchanged for his humanity an act that violated all the laws of this world and knew no pity. Such magicians are able to create a certain image for themselves and endow it with powerful magic. This image is controlled by the magician's thoughts and can act far away from their own and real body. Deluxe had lost this vein of vital energy because of a sacred maiden. Because of her, his soul was held hostage by his body. He was weakened, and if he died this time, he would not be able to rise again. Now Jared had to be very careful not to get too close to the magician, lest he use dark magic that can take away the life force of the victim. In his past life, Jared had already fought DeLuca more than once after he was freed, so now he had to do it again, but in reality, not through a computer. Continuing to keep a certain distance, Jared summoned arrows of lightning to hit DeLuca. But for a magician like this lich, such techniques would be too easy, and he would easily dodge the arrows if he were full of power. But now he was almost at zero, and Jared wasn't the weakest of opponents. DeLuca was also confused by the fact that he could feel the divine power of eternal fire in Jared's body. Now that he understood what was going on, he noticed the ring of the Holy Maiden who possessed this powerful magic. After all, as strange as this was, if DeLuca wanted to live, he had to think of something fast. Jared laughed, however, and approached him with his sword, wanting to play with the Count a little longer. Jared realized that if he didn't interrupt the attack, it wouldn't work on DeLuca. But despite the fact that he didn't manage to destroy him from the first punch, if Jared continued at the same pace, he could definitely win this fight. DeLuca noticed that the guy seemed to see right through him. 
He knew the techniques he was using, but it was still evil territory. To help him, Daluk summoned the knights of his dark dungeon who rose from the ground to defend him. A stranger had invaded their kingdom, so the Lich ordered them not to wait and to deal with the guest. Daluk shouted for the guards to block Jared's path to him. Isabella panicked, appearing next to his head, saying that there were too many evil spirits here. However, Jared remembered that in the game, these knights appeared where traps were set, so he assumed that everything had changed after he had been resurrected once again. The guy reminded the Count of all the suffering he had endured throughout his years, and since he had already managed to absorb the Divine Flame, he offered to fight in a fair duel. Jared came up with a plan. Realizing that he needed to block him in any way possible before the Lich could use higher-level magic, Isabella decided to take over all the guards that were supposed to protect DeLuca, so the demon allowed Jared to think only about how to defeat the main boss. When Isabella flew into the skull of one of the knights, he looked around nervously at the others of his kind, who slowly began to retreat. She began to control him from the inside, of course. The monster's appearance was so-so, but the flesh was quite strong, so it worked for her. This was not good, because if it continued like this, the two of them would be able to reach the Lich in no time. Deluc decided to deal with the additional problems first, so he threw Isabella, who was wearing the remains of the flesh of one of the knights, away. The skeleton nearly shattered into individual bones from the impact, but Isabella was unharmed. This played into Jared's hands, because while his main enemy was distracted by her, he could easily attack by surprise, which would have strengthened the blow. The King of Krivia used powerful magic again, using the Sword of Lightning, and with the next blow, he decided to finally finish off his enemy, picking up a magic staff with incredible energy. But the second time DeLuca was not going to lose, he protected himself with a powerful shield in the form of a stable wall that completely covered him. But the fact that Jared had the ability to use two spells at once was not good for him. But that was his specialty, double magic, a big plus against such a powerful evil. Jared remembered that when he played Paradise, this lich had lost every time he used those lightning bolts, so the guy had put a certain quality into his strike. Thanks to this spell, DeLuca was even more bound by the chains. Jared stood calmly, trying to regain his breathing, and Isabella, who was still in the bones of the Dark Wizard's Knight, looked at DeLuca, whom they had defeated, in amazement. She was sure that she had a lot to do with it, and without her, Jared would have had a hard time. However, as soon as the boy was near the Lich, he seemed to come to life and began to move abruptly and scream loudly. Without hesitation, Jared struck his arm, knocking him back onto the throne. Jared used his ability that Isabella had given him. He knew that such spells would not kill DeLuca, but they would definitely exhaust him. So the boy sneaked up on him and repeated his super-powered punch. Lich screamed loudly. He could not believe that this was what his death looked like, that it was going to happen right now. This was the first time he had felt the fear of death since becoming a Lich, and his instinct was to avoid this guy, but he could not do so because of his chains. The powerful Lai Chi, who terrified all the people who came across him, spread mortal fear. He had power over death and could not say goodbye to life so easily. All the anger that was boiling inside him broke free, but the chains that held him still had not broken. Delic, in his new form, offered to fight the young wizard once again. Without waiting a moment, Jared rushed at him, protecting himself with a strong shield. The flow of magic from DeLuca was too powerful, although it could hardly be called ordinary magic. This super-powerful force had broken the barrier behind which Jared had been hiding, and now he stood unarmored before the powerful Lich. Isabella couldn't let Jared die so easily, so she continued to manage the Dark Knight's work and came to his defense, deflecting DeLuca's blow. Leech was furious. He was once again prevented from achieving his goal and ending this fight with his own victory. DeLuc ordered the Dark Knight to disappear from his kingdom, and the bones flew in different directions. Now Isabella could not help him in any way, but she still believed that Jared would find a way to overcome this evil. And the boy was also confident in himself. He knew that DeLuca would never, under any circumstances, defeat him, 
neither in the game nor in real life. In the beginning, he was a little confused by his appearance and method of attack, but his basic techniques were still the same. In Paradise, this boss appeared most often, so he studied its weaknesses and techniques that can be used to defeat it. All the methods of attack and defense were well known to him, so nothing prevented him from reading Deckluck through and knowing in advance how he would act in a certain situation. Jared was moving too fast for such a slow lich, first of all because he was chained, and secondly, Deckluck was much bigger than the guy, so he decided to crush him with his own weight. Jared had just a few centimeters to dodge the lich's attack, but he missed again and was unable to reach his main target. Jared stopped at this point, trusting his intuition and knowledge, but the lich itself took it as a shock. For Jared, challenging even his biggest fear was very easy if you have confidence in yourself. At this point, DeLuca wondered why his opponent was only dodging. Was he really going to destroy him in this way? Jared caught the right moment and was right next to the enemy's head, holding his magic staff. He used fourth-grade magic, stabbing the staff into his chest. Only now DeLuca realized his plan. The guy was deliberately using low-level magic to mislead him, and it worked. And besides, Jared was confident. He was 100% confident, and that gave him a head start on the fight and the victory. Now it was time for the final stage of the fight and Jared strengthened his magic with the chain of the Holy Seal and bound his enemy even more tightly. After the boy had locked him in with the holy object, there was no way DeLuca would be able to get out. He put his hand on his heart so that the evil one could feel the full power of the divine blessing. There was noise all around and Della kept trying to get out of the trap, but it was all in vain. Isabella hid behind him and told him to give up immediately because the demon king he was waiting for would not come. After hearing this, Deluc really lost the strength to fight anymore, but he did not stop threatening them with a terrible future after what he had done. The demon was already almost completely underground, pulling him in very quickly to close him within its walls. In the last seconds, the demon asked if the young magician was sure he could handle the next stage. Jared very calmly replied that it was still quite a long way to go, the ninth class of magical abilities could be considered the real end point, and he had only four so far. However, DeLuca had been sitting quietly and dying all this time. He didn't understand why the guy had come to fight him, but the boy had a simple answer. He had to finish off the most powerful monarch on the mainland. DeLuc considered it all just childish games, and besides, all these treasures were covered with the blood of innocent people, Jared wanted to get what none of the great knights who had been given their powers by the deities could get, what the demon king himself could not achieve. DeLuca was interested in this young mage with such ambition and fierce confidence, and he was going to watch the developments from hell itself to see if Jared would pay too high a price for his enthusiasm. Isabella was frightened by this guy at such moments, as if he was ready for anything and his instinct for self-preservation was simply turned off. There were a lot of people in the world who were much stronger than him, but Jared didn't care about that, as if he knew that sooner or later he would be able to climb as high as he did. When DeLuca's lich was gone, Jared finally picked up the thing he had come here for, a large bracelet that was an artifact of growth. Now there was nothing better for him than this precious thing, but Isabella saw a strange book in front of her. She immediately told the boy about it. The current king of Crivia walked over to the book and picked it up. It could have been something that Lich had left behind after his death, but it was very strange because the boy had never picked up anything like DeLuca's books before. He looked at the binding, realizing that he was holding a book of spells for resurrection. It turns out that the object resurrected by the wizard cannot resist his wishes. It simply becomes his subordinate. And if someone decides to try to go against these rules, he will not just die, but disappear forever without a chance to return. As Isabella read a few pages of this strange book, she realized that it was more like slavery than a gesture of goodwill from someone. She wasn't going to go along with this. A demon would never allow herself to be bossed around. But Jared interrupted her tantrum and told her to tie him up first. Isabella was quiet for a moment, thinking she had heard something wrong. Jared said that she should use a curse on him and he would be patient, 
and Isabella liked that because she also liked similar things. The guy also emphasized that when the spell was repeated, the strength of resistance and resilience would increase significantly, and it would be ideal to hire a powerful wizard for this, but it was too expensive, and Isabella would do it for free. The demon looked at him as if he were a man out of his mind, as soon as she found a flaw in him for the first time in all her time. With some hope, she asked if that was all he had to say to her, to which Jared replied that he would think about the rest. Isabella agreed. She was tired of living in the body of an evil spirit anyway. When the boy heard this, he immediately went to get the body he had found to resurrect her, but she didn't think it would happen so quickly. However, there was no time to dawdle on such a step, so very soon Isabella was already transformed into a new person, and in the first minutes, Jared already thought he had done it in vain. It was hard for him to carry her all the time on his back, but it was hard for the former demon to get used to a new body so quickly, and she also asked to be called Isabel. Although her appearance had changed a bit, her character remained the same stubborn and hot-tempered, and although she said she had forgotten everything after the resurrection, she did not like her old name. Isabel began to pester him to walk faster because it was very cold. He was just as perverted as DeLuca, and if he had worn the same clothes, there would have been no difference. He was pleased that Isabel's readings remained the same, but her temper was almost impossible to tolerate. It seemed that she had become even more emotional. But she changed the subject. She was more concerned about the fact that there were so many corpses lying around, but Jared reassured her and told her that they could relax because it was an area with traps that he had managed to disarm. When she was still in the demon's form, they came to the body Isabella was about to move into, and she asked Jared if he knew how the girl had died, and when he said he had no idea, she was glad, because he was not a know-it-all. Isabella hoped that the girl hadn't become an evil spirit, because this life makes you tired very quickly. You feel almost nothing but cold and loneliness. While they were making their way through all these passages, Isabel even thought that this girl would be very grateful to her if she lived a decent and interesting life in her body. She suddenly decided that she would eat a lot of delicious food, go on adventures, and dress beautifully. She hinted that she could not get away from Jared because he was never boring, and sometimes even dangerous. She leaned against his back. She felt good now, and Jared was happy to have a good partner. Meanwhile, the number of monster hunters was decreasing significantly. And the reason was that the cure for Rennell's disease was only available in Crivia, and they all went there. But the king of the kingdom was very disappointed and angry, and he specially allocated a large sum of money to hire specialists and produce a similar medicine to bring the hunters back here. But the problem is that, in Crivia, they are very careful not to let the information about the healing potion leak out, and they barely managed to get one copy, but it was not enough. But the man was too angry. He didn't understand what his wards were doing if they couldn't even do that. He threw open the door and kicked him out of his office, telling him to get out. This little Jared was so brazen and had absolutely no fear of anything, which did not please the head of this state. But he decided to try his own way, which he had recently invented. He sent his men to Mallorca to negotiate a treaty with them. However, such actions could provoke a war, and if this happened, they would be guaranteed to lose. There were very few warriors who were ready to tear the enemy apart. But the ward said that they had 1239 soldiers who would be ready to do anything to protect the king. However, this was still not enough, not enough to strike a fatal blow and defeat the enemy. They said that Jared himself had level 4 magic, so his army would be very powerful. Now this was not that stupid fat pig, and if he had known that things would turn out this way, he would have ordered Glagus to kill him immediately. But he was no longer there. The assassin sent by the master had destroyed Glagus. During this time, while the question of the army was being decided, the one for whom Horgus had been waiting for so long came to the hall. The magician Akron returned, bringing with him several people. These were powerful magicians whom they had gathered on Horgus's orders, and it had already taken a lot of money, but the king had given permission to spend as much as necessary. 
Horgus approached one of the magicians who was wearing a cloak and asked him what class of magic he had, and the man replied that he was third class. So if they were to attack Krivia now, that kingdom would disappear in a day. This was great news, and finally, they could go into battle. Meanwhile, Jared had just entered a forest in the northern part of the continent. His men had heard that he was going to establish diplomatic relations with neighboring countries. However, he denied it because it was unlikely. Their closest neighbors were Mallorca and Ranella, with whom they always had disputes over wages. So Jared was going to negotiate not with kingdoms, but with tribes. Very soon, everyone will know about everything. You just have to wait a little bit. And when that moment came, the king's ward almost fell off his horse. He was very frightened. The man saw a flock of red goblins holding weapons and not being very kind to the guests. Obrin, who also went on the trip with them, was also shocked. He knew a lot about these places, but this was the first time he had heard that red goblins were found here. Now there was nowhere to go. Their vehicle and all of them were surrounded by a tribe of red goblins that were getting closer by the second. The elders immediately shouted out to the knights not to think too long and to defend his majesty from the enemies, who were so numerous. Lachis, who led the whole team, ordered them to be ready to defend themselves and never attack first. It was strange that they were preparing to defend themselves against some monsters. But now the knights calmed down a bit, because the head of this tribe came out to them, who seemed to be in the mood for negotiations. Ibanaba was the leader of all the goblins in the tribe and was ready to discuss the issues with which the guests had come to them. Aubrey was surprised that there was a goblin who could speak Nara, but Jared stepped up to him and introduced himself, saying that he had come from the kingdom of Krivia specifically to meet him and that Ibanaba remembered the leader of that kingdom, but he looked much better than he thought. Jared made his request. They wanted to start diplomatic relations and exchange their own resources for their gold and iron. The leader of the Red Goblins was really pleased with this desire because Jared was the first person to offer such help. But the tribal king had a sixth question, and it was important to him that the boy should be able to accept their estate and soul. The next moment, a cartload of nightmare stones appeared beside them both. Jared wanted to show his friendliness and get them to make a treaty between them. King Krivia's wards were embarrassed because they were just ordinary stones which were plentiful in the Nightmare Forest and had no value at all. And Lachis knew that the Nightmare Stones were only beautiful on the outside, and hunters often took them for themselves, but as a souvenir, so using them as a bargaining chip could have serious consequences. Ibanaba said what Lachis had been thinking and he also knew that the Nightmare Forest was full of these stones. Usually, no one wants these stones at all, but the king brought them as a barter item, and at this point it was clear that they were in big trouble. But the head of the tribe did not need anything else. He was so happy that he had been brought just such a thing. Ibaniba shook Jared's hand and said that he was very grateful to him. The boy had brought the Nightmare Stone, which was so important to them, the goblins. This creature signed the treaty, and they became one big family in the north. Jared was ready to say goodbye and move on and thank the wisest king of the Red Goblins once again. He hoped that their friendship would only grow stronger in the future. Ibaniba called out to his men and told them to bring the gold and iron they were to exchange. They were showered with these resources from head to toe, and the goblins were so happy to receive the nightmare stones that they had already made jewelry out of them for themselves and could not stop admiring them. Their hearts beat even faster just thinking about how they would grind these beautiful stones. It turns out that these goblins have a lot of minds. Since they can extract such valuable resources in such quantities, there was already a thought to drive them out of these lands and take possession of them ourselves. And just as Jared was about to leave, he was stopped by Ibanib, who said he couldn't just let them go because they had signed a treaty today and there was going to be a big party to celebrate. After that, the leader shouted a little louder to those who were hiding in the bushes. They no longer needed to hide their presence here and could safely show themselves. After a few seconds, a few strange creatures appeared, a little timidly, but still, they looked more like humans, but they seemed to be not so friendly compared to the others. 
They were dark elves, a warlike tribe that alarmed people a bit because they mostly lived somewhere in the depths of the forest and did not treat others very well. But the king knew about them too. Jared literally knew about everything that happened here. The red goblins who live in the northern part of the continent above Crivia, they never appeared to people for no reason. But that didn't mean they were closed to humanity. This tribe had quite close relations with the dark elves living on a neighboring island, so close that they signed a treaty of joint defense. Ibaniba had high intelligence and wisdom, which allowed him to conclude peace treaties with many tribes. Human culture was not fully understood by him. It was something new, but very exciting. At that moment, Jared was glad that he knew so much about this game, because if they did attack the Red Goblins, they would have stayed here forever. They would have been killed. Later, when it was getting dark, they had a party with drinks and lots of food. But Jared's mentee was still curious to know how he remembered so much about the area. Now, several different cultures had united into one big family. They did not see each other as enemies. They saw each other as partners, and they could turn to each other for help. After some time had passed, Jared called Lacus over to his office. He asked if the workshops and forges were working properly in their kingdom, and Lacus replied that due to the lack of certain resources, the production of weapons was suspended, so now they were working on improving the existing weapons. So he ordered to send all the iron they had received from the goblins today to be used to make swords, arrows, and other defensive weapons. Lacus accepted the order and nodded his head. Now all that was left to do was to complete the task. But Jared snapped at him and told him that half of the gold they got would go to the kingdom's army, and he instructed Lacus to recruit soldiers in his stead. Ibaniba, who was sitting next to them drinking something, overheard their conversation and asked curiously if they were going to fight Majorca. There was only one reason why Crivia needed so many resources, war. He approved of the decision, because Majorca had become a haven for criminals, and if left to its own devices, the kingdom would continue to spread a terrible influence over neighboring states. Jared apologized, thinking that he might be upset that they were preparing for war using their resources, but Ibanaba assured him that he didn't mind at all. He just wanted to speak out about the situation. In any case, the amount of gold and iron meant nothing to them, and he did not like Horgus himself, so he supported the decision. After the conversation, Ibanaba, the king of the Red Goblins, exclaimed that it was time to drink to the newest son of their family, King Jared. Everyone raised their mugs in the air, shouting a round of applause. Eventually, they returned home. Active preparations for the war continued, and Isabel tried to get used to her new body. Four weeks had passed since then. Jared introduced her as his classmate, with whom he had been studying at Desmond Academy, and she got used to living in the palace much faster than Jared could have imagined. Every day, Isabel helped him to develop his own magical abilities. Her magic level was at the second stage, and it allows her to give people hallucinations in the form of their fears. She created a giant spider which the boy was very afraid of, and Isabel could not understand why he was screaming so much. It was just a common spider. But thanks to her, Jared managed to improve his skills to level 34. After the next training session, he handed her three candies in his hand. But the girl didn't want to eat them because she was worried that she might get fat and spoil her beautiful body, which she had recently moved into. But he decided to think of something, saying that today was a special day and that was why he had given her the sweets, and that was why he asked her to eat them. She didn't know what kind of special day he was talking about, but he was making it up, even though in the real world where he used to live, it was White Day. He said that on February 14th, according to tradition, she was supposed to give him something sweet, but now, a month later, it was the other way around. Listening to him talk like that, Isabel realized that he was very romantic and thought that he had finally started to like her, but he denied it saying that he had given it to all the girls in the palace, which upset Isabel. But she didn't show it. Instead, she opened the candy and ate it. This guy was very interesting. He used her every day for his own training, and he didn't want to give up his heart. However, she was not going to give up and leave him so easily. 
They were bound by the spiritual eye, bound by the kiss of the eternal contract. In general, there was no time for jokes, so he pulled away. He needed to continue training, and since he had increased his defense, he suggested that he increase his magic by a factor of two, to which Isabel agreed and said she would push him with all her might. She was using the magic of lust, which she knew just fine from her past life. But Jared screamed with all his might to stop her from doing it, but it was too late. After the training, he left to take care of further business to prepare for the war, and she launched a certain project to train disciples, the essence of which was to use the spiritual eye to find people of the future with good abilities and lure them to their side first. Besides training talent, there were other reasons for Jared's bold investment in this project. The main one was to capitalize on the mutual reward system, in which a teacher receives bonus stats according to the progress of his or her students and can have a maximum of four students. Isabel was the first to show results. She didn't mind becoming his student. In general, she was not eligible for it after the resurrection. Lena also joined his team and performed all the tasks assigned to her conscientiously. She was ready to do her best. For Mia, it was something new, very interesting. Like a big game, she was very happy to be taught such magic. And when Jared saw his students practicing hard and making progress with the traps he had also taught them, the plan began to go incredibly smoothly, or so he thought. But there was a but. Hayes walked into his office. She was a mere servant and did not think she had the right to call the king her teacher. It was impossible for her, and that is why the unforeseen circumstances had arisen. She, of course, wanted to show some progress and become the best healer, but her level of progress was zero. It was a special profession that differed from priests in the ability to heal. Her specialty was supposed to be in this, but no more than five such healers could be found on the entire continent of Nars. Apparently that was the case, he exhaled, realizing that he might lose his student, although he had originally had high hopes for her. So he stood up from his chair and began to scold her a lot because she always put herself in the frame of a maid and did not value herself at all. He realized that everything should be in its place and he did not want to lose such a person. However, to become a healer, Hayes needed to feel the title with her whole body and soul. She had been a maid in this palace since she was a child until she was 23, and breaking that mold would not be easy for her. Something inside her was holding her back. Perhaps she had a defense mechanism on a subconscious level or was too pessimistic. He needed to choose the right direction for her, but he didn't know how to do it. Jared put the cup of tea on the table. Then Obrin continued to speak. Their king had found new and diverse ways to solve the problem, and every citizen of the kingdom was grateful to him. However, Jared was not obliged to be responsible for absolutely everything. Physically, he could not do it, because no one was to blame for the fact that Hayes could not achieve any result. All that remained was to believe in her and support her, because the girl was trying her best. She was also his person. Jared had once promised to make her a healer, and he was doing everything he could to make her one. And then he realized what the older man was getting at. Jared's traps that had worked for his other students just might not work for Hayes. There had to be a very honest way to get her power to come out, and as soon as he said that, he was attacked from behind by a guy who had appeared unnoticed. Hayes saw this and immediately ran to his aid, and she immediately entered the room where it happened. However, the king was already lying unconscious on the floor, unable to defend himself against the attacker. The girl put her hand over her mouth, quietly asking how it had happened. One of the knights standing nearby with Jared's body told her that the king had been attacked by a hired assassin. They had called for the best doctors, but the situation was getting out of hand, and ordinary human power might not be able to help. And even if there was enough medicine, it would be too late by the time the doctor arrived, so there was no time to wait. She was tormented by the thought that she was the only one here who had trained as a healer, and only Hayes could help this disaster. The knight did not leave the king's side, and then Hayes approached, and she decided to take matters into her own hands. Focusing only on this case, she mentally begged that she would succeed and be able to save Jared. Tears welled up in Hayes' eyes as the energy blob faded away, 
and with it the king's life. But the girl couldn't let him go like that. She promised to help him all her life. When Hayes closed her eyes, her memories were only of the moments with Jared, who believed in her despite all these difficulties. And a miracle happened. She was so overwhelmed with emotion that the energy she had been unable to release for so long finally broke free, leaving the entire room green. Half an hour later, when everyone was sitting in the room and explaining the whole situation to the girl, she was so angry with them, even to the point of hating them. Hayes couldn't hold back her tears, because even if it was all done for her and her opportunities, it wasn't the way a king pretends to be mortally wounded. Jared calmly told her it was just animal blood and that his wonderful plan had worked, even though it had made her hysterical. But she had been able to reach a new level. She didn't like being a healer at all if he was going to play with her like that. She was also very angry with Jared's other wards. Even if it was the king's order, how could they scare her like that? Unable to withstand the pressure, she ran out of the room in tears. Aubryn, who was standing behind her, said quietly that he didn't quite mean it. That scene was too cruel, but the project to educate the students was going really well. Meanwhile, Lacus was wandering through the snowy lands of the kingdom. There was an extremely strong blizzard and he was almost blown away by the wind. Suddenly, he noticed a bright light in front of him. He didn't expect to see anyone else in such a blizzard, so he decided to check it out and walked on. And when he got close enough, he saw a bearded old man who obviously recognized him. Mr. Olson invited him into his home to warm him up and give him tea, and he remarked that the younger man had grown a lot since they had last seen each other, and that it would no longer do to call him a little boy, since Lacus would be turning 40 this year. When they got the fireplace going and piled wood on it, Olson asked how Lacus had ended up in this nightmare forest. Lacus had a mission to accomplish here, and he thought of Mr. Olson very often, so he wanted to start by giving him a gift he had brought with him. From his bag, Lacus pulled out a bottle of red liquid, Ranella's medicine, a necessity for those who stay in the nightmare forest for a long time. Olson had heard a lot about this medicine, as rumors had spread throughout the kingdom and across the mainland. The old man heard what people were saying, how much they praised the medicine, and he wondered how such a stupid king could come up with such a brilliant idea. But Lacus told him that Jared had repented of his past, and now he had changed his mind, which was why the king had sent him here to ask Olsen to return to the kingdom. The man laughed. Jared had once abandoned him so easily, and now he wanted him back just as easily. However, Lacus insisted that the man return because right now they needed experienced veterans like Olsen. Lacus assured him that when he saw how much Kriviri had changed, he would immediately change his mind. Until now, there had not been so many wars on the Nars mainland where crowns had seized land. An incredible number of lives had disappeared and a large number of rulers' heads had been chopped off. Family ties or anything else did not help to escape death. You could get on the horse of death and ride at breakneck speed to the north. Jared was holding a mug of cool beer, which was incredibly tasty in Krivia. And because they were near the sea, all the seafood was very cheap. But Isabel had a different opinion. It was too cold here and nothing grew because of it. This frost bothered her the most. Jared could only hope that this time his pesticides would do some good. However, Hayes was sure that it would work because Jared had made them himself. She also noticed that everything on the land had been cleaned up. Even the roads were better. It was all thanks to Aki. He said he would set an example for others and keep everything clean and tidy, but some people were sure that Jared was the only one who had made the kingdom of Krivia rise from its knees. If there is a cure for Renella, a potion, and full support from the kingdom in case of Renella's illness, things will only go up, so Jared was asked to think about expanding the territory. It would be great to move their Hunter's Guild headquarters here. It was something to think about, but it was good to see that they had found a lot of valuable things in each village. But Jared looked off to the side. A girl exclaimed loudly that the beer here was delicious, just incredible. She held up her mug and asked for another round. She turned to the girl and asked her if she wanted another beer, but she was sitting next to her, chewing quietly. Jared kept his eyes on her. He remembered this character. 
It was the same strange sword warrior named Ella. This is a very famous character in the game Paradise, who constantly helped the main character to solve difficulties. But for money, Ella tried to persuade her friend to take another cup of beer, but she resisted, saying that alcohol blocks the brain and mental abilities. But that's all. This beautiful character had her flaws. For a good amount of money, she was ready to help even the devil himself. Then Jared turned his attention to the girl sitting next to Ella, someone he had seen somewhere else while playing Paradise. Her name was Chloe, and she was quite calm and quiet, and so she was called the Queen of Silence, but it was not clear what she was doing in a place like this. He couldn't believe his eyes that this was the same Chloe who, five years after the Great War, at the age of 38, would play the role of the Queen of the Dark Elves, a mystical character whose story the game developers had hidden for the purpose of the biggest match. Jared didn't remember Ella appearing in the North, and he shouldn't have known about evil at this stage. It was unexpected to meet two such important people in one place at once, and it probably wasn't a coincidence. So he couldn't miss this great opportunity to talk to these people. So Jared quickly got out of his chair, leaving the others to continue talking, and made his way over to the table where the two lovely ladies were sitting. Soon he was behind them, and deciding to start a conversation, he came even closer. But before he could say more than two words, Ella sent him away, saying that she was not interested in babies that way. The plan was a failure. Such a quick end was not expected. Jared collapsed to the ground, and Hayes ran to him in a flash. She put her hand under his head, telling them to be a little more polite to him, because Jared was a high-ranking member of the Curve. Everyone in the room immediately looked at him, realizing that he was none other than King Jared of Crevia, and it was hard to believe that he was sitting in such a place. However, Ella did not like Hayes's response at all. She was just a maid and did not dare to address Ella herself in such a way. She also held a high position, and there were many places like this in the world. But Jared got up from the floor and gently put his arm around Hayes's shoulders, protecting them in front of Ella. He was willing to pay her a lot to accept his request. It was unexpected for their first meeting, but she thought about accepting it and apologized for her rudeness. She just thought he was an annoying guest at the pub. Jared assured her that everything was fine and suggested that they go to a quieter place to discuss the terms of the agreement. In the study, Jared made his request. He was willing to pay 5,000 gold pieces a year and give her his personal house for her to teach his student. The king even said that he would pay the money up front, but a contract would have to be signed. Chloe would have done whatever her mentor told her to do. No matter where they went, people lived the same way. This request was a little strange. Not knowing these people at all, the guy asked Ella to do this. She herself had just recently started teaching Chloe and it was all new to her. The girl asked if he trusted her to sign such a contract. Jared, of course, didn't trust either of them yet, but he had his own plan for all of this. Besides, he trusted who he paid. He knew perfectly well that Ella would not refuse the sum of five billion one, which was the currency of his previous life. However, he also remembered from the game that in the future, she failed to gain recognition among the influential characters because of her character. It was the most tempting offer she'd had in a long time, so she accepted without hesitation. Chloe drank her tea in silence and waited for the child who was worth 5,000 gold pieces to enter the room. Jared was happy because the problem of finding a good teacher for Lena was solved. It was very late, but the boy was still awake. Thanks to Gorius's pendant, Jared didn't feel tired when he wore it. He had forgotten a lot of information, too much for one person. Today, it was hard to even remember Wicked, who is a popular character. Perhaps, given the rapid development of the kingdom, it would be very difficult to record anything about him. In fact, he wanted to leave the notes in Korean so that no one could read them. It was a book that held the knowledge of the whole world behind its cover. The next morning, Lena and Chloe trained together. It was a little difficult for the girl at first, but she remembered the promise she made to the bark, and especially to herself, so she kept going and kept moving forward. It was indeed a hell of a workout. Jared only hoped she wouldn't become an overly pumped up and murderous monster if she kept up the good work. 
Chloe was working just as hard, but she didn't even seem to be tired. Ella replied with satisfaction that the world was too big for Lena to be the only talented child in it. There were many equally or even more talented individuals. Whoever had taught Lena before, she thought, was a bad teacher. Ella could have killed anyone in five seconds without hesitation when she looked at Lacus, who looked like a weakling to her, but at least he deserved five seconds. Despite the fact that Lena didn't study with the best, Ella recognized that the girl had a rather high speed. She instantly grasped everything thanks to the magical tools. There were four homing elemental spells that were enclosed inside. They were very well suited for training the ability to use the shield. Jared was asked a lot of questions about how he was able to find such a perfect training for Lena, and he only answered awkwardly that it was a special way of training on the eastern continent. Due to a certain system, if you use the same training method, the experience growth will decrease over time, but if you use four different elements, the system will recognize them separately. This bug bypassed the anti-macro training system. However, Jared was very impressed that Ella had somehow recognized Lena's condition without even using the spiritual eye. But he was sure that there was nothing to worry about. Given the pace at which Lena was progressing, the training was very effective. In the meantime, Mr. Auburn returned to the kingdom, and the other servants and knights were very happy to see him back. The old man came back only to check on the progress of the crops. And everything was as usual. After they had killed all the pests in the fields, everything was going like clockwork. And because these pests were migrating to the territory of the kingdom of Renella, the neighbors were eager to learn the secret of cultivation. These people were very grateful to Mr. Obrin and their lord for the fact that they could work in these beautiful fields every day. Obrin felt responsible for all of them and also thanked them for their hard work. And when he sincerely thanked each farmer, they were very touched. It was very nice to hear. The united voices of all the farmers saw their leader as the king of the kingdom. So Jared was able to complete the task of sincere recognition. And he also received 200 points of loyalty. And during this period, the Golden Age came to the territory of the state of Krivia, Thanks to this achievement, all abilities related to production will increase by 100% within a month. There was no end to the joy of the farmer's clan, who continued to praise their lord, shouting his name and clapping their hands. The other processes in the kingdom were also in full swing. Everything was in full swing and everyone had their own job, which they were very good at. And Jared could not get enough of what was happening in Krivia under his rule, Realizing that it was his merit, the smile just did not fall off the guy's face. And of course, there were many envious people who could not rest because of such a good reputation of Krivia. But recently, there was little known about the welfare of this kingdom. Despite the fact that both lived in the northern region, they were definitely ready to die for such landscapes and destroy everyone who lived there. The man had come from a neighboring kingdom and bowed low when he saw the lord who came to meet him. Akron was from Majorca, and he had come to the kingdom of Krivia to deliver a personal message to the king. Jared smilingly welcomed him into the palace and shook hands with the man, after which they began to discuss the relationship between their kingdoms. Jared asked if the previous amount satisfied the lord of Majorca. Akron hastily replied that the lord was very pleased, because given the poor relations between Majorca and Coivia, Jared's decision was commendable. The boy didn't say anything, but his mind was in chaos. Akron made it sound like Majorca was superior to Coivia just because they were being honored. Lachis stood next to the king with a very dissatisfied and stern face, not letting a single word pass from either of their mouths. After all the points discussed, Jared asked if he could see the message that Akron had brought to the kingdom. The man immediately took the envelope in his hands and handed it to the king, telling him that the letter was written by the Lord himself. When it was in Jared's hands, the boy opened the envelope and began to read. Lord Mayakri wrote that, after looking at their relationship, he realized how badly he had treated the king and his territory, but he still dreamed of peace and harmony between their vast and wonderful lands. 
So the man suggested that they try to build further mutually beneficial relations between the kingdoms. A great friendship began with small steps. In his mind, Jared was very angry with Horgus, because he was basically holding him to nothing by suggesting such an idea. The boy dreamed of peace between all countries more than all of them together, so he was outraged by such words. Still, Jared said that very soon he would send the best crystals from his entire kingdom to confirm the beginning of a strong friendship between the countries. Akron looked at him with satisfaction. Having fulfilled his lord's main order, Horgus must have been very happy with this outcome. Jared, despite his irritation, smiled gently saying that she would always be welcome in Krivia. And after the representatives of the neighboring kingdom of Majorca went home, Jared went outside with his bow and arrows to hunt prey. It was already evening and the sun was setting. His target was a deer that appeared out of the woods, and an arrow immediately hit the animal. One of the warriors standing next to Jared shouted loudly to the others that the king was down. The guy was also an excellent archer. He was a multifaceted person who was constantly developing. At one point, Lacus approached his king and quietly asked why he was so submissive to these bastards from Majorca, when the agreement was that they should have been distancing themselves from their influence. But now he had to think about his life. Sooner or later, someone would be the first to take up the sword in the battle arena. So for now, it would be better to wait and put on a smile. Now Lacus understood Jared's plan. He thought that the enemy would let their guard down and become more secure if they hid their true intentions for the neighboring kingdom at the beginning. As they both stood a little distance away from the others, Jared emphasized that the last blow is always the best, as long as you don't put so much effort into the destruction and preparation for the process itself. So he quickly turned and suggested that everyone celebrate their province's rapid development, a huge banquet could be thrown. Perhaps if Lacus learned and fully realized the relationship between Crivia and the Kingdom of Majorca, he would not be so worried about the coming wars here. He played along with Jared and smilingly said that he would not have any worries, especially since the Golden Age had come to their country. It was too safe for Jared and the rest of Crivia to say that, but it played right into the hands of their enemies. For now, they could enjoy the moment but hell was about to break loose for the entire kingdom that had just risen from its knees. The next glass they would drink from would be filled with their own blood, and they would just have to wait for the right moment. Thanks to the spiritual eye, Jared could see right through the guy, and he knew the thoughts that were going through his mind. Jared was prepared for spies to roam their territory, and this guy was well into his character, having a good background in intelligence. As soon as the spy gave all the evidence to his lord, they would immediately go to Crivia with the army. Jared was already waiting for this moment, when they would come to their territory and then realize who they had contacted. After a few glasses of alcohol, Jared felt sick and went to a tree, leaning on it with his hands. Lachis again blamed himself for the king's condition, because he could have taken better care of him. The banquet was over. Everyone returned home and the whole month, which had been full of expectations, passed quite quietly. And it happened today. The enemies took up arms and marched with the whole army to Crivia to destroy their rivals. They were all full of enthusiasm, and the desire to take the lives of the people of Crivi Rig drove them crazy and gave them even more thirst and confidence in their own abilities. Lena was training with Chloe as usual, and she stopped for a moment to rest and noticed that the whole castle was very suspiciously quiet today. The girl asked Chloe if she had seen where everyone had gone, but she didn't know and didn't really care. Suddenly her mentor appeared behind Lena's back, and Ella said a little angrily that she had not allowed her to open her mouth during the training. These words were followed by a punishment. Ella ordered the girl to run twenty laps around the training ground, so Lena quickly ran to fulfill the task. Ella already knew about Jared's intentions, but she didn't understand why he hadn't told her about his desire to start a war before. He wasn't thinking at all when he didn't tell her. She couldn't just sit still if something like that happened, even though Jared might have been against her hand in the war. And suddenly, and unexpectedly, something flew at the warrior who was supposed to be keeping a close eye on the territory of the kingdom. It happened by surprise, and because of their unpreparedness, 
the soldiers of Crivia decided to fall back to save their lives and inform others. The watchtower of the enemy of Majorca was destroyed, and it was necessary to redeploy the guardsmen and possibly even a special unit as soon as possible. However, their lord objected to these ideas. It was not worth wasting so much time and manpower on such trifles. He already thought that Jared had only one battalion, so he was very happy. Although if he had known earlier that it would be so easy, he would have captured his kingdom much faster. The other soldiers found a very good supply of alcohol, which hundreds of soldiers kept in their storerooms. This news cheered the man up even more, because Jared seemed more and more worthless with every step they took forward. The soldiers of Mahorka raised their swords, adding to the morale of the army. Right now, they were about to take back what was supposed to be theirs by right. The people who lived nearby came out of their homes, hearing the soldiers shouting so loudly. Yesterday, everything was fine, but today they were under threat, but everyone was worried about the Lord. Jared was informed that the enemy troops had already broken through the fourth line of defense. Given their speed, the enemy would soon reach their location. Jared had planned everything a long time ago, but he didn't think they would be able to advance into their territory so quickly, so he had to speed up. The king turned to Lachis. He was his right-hand man and Jared could rely on him in any situation. It was crucial to hold this place now, because if it was captured, there would be nowhere to retreat. Lachis set about fulfilling the order and at the same time an excited haze ran up to Jared. She didn't know why he hadn't taken her to this war and she begged him not to leave her out of it. She tried to persuade Jared that she had healing powers and that would be very useful to many on the battlefield but the king was adamantly against it. The arena that their kingdom was now serving was too dangerous a place where one mistake could cost one's life. Hayes' ability was incredibly rare, and it could be indispensable during a brutal war. But despite this factor, he couldn't take her to a place where he could lose her. Hayes was almost in tears. She wanted to be useful to the kingdom, to Jared, and to do everything she could to help, but no one could let someone they cared about go to certain death, and he didn't want to lose her, especially since they had been together all their lives since childhood, as soon as little Hayes entered the kingdom's palace. He had always been there for her, and she really meant a lot to him, so he had a plan to keep the ones he loved safe. Jared had been preparing for this day in advance, and it had taken him a long time to think through all the details. As he held her hand, a memory flashed through Hayes' mind of when she had first arrived at the king's castle, and Jared had held her hand in the same way, helping her to stand up, and she had looked into his eyes with a kind of trust, and she needed to do the same here, just trust. And as she continued to hold his hand and keep looking at him, Isabel appeared behind her, and she abruptly grabbed Hayes by her clothes and pulled her back to the rear so that she could treat those who were injured on the battlefield in peace. Isabel promised that she would make sure that Hayes was in her place and they parted ways. Now everything was settled, everyone was in place, everything was ready. So it was time to go to war and make a living hell for the enemy. They had advantages. The soldiers had found a very good position for themselves, but there were only 300 men in the army which was very small compared to the enemy's manpower. There were many talented soldiers in this battalion, but it was still not enough to defeat the enemy. Lachis stood at the head of the entire army and directed further actions according to the king's orders, but now he was too thoughtful, it all confused him. An army that included so few people, 100 of them farmers, that they were not at all suited to fighting, they didn't even have decent weapons or armor. The army was still grateful to those people who responded and decided to help as soon as they heard the announcement of the war. Although Lachis was ashamed to ask ordinary civilians to take on such a task just because there were not enough soldiers, everyone knew that Jared wanted only peace with Mahorka. He even offered them a truce. But despite all the Lord's efforts, the enemy still tried to capture them and take over the territory. Even now, about 1,200 trained soldiers from Majorca with all their equipment and gear were approaching their positions. That is why all the civilians who were afraid did not have to be ashamed of it and could leave the battlefield of the great battle in peace. 
Lachius remembered his past when he was called to leave the kingdom and forget about Crivia. They told him that everything would soon fall apart, that the former king was dead, and that Jared was too foolish to rule the entire kingdom, but Lachis stubbornly insisted that he would stay. This caused indignation, because even after being thrown out of his job for no reason into the cold street, the man still remained loyal to the king. Crivia might not even survive this coming winter, with severe frosts coming that could wipe out the lives of all the inhabitants of the state, but such words could not change his mind. If the kingdom died under the ice of frost, he would die with it. Still he could not be persuaded, so these attempts were abandoned and Lachis was told not to return here. When Lachis returned to the present, he heard the loud shouts of people who refused to budge. No one had the right to speak of Crivia in such a way. This kingdom had always been theirs and would continue to belong to this people. It was thanks to the Lord that Crivia had become the place they deserved, and for the sake of their home, for the sake of the king, people were willing to fight with their bare hands against enemies who would come to their land. The people would never have given up their country to these bastards from Majorca, who could not even be responsible for their own words. It was better to die on the battlefield, defending what was important than to run away and die there. Then Lachis remembered those words again about the cold winter and the inability of Crivia to survive the frost. And how wrong that man was then, he had never been as hot as he was now. The words of ordinary people who were faithfully and steadfastly ready to stand to the last inspired Lachis, so he ordered his soldiers to give armor and weapons to their new fighters. Suddenly, one soldier appeared behind all the barricades, running as fast as he could to tell him that the enemy was approaching and would be here soon. Lachis looked around the area. He could see someone approaching from afar, and the thing they had been preparing for so long was about to begin. And everything turned out to be right. The warriors were indeed extremely close to the borders of Crivia, but something happened that they were not prepared for. It was not an army from Majorca, but Lord Rinella's troops approaching the kingdom. They had serious intentions of destroying Crivia to the ground and leaving no one alive. What he saw surprised Lachis. They did not expect another problem on their territories. Now the two armies of the kingdoms of Ronella and Majorca could be seen on the horizon. The Lord of Ronella, riding on horseback in front of his soldiers, shouted joyfully that he could already see the borders of the neighboring kingdom. The goal was close. A month before, the kingdoms had indeed argued for a long time about wars with each other, but they were pursuing the same goal, peace between the kingdoms and mutual benefit. Meanwhile, Horgus and Lord Ranelli were talking to each other while sitting at the table. The Lord was actually not completely indifferent to the whole situation, but his resentment was not too deep either. Horgus asked him directly if it was true that the ruler of Ranella had recently received a tribute from Crivia. He confirmed this and added that Crivia had sent them a lot of provisions in a fairly large amount in order to maintain friendly relations, and given that they had received enough gold, the financial situation in the kingdom was stable. And this confirmation irritated Horgus more than anything else. This behavior was too cunning. He tried to persuade Rennell to think about it better and think about the future. It was indeed suspicious when Jared suddenly started wagging his tail at them and being so nice after so long of silence. As the percentage of their hunters fell, and this already large number continued to grow, Jared, in turn, continued to follow his plan and wanted to seize the territories of the neighboring kingdoms. Horgus decided that this little guy was just scared because, although their territories were expanding, they were not yet ready for something bigger. And they concluded that this was the reason Jared decided to buy the truce by paying money. Horgus had studied Crivia inside and out, and he learned that they barely had 300 men in the army. Rennell was surprised at the number of soldiers. But this information only confirmed their theory that Jared was going to buy peace between them all by paying them. So they decided that if Curia offered them a round sum, they would be satisfied and not attack, or at least Jared would think so. He sent Akron, a scouting mage, because the kingdoms had decided to declare their kingdoms allies. Rennell was even more shocked. He stood up from his chair, almost knocking over his cup on the table. 
But this action was planned, so right now they are starting to prepare for war with Krivia. A month should be enough time to prepare, and then they will attack them unexpectedly. It was just a brilliant idea. They decided to create a united front so they could crush Jared and his men more easily. After these negotiations, Ronell and Horgus formed an alliance and shook hands. At first glance, it might seem like a united force of more than 3,000 soldiers, but they had nothing in common. However, these two had absolutely nothing in common except for one enemy, which they decided to deal with first, and next they would open the battlefield between their kingdoms. Rennell suspected that Jared would be furious when he found out about their joint offensive, at which point it would be too late to retreat and come up with something new. All Rennell could say was that Crivia's barbaric decisions and actions would shorten his life by many years. Even diligent attempts to stop him would be futile, and it would be very difficult, perhaps unrealistic, to resist such a force. And while they were talking for so long, Horgus's army had already surrounded the whole of Crivia. It was very foolish of Jared to concentrate all the manpower on the front of the state and leave the bypass routes unattended. Ronell shouted loudly that ignorance is a huge sin, so Jared could say goodbye to his lands right now, because very soon they would pass into their blood-stained hands. Ronell also added that if the kingdom decided to beg him to have mercy on the people, he would still take pity on them and not be too cruel. The boy who stood in front of all the soldiers reached for his helmet and slowly took it off his head. And it wasn't Jared all along, but a guy who was wearing similar clothes and had a similar build to him. The spy who was watching the king nearby saw this picture and realized that it was all a trap, and they had no idea where the real Jared was. He ran back as fast as he could before anyone else noticed him. He had to tell the Lord as soon as possible before it was too late. But before the spy could take a step into his own territory, he was suddenly intercepted by Crivia's men, not allowing him to report his plan. But the soldier next to him said that if a person like him, who is responsible for public order and health care, is so shocked that there was indeed a spy, then what should they ordinary soldiers do? But then the guy said that this spy was the man who allowed Ranella's army to invade their lands. This guess made him realize that Crivia had discovered his identity even earlier. Then the knight realized that all the information he had previously received from them was an absolute lie. He was so angry that the spy could only redeem this guilt with his death. A few days before, Jared and Lacus had talked again about a possible offensive and the kingdom's actions after the war began. And here Jared was sure that the two armies would choose the main road as the main path where the front between the kingdoms would later unfold. But Lacus told us about his version. He thought that the armies of Ronella and Mallorca had two possible options for the offensive. It is very easy to ambush and attack by surprise near the main road, and Horgus also realized that there was a very high probability of losing his soldiers while Crivia was occupying the hill. Jared agreed with Lacus's thoughts on this. Anyone would notice their geographical advantage. Rennell then asked Horgus what option they had left to take action, and the Major Can leader said that after careful research, he had found a bypass route to the kingdom. Jared suspected that if their spy was good at what he did, they would find out about the bypass road, and since the guy was pretending to be a lumberjack, he probably already knew the road to the smallest detail. So Jared decided to lay one of his traps on this particular path. He was holding a landmine in his hand. It was a magical device that caused a magical overload of magic reception. And because of this, a powerful explosion occurred, comparable to the power of fourth-class mages. This measure was his personal creation. Lachis had never seen anything like it before, so he was curious to test the device's capabilities and asked the king for permission. Then Jared asked him to stand behind him to show him how it worked, and the man was very surprised because he didn't remember since when he needed to be protected like that. Then the man pulled the string that was attached to the mine, which was supposed to transmit a magic signal that would set off the mine. The mine they had placed on the stump lit up when this impulse reached it. And a short moment later, a very powerful explosion occurred, blowing everything around it apart and throwing out a large amount of magical energy. 
Jared instantly created a protective barrier that protected him and Lacus from the debris flying in their direction. Lacus was really shocked. This power was really very powerful, and it was exactly what could level them against a large number of soldiers in the enemy army. The explosion left a large hole in the place where the mine was located. This weapon was unique. Therefore, with the help of this spy, who would deliver information about the secret path, Jared would be able to destroy the enemy with one explosion, so their land would not turn into a battlefield because the forest would become a grave for the attackers. This witty plan worked and the enemy army reached the territory of Kriviri on this road, which would be their last. This road was a one-way ticket for the enemy soldiers of Maorca, and no one would get out alive. Horgus, who rode his horse ahead of the others, began to give orders to his men as soon as they reached the road. He shouted loudly that his army should dismember all those who would resist their authority and destroy everything that would stand in their way. And those people who decide to surrender to the army, they should be chained. With the beginning of this great war, the era of their wealth, glory, and rule will begin. The soldiers raised their weapons, shouting loudly. Horgus was in a great anticipation of what was about to happen. He had already seen himself ruling over conquered lands. But something disturbed Lord Majorca and he looked around, where he saw Jared. The boy was ready to pull all the strings in his hand to put an end to them. Horgus was very wrong to shout at his soldiers to raise their weapons, for they were better off raising their shields and trying to survive. Sitting in the bushes, Jared pulled the ropes that sent the signal to the mines, which he had placed one next to the other underground to maximize the effect so right now the enemy army could enjoy his traps. They were placed very carefully and would explode in a moment under the feet of the soldiers from Majorca. Horgus tried to stop the horses from going so fast, but he realized too late. They were already standing on dozens of mines that were about to explode. The mines beneath them were already beginning to shake the ground, and there was nowhere to go. Akron, the magician, called out to Isaac and Odium to work together to create shields and to begin working defensive magic immediately. Half of their army was already burning brightly from the mines that had exploded under their feet, screaming loudly as they were burned alive. The three wizards quickly stood in the middle of the road and created a powerful barrier to protect those who were still able to escape. And then Rennell heard a loud explosion from the side of the bypass road which startled him. Now they were the only ones who had significantly less advantages, not Krivia, who remained on the defensive with an army of 300 men. However, even without Majorca's support, Rennell had 1,800 soldiers, so he did not think to stop. The man ordered to reduce to dust all those who would come across on the way, anyone who would not submit to their rule. Corasus raised her shields and weapons, preparing to launch a defense and attack. Akron looked around after he took off his shield and asked Horgus if he was all right. Nothing happened to the Lord and he ordered a report on the situation. And the news was completely disappointing. Everyone was dead, except for the 500 soldiers who were walking behind them and didn't have time to get here at the time of the explosion. Horgus looked at the flag of his kingdom, which was burning miserably on the ground. And the Lord asked Akron, a little confused, what had happened to the other two mages. He replied that Isaac and Odium were also dead. It was a catastrophic situation in a difficult war. They had lost most of their army. All the soldiers with whom he was going to fight Jared were dead. Horgus would never have thought that someone like Jared could possess such a terrible and powerful weapon that could kill so many people in one blow. Now the Lord could only rely on Akron. So he told him that starting from this second, the maid should not move too far away from him. The Lord had already begun to think of a new plan to avoid an even worse situation. But another disaster came to him unnoticed when Jared rushed at Aaron, who was standing behind his king. He only had time to look back and shout his name when Aaron was already in the clutches of an enemy who was strangling his neck. Jared lifted him into the air, still squeezing his neck and Akron realized that this appearance of the king of Krivia was just a staging to mislead them. But now it didn't matter if he realized anything or not. It was too late for him to know. 
Jared soared into the sky, never letting go of Akron's neck and only went higher and higher. And this height was enough, so Jared let go of Akron, he started to fly down. The king of Krivia gave him a choice when he used ice magic against Akron. The man could have activated flight to avoid dying falling from such a high altitude, or he could have used a shield to protect himself from the ice storm Jared had sent. Having made either choice, he is still at a disadvantage because he will die from the fall, just as he would from a high-level spell. And yet, Akron decided to create a barrier around him to protect him from the spell. Jared seemed to have gone mad, coming up with such a plan and being so cruel. Usually, in duels between magicians, they keep a certain distance from each other, and after each has cast one spell, the magicians discover the level of power of their opponent. After a long mutual study, the mages bombard each other with chains of powerful attacks, and this is mostly how all the duels between them went. But Jared had no common sense in this situation, and he was driven by a strong and indomitable desire to defeat the enemy who was preventing him from building a life in peace. The guy simply ignored the common sense vision of the fight and decided to get rid of his opponent in a bloodthirsty way, not giving him the right to live. After Jared grabbed him with both hands, they flew down together. Akron did not realize where this situation would go, so they could both crash. But it was actually part of Jared's plan. He had created another magic circle while he held his enemy tightly in his arms. It was only then that Akron realized his intentions, although it was not clear whether it would have helped him in any way, because with every second the meters to the ground were becoming fewer and fewer. After a general overview of all classes of mages, the fourth class is definitely not the last among them. Even Horgus, who had filled the ranks of Majorca with criminals, was not strong enough for mages of this level. The Lord of Majorca spent a quarter of his fortune to hire third-class mages to do his work in his territories. But nevertheless, Jared had two reasons why he had screamed in horror when he saw his body in the mirror for the first time some time ago. In the past, his strength had been enough to conquer the transformations of the Lich de Luca, who was famous for his power more than once. And in comparison, a fat sack like Jared could only use fourth grade magic once at most. His skills were balanced to the max, making him a perfect match for a mage of his level who was proficient in fourth class spells. Although Akron's fighting skills were lacking, he was on par with Jared in magic. And this man was not as easy as he seemed, and to defeat him you had to try very hard and give it your all. Jared used the shield again, which would protect him from Akron's attack. If you keep a good distance, it would really work. But this barrier had its drawbacks. It was very easy to break in close combat. So Akron punched Jared's magic shield with all his might, and it shattered into pieces in an instant. Now the mage knew who he was dealing with. Because Jared had already used his own spells many times, he could study his magic perfectly. The next moment, Jared used teleportation magic, creating a portal of different dimensions. He decided to use the fact that he couldn't use the magic of flight to prevent Akron's attack from coming at him. So he decided to use just such a trick and go through the portal while Akron would fall to the ground and that would lead to his death. The magician was actually amazed by this. He knew that such a spell was part of fourth-class magic, but he would not have thought that the Lord of Curvature would use it in this fight. But over time, Akron was able to recognize his tricks, which he was actively using. Having thought it through, the man was in a favorable position, as he thought, because thanks to Jared's last attack, the person who would go through the portal would be Akron. The boy quickly reached out to his enemy with his hand, trying to grab him, but the speed of the flight did not allow it. Now it was up to Jared to stop the attacks. He had to choose how to act. Either he would stop the fire vortex he would be caught in in a few seconds, or he would fall to the ground and break. If the flames of Akron attacked Jared, he would die immediately. The energy of this magic was too powerful to withstand. Regardless of Jared's choice, he was bound to meet the same end, death. Akron was about to fall through the dimensional portal, and Jared was approaching the fire trap he had created. The magician of Mallorca was very pleased with himself, because even if the boy had survived, 
he would no longer be able to use the portal to get to another place. And even if he somehow managed to do so, Akron had a plan for that too. He would simply stop him at the entrance and destroy him completely. But this overconfidence played a cruel joke on him, and Akron eventually fell, not into the portal, but onto the sharp spears that were stuck in the tree. Jared landed safely, using his own magic Akron missed, even though he said he had studied the opponent's magic. He went down to him to tell him that Akron's face showed that he was very embarrassed and confused. Without his magic, he was just a bumbling man, Jared shook his head, looking away. Jared had managed to cushion his fall, thanks to Akron's last attack, and he shouldn't have attacked his opponent while he was on top. But the ice storm that the guy used against his opponent, on the contrary, accelerated Akron's fall. He had deliberately thrown himself under the magician's attack, making him the first to fall into the portal that served as a trap. He had seen him. He had emerged victorious from that duel, and he had seen all his weaknesses, which he had managed to strike. People say that if something looks too good to be true, it probably is. If something looked too perfect and appealing, it probably wasn't the best opportunity. From the very beginning, Jared had been walking so close to him, and it could have been over, but Akron believed so strongly in his brilliant plans that he completely stopped seeing the trap in it. Jared wanted to take revenge on him, and Akron, who had done so much evil and sowed panic among civilians, would find justice at his hands, not from his victims. Finally, the king was able to complete the next task, for which he received 15 points of wisdom as a reward. Akron was such a miserable creature that he couldn't even touch Jared's robe. The boy crushed the magician's glasses. It was the last thing left of him. But at the front, a fierce struggle continued with both armies fighting to prove their worth. Several of the soldiers from Crivia had already been injured and she was sent to the rear to be saved by Hayes with her healing abilities. Ronell was no longer as confident as he had been at the beginning of the offensive. He had lost an ally for this fight, and the Crivian troops were already closing in on them. The fierce struggle continued. Jared's men had already managed to finish off several dozen of Ronell's soldiers, but they needed more men in the center, so the warriors turned to Lacus. Due to the lack of soldiers, the enemy still managed to break the center and break further into the territory of Crivia. After the breakthrough, Ronella's army was ordered to ignore the soldiers and use ordinary people first. They had already seen their victory and how they would fill all their pockets with gold coins and various valuables, after which they would become rich and not know hardship. With such thoughts, they rushed into battle. The number of wounded was increasing every minute. They knew no pity. Barrett, a veteran whom Lacus was able to persuade to return to the kingdom, had heard the predictions of the kingdoms about the breakthrough of their troops, but he did not think they would be driven out so quickly. Another veteran also came back to help, but he noticed that, without their presence, the army of Crivia was completely helpless. Apparently, this was the reason why the Lord was looking for all the experienced warriors to improve the situation in the country. Lachis was, of course, very happy to see Barrett and the others, but wondered why they had come only now when the war had already begun. Barrett said that they had a good reason for doing so because, before coming here, they had put the warriors of Majorca in their place so that they would not interfere in the future. Now the master of Crivia, the great leader Beret, accompanied by an equally great man, the current king of Crivia, Jared, were on one side of the front, 100 of Barrett's elite soldiers and 900 of Jared's army. All of them will continue to fight side by side against the enemies of their state. Despite all the past events, Barrett was ready to forgive Jared for all his past mistakes, but he would never forget the day he was released. The king praised him and said that all the time the experienced warrior, a veteran, had done his hard work very well. He had served very well and for a long time, but then the king decided to dismiss him. The old man was against this decision. He swore his loyalty to the kingdom, but Jared immediately interrupted him and said that the rules had changed. His father was gone. Everything was different now. And since the previous king, Jared's father, was gone, his soldiers would not be needed by the next king. 
Barrett still did not understand how such powerful soldiers could be dismissed so lightly. But Jared did this to many soldiers. He dismissed almost all of them. And the reason for this was the lack of funds and other resources. Most of the money disappeared because Jared spent it all on his own desires to enjoy himself and live a luxurious life. After that, the parasites took advantage of this situation and, led by Glagas, conquered Krivia without any problems or obstacles. All of Barrett's bodyguards were removed from their positions, fired one by one, and the soldiers who had been receiving high salaries faced a steady decline in their pay, and then they were removed from their positions as well. Olsen and the other veterans did not want to watch this. The state they had built for so long and stood for against all the invaders was simply falling before their eyes because of the new ruler. So they all decided to disperse into the forest and quietly continue their lives among the tall and dense trees. It was hard for Olsen at the beginning. Like for all the other veterans, even though he was used to weapons in his hands and similar conditions, but here he had to survive every day, hunt, and get food. And once again, he took his spear in his hands and went hunting. The spring snow was too heavy today, and the man already thought that he would not hunt anyone here. At this rate, he could stop coming here at all. But suddenly, someone caught his eye. He could not see well because of the heavy snowstorm, so he came closer. And it turned out to be goblins. They were gathering resources and were very surprised to see an old man in front of them. It was actually very strange that the goblins had come so deep into the forest. They usually did not do that. Olsen was already prepared to attack. However, after a few seconds of watching the stranger in shock, the goblins calmly went on with their work. These goblins, they simply ignored him instead of attacking him alone with the whole army. The reason for this behavior was unknown to him. Later he went home and told his friend about this strange situation. Olsen said that the goblins were collecting iron nearby and that this also surprised the man. Apparently, these were the ingredients they had ordered as they had recently sold a lot of weapons to the military. Because the Lord did nothing but give orders to the workers, they worked all day and had little time to rest, and this schedule made them all very tired. It was very hard, but because of that they lived like real blacksmiths and had a good income. The blacksmith was very grateful to the Lord, despite the fact that he did not spare him, literally throwing him with tasks but it was with his help that the man was illuminated by the flame of passion. The blacksmith also told Olsen to keep this information a secret, because this information about the weapons they deliver should not be known to other citizens. But Olsen did not care about this. He was already tired of these stories. Still, with the right decisions by the organizations, the drought problem was completely solved. The problem with the arrival of new population was closed with the improved road network and the attitude towards soldiers. The availability of new positions and the recruitment of new talent were better than in previous years. Soldiers who had left the Krivian army due to dismissal returned to military service, all of whom gave Jared a second chance after he had done such a great job. These men stood shoulder to shoulder with Jared and worked together to defeat the monster that invaded their homeland. They were the best of the best. The army of Ronella and the army of Mahorka were simply no match for such a majestic force, and their blood was spilled on the territory of Krivia as proof of their defeat. Even though the enemy soldiers were outnumbered, they could not defeat the vast experience and skills they had gained over the years. These pathetic creatures could not even look the veterans in the eye. They were ashamed. Ranella's army was ready to kneel down and beg for mercy. Those who stood farther away from the front lines rushed to escape from Krivia's troops. Ranell was furiously riding his horse, retreating from the enemies. Some time ago, he was sure that he would win and become the best. In his eyes, Horgus was a real fool because he could not detect and think of the fact that there would be enemy traps on the bypass routes. They had formed an alliance with each other in vain, so Ronell and those lucky enough to be safe fled as fast as they could. Horgus was the first to leave, but he was very scared when he looked back. He was frightened because he saw a magician chasing them, and in a couple of seconds he would be able to catch up with them. 
But when the man took a closer look, he realized that it was not just a wizard, but Jared himself. Now it was too late. He caught up with them and sneaked up on Horgus, who was looking around as he disappeared from view. When Horgus turned around again, he saw no one else with him, and Jared had just flown up and was behind Lord Majorca. Jared looked thoughtful, and he looked at Horgus, who was looking down at him with fear, telling him to come down to Earth and compete here on equal terms because he had no magic and could not take to the sky. Jared thought about it for a while and decided to do as he said, but in that case, Horgus would go down first. The warriors of Majorca shouted out for everyone else to protect their lord from the enemy's spells. But Jared immediately shouted that they should stand back and not dare to come any closer. After this order, he got down on the ground with them, and all those in front of him stepped back, fearing his actions. Jared knew from the very beginning that there could be no peace. He knew perfectly well about their plan to conquer the territories of Krivia. He knew about their plans for an offensive, but Horgus stubbornly refused to believe it. These people wanted to take everything and everyone from the lands of Krivia, to sweep away everyone who got in their way, regardless of whether they were civilians or soldiers. Now he had to make sure that he corrected them all and they would stop sowing such crimes across the Nars mainland and keeping people in fear. He had to make sure that no one else would suffer at their hands in the future, that there would be no more victims who would end up in such a hell. It is for this reason that Jared will very carefully cleanse all his lands of every remaining Major Can and Ranella soldier. At this point, the already bloody Horgus laughed. The plan Jared had just told him was almost unrealistic. The boy had stepped up to the enemy and he admitted that he had made mistakes, but he was sure of one thing. Even the old Jared, who had been so irresponsible with his royal obligations and the workers he had given a huge amount of work to, was better than this. Horgus exclaimed loudly, about to get up from his knees and strike Jared with his hands for saying such unpleasant things, but he pulled out the knife he had been keeping on his person. After he stabbed it painfully right into Horgus's leg, he screamed again, but this time in extreme pain. But Jared managed to calm him down and bring him to his feet so that he wouldn't be so rebellious. He was writhing in great pain, but he warned him that it would not be over so easily at this stage. If the general of all the knights found out what Jared had done here, he would surely bring his mighty and large army to take revenge on Horgus and his army. Meanwhile, Jared took out of his pocket the small green book he had been poring over for so long. He writhed in great pain, but he warned that it would not be over so easily at this point. If the general of all the knights found out what Jared had done here, he would surely bring his mighty and large army here to avenge Horgus and his army. Meanwhile, Jared took out of his pocket the small green book he had been poring over for so long. Meanwhile, Jared pulled out the small green book he had been poring over for so long. He opened the book and began to flip through its pages, looking for something, and then he opened it to where he needed it, reading the name of the mighty general of all knights, Count Birox, and he added that he would definitely not come here. Horgus, who was still sitting with a knife stuck in his leg, had already forgotten about the pain when Jared heard the name of the Count, and he asked him in shock how he knew his name. Jared calmly replied that it was a book he had spent countless nights reading, and that its pages contained various records of people and events. He also found out that Horgus and this Count Byrox were related. While he was writing all this, Thanks to this book, there was little that could be hidden from him. Then Jared began to proofread some more things and flip through the pages, and suddenly he laughed out loud when he came across another line, the words that Horgus had used to threaten him and say that the general would kill him, and he was very amused. He abruptly closed the book, glaring at his opponent. It was wrong of Lord Majorca to think that a general of a knightly order from the Ethema Empire would come just to save his nephew. Jared was now talking about traveling more than 5,000 kilometers, overcoming the borders of all four kingdoms, and it was simply impossible to cross so many territories. Besides, it's unlikely that Byrox would be very sad about his nephew's death and would want to do something to avenge the situation. For a man like him, who only pursues power, fame, and wealth for Byrox, 
Horgus was just a thorn in his side. Jared asked Horgus another question. Would anyone regret the death of their lord, or would everyone be completely indifferent to all the recent events and his name would be forgotten in the next few days? Moreover, most likely, everyone will only feel relieved that such an executioner, a tyrant, is no longer in this world and people will be able to breathe easy. Horgus's life was so miserable and miserable that there was not a single bright spot that he could have clung to. It was time to end this war, for which Jared was much better prepared than the other kingdoms, despite having fewer soldiers in his army. Jared stood over Horgus and nobly asked him what words he wanted to say in his last moments of life. At least he gave him that opportunity. But at that moment, Horgus lost his mind, pulled a knife from his knee and prepared to attack Jared, screaming at him. But despite his efforts to rush forward and somehow harm the boy, he could not do so because Jared immediately used ice magic and waves of snow knocked the unfortunate Horgus off his feet. After the snow had melted a little, Horgus stood frozen, looking like an ice sculpture, and now he would not be able to move and cause Jared any trouble. The words he managed to say at the last moment were indeed a very terrible wish, the end of which Jared would hear only in another world. After he touched the frozen body of Horgus, Lord Majorca was snowed under even more and began to crumble to dust in the snow. In the end, the task of the first successful defense was completed. He was well rewarded for it, and the value of his territory increased by 50%, regardless of how good the state of internal affairs was. Now Jared could at least breathe out calmly for a few minutes. With a sigh, the guy fell to the ground and closed his eyes, realizing that it was not over yet and that he had a lot of work to do. The Majorcan warriors, who were standing behind him and silently watching him, tried to be as quiet as possible so that he would not pay attention to them, but suddenly Jared turned to them with a displeased face. All at once they raised their hands in the air and began to shout that they were surrendering, hoping to escape death. And Jared listened to them, and their armor was stripped off, they were put in chains and they finally surrendered, an easy victory. But the king did not become complacent or focus on this victory. Instead, he disguised himself as a resident of Majorca with Lachis and continued to move forward. From the very beginning, he devised his plan in such a way as to achieve his main goal, which he persevered in spite of all troubles and obstacles. He wanted to take control of the kingdoms of Majorca and Ranella so he did not stop at killing the leaders of these kingdoms. And as a result of another struggle, Majorca fell to its knees under his army. The remaining soldiers begged for captivity and surrendered. On this day, the leader of Majorca changed. Such great changes happened very quickly. Now, Crivia was a free and independent state, of course. Those who wanted to capture it did not disappear, but they all realized that they could face a terrible ending in this case. That evening, Lachis approached his lord and asked what he was going to do in the future. Ranella no longer had any fortresses left, and the entire army was smashed to pieces by the army of Crivia. It is unlikely that they will have the strength to resist them in the future after such events. Jared turned to him, and Lachis was right, because the battle between the kingdoms always came down to the number of soldiers in the army, and now Ranella was losing to Curia in that regard. So Jared was determined that their next move would be to invade Ranella's territories, and they had to do it as soon as possible, so that they wouldn't have time to come up with any plans and the fight wouldn't drag on for too long. However, after he had already made this decision, everything went wrong. The plan was shattered by the unexpected appearance of one man. General Capre, who served in Messiria, knew that the genius of this war, Horgus, had been killed by Jared, and his lands were under the rule of King Crivia. And when they captured the lands of Mahorka, they thus lost the reason to wage war and achieved very good results. However, Jared thought in a completely different way than this man. He was sure that it was not only Horgus who was responsible for the decision to go to war. He started to bleed, but he began to say something incomprehensible to Lord Capra, though he was confused by his excitement. But the latter did not even listen to him, understanding what Jared wanted. Capra said that in this case, 
Lord Rennell should pay a considerable fee, because as a peace-loving pacifist, he would not want to see his neighbor's territory involved in a bloody war. Jared did not express this opinion, but he suggested that Lord Capre of Miseria had long been planning to seize Ranella's territories. And all these stories about peacefulness and pacifism were just a cheap show, but Ranella agreed to such terms of compensation and was very grateful for such an outcome, at least. But Jared was not at all satisfied with this decision, and he reacted quite aggressively and was already preparing to attack both lords. Without waiting another minute, Jared immediately cast the spell Ice Storm and wiped the two idiots out of his sight. And he wasn't going to stop there. Jared used fire magic to release a fiery arrow from his hands. And then he decided to end the fight completely and shouted the spell Lightning Bolt, releasing it towards the enemies. But Lord Capre calmly walked out of the cloud of dust and chaos that rose behind him, not even a scratch on him. Instead, Capre ran past Jared and struck him with his sword, which was now bleeding from the impact. Jared suspected that this magic might not hurt Capre. He was a B-rank tank and unlikely to be affected by something like these spells. Capre was also the leader of the Central Territories, with a large army that outnumbered Crivias by two to one, so Lord Misery asked Jared again if he agreed to all the conditions. The boy had no choice but to agree to all the conditions, because it would be very foolish to start a fight with him and his state. It would be sure death under the feet of the enemies. So Jared just bowed his head and tried to accept the fact that he could not do anything about it now. Besides, if he wanted to move from the north to the central parts of the continent, he would have to pass through Miseria. That would happen, but later Jared promised himself that one day he would kill Capra with his own hands and put his state to rest. Everything was calm in Crivia for the moment. It was a quiet night, and Lena was sleeping peacefully in her bed, very tired after the hard training she had been doing under Ella's guidance. Ella was sitting outside in her bathrobe, sipping wine. Night was her favorite time of day, so she was just enjoying herself. After taking another sip of the sweet wine, she looked to the side, quietly asking her friend what she was doing out so late. Chloe calmly stepped outside to get some fresh air, her voice monotone and quiet as always, barely a trace of emotion in it. The younger girl sat down on the chair next to her, and Ella noticed that Chloe had been very thoughtful all day, and not the first day either. She asked what was wrong and if it was the war that was affecting her so badly. The girl's face was lit only by the dim flame from the candle on the table next to the bottle of wine. Chloe was not really worried about anything. She didn't even care about the war. But she still couldn't answer the question about Jared not calling Ella to help in the great battle. Cola cared much less about that question, but she assumed that the king wanted the guests to simply defend his home, not to take part in a dangerous war. Cola was a powerful warrior, but she had come here only to train Lena. Chloe didn't understand why a warrior like Ella wasn't even asked to take part in the fight. But the girl calmly replied that Jared could tell that he had been preparing for this for a long time, and Ella picked up her glass again and took a sip. Chloe continued to speak hesitantly, not knowing whether to talk about it at all, but she had noticed it since their first meeting. It seemed to her that Jared could see into the future and thus think his moves ahead. During the holidays, she had quite a few opportunities to talk to him, and once he asked if she was okay after training. As he continued to talk, Jared knew that most Grey Elves were much more comfortable and safe in their own territories. He wondered why Chloe had stayed in this world instead of living among her own. Jared also knew about the horrible end her father had met when he saw the Black Years, when they tore his flesh to pieces and feasted on his body. This alarmed Ella a little, because only the Grey Elves knew about such details, and she was the only one who did, because she was close to Chloe, and she told her about the situation. Jared also gave her one piece of advice. He said that she should not only look for revenge in this dirty world, you should also look at the bigger picture and soberly assess the situation and your options. Jared was really a very interesting person. They had no idea how he could know about all the nuances of their lives. Ella stood up from her chair and took the bottle of alcohol in her hands. 
She suggested that Chloe follow Jared if she was so interested in this behavior. There was time for that, because they would not leave the territory of Krivia soon. She added that Chloe should let her know if she started to feel anything in the near future, and she laughed and moved on. Chloe sighed and turned to her. This was a common behavior for Ella, and even though she was her teacher, she sometimes acted like a small child. Ella stopped for a moment, not turning to face the girl, and began to make excuses, saying that she had just wanted to ask Jared if he wanted a glass of wine as well. Chloe sighed again. There was nothing she could do about Ella. Freedom was a wonderful feeling for Ella, but it was the reason why there were so many double rumors about her. In Mallorca, meanwhile, things were not so happy and peaceful. It was a dark night and the moonlight did not illuminate the alleyway. As soon as they learned of Horgus's defeat, they immediately began to panic and become angry, and one of their leaders was so furious that he broke everything in sight. Horgus took with him almost all the soldiers of the state, but they were all defeated, and so easily, and after all this he managed to die at the hands of the same King Jared. It was hard for him to believe that so much money had been spent on Horgus when he had assured him that everything would work out and they would win this fight. The man ordered them to collect all the money they had left and all the valuables that were in the room, and he gave the order to leave Majorca immediately. It was a good thing that at least their trade routes were protected, so they only had to prepare for the future when they arrived in Ranella's territory. Prua stepped out into the street when his guard told him to stop and look to his left in a slightly louder voice. The man exhaled, but Jared was faster and more cunning than he had ever imagined. Jared grinned as he stood in front of his army and next to Lachis, the boy greeted his newest competitor. The king asked where he was going in such a hurry. Since his guests had just arrived and he was already running away, Jared used his spiritual eye to analyze Prua's vitals. He grumbled that he was moving because of a new job, and he didn't want to waste time with someone like Jared and wanted to get out of the place and his company as soon as possible. Prue had no time for jokes or any kind of tricks. But Jared was not going to joke. He was also a busy man, and right now he was busy killing Prua and his team. The man realized that it would not be so easy to leave these lands with the intruders, so he decided to do something different. He activated an artifact he always carried around his neck, a small watch. Prue created a dome thanks to this watch, which distorted time and Jared's magic stopped before it could reach his people. Lycus was very surprised to see that he could use spells because he was sure that Prua was not a magician, and Jared confirmed this. The magic was not Prua himself, but his artifact, which had an effect that stopped the magic if it came within 20 meters or less. And then there was a problem. The artifact could only be affected by Class 5 magic, but Jared still had Class 4, which the watch would easily respond to with a reverse effect. As Jared approached the barrier Prua had created, he realized that he had to do something to strike back, whether he liked it or not. And to do so, Jared needed to be within 20 meters of his opponent. Prue was shocked that Jared, a mage, would be competing with him up close. Mages were supposed to keep their distance in combat, but there was no other way out if Jared wanted to put an end to Prua's drug cartel. He asked him with an ironic smile if he was tired, because the war had just ended and he was already trying to catch him. Prua then offered a deal to stop the circus. The man said he would give him twice as much money as he was giving Horgus, or even three times as much if Jared would just turn a blind eye to their company. He said he didn't want to joke about a war with the new lord of their territory. Lachis was infuriated by Prua's words and intentions, and he gritted his teeth, but stood still, waiting for Jared's order. The king realized that he would be making a mistake if he let them all go now, because in that case, all the northern regions would be under the control of Detrachar. In this case, they all faced a future in which Lena would be known as the impenetrable wall and Prua as the right hand of that tyrant, the advisor to the demon king. So Jared was forced to kill people like Prua to maintain control and security of Majorca. Prua took his sword in his hands, ready to defend himself, and asked one last time if it was possible to arrange peace talks. And when he got a negative answer, Prua rushed to attack. The children's time was already over, so he wanted to put him to bed immediately. 
But Jared was going to do it first and pulled up his sleeve, under which was a powerful artifact in the form of a gold bracelet. This was the bracelet he had taken after DeLuca's disappearance. It had very good qualities, and if its level was lower than the enemy's level, then the strength and wisdom would double. And according to the fifth option of this artifact, all the functions were now available to him and the fight was to become easier. Prue also activated his artifact for some reason and prepared to attack. Jared was ready to use his new nightmare magic on Prue, and the boy approached, creating a sphere of spell in his hands. When he released it, the sphere flew straight at Prue, who was below. He was able to dodge Jared's first attack and kept his eyes on him to avoid being hit. Prua and Jared were now on a level playing field, so he used the Sword of Speed spell and charged again. But one of the soldiers of Krivia suddenly entered the battlefield, and he would not allow his lord to be injured, so he hurried to protect Jared. But Jared himself was against it, because Prua was too dangerous and he did not want a soldier to get so close to him and sacrifice himself. When Prua attacked the soldier and tried to stab him with his sword, he quickly defended himself by putting a shield in front of his face. Jared continued to fly in the air and tried to get close to Prua, who still had his eyes on him. In order to somehow slow down his opponent and confuse him at least for a while, Jared used a flash, and suddenly everything around him turned white. The flash blinded Prua, who tried to cover his eyes with his hands and was stopped by the sudden bright light. Prue was already scratched up and had a busted lip. He was always amazed at Jared's power. He didn't even realize what kind of wizard he was because he could use some pretty unorthodox spells. Even though Jared was a mage, he was very good at hand-to-hand -hand combat and his magic was frighteningly fast. Prue had already begun to suspect that Jared was a fifth-class mage, not a fourth-class mage, because all of the guy's indicators pointed to him being a very powerful mage. It was the same as fighting four dragons for Jared, and he was able to see Prua's abilities to determine who he was. He was able to cut through the shield. By evaluating all the above points, Jared realized that Prua was a master of the Coast Sword. But what was most interesting was that Jared did not feel any energy from the artifacts he was using, but he did notice a black color around the sword and that meant that the sword was created specifically to fight magic. And Jared was right. The Moiselle was the sword used to fight magic, and it was also the 99th sword of failure. Jared landed on the ground and began to slowly take steps forward to Prua. The guy had suspicions about why he was carrying it with him, because Prua was too weak. The king continued to unbalance Prua, saying that he expected much more from such a person and such words hurt him. But Prua reminded him that he had used weapons in the East before, and Prua held on with his last bit of strength to avoid rushing into a mindless battle. The king just shrugged and smiled sweetly, but then added that the artifact in the form of a watch that Prua was carrying around his neck was only an accessory that could somehow save the fight within 20 meters, that is, it was a completely useless thing. This finally pissed Prua off and he shouted at him to shut up. But this was the reaction Jared had expected. As Prua approached him with his sword, he quickly dodged the attack. And a moment later, he released a flame from his hands, which he directed at the enemy. Prua also skillfully sized up this attack and in no way did the spell touch his body. Jared immediately turned around while he was busy with his last attack and ran in the opposite direction from Prua, simultaneously shooting at the walls of the houses that were on the way. In this way, Jared made large rocks fly at Prua and there were countless of them. However, he quickly realized what to do next and started jumping over them to get to his target, thus reducing the possibility of being hit by a rock. Jared ran down the alley just as fast, glancing over at Prue who was close behind. He was about to strike Jared's legs with his sword and he swung hard, but it didn't work. All he managed to do was to catch Jared's robe and tear it, leaving some of it down. He was very nervous about the results, but he could not understand the technique Jared was following, which confused him even more. The king flew high into the sky, then turned to Prua and noticed that his speed was really good. He even had to use a spell. But now it was time for the fatal blow 
So Jared prepared himself and once again created a sphere in his hands that glowed purple. With all his might, he shouted the spell of lightning and the awakening of the night, and a purple light appeared in the midst of the dark realm, shining brighter than the full moon. Jared calmly sat on the roof of the house and told Prue to give up. The boy had too many advantages here, and if they were to fight with swords only, Prue would not be an easy opponent. He was much faster than any ordinary swordsman, and at the same time, every blow Prua struck was quite powerful. But despite all this, Jared was not in his range of attack, for he kept his distance. Prua said with a smile that in the analysis, Jared really deserved to be applauded. But that wasn't enough. The man had improved his speed level by one more, and he was even stronger. And since the king was so good in the tests, Prua suggested that we determine who would win this difficult battle. Jared, who was still sitting calmly on the roof, said with confidence that he knew he would win this fight, and this confidence made Prua's fears even stronger. But he was already so mad that he began to shout loudly, telling him to stop talking such nonsense and take better care of himself. Prua once again improved his abilities and moved to the fourth level. Jared was a little scared when Prua ran straight at him with a sharp sword in front of him. He had such a frantic look of wanting to win that it really looked quite scary. But something unexpected happened. Prua himself ran into his sword which pierced his chest and he could barely breathe. Jared did not expect this outcome, so he walked over to Prua in surprise and looked at his wound. But the next moment he was already breaking into a smile, Jared, with his confidence and strength, could go very far. Deluxe and Prua were very similar and yet very different, both powerful opponents but both making the same mistake. However, Deluxe was getting weaker as time went on. His body was partially closed and quite weak. Prua at that time was at the stage of rapid growth of his power. He was skilled in almost everything, and he had an artifact as an advantage. Jared was already experienced in this kind of fight. He could easily dodge DeLuca's familiar attack pattern, and then he would gradually deteriorate Prua's health with his magic so he could be reduced to zero and easily end this fight. But if Jared let his guard down for just a second and got distracted by something, he could kill him with just one hit, where putting in too much effort was a strategy that suited Prua and Capra very well. And it was problematic for Pru himself, because Jared was able to expose his primary and special ability, recklessness. It was as if he had stepped on an accelerator. With this ability, he could improve his physical abilities very quickly, a feature that was a perfect match for Jared, whose basic skills were not that good. Jared laughed, realizing that everything that had happened was the best that Prue could do. This artifact was the only thing that gave him a chance to win, but he couldn't help and save the situation either. Jared was deliberately taunting Prue, telling him things that got to him, so that he would hurry up and be reckless. And the plan was slowly working. Prue had once admitted that he was stronger than Akron. He continued with this sore subject and reminded him that he had been pushed away by a mage in close combat, while mages were not very good at that. Prue had been dragging his feet for too long. The sun would soon be up before he decided to do something. And yet, this was the last straw for Prue. He took off running at Jared, his head filled with nothing but reckless actions. After such a successful operation, Jared used the magic of space to strike at Prua with his own weapon. In this fight, Prua made a mistake that he would not have made in an ordinary fight, but here he could not think straight and this played a key role in his defeat before the king of Krivia. Jared stood at a distance from him, saying a phrase he had heard many times before, Keep your cool, but never forget your good heart. He asked Prua if he had ever heard that expression. After that, the boy held up a bag of drugs that had killed many people to whom their entire company had sold these illegal substances. Those who did not have any more money started to give it up, but they were very much in pain because they were drawn to buy another dose of drugs. Jared went up to Prue and shoved the bag of drugs directly into his mouth. It was his parting gift before the end of Prue's life, which he would have liked very much. In the end, 
Their whole company was very proud to be in this business and to sell this stuff to people. They said that anyone would be willing to die to feel this high just once more. The powder started to turn to foam as Prua. He started to have a hard time with it. Jared proudly proclaimed that Prua would be beheaded because it was a great sin to try to claw at the future of a nation and a people. All the other people of Prua who remained downstairs, they surrounded the Krivias from all sides and did not allow them to escape the scene. They were ready to deal with these scoundrels. And in a few short minutes, Lacus reported to his lord that all the criminals had been captured, and now they stood with their hands up and surrendered. However, the case was not yet closed, because just because they had defeated Prua and his entire group did not mean that other similar groups would cease to operate. Although this one was the most powerful, it was worth destroying all the criminals to keep them close to Majorca. Jared said confidently that by sunrise, none of these groups would exist anymore. And if anyone opposed the army, Jared gave the order to kill them. Such people could not be left alive. Above all, he ordered their heads to be cut off for any protest. Lachis was tired after all the lives he had taken in the last few days. His face was covered in scratches, but he continued to follow his lord and his orders, wiping the sweat from his brow. Jared always surprised him, because every time the boy exceeded his expectations, which seemed impenetrable, and every decision he made was veiled in mysterious wisdom. However, this time Jared showed a sharp and confident yet spontaneous nature, instead of wisdom and prudence in his actions. The people of the kingdom looked at him with wide-eyed wonder, seeing him as a true leader. The Rising Emperor was the name he was given for his clever, though sometimes risky and crazy, actions that led the army to victory over the enemy every time. Over time, Lacus's loyalty grew, and when his loyalty reached level 200, he would enter the first stage of awakening. When Jared returned to his work, he realized that his office looked more like a realm of complete chaos and disorder, with letters and documents lying everywhere, but he had no time to deal with them. His eyes were already red from fatigue and several sleepless nights, but there were still two things he had to do. The first was to visit all the ancient tombs of Mahorka to gather as much strength as he could, and the second was to find a highly skilled specialist who could extract caladium, an underground resource. Caladium is a very difficult ore to mine, which will be found only after 13 years. It is even stronger than iron. And if they manage to get to it first, they will be able to make a whole breakthrough in weapons and reach a new level. But he had no idea what to do with the job that had been thrown at him. He couldn't have figured it all out in a year on his own. But suddenly Jared remembered something, the moment when he first arrived in Krivi Rai. Hayes had been a great help to him back then, knowing literally everything he needed to know. He was happy when he realized that he would see her again, because it had been a long time since he had seen that sweet face. So today he was going to start looking for special talent to help run Mawarka. So he sat down in a comfortable chair and began to consider all the possible candidates for the role of Mallorca's top talent. The first candidate was Tonio, a man who could handle any political matter, and with him Mahorka would definitely reform, just like Krivia. He would definitely be glad to have such an assistant in his kingdom. But then it turned out that Tonio had been executed while he was still an advisor to the Horgus, so this candidate was no longer suitable. But he didn't dwell on it for long and moved on to the next one. A girl named Katie was the right person for the job because she had a sixth sense for business. It wasn't the best option, but he'd have to take what he could get, so he fed the yes vote. But even here he had a problem. The girl was kicked out by Horgus when she asked him for a bigger budget. The third and final candidate was Marklin. He was the kind of person who was very good at dealing with other people, and he was also quite intelligent. As much as he didn't want to, he had to work with what he had, so he gave his vote to him. But even here he was unlucky. The day Horgus was killed, this man left his post and fled the same night, and he was very afraid that he would be arrested as well. Jared was already completely disillusioned. There was definitely something wrong with this country forgotten by the whole world. He didn't know what to do anymore. There was no talent here. He didn't even have much to choose from, 
and now was the first time his wisdom and sharp mind failed him. He hesitated, not knowing whether it would be better to bring Aubryn and Avila here, and yet he concluded that it would be a mistake, since the two were busy with Crivia. Eventually, the complaints from the head of the Labor Department of the Mayor's office reached a boiling point. Five people left the Labor Department in the region. It had been three months since the head of the Ministry of Trade was paid, and after this incident, five more people left the Ministry of Trade. While Jared was lying there with no idea how to solve the case, Lycus rode up on his horse. The king exhaled, asking what had happened this time and his advisor replied that there was a problem in the village of Devani, which was located in the western territory of Majorca. The leader of this village had recently taken office, but they had already heard that this man was doing nothing and did not want to work at all. The inhabitants of this village met Lachis and approached him, begging him to return the Divani to its normal state. In addition to all this, it was known that this guy drank every day at work and drew very obscene pictures right at the workplace. He seemed to have achieved nothing more than winning a place to run this village. Jared realized that he was going to have to go in and teach this guy some discipline. So Jared arrived at the village of Devani as soon as he could, even though he had a lot to do and was very busy. The people who lived there escorted him to the place where the worker was staying. As soon as they got to the door, Jared kicked in the door and went inside. Jared ordered him to report immediately to the head of the village of Devani, Mr. Julian. Lycus, who came in after them, also shouted for Julian to come out. But as soon as everyone else entered the room, they immediately noticed a wall full of Julian's paintings, which were fiercely beautiful. These paintings caused much admiration among the soldiers standing in the doorway. They were happy to look at every inch of them, but Lachis immediately shouted at them to stop staring at the wall and shut their ugly mouths. Julian was sitting in the corner of the room, holding an empty cup of drink, and he quietly asked what these strangers wanted from him. Lachis entered the room and asked where Julian was with an angry face. But while Lachis was trying to talk to this man, Jared felt a very powerful energy from Julian. He had seen many talents before, but here was something completely different. Each of them was gifted with a specific and unique talent. Jared made sure that each of them could develop their talents to the maximum and as quickly as possible, even if it was late. This guy was completely different, not like any other talent he'd encountered. Julian, meanwhile, took another drink. He was the closest to perfect of all. The guy was as high as level 65, which was very high. He closed his eyes and asked what they wanted here. Jared used the spiritual eye to find out that he was a high-ranking administrative specialist, and thanks to the powerful synergy of his special abilities, Julian's wisdom had increased significantly. Lachis was about to pounce on Julian, but Jared asked him to wait and let him talk to him. Jared did not understand what was going on here because Julian had very powerful skills, but for some reason he was hiding them. Jared demanded to know why he wasn't doing anything at his job, which he had been able to get. He wasn't being paid to do nothing here. Joaline, still sitting calmly in his seat, said that it was because his job was too trivial. He took another sip of alcohol, saying that he shouldn't be dealing with such matters. He was not the kind of person who should be in such a peaceful village. This made Lacus insanely angry and he wanted to deal with this guy as soon as possible, and he was about to pull his sword out of its sheath. However, Jared calmed him down with his calm demeanor, and he sat down on the floor calmly, about to talk to Julian. The king asked him again if he did not agree with his work, and Julian shook his head and confirmed that he did. At the same time, Jared asked Julian to tell him only the truth when answering questions. The boy asked why he was hiding the truth, Maybe he couldn't tell it or just didn't want to. For a moment, Julian stopped drinking and looked at the boy. After that, he repeated once again that he did not want to talk at all and turned around unhappily. Jared then asked him kindly if Julian could prove his words, to which he replied that the king could watch him from the side to make sure he was a good worker. Julian called out loudly to the boy, who was an assistant here, who immediately ran to the office at his boss's request. The manager immediately told him to bring him all the old documents on his desk. He had to check them and even consider the smallest public issues that concerned citizens. 
But while he was waiting, he went to his art gallery to look at his masterpieces. Jolene asked Jared and the others to help him take it all down from the wall. The boy's excuse was that he was always painting and hanging them all up, but over time there were so many that he didn't even have room. They all began to help him at his request, wondering how he was able to hang the painting so high, but Jared noticed that he painted very beautifully. He definitely had a knack for it, but there was no time to look at it for a long time. The matter needed to be resolved as soon as possible. People from the village of Devani began to come to Julian, telling him about all the problems. The woman who brought the little calf here said that it was not growing properly, and she did not know how to solve this problem, but the boy advised her to feed it properly or not to wean it from its mother's milk. The next to come to him were workers from the mills. The girl said that if the wages for milling flour increased, they would process much less grain, so Julian said that the wages would be reduced by 16%. Julian was also visited by beekeepers who told him that if the population in the hives decreases, something bad can happen to the queen bee, but Julian said that they can simply destroy the old hive, and then the bees will fly to the next one on their own, and they decided to do so as soon as they returned to the apiary. Julian turned to Lacus after so many tricks and quietly said that someone was spending the money they had earned that was supposed to go to the harvest, and Lacus started to rebel again. He was ready to catch the rascal and punish him for his insolence, and Jared also noticed that this guy could do a month's worth of work in just half a day. Jualin was just the perfect candidate for Jared. As the workday was coming to an end, the guy said that everyone could leave, they had worked hard today and completed all the work. Jared also let his soldiers go, but he had to stay to talk to Julian. When everyone had left and the two of them were alone in the room, Jared and Julian sat down at the table. The king now realized why he was so confident. He had already studied his course of action. But Julian spoke first. He said that only now he began to realize that until now he had not even tried to manage the village all this work would not take too long if he solved the problems as they came up and put his heart and soul into it. All this time he had been putting off the work for later and then never got around to it. Then Jared praised him, saying that he had managed to do his job perfectly when he was already here. And then the king asked if he had any idea what he was sitting in front of him, and Julian laughed a little, not knowing what to say at first. But Jared immediately continued to talk about it, not even letting him answer the question, and told him that he had some business to attend to. Julian exhaled heavily and asked what the Lord wanted, already imagining in his mind what conditions he might be given. He remembered all the other lords who had come to him with similar requests, but none of them had treated him like a normal person. They all called him too arrogant, although they recognized that he was a very good worker, because he approached his tasks with skill. Even in his lifetime, Horgus considered him to be a man who was delusional. He brought him here to revive the nation, and Julian had all the qualifications for this, because he was taking a test to manage an empire, but such arrogance spoiled him. The ambitions of the leader himself must be much greater than those of the entire nation combined. And even he who served his master felt very small and helpless no matter what he did. And then Jared told him his greatest wish, which struck him deeply. He wanted to become a hero of the continent of Nars. Instead of remaining a nameless lord of a small territory, he wanted to become a world hero. Julian did not believe the king's words at first because it sounded too good for him. But Jared was very serious. He was very purposeful in his pursuit of this great goal in his new life. He wasn't some insignificant person who would lie about it. Words like that drove Julian crazy. He wanted to be useful and influence everything that was happening around him. He wanted to help, not just follow the Lord's little orders. The boy opened another bottle of strong alcohol and poured them both. He had wanted a Lord he could look up to for a very long time. If there is a vassal who looks up to his master and who makes a mistake, it will most likely be the Lord's mistake, not his ward's. So he smilingly told Jared to become an earl by the end of this year or head a conglomerate of territory so that Julian could make sure he got his dream. 
Then the guy handed Jared a drink, saying that he would definitely prove that he could do a lot. When the glass was in Jared's hand, he invited Julian to watch from the sidelines if he wanted to see exactly what the boy was capable of. He laughed, saying that he would never betray the trust of a lord who had earned his complete disgrace from the first. But he would. Julian would have left if he did fail, and Lacus stood outside the door, listening intently to every word of their conversation, even though he should have been home with the others. They made a pact that they would stay together forever, and then they toasted their decision. So he decided to take him on as acting head to manage all the internal affairs of Mallorca. Very soon, they returned to the castle. Mia had already learned a lot during this time. She had special abilities to sense and control mana. Despite her age, the little girl did not study new things intensively. Everything was calm in Krivia. The sun was shining, illuminating the roofs of low buildings, and the noise of people and merchants could be heard trying to sell their goods to passers-by. Every day, Hayes diligently performed her duties, not forgetting to practice healing magic, and she was looking forward to the Lord's return to his mansion. Olsen and Avila entered the spacious room where Hayes was cleaning, and they were actively discussing something that interested her, so she listened. Olsen knew that even if the Lord decided to install a single vassal as acting head to rule the entire territory, they would see it with their own eyes. Obren, who had just entered the room, heard this loud conversation and looked at Avia, who exclaimed that they all needed to leave for Mallorca immediately. Then Aubren asked Hayes if she would like to come with them and say hello to the Lord, whom she had not seen for so long. The girl thought about this suggestion and stood silently in the middle of the room for a while. Still, she decided to go with them because she missed Jared, and soon they all arrived in Mallorca. Jared was busy as usual, writing something as he sat next to Julian. After he had appointed the guy as the acting head, Mallorca had achieved stability in a very short time, and Hayes had been working hard all along. For the past week, they literally lived in the office and never left. On one of their most routine days, Hayes came into the office and brought in a tea made from the Carlacas flour. She had heard that this tea was very useful for weight loss, and Jared smilingly thanked her for it, even though his diet had been completed for a long time. Hayes asked if Jared was tired and she offered to massage his shoulders while Julian watched them silently. Soon he decided to break in and told Jared to take a break from work and get some rest, but Jared assured him that he was fine and could continue working. Julian insisted, however, that Jared take a break because this concentration of work was taking all his energy and would negatively affect his ability to focus. Julian stood up from his chair and bowed, saying that he would go meet with the other vassals and return. Jared's vassals from Krivia came here to Mallorca as soon as they heard the rumors, eager to see for themselves, worried that such a young administrative official could create global problems in the administration of the territory. However, they quickly got past this stage of acceptance of Julian's skills and now everyone praises him. When he and Hayes were alone, he asked her to have tea with him, as there was another cup. The girl shook her head, feeling uncomfortable with the offer because she still thought she had no right to do so, being only a maid. But Jared had already told her a hundred times not to worry about such trifles when they were alone. Eventually she agreed, but she still felt awkward. After a moment, she sat down at the table and picked up her cup, glancing over at Jared, who was savoring his drink. She gently picked up the plate and brought the cup to her lips, taking a sip, at which point her name was called and Jared spoke it. While he was calmly sipping his tea, she had already doused herself as soon as she heard him suggest that she quit her job as a maid. She started to shake, but she tried to show that she was not worried at all, even though she was already sitting there covered in tea from head to toe. Hayes was beginning to worry that she wasn't doing a good job as a maid, but Jared wasn't going to let that slip with his offer. The girl had already begun to make up all sorts of excuses. She remembered that everything had been perfectly clean before she came here and attributed it to the fact that she had no powers and the Lord had to clean everything himself. But Jared denied her claim too, saying that he had cleaned the place because he wanted to practice his cleansing magic. After all, there were times when that kind of magic was very useful 
and in a flash he had erased all the stains Hayes had managed to put on her clothes. He explained that since she was now a healer, Hayes could be promoted to a higher position and that she could quit her job as a maid forever. But she almost burst into tears at that, and Hayes really didn't want any other maid to take care of him. He exhaled calmly as he said her name again. But the next moment, he raised his tone and demanded that she listen to him at least once. After all, she was supposed to be obeying his orders. But she also responded to this one by screaming and saying that if she stopped being a maid, she would no longer be a healer. Suddenly, the pendant they were standing next to, which they were arguing over, floated into the air, and the only word that came out of it was, death. And after it began to glow with a green light that radiated throughout the room, three more words were heard. Plans. Despair. God. Hayes and Jared fell silent, not understanding anything, but they listened to the pendant and heard two more words, mirror and dungeon. And the last thing the pendant said was rebirth, a situation that gave them mixed feelings, but they both definitely forgot about this fight about Hayes's position. Jared knew that this pendant was an ancient artifact that had previously belonged to a criminal. It was a simple artifact that increased a person's existing training up to 25. However, its true purpose was something else, namely the key to all the ancient catacombs under Mashorka. He didn't tell Hayes about it, but he did suggest that she take a walk somewhere. He had wanted to do so for a long time, ever since he set foot in the kingdom. Hayes was very surprised by this spontaneous idea, but decided to go along with him. Meanwhile, something interesting was happening in the small town of the kingdom of Lentus Morales. A young man stood outside Mr. Beltane's door and knocked on it. He was a postman, so he was in a hurry to deliver a letter to the master and had knocked on the door several times. Beltane was a traveler, and as soon as he came out, he began to read the contents of the letter that was handed to him. Several large packages also arrived at his address. The postman asked if he had any idea what might be in them, but Beltane replied that he did not know the person who sent them to him. After hearing the answer and completing his work, the young man went on delivering letters around the town, leaving Belton to think about the mysterious person who had sent him all these things. But soon the traveler began to guess who it could be, and he was right when he read to the point where the personality gave his name, and it was Jared, who questioned his level of magic and asked that he give him his instructions. That was all that was required of him. He glanced at the pile of gold coins Jared had sent him, and in return he had asked that Belton come to him. This was very naive of the young lord, and suddenly there was a flash of light around the boy. Instead of the young traveler, an older man stood in the doorway, a powerful ninth-level mage whose name was actually Belhard. The man thought even the words from Jared sounded very strange. Perhaps it was a clue that he had reached a new level of ability. He recognized that even geniuses sometimes have no idea what they need to do to get to the next level of magic. And Jared was a small man. He wouldn't even dare write such a thing. Belhard shook his head, holding the letter in his hands. But suddenly he suspected something. His pupils narrowed in surprise and he stopped. Belhard drew a parallel and realized that Jared was the same worthless son of the former King Barrett, but he did not want to believe his own theory so the magician tried his best to put it out of his mind. But still, he would have to go at the request of Jared, whom he disliked, to find out the whole situation. After all, a great magician like him must have a certain amount of instinct. In the meantime, Hayes and Jared put on their robes and set off down a dark forest path, the sun only occasionally peeking through the treetops to make the path a little clearer. Hayes was even a little scared to walk here, but... Jared reassured her and said that there were no thieves here, so everything would be fine. The atmosphere seemed very tense and creepy, but it didn't seem like there was anything special, but Jared kept moving forward. During the development of this game, no one had the slightest idea where the catacombs were, and even if you look at the places that were modified by the developers, you still can't find anything. Everyone was ready to give up. But one day, the location of the ancient catacombs was posted on the personal social network of one of the developers. The mirror reflected what was now on his computer monitor. Soon enough, 
they were able to get to the very photo that Jared remembered. It was a large tree with a ravine under it, and it looked pretty ordinary except for the green trees around them. Hayes tried to stay close to Jared, afraid of getting lost and being alone in this eerie place until she saw the strange sand covering the roots of the tree. He calmly but clearly told her to take five steps away from him, and then something really creepy started to happen. The crown of the tree turned into the face of Mahart, who in a low and fierce voice ordered her to get out of here. No one had the right to break into the catacombs of his kingdom. Jared had seen his name before, and even this appearance did not faze him, but he stayed away. Mahart continued to speak in a dead and soulless voice to them, a cursed boy who did not belong in this world. Jared continued to stand still, not taking his eyes off his head. Mahart turned to Jared again, and he looked down at him with bottomless gaze and was silent for a moment. The fact that the two of them had met didn't bode well. Mahart continued to talk about how Jared was cursed. Now that this has happened and the two curses have collided together, this world will cease to exist. The end will come through great chaos, and everyone's death will be terrible. Jared was now even more confused in his thoughts. He definitely did not expect Mahart to know who he really was. He couldn't figure out if Mahart was talking to the Jared inside him or if it was part of the game because he remembered a similar moment when he played Paradise in his past life. Jared wasn't really scared. He was more curious to know what it was all about, so he asked what Mahart was telling him. But the only answer was that they shouldn't talk anymore and interrupt his sleep. The guy remembered the events of the game, and now he was sure that these words of Mahart's were absolutely identical to those he says to every player at this stage of the game. Since he would not have gotten anything out of him anyway, Jared decided to end him here and now, so that he could enter the coveted and mysterious catacombs without any obstacles. Such actions infuriated Mahart, a path that Jared had already taken, and one that meant only one thing, death. Despite his rage, however, for some reason he did not act immediately, but Jared quickly used magic against him. He blew off a part of his head, which was also made of sand. Mahart did not say anything, because he no longer existed here with them. Instead, the boy managed to open a passage to the catacombs and suggested that they move forward. Hayes wasn't entirely sure she wanted to go in, but there was no other way to go since they were right there in front of the entrance. So she and Jared walked forward into the dark tunnel of the catacombs of Majorca. Later, they returned to Lord Majorca's residence. Jared had asked Hayes to sketch all the places she had seen there. But by the time she came to him with her work done, she thought she had missed something even though she had been sure before that she had painted everything she saw there. But Jared reassured her and said that he had no doubt that she had drawn everything perfectly. He admitted that he had no idea that she had such a talent for drawing maps. Hayes looked away a little embarrassed and said that it was from her childhood. She used to watch her father draw maps and try to imitate him, so she was good at it. Jared thought that such abilities were very useful, he praised Hayes and thanked her again for her work. She blushed at the compliment. It was really nice to hear him say that. Suddenly he remembered Mary. She said that she would be arriving in Mallorca very soon to join them all. But then Miss Chef said that she still had some work to finish, and that was why she had to come here in two days. Jared was already very hungry, but he had to keep working. So he turned to Hayes and asked if she could make him some snacks. The girl's eyes lit up. Hearing such a request, she was ready to cook even at midnight. She immediately ran out of the room, saying that she would be back in a second. Hayes's happiness knew no bounds. She felt that she was needed in this place and was not sitting here in vain. Jared laughed. Her persistence sometimes even scared him, although it was a very good character trait in general. He decided to do a little more work before Hayes came. Together with her, they went through about half of the catacombs, they noticed that there were only safe areas with no enemies at all, no light shining through, but it was all so mysterious that they needed to do some preliminary investigation. He was most interested in the ancient tomb of Mahart, which was known as the Mirror Dungeon. Jared knew that if he killed the slave Prua, the advisor to the Demon King, he would still be able to complete the quest of the Mirror Dungeon. 
Prua, who was a drug dealer, became a tycoon in the future. And all this happened because they were the first to find the artifacts from the mirror tomb and steal them all. In general, it was extremely difficult to find a large dungeon and they barely noticed it, which was the fault of the game developers. As a result of the notoriety of this place and what could be found there, many guilds gathered here. There was a chance to earn fame and fortune, so no one wanted to miss it. But thanks to the cooperation during the dungeon raid, they could all be dispersed quite quickly. But despite the possible fame, fortune, and carefree life in the future, everyone was thinking about something else entirely as soon as they got here. It wasn't safe, and at every turn you could run into a mantra, roaming the catacombs of Majorca in search of his next victim. No one was able to even get close to Mahart, the boss, because he destroyed everyone in a matter of seconds, not even giving them the opportunity to say their last words. After such a shocking defeat, many people decided to unite and form a guild alliance to challenge the underground monster once again and have a chance to win the fight. But all of their attempts were in vain. Few of them returned alive and unharmed. And later, they made the mistake a second time and lost the battle. But the fact was that a very small guild had managed to clear the dungeon. It was then that Jared realized that everything he had done in front of Mahart was nothing compared to his mighty power. Now, every mistake he made, even the smallest, could result in death, so acting without thinking and spontaneously was no longer an option. Jared spent several days in such reflections, all the while carefully considering everything that could happen next and what path would be best to take. Hayes had been watching him constantly, and during that time she had noticed that the Lord had been acting very suspiciously lately, and she was alarmed. He was cleaning the entire room by himself and called it practicing his purification magic. He was also hoarding artifacts and weapons that he didn't use, and Aki bought all the weapons with sacred attributes for him. He also painted very often and called it part of his training, and Julian helped him with it since he was good at art and Jared was very good at it. Hayes began to wonder why his behavior had changed so much. It seemed very strange, but she never came to any conclusion but she knew that there must be some good reason for it. Aki also noticed that the Lord had been spending a lot of time painting these days. When Jared saw him here, he asked him to help him find some people who could buy his drawings. Aki took the drawings in his hands and blushed. Looking at them, Jared explained that all the obscenities Julian had drawn had accumulated, and he wanted to find some use for them. The boy smiled sweetly and nervously at the same time, saying that he would try to find a buyer who would buy the paintings for himself. Jared wondered why Julian was always drawing such things, and he replied that he liked it and that he had found some free time at night and decided to paint. Jared was very surprised when he heard that Julian somehow managed to find free time in his busy schedule, and he didn't even have a sage pendant. This guy was impressing him more and more every day, and he had no doubt that he had chosen the right candidate for his team. Jared's office was soon entered by one of the military men, who told him that a crew from Krivia had arrived, and Jared promised that he would be out to see them soon. He stood up from his chair and called to Hayes, who was nearby and still thinking about the Lord's strange behavior. He told her that he would soon need to go to a place and Hayes realized that Jared was talking about the same catacombs they had visited together recently. Hayes very hesitantly decided to ask if she could come along, but she was already expecting a negative answer. Jared didn't want to offend her, but the place they were going to this time would be better with fewer people. Hayes was very worried about him. It was a very dangerous place, and she would not want him to go there risking his life. He also knew very well that this place was very dangerous because... It was a reality, not a game where you can turn back the passage of a certain stage, but there was no other way out and he had to go there. But he was doing it all because he really needed the reward of the mirror dungeon, so this time he was going to take the best fighters he knew. As Jared was walking down to them and thinking about it, he heard Isabel's voice loudly telling him that he was late. It was very rude to be late when he had already promised to come, but she decided not to make a big deal of it. Ella and Chloe were standing next to her, already packed and ready to go to the dungeon. They didn't talk too much, 
They had a clear goal and the team quickly reached the triplets, stopping only before the entrance to the catacombs, looking at the passage. Jared said that he had already walked around the dungeon with Hayes, so all they had to do now was follow the map, and Isabel suggested that they get it over with and go home as soon as possible because she had already missed him. Chloe still wanted to clarify something before they went in, so he stopped and came over to her. Meanwhile, Ella and Isabel stepped into the catacombs. It was very dark, and she didn't know if they had brought a flashlight, but Chloe was interested in something else. Isabel had come with him. She was a powerful sorceress and a great swordsmanship teacher, so she understood why the two of them were here. Chloe had no idea what she was doing here, though. But Jared calmly told her that she was devaluing her skills too much. She was just as important here as everyone else. She didn't say anything to that and gave him the same tired look as he headed into the dungeon. Actually, they didn't all like this place very much. Some of them hated the demon realm and the blood of the Church of Darkness, but that wasn't really important right now. Ella, on the other hand, suspected that Jared had come here for more than just the power of darkness. But all Jared had told her was that he was only interested in the ancient artifact and had no need for any dark powers. Ella calmly walked on, and he could breathe a sigh of relief, because if the answer had been different, they would have most likely ended up in a fight. He started to feel a little nervous, but it was really a relief, because it wouldn't happen in reality. He definitely didn't want to fight with this girl. Ella was quite sensitive to light. She wore dark glasses almost all the time, but he didn't know if it was only after she was injured or if she had it since childhood. Isabel was walking next to Jared, and she noticed a light at the end of their path, which meant they were nearing the exit of the maze. But after the maze, there was only one way to go, Mahart, and to get there, they would have to pass by every cell. And soon they reached the gate, the raid of the dungeon. There was no turning back. They had to start. Once inside, they were greeted by clay soldiers who seemed to be looking at them through their armor and accompanied them with their lifeless gaze all the way. Jared suggested that they use the tactics he had suggested earlier when they had discussed the whole plan. Isabel crouched down next to him and summoned the spirit of a black body. Something black began to appear from her hands and began to move towards the clay soldiers. This entity started pushing the clay soldiers in different directions and kept jumping. This stirred them up and the soldiers began to say something in a language that everyone else could not understand and they got into a fighting stance and were ready to defend themselves. Jared stood in front and behind him was Isabel, and to his surprise, all these soldiers passed him. They were not even going to touch him and ran on. They ran on to Isabel. She got to her feet and was surprised and couldn't do anything. Jared, meanwhile, quickly knocked the bastards down and they fell on top of each other, never reaching the target. In a moment, all of these clay soldiers shattered into dust and gems flew out of them and hit the ground. Isabel exhaled calmly. They were really only aiming at her and she didn't like that because they were just bypassing Jared and coming straight for her. Jared didn't fully understand why they did that. These knights had attacked dark wizards and sorcerers first, so maybe they were just familiar with this black magic and attacked her because of it. So, they had dealt with these gate guards, and now it was time to change, Chloe and Isabel. He had given them the magic stones that were left over from the warriors, and they went to change their clothes to look like the glossy gatekeepers of the dungeon. After a while, they put their helmets on their heads and were ready to move on with a disguise that would help them avoid trouble. Breathing was difficult, and they could see almost nothing through the small holes, and Isabel was already tired. But despite this fatigue, they moved forward and entered the next stage. Ella immediately noticed that there would be at least 2,000 soldiers here. She could not even imagine that there could be such a large army under the ground where she lived. They wondered where Jared got this information, but there was no time for idle chatter. Isabel asked a little unhappily if the thing she was wearing on her head would help them, and Jared assured her that the longer it was on her, the longer she would be fine. Together they started to fight their way through the army of clay warriors, which were so many. Jared knew that there had always been about 2,500 soldiers here, but now there were even more because they had to make up for the guards who were standing at the entrance to the dungeon. 
So now there were 2504. When the Guild Alliance consisted of 500 people, there were 3,000 soldiers here. So we can conclude that this group of people started a very dubious battle. Since there were so few of them, they didn't look too suspicious, and there was another important thing. Thanks to the camouflage effect that Chloe had put on them, by making masks for them, they could get to the right place very quickly, even without a fight. As they passed through the crowd of these strange soldiers, Jared turned to Isabel, who had questioned the need for the thing on her head earlier, and assured her that it was the reason they hadn't had to waste time fighting. Chloe was at least a little pleased that her masks were useful, but she didn't know that it was a necessity, not just a bonus. Even though the helmets made it very difficult to see, as there were only small holes where the eyes were, if they walked around without them, they would be noticed immediately and the defense would begin. Chloe's voice sometimes made it hard to tell what mood she was in, and now you couldn't see her face. Jared told Chloe that the room where they would fight would be located, and he was counting on her, but Isabel was not happy that he was focusing on her so much. Since she had also been a big help in this situation, she threw herself at him with a complaint. Jared could not react to this in any way. Her character could not be changed, so he just had to accept what was. But still, he decided to cheer her up a bit and told her that she was a great girl for using her magic to help, while he spun around funny in place, imitating her. Chloe and Ella stood in silence in shock and watched this ridiculous spectacle of their lord in the mask of some strange warrior running around in place. But his tricks were over when a large clay statue appeared on their horizon, and it seemed more important than these soldiers. All these creatures were somewhat similar to evil spirits, but they were different as Isabel had noticed. This was because they were born of a curse that was not related to dark magic. Even before the monarch Mahart fell into a long sleep, he had cursed his wards to take on a form that would not age at all. Many of them simply stopped fighting and lost their shape because they could not accept their new identity, which is why they became clay soldiers. If all these soldiers were subjects, then Mahart was definitely not the best king in the world. But Jared also warned that there were some clay soldiers who had managed to keep parts of their real bodies, so they should be very careful they were no safer or stronger. The large figure standing next to them turned his head towards them and looked at the team of people carefully. For a moment, they were all quiet in the moment, hoping that this big clay thing would not suspect them of anything. Suddenly, the monster broke free of its chains and rushed at the team. It jumped on them, smashing everything in sight. Jared immediately took Isabel in his arms and ran away. He soared with her above all the dust and flew away from the monster. Chloe and Ella stayed on the ground but managed to jump away from the place where the giant had landed. Isabel started to panic when the big thing attacked them, even though it wasn't supposed to. As he remained in the air, he wondered if the dungeon and its laws might have changed since he returned here, as if it were a reality and not a game. Meanwhile, the monster started jumping at them again. Although it was large, it still behaved and moved quite nimbly. Jared's helmet was already pierced, so he could see better. But there was still a problem with that monster jumping all over them. It could easily get to them no matter where they ran. While Jared was trying to keep Isabel safe, Ella took the situation into her own hands. She told everyone else to run away from that monster immediately so she could strike. Taking her sword in her hand, she stepped closer to it and prepared to attack the big monster. Her sword was very powerful, magical, and as soon as Ella slashed it through the air, a green glow appeared behind it and she struck the monster with it. She managed to hit the target and slow it down, at least for a while, but that was the most she could do. For some reason, it didn't do any damage to the monster. Although the monster was resistant to electricity, nothing happened to it at all. It didn't even move when Ella attacked it. But in a matter of seconds, the clay giant ran straight to Ella to attack her, moving very fast as before. However, this was even more to Ella's liking. She liked strong opponents, so she decided to let him show all his strength and power. She used a special technique called the Mahart's Greeting and put her hand out in front of her, shouting loudly. The monster stopped at the same moment, even though his fist was almost at her side, but everything suddenly stopped. 
This giant stopped raging and fighting. He leaned over to Ella, gazing into her eyes, and she also stood steadfastly in front of him. In a few seconds, he stood upright again, but he was still calm and did not even intend to attack them. And very soon, the giant turned around and walked in a completely different direction from them. Neither Ella nor Jared had any idea what had just happened, but they were still happy because now there would be no battle with this monster. She didn't know if it was magic or what, but the war doll backed away after just one phrase she said. She began to suspect that it was some kind of password, after which the monster calmed down and returned to its place, and that it was some kind of completely different clay doll than all the others. It was impossible to defeat this monster. It was very rare that this giant was endowed with such invincible powers. This can only happen with a probability of 0.1% per person. And if there are four of them, it's 0.4%. So in the end, they should forget about what just happened, but it can't be erased from their memory. It was the first time Chloe had ever heard of such a concentration of power in one creature, and it was a little scary. But Jared explained to her that these monsters were created from a curse, so the side effects could be quite scary indeed. There were two options here. Either these monsters cannot leave the area to which they are attached, or their creator dies and they go to the next world with him. Although there was a third option, they simply have no intelligence. These monsters could not distinguish between enemies and friends at all and attack everyone, but that was over and they could now take off their masks. Jared also added that the creator could have created a special password for such situations, and here, the password was the phrase, Mahart's greetings. But he would be very grateful to Ellie if she would just think of this situation as an experience she learned from her next experiment. In the end, the four of them continued to traverse the treacherous catacombs of Mayokra, and eventually they came to a statue of some sort, or so she recalled. But she could speak, and after greeting them, the statue, or rather, the monster, called them disturbers of the peace of the place. This was their patient sanctuary, the sanctuary of the mighty Maharta. Before them stood a very strange creature. They called themselves Sun and Moon. With each intruder, the wisdom of this creature increased. The two were one, but very different. The moon was always unhappy, and the sun was very kind and quite gentle, but that was only at first glance, so it told them to feel at home here. As they had planned earlier, Ella and Chloe were to stay here and distract the two-faced priest. The sun offered to give a warm welcome to its new guests right now. The monsters of this dungeon rose from the darkness, and the power of this creature increased again by breaking the rules. The next order of business was to kill all the uninvited guests who appeared to them, and the creature's agility increased again. All of these monsters started to attack on command, but as soon as they reached Ella, they simply walked past and moved on. Isabel didn't find it so funny anymore. For some reason, they all came to her first, so she screamed loudly and took a step back. She began to run away from these creatures, and Jared tried to destroy them with magic. The whole scene repeated itself again, and it probably wouldn't be the last time. The sun and the moon were too angry. She was angry that some people disturbed her peace. Having created another big monster, they both started to control it and try to hurt someone from this group. And while they were doing this, Chloe managed to get so close to them that she was able to hit them with her swords and blood poured from their bodies. In an inhuman voice, they screamed in unison and wanted to catch Chloe who had wounded them. The sun shouted that it hurt so much that the control of magic fell only to the companion who blamed his slaves for this because their incompetence made their masters old. These monsters did not develop at all over time, neither intellectually nor physically. Ella had just confirmed for herself once again that beings who use dark powers can be very catastrophic. The moon tore at the mask of one of her slaves in her hand to show her displeasure, and these councils would never be able to achieve the status of a subject because they were only tools to achieve the goals of their rulers. Ella skillfully and deftly fended off all the attacks of this creature and added that Mahart was also using her as a slave. And such words insulted the moon. 
they both considered themselves the most loyal subjects of his majesty, and to say such a thing was a real disrespect. But Ella wasn't going to end this topic. She needed to bring this creature out of his senses. So she touched on a painful topic, saying that even if the moon said such things, somewhere deep down he still knew and understood the truth. The sun was more likely to give in and be influenced by Ella's words, but the moon stood his ground and insisted on not giving in to the lie. The moon separated from the sun, intending to deal with Ella alone. She could not be forgiven for such blasphemous words. But Ella wasn't alone here. While she was distracting the creature with her presence, Chloe was already attacking with her sword. And although she was not very lucky and therefore spotted, Ella still managed to ram the creature's back through with her sharp sword. She stood victoriously and proudly next to the moon, saying that it was not very normal for such loyal servants to lose their temper after just a few not-so-gentle words. Ella still stuck to her opinion that she had given out at the beginning and struck the creature's body with her sword once more. It wasn't an enemy that was too easy to deal with, but it still proved to be weak when its weaknesses were hit. And it was all according to Jared's plan, the guy had told them before they left. He had told Chloe and Ella to weaken these creatures with their own insecurities. Jared seemed to be just proving that they were on the right track. And then the girl asked him if everything was already done here. Isabel, meanwhile, had already used her own magic, and together with Jared, they dealt with the king. Almost everything was ready, and it took them three hours. And now they had 29 magic stones in their arsenal. Ella was calm, but she noticed something strange about Jared's behavior. Somehow, he had perfect knowledge of this mirror tomb, what was where and how to proceed. He had a clear plan that was not being followed step by step. Jared even took into account the fact that Chloe had no experience in such situations, but he gave her some responsibility and left her on the defensive with Ella. Thanks to Jared, Ella had easy money and her discipline grew in strength, which was very cool. But still, she was here as a bodyguard, not as a vehicle for the magic stones, and it was too much to ask of her. But there was no time for all that. Jared approached the closed gate, behind which there was only one armed soldier. The plan of attack was very simple. They had to aim at him at the same time, and they would be fine if they managed to hit him hard enough. Isabel was a little surprised by the simplicity of the plan with such a strong enemy, but they didn't have a lot of options for attacking. Even in the game itself, this monster could easily repel an entire guild alliance raid, let alone the four of them, and cheap tricks wouldn't work here. However, they were already here and there was no turning back, only forward, so they opened the gate and entered. The hall was very large with high walls, spacious and eerie, knowing that their strongest enemy, the boss of these catacombs, was here. He sat next to a huge pile of sand and held his weapon in his hands, and these were the last peaceful moments for them. This armed soldier of Maharda was called the Golden Hulk. His skill should increase in proportion to the number of his opponents. This soldier was very strong and with one blow could sweep them out of the way if they made a mistake. The man only said that they should not dare to interrupt his master's sleep. His voice was low and echoed throughout the hall. As soon as Isabel entered the room, she could feel the powerful energy he was radiating. It seemed to her that the presence of this golden hulk completely absorbed everyone, time, and everything around her. The golden hulk turned to the sun. He felt it was a betrayal that he and the moon had failed to deal with this group of rogues. But the sun shook his head nervously, trying to think of something to say. Chloe had already drawn her pee and was ready to defend herself if necessary and Sun replied that there was a very good reason they had brought these people here. As Chloe listened to their conversation and kept her eyes on the soldier, he fired energy at the traitor he had called the Sun. Now the creature was smeared against the wall, headless, and a pool of blood spread on the floor. Whatever the reason, the traitor still had to be punished, and they all had to put their lives at risk if necessary to protect their lord. Jared realized that there was no time to waste, so he said that they should somehow try to distract the Hulk's attention and attack him from the back. Without waiting a second, he threw a powerful fireball at him. 
When it hit somewhere, there was a loud explosion and for a moment everything was too bright to keep your eyes open. However, this attack did nothing at all to the Golden Hulk. Absolutely all the criminals who did not need to be warned or protected from him had to be punished. All these people had to face death one on one. Jared shouted to the others to be very careful and cautious. This enemy was very strong. The boy decided to use the magic of the nightmare and the magic missile to try to strike again. Several of these rockets flew in the direction of the Golden Hulk, and Jared put all his strength into them. But despite all this, none of the nightmare missiles harmed the opponent. His armor repelled all the attacks, but Jared did not stop and continued to attack him. However, Mahart's soldier was the first to do so and used a very powerful magic against Jared that could have swept Jared out of his sight. But the boy managed to dodge in time and at the same time he remained alert and closely followed all the movements of the enemy. When Jared landed on the ground, he immediately used the spell Flicker. Everything worked out as he had planned it before. The proximity of the strike of the already powerful Golden Hulk increased his strength by one level. This ability instantly increased the strength of the attack by 1,000%, which was a deadly challenge for all the soldier's opponents. Jared was well aware that even if the Hulk managed to hit him even slightly, he would be saying goodbye to his life, because such a blow would cut him in half. The Golden Hulk was faster than Prua, and compared to Capri, he was even stronger. Although it seemed that there was no room for improvement, Jared did not give up and confidently moved towards his goal. Still, Jared was not alone. If he had to compete with Prua and Capri one-on-one, -on -one, he had three powerful warriors behind him, in whom he was 100% sure. The soldier knew that no one would be a worthy opponent for him here. But overconfidence was not a good quality at the moment. Chloe was able to get very close to him and was already prepared to attack. This character was a pest who had kept no one from the throne for a long time and who had put many in danger, someone who shouldn't exist at all. While Chloe was distracting this monster, Isabel used one of her most powerful spells, which began to work on him when Chloe landed next to her. The Golden Hulk's vision began to fall asleep instantly. He saw everything very dimly and indistinctly, and he was angry with himself for not noticing that there was also a mage in the group. Seeing how they began to implement a frontal attack together, the monster lost its caution and speed of reaction, and Jared seemed very talented to him, despite his young age. Now that Hulk had analyzed the serial's attacks, he realized that in the beginning, Jared had blocked his line of sight when he used the fire spell. And after that, when he started to slow down a bit, they all surrounded him from different sides so that they could launch a continuous attack, so they could test whether the monster would react to the blow. Jared was doing the basic attack and Chloe was supposed to deliver the fatal blow. It was a very good and impressive fighting tactic that was only available for a limited number of faces. None of them ever stopped attacking the monster. It was the only way they could achieve maximum results and defeat the Golden Hulk. While the others were doing their job, Chloe threw her swords at the Hulk's back and plunged one of them into his flesh. But the soldier didn't give up. He was angry at them and at himself for letting this happen and being surrounded. After Chloe's punch, Jared used his attack and blew up the soldier's armor. Now he didn't have any decent armor, but he wasn't going to give up his position. This warrior would definitely stand to the last to protect his lord and not let him down. Now it was very dangerous for him, because at this rate, his already decomposing body would not last long. So the Hulk came up with a strategy. He decided to kill one of them first, so that they could no longer sustain a joint attack. And when their tactics began to fall apart, he would start killing the others. As he began to approach, Jared ordered everyone to move aside and give him space. He had to overcome the magician, the leader. He had to kill him alone. When Jared was very close to the Hulk, he used his special ability, detection. With this, he determined what Jared was going to do next and preemptively struck him with his weapon. He knew that Jared was going to attack him and reacted smartly, dodging the blow and almost hitting him. Jared appreciated this move, but he was ready for it and therefore used the magic of mirror reflection. So all the attacks of this giant did nothing to him. 
While they were fighting, or rather, Jared was fighting, Ella stood back and quietly watched from the so-called rear. If the four of them had fought together, they would have won the fight, but Ella's instincts had completely failed her. No one could know for sure why Ella had done it. Maybe she was just jealous of Jared's performance as a teacher, or maybe she just believed in him. Even she didn't know why she did it, but at the same time, Ella had no doubt that they would win this battle. She knew everything in advance, and for some reason, when the fight started, she stepped back. Ella realized that the outcome of this battle depended on whether she would survive or die, because all three of them were growing at an incredible rate, and they would soon win. In the middle of the battle, the soldier also realized that he should have fought in his true body, but that was not his original desire. When there was almost nothing left of his body, he quietly told them all to leave immediately. In the state they were in, no one could even breathe in the presence of the Emperor. Only then will the Golden Knight be sure that they will meet again in an equal fight someday. With that, he began to turn to dust and disappeared from their sight. When he disappeared from the hall, Isabel walked over to where the Hulk had been standing. Some fabric was left behind. She didn't know it was mirror armor. But Ella immediately came up to them and started saying that the weapon from the grave would bring Jared bad luck. It might even be cursed. And the two were about to throw it away, but Jared couldn't let them, so he immediately grabbed it for himself because he couldn't throw it away. Isabel asked him if he knew anything about this armor, and Jared certainly did. It was the only piece of armor on the entire Nars continent. If one wore this mirror armor, the soul of the blacksmith who created it, rolled, would create a force field around him that would turn all arrows into ashes if they flew towards that person. This armor was thinner than cotton, so it could be worn safely over another piece of armor. The three of them stood there with mixed feelings about it, but there was no changing Jared's mind, so they just decided to forget about it, even though no one realized that it was really a very useful thing. He almost started to cry. The guy had always wanted to get this armor, having conquered it with his own hands and finally managed to do it. But for a moment, he thought about it. Jared thought about the armor and remembered that the player who owned it said he had made it himself. He had given him a ton of metal and raw material to create the thing, but Jared felt like the whole thing was a lie. It was pretty funny and sad at the same time. It turned out that he couldn't use the nightman from his past life. In general, the guy was a little confused about this time. In the end, he took the armor with him and they moved on, and soon the team found the gate they had been walking to for so long. They had already reached the very end, so Isabel suggested that they deal with the next enemy using the same strategy, but Jared said that from now on he should go on alone, and the three of them should wait here. The girl was speechless for a while. She couldn't believe that Jared had said such a thing, but he explained that the Doma Hearts were the ones who spread their curse everywhere they went, so if it touched Isabel or anyone else, it would simply destroy them. It was too dangerous to go on. But then, Isabel asked him what he had to make sure he came back alive. Jared had the Ring of Gracia, which he had received after defeating DeLuca. With this jewelry, magic doubled, and all negative mental buffs were supposed to be neutralized. But he reassured them that they didn't have to just sit here and beat around the bush. They had a difficult task to accomplish as well. Jared asked that they absorb all the demonic energy that Mahart would release during their battle. There was a small hole for that. Demonic energy was like toxins. It might hurt a little bit, but it would be possible to absorb his demonic energy. Isabel said that he could rely on her and she would take care of everything here. Chloe had a different task. Jared needed her to guard the entrance so that no clay soldier could interfere with their fight. Ella came up to him and asked him, as always with a slightly smiling face, if there was work for her, and Jared said that she would not be idle, and Ella was already glad that at least that was the case. But the next moment all her hopes came to an end, because he told her to guard the magic stones, and she did not understand whether he was mocking her on purpose or not. After that, Jared went to the gate with the big lion and opened it using magic. There were clouds of dust everywhere, but he stepped inside into a dark room, but Jared's eyes quickly got used to the pitch blackness. 
He turned to Mahart, saying that it had been a long journey to get here, and he might have died several times already. Mahart said that he would not mind if Jared decided to take a little revenge for all the fun and adrenaline rush. So the boy took his magic wand, which had many good functions, and went on. When Jared went further, he noticed that the tomb was glowing green from the inside. It was slightly open, but he could not see anything inside. Hen Mahart himself appeared. He stepped out of the tomb and onto the ground. Jared was the one who had broken his peace, the one who had entered Mahart's realm of tranquility, and he praised him for making it all the way here. Mahart was standing quite far away from Jared himself. He started to say something else to him, but suddenly fell silent. He looked at the boy and asked what he was doing here, watching him in surprise. Mahart was really shocked and very angry at Jared's behavior. All over Mahart's grave were many pictures that Jared had just drawn. Mahart became even more angry because no one dared to offend him so much. It was vandalism and he almost turned red with anger. But Jared confidently said that today's appearance was the last appearance of the tyrant Mahart. The guy was here to end his life which was filled with murder and blood, so there was no point in setting any other mood in this situation. Mahart, in turn, said that he had created this place with great difficulty. It was made especially for the soldiers he had come to love. But Jared knew all his true plans. Mahart simply wanted to resurrect and conquer the mainland. And as for love for his subjects, it even sounded ridiculous because he made them work very hard and drove them to death with his orders and attitude. And when all the subjects in that place died, he simply left their bodies to rot further. But he said that giving their lives for him was a blessing. Jared couldn't take it anymore and exclaimed that it was all a social lie. Mahart was so afraid of his death that he began to imitate immortality. But Mahart was also on the verge of destroying the place, and he didn't even want a pathetic guy like Jared to say his great name. And then, when Mahart managed to get a shot off, Jared's magic began to work. The mental curse disappeared thanks to the effect of the Ring of Gracia. Even though Jared fell to the ground and seemed to be in a trance for several seconds, the artifact had worked and fulfilled its function. But Mahart didn't stop there. He wanted to finish the job, saying that he would brand him an eternal sinner, and he released a dark force towards Jared. The large black skull from Mahart's hand began to approach the boy, who had just barely gotten to his feet and managed to recover. It was still unusual for him to feel the effect of this artifact. But he quickly gathered himself. Seeing this stigma that would eat a person until he died, even he could not dodge such a thing, because this thing would pursue the target until it caught him, and there was no point in running away. Within seconds, the stigma was on Jared's face, and he looked his rhinestone in the eye without wavering. He had a plan this time, too. He could be clever and dodge when the stigma caught him with the blink. At that moment, he would be able to close it and the piece of paper where he had previously drawn a certain picture. Mahart was amazed by this ingenuity. Jared not only managed to evade the curse, but also avoided being labeled a sinner. When Jared flew into the air, Mahart created a wall so that he could not escape. So if one of them dies, the other cannot leave this place. Mahart also added that if Jared decided to become his loyal subject, he would pity him and forgive him for all his sins, and he was even ready to promise him immortality and great power. But then Jared asked him what he meant by immortality, because the prospect of becoming a bald skeleton that could not rot and die did not suit him. However, this brought Mahart to even more negative emotions. He took it as a very strong insult. So he decided to show the Emperor's true power, and many green lightning bolts appeared around him. They smashed the walls around him, and all these pieces flew right at Jared. Now it was even harder, because dodging such a stream of rocks is not so easy, but Jared held on and tried his best. When he got a little further away, he quickly summoned fire magic and threw a fireball at Mahart. He was able to hit him, but Mahart simply took the hit and remained unharmed. Now it was his turn to show what he could do. Jared knew he couldn't beat him that way, but he was very grateful that at least Mahart's body needed to regenerate as it had in the game, so he could buy himself time to land the fatal blow. 
So now he needed to throw spheres of his magic at him with all his might because Mahart's stamina would definitely run out faster than the guy's magic. But nothing was settled for Mahart, and he raised his magic arrows upward, aiming them at Jared. Jared also had something to say about this attack, and he used several spells at once to get the best results. Jared had a stronger artifact than the great emperor had thought, and the energy rammed into his head. But he didn't give up, releasing green plants from the stone ground that were eager to capture Jared. To avoid being trapped, Jared used his shield and began to approach Mahart very quickly. He didn't care about his opponent's magic. He saw his goal in front of him and moved confidently towards it, forgetting about the obstacles on the way. But he was still getting tired, and because the fight had been going on for so long, Jared felt like he was in a burning hell. The attack that was being used against him was still stronger than his own magic. Mahart's spells were pouring down on Jared in endless waves, and even with full concentration, his body and mind were too exhausted. He had lost count of the number of times he had been on the verge of death, and Jared's mana and physical strength were almost at zero. But the guy realized that he had to hold on just a little longer, and then he would be able to defeat the enemy. Mahart was fascinated by this struggle because he saw that Jared was fighting to the last, but he was not going to give up. It was very desperate. And surprisingly, all of his techniques worked. Mahart was also exhausted over time, even though he was stronger than Jared and it took much more time and effort. However, it seemed to Mahart that Jared's struggle was contrived. Perhaps he was the one who made up for the lack of strength with skill. Nevertheless, Jared was acting like a simpleton, or he was really trying to hide something from his enemy's eyes. Suddenly, Mazar fell to his knees from the instantaneous decrease in his strength. He did not understand what had happened and why such an incident had occurred. He absolutely did not want to believe that this was one of Jared's traps, which he had fallen into simply because of his carelessness. He pushed all these thoughts away, which both made him angry and distracted him from Jared's further attacks, and the man's strength was fading with every breath he took. But when Mahart looked around him, he noticed that he was standing right in the center of the circle Jared had drawn earlier, and it was not just any circle, it was a magical one. Now he realized that this was exactly what Jared had been trying so hard to hide from his opponent, and he had succeeded. Suddenly, the circle began to glow with a bright green light that blinded them both. Mahart realized that Jared had closed him in a magic circle that allowed him to turn the enemy's attack against him, and the fact that Jared was on to him was not good news. For such friendly methods, Jared should have been severely punished and Mahart was about to make it happen. Jared merely replied that it was arrogant of him to talk about other people's dirty methods, when he himself had committed so many crimes. And then Mahart was instantly at the side of a tired Jared, who was trying his best to end the fight with a victory. Mahart managed to catch Jared with his chain. He grabbed him right by the leg because of the guy's exhaustion. As soon as the great god of the catacombs descended to the ground, he pulled Jared down with him, holding the magic chain tightly. Jared flew down in a flash and hit the ground painfully his face and armor covered in numerous scratches from all the blows he had taken. And before he could get to his feet and recover from the fall, Mahart stepped on a large demon that was advancing on him very quickly. He had no time to do anything else but fold his arms across his chest to deflect the blow with magic. The next moment, however, he was already flying to the ground from another hard blow. Mazar had once again managed to hit his target. This attack was one of the most powerful and painful for the guy. He grabbed his arm, gritting his teeth to keep from screaming. His arm hurt so badly that he could hardly move it, and at that moment Mazar came up to him and hit him again. This finally knocked out what little strength Jared had left after everything he had been through in the catacombs, and it seemed that Mahart was just starting his game, because it was all just a warm-up for the real battle. Mahart hit him in the face punishing him in this way for everything the guy had done. Jared was already bleeding, it was everywhere, but his opponent didn't stop. Maybe coming here was his biggest mistake that would lead to a fatal end and all dreams would fade away in a moment. Once Jared stepped through the door, there was no turning back and no time to enjoy his life.
A small sign appeared, informing him that Jared had less than 10% of his health left and he needed to get treatment immediately or at least leave the battlefield. Already almost exhausted and at a complete loss as to what was going to happen next, he tried to use magic to give himself a chance to hold out a little longer. However, Mahart quickly came up to him and gripped his hand tightly, preventing him from doing anything. That was it. That was the end of it. Jared would not be able to use his magic, which was so weak against Mahart, and he would not be able to think of a way to lead his enemy into a trap. But with all these thoughts running through his mind and all the memories of what he had already accomplished and where he had been able to go, Jared gathered himself and tried to hit Mahart with all the strength he had left in his hands. But unfortunately, he failed. His body was too exhausted even for a simple punch. Unlike Mahart himself, whose anger was boiling in his blood, he had gathered his magic and was about to end this unequal fight. But as soon as he swung, a small but sharp dagger flew out of the ring. Jared thanked himself that he had managed to put the accessory on his finger before Mahart attacked him. He had a dagger in his pocket and there were many other ways to win, and besides, Mahart's body was very soft and resembled ordinary sand. It was very easy to plunge the swords into him, one after the other, and they would pierce the enemy's flesh. All these weapons had divine power, which increased the power of the blow. Each dagger was equipped with a purifying magic that penetrated the flesh of Mahart. This magic began to spread throughout his body, and since there were many weapons, it happened even faster. Mahart irritatedly said that Jared had a low level of magic, but he interrupted him and did not let him finish his sentence, saying that only the weakness of his demonic energy was noticeable at the moment. Demonic magic was also subject to purification magic, and it didn't matter how much of his energy he lost at this stage. Eventually, Mahart would still die. The energy was already reaching every point of his body, and it was impossible to do anything about it and stop this effect. Mahart realized that now he had nowhere to go. He was caught again, but this time it was much more serious. So he ordered his army, which consisted of countless clay soldiers, to protect him. But in order for the army to get to the king, they had to pass through Chloe, who reacted immediately to the visitors and rushed to deal with them. While they were marching in time to the hall where the fight was taking place, Chloe managed to get around them all and completely break up the group of soldiers, preventing them from getting to the leader. The girl managed to do her job quickly and accurately. No one stopped Jared from fighting Mahart. And the Lord of the Catacombs of Majorca himself was very angry when he felt that all the soldiers approaching here were destroyed right at the entrance to the hall. Jared smiled, mentally thanking Chloe, and Mahart now knew that he was not fighting against Jared alone because he had at least one ally. However, even this information did not deter Mahart's desire. It only made him more eager and determined to win. As the energy continued to spread through his body, he summoned an immortal army from the portal, a spell of soldiers who were able to escape the clutches of death. All he wanted to do was leave this world, but Jared suddenly appeared out of nowhere and began blocking all the entrances and exits. Mahart's main goal was to take over the entire continent. Listening to all these words echoing in Jared's head, he plunged another dagger into Mahart. His eyes could hardly see but there was also a destiny. He had to win this fight. Now he had to take the last step to achieve what he had been working towards. So Jared continued to hold the knife firmly in his hand and shouted loudly that he would destroy Mavart's plans and unite the entire continent as one. Something exploded loudly in the great hall where the heaviest fight of the day was taking place, and Isabel held her breath as fragments of the door flew past her, broken by the explosion. A layer of dust rose up around her, and she got up from her knees when everything was quiet, thinking of Jared, hoping that he had survived the explosion. Next to the mountains of sand and amidst the silence, which this time was very sharp, stood Mahart, and next to him lay Jared's body. He didn't open his eyes anymore. He didn't have the strength to do so. And Mahart laughed with satisfaction. The Emperor of Immortality had won again. But then he made a mistake that cost him his precious life which was gone in a matter of seconds. 
Mahart's body was crumbling into the sand and he gradually began to disappear and turn into dust. He had lost to Lord Jared, who was the owner of the smallest and weakest land in the north, Crivia, at which point Isabel approached Jared's lying body. He managed to do what seemed impossible. He managed to defeat the tyrant and the great emperor of immortality. Although he was exhausted, the thought of victory made him happy, and Jared smiled broadly, not even opening his eyes. He was so happy that it was over and that he had proved to himself that he could do more, even if it seemed like the end had come. He barely raised his hand, trying to say as loudly as possible that he had won the battle, still not believing what had happened. However, at the same moment his hand fell to the ground from powerlessness. But despite all this, Jared's raid was very successful. He was able to defeat the head of the Mahat Empire. Isabel started to scream that he couldn't just die and leave her, because they weren't even together yet. She wasn't ready to lose him and was ready to commit suicide if he didn't wake up. But Ella calmed her down. She stood behind her and quietly answered that he wasn't dying. Jared had turned over on his side and still didn't open his eyes, but he softly said the name Isabel, and she tried to be quiet to hear what he was saying. But Jared didn't say anything but slurred sounds, and she tried her best to understand if he was in pain and if she could help him in any way. Still, Jared took a deep breath and spoke into her ear, telling her to take care of the artifact for him. It was not a happy thing to hear, but at least he was okay if he could still speak. He also pointed with a trembling hand somewhere to the side and told her to make sure she took the magic book and the secret hiding place. Isabel could not perceive him normally now. To her, he looked like a mercenary creature, and the most mercenary she had ever met in her long life. Chloe and Ella approached him. The gray elf had no emotion on her face, except for a kind of indifference to everything that was happening around her, and the fencer was too calm after everything that had happened. So, all the trophies from the raid were eventually returned to the lands of Majorca. The calendar had turned to July, 23 days had passed since the tomb raid, and life had returned to normal and routine. But on this day, Jared suddenly remembered that he had forgotten to ask Mahart about his existence. He knew he knew more, but that chance had been lost with the life of the Lord of Immortality. Julian was sitting next to him working when he heard Jared exclaim, but at the same moment the Lord told him not to be distracted by trifles and to continue working. So Julian continued to read the results of the raid. This event had a very good effect on the lanterns that had the mana stones of the lands of Crivia and Majorca installed in them, and the crime rate decreased by 90%, a result that was impressive. There are very few blind spots left, but given the pace of new deliveries, lanterns should be delivered to other places this week, in addition to forests and areas abroad. All the residents were extremely grateful to Jared. From now on, anyone could safely move around the streets at night, and if they reach wider areas, illegal deforestation will be reduced. It was all thanks to the fact that they had gotten the trophies. It was usually very difficult to get any magic out of the very hard stones, but Julian was still worried about something. The wound on Jared's left arm from the fight with Mahart hadn't healed yet, even though it had been a long time. Jared knew that it was an unusual burn, so he doubted whether it would ever heal completely, and he could consider it a small price to pay for the victory. After that, Jared turned to Aki and asked him about his new clothes, and the younger man was very excited because he was looking forward to this question. So he readily answered that it was very fashionable now. They said that such things are now at the peak of popularity among the nobility of cinders. He had bought it all to explore the latest fashions and expected to be showered with compliments on his look today. He was in a good mood, expecting a standing ovation, but instead Jared could only say that everyone's standards of beauty were different he didn't want to offend Aki, so he decided to stop there. These clothes weren't Jared and Julian's style, so they couldn't say anything exciting about them. Aki collapsed on the floor, crying at these comments, and Jared asked what he had learned about the collection he had asked to study and research. The guy told him not very happy news. All the items from the collection were sold, 
and he forgot to tell him about it earlier. So Jared asked who was the buyer of all this wealth. The answer was not too surprising. Mr. Ibanaba had bought everything from the shelves. As soon as he looked at the contract for the purchase of the Nightmare Stones, he couldn't resist and bought everything there. Jared was very upset and surprised. He didn't understand why the Red Goblin King, who seemed friendly and nice, would buy all of this stuff. He still hoped that maybe Ibanaba would decide to return some of these items. But the thought that the Goblin King didn't take him seriously just because Jared was human was running through his mind. Aki also had something to tell him. Just yesterday, the Sanders soldiers had sent an official request to them. They really wanted to create a long-term contract for the exclusive export of Jared's landmines to their kingdom. The Lord firmly replied that they don't do that kind of thing, so it needs to be passed on to the Sanders soldiers. Jared wasn't going to agree to any other contracts than a monthly delivery. Aki nodded his head, saying that the kingdom that had asked for a deal with them had a lot of interest in the Lord. This was not without reason, for Jared had pesticides, mana potions, and a cure for the terrible disease Ranella, which was considered a death sentence for many. He also had crystals that were collected in the territory of Krivia and mines that he had invented himself. But Jared thought differently. It seemed to him that people were interested in his territories only because the kingdoms were very close, bordering each other. He was sure that there was a reason for all this, and that something was happening in the kingdom of Cinders, and that this something was not good for Krivia. Aki didn't understand any of this, but Jared thanked him and said he would keep an eye out. Jared remembered that according to the storyline of Paradise, the king of Cinders, Decod, was supposed to die soon. And after the death of Decodus IX, as many as four princes would claim the throne of the kingdom, and that was when the battle of the throne was to begin. By law, the new king, who would be named Decodus X, would be Prince Fathalan, which would not have ended as well as one would have liked. The problem was that he is a follower of the black magic religion and thus an ally of the demon king because of this. And this umbraism could be the cause of the downfall of his state and the king himself, because it was the followers of this faith that had once started the Holy War. At the time of the Holy War, all states fell under the pressure of Umbraism, and judging by the fact that the demon lord is seizing power, he can easily become the main enemy for all kingdoms. Jared decided that he would keep a close eye on the situation, and, as problems arose, he would make some decisions and take action, since he was not a subject of cinders, he could not interfere in the political affairs of the state. He needed to get a special invitation to begin with. Suddenly, Hayes flew into the room, opened the door, and ran to him. He was surprised to see her in such a state, and she told him that something had happened. She closed her eyes and revealed that the king of Sind had given Jared a personal letter. However, the fourth prince wanted to deliver it personally, rather than pass it on through others. He and his servants were already approaching the palace while Jared was trying to take in the situation and decide what to do. Julian could only assume that this visit and the news he was bringing would not be a pleasant one. But when Jared found out that the fourth prince wanted to visit him in person, he finally felt something special. Once he was at the palace, Jared received an invitation to the same banquet. When the green-eyed Eziel arrived at Jared's place, he introduced himself and the king of Krivia immediately used his spiritual eye to see all his indicators and found that his Caesarism was at a high level. Jared von Eucalys greeted him, giving his full name, bowed, and waited calmly for Eziel to hand him the invitation. The letter was in Jared's hands immediately, and Eziel added that his father had wanted Jared to be invited to a banquet in honor of the king and he asked that Jared accept the invitation, as Dakotas would be very happy to see him at the party. Jared carefully opened the envelope to read what was inside. Eziel said that most of the letter was just a formality, but Jared was surprised that Decod was showing him so much attention compared to other kingdoms, and it was still too dangerous for a boy to attend such royal ceremonies. Eziel added that he had suggested to his father that he deliver the invitation himself. He was eager to see Jared in front of him, because Jared was the first person who had aroused so much interest in him. 
He felt a little embarrassed by the words, not even knowing what to say, because it was the first time he had ever heard so many compliments at once. So Eziel hoped that Jared would come over and they could have a good drink and talk. But the king of Krivia immediately dashed those hopes. He was not a subject of their kingdom and was not obliged to bring him, so he just thanked him and was going to leave it at that. He was uncomfortable talking about this, but Eziel saw no problem with it and was impressed by his response. After a moment, he turned and started to walk towards the exit, saying that his personal visit here was a big mistake. He stopped and turned his head to Jared, saying his name. Eziel emphasized that after all this, he would not dare to disturb his father, King Dakad, no matter what happened in his kingdom. Jared, in turn, promised that he would not ignore this letter sent by the king and wished Eziel a safe journey back. The prince turned out to be much smarter than Jared had expected. As he had thought, the prince had the aura of royalty, and he also possessed unrivaled knowledge that could serve as the basis for a sacred state, which was the exact opposite of Mado's concept. But Eziel had to be very careful and cautious. For some reason, Jared did not want to trust the people around him, and he could not show outsiders that he and the prince could have a good relationship. Jared decided to show him something that Eziel didn't know for sure, the power of the Northlands. In the end, the prince traveled to his home, the kingdom of Cinders. Fathalan's descendant, who was to be the next to take the throne, called his servants to him to settle a few matters. The fact is that Fathalan had heard that this servant had worked for Lord Crivia for quite a long time, but he invited him here to verify the accuracy of the information. The old man confirmed that he had indeed served Crivia during Barrett's reign, but had left last year to join Cinders. Fthalin said quietly that this was very good news for him, and that the old man would be useful in his plans. Because his grandfather probably knew more about Crivia than all the citizens of Cinders combined, Fthalin told him to tell him everything he knew about Crivia. Meanwhile, in the kingdom of Mahorka, Mia had already learned to use her magic, but this was not good news, because the child played with it as much as she could. Lena tried to catch up with her and tell her that she shouldn't run around the corridors using her magic. It made too much noise and could be dangerous. But Mia didn't listen to her. She ran into Jared's office and was eager to see the Lord, ready to throw herself into his arms. But they didn't see Jared there. Only Julian stood there. So the girls asked where the king was because it was him they were looking for. Julian himself felt a little embarrassed, but he calmly replied that Jared had to go away for a while, but would be back home very soon. The Lord left for Cinders two days ago, and in total his trip should take about four days, and this was a little disappointing for Mia and Lena. Hayes was very happy. The fact that they were going somewhere together reminded her of the good old days that she often missed. Then Jared remembered how Aki had been trapped with bandits, and the boy had almost turned the carriage over, a horrible memory he would have wiped from his memory for the love of God. The boy begged Jared to forget about the incident and never mention it again, which was unpleasant to hear. But the Lord calmly replied that thanks to this incident, he had met such a beautiful and talented person as Aki, and Jared was very grateful to him that the boy had always supported him. Aki blushed, turned away from him, and said that it was all in vain, because it was thanks to Jared that he had survived that day. Meanwhile, Hayes looked out the window and saw that the kingdom of Cinders was very close by, and they would soon arrive. The banquet was about to begin, and the palace was crowded with people from many different kingdoms, with waiters serving drinks and snacks to the guests. When the next guest arrived, he immediately met the king and bowed to him. The others whispered about something very quietly so as not to disturb anyone, and waited for the celebration to begin. At that moment, Jared entered the hall, and everyone immediately turned their attention to him, because there were so many rumors about this king. He pushed on through the crowd of people, who quickly parted to make room for him to get to King Dakad. The people who stood a little further away watched the invited guest with interest, talking quietly among themselves, saying that they had heard that Jared looked like a fat, unkempt pig. They had also heard that only a couple of months ago he had only 200 men under his command, and that this number had grown to 5,000 under his authority. 
and it is unlikely that the Lord's soldiers were gathered from nowhere, randomly and without any reason, while others believe that he was simply so rich that he could afford such a huge army of soldiers. However, he had created a cure for Ranella, which was actively sold. There were many mines in Crivia. He also sold pesticides and mana stones, and the income from dungeon raids was off the charts. So it turned out that Jared was making a lot of money while he was just sitting still. Jared approached King Cinders and bowed before him, showing his favor. Dikad said that such a greeting would be enough. He had a lot of respect for Jared's father Barrett, especially since it had taken him so long to get here from his kingdom, so the Lord simply invited him to enjoy the evening and relax. Jared stepped away from Dikad's throne a little, looking once again at all the guests in the room. Suddenly, someone called him, and he was really tired after such a long journey, but he still had a long evening ahead of him. He finally realized this when everyone started to talk to him. People started to ask him to come to their kingdoms next time, to get to know each other, and Jared himself just wanted to get out of this place so that no one would touch him anymore. He couldn't say this in a rude way, so he tried to break through and find the Cinder's princes with his spiritual eye. Jared heard someone call a prince's name nearby, and he looked in that direction, seeing a young man with long brown hair surrounded by servants and doctors. The first prince, Ian, was not feeling well at the moment. He had a certain illness that was bothering him, but he assured him that this had happened before, so there was no reason to worry. Jared noticed that Prince Ian was constantly surrounded by people from his family or senior doctors, and his rare illnesses were gradually driving him from his rightful throne. The third prince was Jessa, who was more noisy and was surrounded by aristocrats who were pushed out of the leading factions. Although Jessa was not as popular as his brother Phtalan, Jared could not help but notice the company of aristocrats who were interested in him. These two princes are always in constant competition, and neither of them is defeated. Eziel was too weak in this regard, and he had no soldiers who wanted to join him. Phtalan's status was so high that he did not even interfere in Eziel's life. Jared looked at each of them carefully, analyzing everything, but soon one man came up to him, stood behind him, and tried to talk to him. It was Phtalan. Jared recognized him when he turned to him. The other prince greeted him but continued to keep his cool when talking to him. Then the prince asked if it would be more convenient for Jared to be called Viscount Jared, at which point the boy fell silent as he read his vitals. Phtalan was a sword master, and his level of proficiency was high. Then Jared noticed Caffrey. He realized that this time he was also on the side of the second prince, thus supporting the devil himself. But then Jared smiled sweetly and told him to address him as he felt comfortable. He could just call him by his first name. It made almost no difference to him. Phtalan nodded and continued the conversation. He had heard that Jared had come here at the invitation of his brother, Eziel. But then the second prince said that he himself had been looking forward to meeting the king of Crivia, Barrett's son. So he was very happy that this opportunity had come and they had finally met. Ezekiel was also in the room and carefully watched the conversation between Jared and his older brother. He realized that he wanted to lure him to himself, to recruit him. Meanwhile, Mara came up to him. She was the youngest child in the family. Jared wanted to end this conversation, trying to bring everything to a close, but Fatalin did not want to let him go, so Jared thanked him once again for his interest in his little-known person. But then the second prince said that he shouldn't think so modestly of himself. Jared himself should know that he was the most sought-after man in almost all kingdoms, thanks to what he had invented and what he could export. But the guy with the same smile stretched over his ears assured him that he focused all his thoughts and efforts on improving his lands and didn't pay much attention to such a supposedly respectable status. Phtalin then moved on to the next topic. He had heard that Jared was not involved in foreign political affairs, but somehow he had managed to get the lands of Mallorca to join him. Jared only laughed, justifying this situation by saying that he was just lucky and still the weakest in the north. Phtalin said it in more polite words, 
but with his eyes and tone of voice he seemed to insist that they should cooperate in the future once they found a common language. The second prince called him a very ambitious person, and he personally came to this conclusion knowing all the nuances about Jared. However, he assured him that it was all just a desperate struggle at a time when neighboring lands were trying to seize his territory. Fethalin didn't try to convince him, so she simply agreed with him and put her hand on his shoulder. He added that they would definitely need to meet one-on-one -on -one someday, and Fethalin had many things he wanted to ask him about and talk about. After this conversation, the second prince finally left Jared and walked away from him, yet he couldn't focus too much attention on him without appearing too suspicious. Jared exhaled calmly as he was left standing behind him, and then the grumpy Prince Jess came up to him, cheerful as was his personality, and asked loudly how the conversation with his brother had gone. And without even waiting for an answer, he said that everyone was trying to establish contacts with Jared because he was a very influential person and very popular, so everyone wanted to be in a relationship with him every year. But still, no matter how hard Fatalin tried to make a good impression on Jared, he was very bad at it. Jess, on the other hand, had a lot of connections among the warlords, and he was even willing to order ammunition for him if Jared wanted it, so he could resell it on his land for a lot more money. But then Jared said he didn't want to sell under pressure from someone else. It would have hindered him even if the price had been agreed with the person in charge. Jessa appealed to his aristocratic acquaintances, telling them to give Jared some space and not to press him with their eyes. Jessa was quite abrupt and insistent, but he only wanted to show that he was very interested in Jared's personality and further cooperation with him. He felt a little embarrassed that he had put the guy in an awkward position, but then Jared assured him that he was the only one who should be embarrassed. In his opinion, Jess was going too far with his interest in a lord like himself. Jared's remarks impressed the aristocrats, including Jess himself. He took it too personally, saying that for some reason Jared had entered into a canado with his older brother and was now trying to escape from it. While Jess was angry, Jared realized that he had a lot more complexes than his brothers. The next moment, Jared was blunt. He believed that he could have gotten more out of it for himself with Thalin. He would feel more secure and confident with the second prince. Jess's friends already knew that these words would not lead to anything good because their friend was taking things too personally. He started to get very angry and was on the verge of starting a fight with Jared in the middle of the room at his father's banquet, but it ended more or less peacefully. He was hurt, of course, but they just parted ways. Jess didn't even want to see him anymore. Instead, Jared met up with Eziel and Princess Mara again, and the three of them sat down at a round table away from the prying eyes of the guests. First of all, Eziel wanted to apologize for his older brother. He was ashamed of his behavior, but there was nothing to be done about it. His temper was very hot. But Jared said it was okay, and after that, even the atmosphere of the banquet began to become more lively. Lord Crivia picked up his cup and took a sip of tea and for a moment there was silence among them. Then Mara decided not to miss the opportunity to talk to Jared. She had heard a lot about him, and she added that it would be very cool if a person like him became a citizen of their kingdom. Jared was getting a little tired of them all saying the same thing. He firmly stated that he was still a resident of Senju and did not want to be a subject of another kingdom. She was not satisfied with this answer, and then Mara exclaimed that her brother needed the help of a man like Jared, but Aziel calmed her down a bit. He was calm, but he told her to watch what she was saying and not to get so emotional. She apologized to him, realizing that she was wrong to say such things, but for some reason the people had turned away from her brother and she wanted to help. Jared also calmed down and put the cup of tea on the plate, saying that he could help them if outsiders were so interested. Jared would be able to make it so that for some time they could talk quietly without paying attention to others. Eziel looked at Jared's hand in amazement. He was now using sound-blocking magic. After that, the boy asked what they could tell him about Prince Pralin and Jess. Eziel didn't follow his brother's every move. He wasn't interested in it at all, but he knew what was important. Jared asked the next question. 
He was interested in whether the fourth prince knew that the two were adherents of the Umbraism faith. The look on the brothers' and sisters' faces showed that they were very surprised by Jared's words. Eziel knew that there were rumors about this, but he did not believe it seriously. The fourth prince took this as an attempt to insult the royal family. He became angry, saying that Cinders was a country that was only committed to the divine nature of Radius. Jared calmly took out another sugar cube to put in his tea, surprised to hear that Eziel didn't know that about the prince. He slowly raised his hand to the cup and said that Eziel's brother might not care about the kingdom at all, or he might just lack faith in Radius's nature. Eziel didn't want to admit it to himself, but he knew there was nowhere to run, because Jared had figured out his brother and ripped the veil off. Nevertheless, he gave away the fact that neither he nor Mera nor anyone else knew about this secret. Jared said that if the two of them had already known everything, their conversation would have gone much faster. But from now on, Eziel and Mera would have to secretly gather all the information about the two princes and their actions. Jared gave Eziel a strange object with which to record a video of some secret meeting or ceremony. And after that, he could collect evidence that no one could deny or justify. Eziel couldn't trust everyone, and he didn't know what Jared's specific purpose was in helping him. But since Jared was not a citizen of the kingdom, he simply wanted to help the people living in the kingdom's territories out of his own free will, so that their country would move in the right direction. The power or close associates will no longer be able to influence them in any way. As the sugar cube sank into the cup of hot tea and dissolved in a flash, Jared added that sometimes it happens that even the strongest relationships between people start to fall apart for some reason. Mara said that now it would be worth removing the sound-blocking magic, because if they sat for so long, some suspicions would arise. So Jared removed the spell and said that he would leave the rest of the details to them. In the meantime, several people stood behind Jared, all dressed in black and wearing disguises to hide their identities. Jared told them to keep a close eye on what was happening in the kingdom and report back to him. Since he had chosen them as the best of the best, he was confident that this group would do a much better job than the spy Prua. The spies dispersed, and Jared picked up the cup again and began to drink the tea he loved so much. But it would have been better not to put so much sugar in it, the last cube was definitely unnecessary. A new hard day began after a deep night had passed, and they had spent it quietly in the palace enjoying their sleep. Jared and Hayes were ready to head back, but Aki was running late for some reason. Hayes remarked that they had to wait for him again, just like last time. She then added that she thought Jared was the only one of all the lords who was waiting for the Gatsai to arrive outside. He offered to buy her some clothes while they waited for Aki, and Hayes asked him a little confused as to why. She added that what she was wearing now didn't make her uncomfortable, so she shouldn't have worried. But he convinced her, saying that he wanted to do it. Taking Hayes by the hand, he led her to the store. She didn't know how to react or why Jared would do this, but she followed him. Very soon they were in the store, and she began to try on different outfits. First, she put on a red dress and went out to show it to Jared. Jared smiled slightly and said that it looked great on her, and the salesman also complimented the young lady. But Hayes decided to try on something else. It would be a shame to leave her choice on the first look. Shopaholic mode was on. Hayes was very happy trying on the clothes, so Jared just made sure they did the right thing when they came here. But as he waited quietly for her to look at her next look, an urgent warning appeared. The territory of Krivia, which was next to the Nightmare Forest, was under threat. Every year on July 1st, the main star of the sky, Dias, and sometimes the star Wendell, would align. At such a time, there would be a large-scale invasion of the kingdom by evil spirits. Today was June 9th, and there were still three weeks to go before the event. Jared was thinking about how to respond, but he was very nervous because the day of the invasion was coming very soon. Massive invasions of evil spirits. In paradise, it was called monster explosion. Until now, the monster invasion had been prevented by numerous tribes led by Barrett of Krivia from the north. And from the south, Ibanaba and his army helped stop the chaos. 
If you fight monsters without proper preparation, it can lead the whole continent to disaster. But if you go into the battle prepared, you can gain tremendous experience on the battlefield. So he decided that this time he would dominate such an important event. Before he had time to think over all the details, Hayes came to him in a new look. She had decided to choose this dress. It fit her incredibly well, and Hayes looked simply gorgeous. Jared thought she looked like an angel. Hayes really resembled something unearthly and beautiful. After these compliments, Hayes used healing magic to create a small sphere in her hands, and then she threw the sphere around her throughout the store. Jared stared at her in fascination as she stood there in the light, a little uncomfortable now, but she wanted to ask anyway. She felt like she really did look like an angel who had come down from high heaven. But when she asked Jared, he replied calmly and gently that she always looked like an angel. The shopkeeper almost wept at the sight of the two of them. After they waited for Aki and got into the carriage, they returned to the Krivia Palace some time later. Jared had been practicing tirelessly as usual, trying to maximize his magic so that he could go into battle with confidence and win. Isabel helped him, but she noticed that even a strong magician like him was having a hard time fighting. Isabella, while still in the body of an evil demon, had spent almost all her resources on lust magic, so the spells were very powerful. She trained this type of magic because it could lead a person to the most fatal mistakes that would be impossible to correct. Jared was already sweating while he fought her. He assumed that she had Mahat magic and that was why Isabel was so strong and since her test was already over, he could destroy her. But suddenly, Isabel disappeared behind a red mist from which a large mirror soon appeared. Jared stopped talking and looked in shock and then saw Hayes standing calmly next to the door. He didn't know what the girl was doing here and thought it was all just a misunderstanding, maybe an illusion. But Hayes began to speak to Jared, saying that he had disappointed her very much, that he had seen a suspicious plan and thought that the two of them had agreed to do this and that Isabel had invited her. The little demon kept whispering in Hayes's ear that she was doing the right thing and it was better to give up on such a lustful boyfriend right away. Then she added that she needed to dump Jared and find someone new, more calm and balanced. But Hayes clung to her own then. There was no reason why she couldn't wear such clothes, but it was too much to do. Isabel immediately shut her up. She didn't understand what the clothes and everything else had to do with it and insisted that Hayes say everything gradually and without any nonsense. After that, Jared decided to end it all, so he approached Isabel. She had already passed the stage of magical training, but she still lacked power. He told her to train even more to increase her strength. But she responded by hitting him, telling him to shut his mouth and stop bragging. It was a dark night with only a few lights on in the windows of houses, and the nightmare forest had a simultaneously calming and eerie atmosphere. On his road among the endless trees, a group of people was walking, carrying weapons and talking to each other about something, deciding to stay in this place because it would be impossible to find another normal one, because all the hotels were full and some people even stayed on the streets. Their leader added that the dungeon had been completely destroyed, so it must have been hard for them. But suddenly the man's attention was drawn to Jared, who had no idea what he was or why he had come here, but his friend only replied that it was very strange to be in Krivia and not know the king of the state. If he now understood who it was, he still did not know why he had come to this place. His friend replied again that he had heard that Jared had been visiting the Nightmare Forest lately, and moreover, entering the forbidden territory. The king of Krivia walked on, finding himself in a small clearing surrounded by complete silence and darkness. He pulled out a small knife, wondering why Krivia could not have developed as much as Renella earlier, but apparently the main reason for this was the invasion of monsters. The wise Viscount Barrett became a real salvation for those who lived on this barren land and the kingdom grew. However, all his achievements and efforts during the year were destroyed by the monsters. And while Krivia often suffered from invasions, Ranella and Mahorka enjoyed all the privileges in peace. All his life, Barrett had only dreamed of one day assembling a mighty army that could withstand the power of demons and protect the kingdom. 
But Jared's father never managed to do it, or at least this point was not fully realized. However, Crivia was still in a safe zone now, at least there were not as many mishaps as before. Jared set up several magic stones close to each other and made them work with his magic. A dome spread over the entire Nightmare Forest, completely covering it and working as a barrier. Meanwhile, the goblins and various monsters were already advancing towards him. This army was really very large and powerful, and it was scary to imagine what could happen if you did not withstand their attack. One of their leaders, who stood in front, loudly declared that today was a day of blessing and they must deal with all their rivals. He gave his soldiers permission to eat the wretched people they met along the way, but he ordered them to gather food and precious things in one place. They were the center of the world and everything should belong to their army. The biggest monster turned to the commander when the portal was opened and it was time to go to the battlefield. Crandall, the commander of the Blue Ogre Legion, told all his men to enter the portal. All the evil spirits that had gathered here in one army instantly slipped into the magic ring, waiting for the moment when they could eat human flesh and take possession of their belongings. They spent some time in the portal, but soon came out and surprisingly immediately encountered the first people standing in front of them. Jared stood calmly in front of the monster, which was moving very quickly towards him. He thought that it was just an unfortunate guy who was unlucky to be near the magic portal. He was ready to attack him and make a chop out of his body, but Jared continued to stand there as if he didn't care about anything that was happening. Meanwhile, more and more evil spirits began to emerge from the portal, seemingly endless in number. The ogre, who was the commander's right-hand man, came up to him and said that their warrior should have already cleaned up the surroundings of this place. By the order of the elder, they were all supposed to hurry to the nearest villages where people live, but Crandall stopped them and told them to look around. It was a very strange place. They had planned to go somewhere else, but they ended up somewhere else, and Crandall looked around. He said in surprise that there must be another land somewhere nearby with people living on it. And Jared, continuing to stand calmly away from them all, said that this was a warped world that he had created using mana crystals as doors to other dimensions and that he had done a great job. The evil army could consider this an obstacle they would not be able to overcome because he had clearly indicated all the coordinates for them to return to their world, which would happen as soon as they passed through the wall. Crandall listened attentively and was glad to find the culprit of the terrible situation they were in. Jared stepped closer and said that he had come out here as a representative of the humans to greet them and welcome them to the new world. Crandall also stepped closer and asked who he was, knowing that ordinary people could not possess such magic. Jared confirmed that there really were no such people, and as a result, the Great War would soon begin, and all this was just a way to confront the enemies. The ogre had no idea what the boy was talking about, but he managed to get the gist of it. No matter how powerful a super crystal people had, such heavy magic required a lot of power. Crandall asked if this obstacle could disappear by itself if they waited here, and Jared said that was correct. The Legion commander also sensed a strange energy emanating from Jared, so he ordered Tabanon to go and check if his guess was correct, and the aide immediately jumped down. The ogres, goblins, and all the other evil spirits began to watch as Tabanon dealt with this tiny fellow. He gladly agreed to start a fight and keep Jared entertained until the barrier was gone, as they had nothing better to do for the time being. Jared, as always, had a plan and followed it to the letter, so at this point he decided to use the magic bracelet to summon the magic of the nightmare. Crandall felt that Jared's aura had become even more powerful. Apparently the guy had been hiding his full potential all along, and then he remembered the warriors who had come with him to the kingdom, but he hadn't seen them anywhere. And when he looked out of his carriage, he noticed that the entire army was already lying dead on the ground. Then the commander realized that something was wrong and immediately ordered Tabanon to stop, but the truth came to him too late. At that very moment, Jared threw a large fireball at Tabanon and burned his face. Tabanon caught fire and now there was almost nothing left of him. His horn flew away from him and hit several goblins on the head. They watched with stupid faces. Then Crandall ordered everyone who was left to immediately grab Jared before he could get away from them. 
They were going to attack and destroy him, and Jared had already prepared to defend himself, asking himself if Mahat felt the same way. Jared was ready to defend himself, and from his hands began to appear spheres of light, which he launched at his enemies. In a moment, all these spheres were already near Crandall and his carriage. While the battles were going on in the lands of Crivia, things were not going well in Ronell's kingdom either. Curry promised Ronell that he would protect him if necessary, and he fled to the central lands. If things continued to go on like this, Jared could come here. Besides, the treaty had already expired, so we had to find another solution somehow. At that very moment, a servant ran into Ronell's office, shouting that enemy troops had already approached their borders and were beginning to attack. The commander was not very surprised that Jared had come, but he was very scared, because he did not know what to do next. But the servant added that there were about 100 people there, and it was probably not Jared's work. The boy threw a book at him. He scared Ronell very much with such loud words, but in fact, nothing serious was supposed to happen. But the boy assured him that it was urgent news because the enemy had entered their territory. He understood that this was the best and most reliable fortress to block evil spirits, and it was captured by some villains, an army of 100 people. Then the servant suggested that they were most likely traitors who had let the enemies in, which angered the Lord even more. They came downstairs in full armor and with the army, and Ronell ordered his assistant to deal with the enemy. He was extremely angry when his kingdom was considered weaker and underestimated. They were not some kind of crivia, weak and inept. A man wearing a robe that covered his entire body came forward and summoned the head of Ronella, with a large number of people standing behind him. When Ronell recognized the man, he went crazy. It was a complete betrayal. It was one of his aides who had been gathering information about Crivia and now decided to get rid of his former lord. But he assured him that he was doing it all for the sake of peace in Ronell. The greed and cruel behavior of the lord of this kingdom was too dangerous for the people of the state. Ronell did not wait any longer. He was satisfied with the words he heard and ordered the soldiers to capture the traitor, and the army began to fulfill the order of their lord. Then the guard who was standing behind the man told him to go back to a safer place. They could handle it themselves. This was bad, because the invaders were here too, and the army against the kingdom's lord was quite large, considering that all these men had once served him. One young man came forward, sword in hand, ready to defend himself. He suggested that they should not waste time on idle talk, because this man's plan was only to take over Renella and behead the previous leader. Meanwhile, on the territory of Crivia, the battle between Jared and hundreds of monsters that appeared from the portal continued. The blue ogres attacked him from all sides but could not reach him. Jared was a really strong opponent and didn't even let them get too close to him, immediately neutralizing the enemies with magic. However, one of the goblins managed to hit the boy. He was aiming right at his face, and this time he got it. But Jared was not confused and immediately activated the artifact of mirror armor, which immediately appeared on his face. The goblin, who was standing closer and shooting at Jared with his bow, was now afraid. The boy seemed invincible. So the monster decided not to risk his life and jumped away from Jared, dropping his bow and arrows. But this guy is not so easy to escape from. He used the magic of fire again, which was quickly approaching the goblin. But while he was dealing with this green guy, a small dragon appeared next to him. This dragon held a plaque in its paws with words written on it for Jared, and it was given the title of Hellfire Incarnate, and the magic damage from its flames now increased by 100%, and Jared was now able to use the magic of the special state Burning Flame. He was excited because he himself suspected that Jared's character had a penchant and talent for fire magic, and now he had a rank like that. It was very cool. The commander of the Ogre Legion stood in a safer place and gave orders, telling who and where to go and what to do. But it didn't help him much. The flames had reached his own carriage. They were about to be crushed, so he ordered them to run in different directions and escape while everything around them was already burning orange. Jared said that if Crandall was so impatient, he could have come down to fight him himself instead of sending his servants ahead. The boy's next strike was aimed at the other monsters, 
almost all of whom were already lying dead on the ground, and those who remained were trying to run as far away as possible to stay alive at least. Crandall couldn't take it anymore and decided to deal with Jared himself, so he took his giant hammer in hand and jumped on the boy. The Kingdom Lord defended his lands to the last. He was already exhausted, having used so much mana for the spell, but he did not stop there. This time, however, something went wrong and Crandall managed to catch him in his big paws, even though Jared tried to dodge. The boy immediately began to break free of his deadly grip while using the amplifier for his own magic. Jared grabbed his wrist and challenged him to a fight, saying that all of Crandall's servants were too weak to get his way, and he was even bored, but the leader was going to be a little more interesting. Suddenly the monster let go of him and began to transform into something completely different, its body as if it were becoming a flame. Its sharp teeth became even bigger and sharper, and the monster smiled greedily, looking into Jared's eyes. The boy, in turn, used the mirror armor to avoid getting hurt in any case, but in front of him he created a magic shield to try to keep the enemy's magic out. And this method worked. Then he retreated, being too tired to continue the fight. After Crandall had retreated a good distance, Jared created a high wall of fire and blocked the enemy's passage to his side. After that, he decided to speed up the destruction process and used accelerated action magic. Jared ironically asked Crandall if he was hot, and then immediately added that he would help him with that and add a little bit of cold. The next spell was an ice storm that was supposed to freeze the rascal. Crandall was in a desperate situation. He was trapped and his entire army was destroyed, and he himself would soon leave this world. To finally end the fight, Jared decided to try out his new powers, and as soon as he shouted the spell, a huge fire cobra appeared behind him. Crandall was frightened, but despite this he stood in one place as if frozen. He noticed that his opponent was only getting stronger with each spell he used. It did not look like the person he said he was. But soon he would no longer doubt it. The cobra quickly approached the ogre and knocked him down. All the other monsters in the army that were standing nearby realized that they had better get out of here now while they still had the chance, because once Jared was done with the leader, he would come after them. But they made this decision too late, because Jared noticed that they were trying to escape and stop them. Suddenly, however, he was confused and distracted, although he did not yet understand what was happening. A dark portal appeared in front of his eyes and pulled them all in. Soon, everything disappeared and Jared found himself alone on the shelves of a dark and dense forest. He did not expect his enemies to leave so easily, but he had accomplished his main mission. He had defended his kingdom from the attackers. Jared was blown off his feet by a very strong wind. He couldn't even stand on his feet and fell to the ground. The portal was closed. Some of the monsters managed to escape and save their lives, and the boy could not give a clear explanation to himself of what had just happened, but he breathed a sigh of relief. All Jared knew was that it was impossible to close the portal from the inside without a Demon King level, but it was strange that such a powerful mage had decided to stand up for them on his own. The Demon King wanted to cut all ties with him, but he was grateful for something because he had made all that evil disappear before the blocking stopped working, which would have been a failure for Jared. Of course, it was a shame that his experience points were gone too, but it was good that it ended on such a note. He now sat quietly under the starry sky with his eyes closed and remembered his father, that is, the father of Jared's character from the game. Of course, the boy didn't suspect anything, but he wasn't alone. He was standing right next to him, hiding behind a tree, watching his son defend Curve. Ranella would not have been so easy to defeat, though. Only a few dozen men managed to destroy his army, leaving their lord almost face to face with the enemy. These men did not even get tired during all this time. They introduced themselves as soldiers of Crivia. It was the strongest army of Agracio, which the king himself created. Still, there was no time to stay here for long, so the boy took the lord by the hair and pulled him along. The king of Crivia wanted to meet him in person at his castle, and they all didn't care that the lord was talking about a pardon. Three months passed as Jared continued to train with Isabel and improve his magic, as important issues for the kingdom were resolved, 
and as his food supplies became more and more in demand. On this day, Jared was walking through a green forest where he was to meet someone. She was late, but after a while he opened his eyes when he heard footsteps approaching him. It was the Princess of Cinders, Mera, wearing a robe, and she came closer to Jared starting to talk to him. She was very upset and seemed to be somewhere else. The guy interrupted her, expressing his condolences about what happened to her father. She reacted calmly to this, even though she did not think that Jared already knew about it. Her father's death had come too suddenly and had hit her morale hard. However, Jared asked Mara to tell him more about it because he wanted to know how it happened. Mara told him that her father began to lose ground very quickly and died in a moment, and her brother Ian was feeling worse every day. In addition to his own health, he was now also worried about the death of a loved one. He was predicted to die just as soon. He might not even live to see the end of this month. Jared remembered how all this happened in the game, and then everything changed completely, and apparently, because of his interference in their kingdom, Prince Ian in Paradise was supposed to live another ten years. With a sigh, Jared said that he could tell Mara three things now. First, he would have people coming to visit him. Perhaps James would not be here because of his character and their relationship, but Fathalan would definitely come. Secondly, in no case should Prince Iswell be allowed to interfere in this situation. He must pass by the Civil War, but while they are trying to reconcile the two princes, they should try to get closer to Prince Ian's people and ask them to leave. Prince Ian's people were very close to the royal family and they were all against the civil war. And third, if this civil war was going to be postponed for a while by natural means, then any resources should be used to gather everything related to the princes and Umbra. They were now like herbivores in the same cage as these two predators, so only one attack was needed for the decisive and fatal blow, and in the meantime, they only had to wait for the right moment to attack. Mara thanked him. She hadn't changed her face during their conversation. Her father's death had hurt her too much, but she still wanted to apologize to Jared. But he said that they hadn't started anything yet, so it wasn't the time for thanks and apologies. Now everything was clearly on track, so it was time to follow the plan and execute the next steps just as well. The figures were adjusted depending on the smallest indicators, and if at first glance this territory seemed to be the most backward, it was actually at the average level, on the same level as the Kingdom of Messeria, which belongs to Count Capri. After merging the territories and dividing the responsibilities between Julian, Avila, and Aubren, things didn't seem so difficult, but more people would still be needed. Jared assumed that if Julian got sick or tired and needed to rest, there could be big problems in running the kingdom. Jared didn't know where he could find more people. It was too hard to live in this world. But after Jared said that, someone shouted very loudly behind him, which scared him. His heart beat faster, and Jared turned to the person who had frightened him. Behind him stood an older man with a long gray beard and equally long hair. He asked why Jared was looking at him like that, as if he were his first love, and he was getting annoyed that the boy was not talking. The great mage Verhad, who was at level 9, did not like the way Jared was receiving a guest in his kingdom. The boy immediately apologized, not recognizing the man at first because he didn't think he would just show up like that. Verhad remembered the letter that Jared had sent him, so he came here. The magician could not leave immediately so he watched the boy for a while. Verhad noticed that Jared had begun to manage the kingdom differently and had also smashed the neighboring territories to pieces, which interested him. The boy was a little different from his father, who was a pacifist and held a peaceful point of view. Jared was very surprised to hear that Verhad knew his father. The mage sat down on the ground, saying that he shouldn't tell him how difficult Barrett's character was, the mage was going to give him advice from the fifth grade and get out of here quickly. Jared was like a small child now. He was so happy that Verhad had responded to his request and come, because the boy really needed his advice and support. It was vital for him to hear these words from Verhad, and Jared beamed with pleasure. But the magician warned him not to even think about asking him to stay in the kingdom or to become a sensei for him. 
Jared happily said that he hadn't even thought of such things, and Verhad said nothing to that and exhaled calmly. Now, all Jared had to do was listen carefully. He wanted to tell him something that had been on his mind ever since he had reached the level of fifth-class magic. Jared used to be just an ordinary employee of a company named Shin Taipoon, living an ordinary and not particularly interesting life. Jared remembered the day he first opened his eyes and found himself in the curve, as if it was not a long time ago, but a lot of time had passed since then. Back then, he just wanted to survive. He realized that he wouldn't be able to sit here for long, so he started to develop this kingdom. But with the rapid development of his state, he himself changed a lot. Or maybe he just realized a very important thing. He is no longer that Shin Tapun. He is Jared, the king and ruler of his territories, a warrior who is ready to give up everything to protect the kingdom and the people of the state. And these people, they were not some characters from the game paradise, they were real people or creatures. Before, he fought only because he wanted to survive. He was afraid to die, but now he realized that he was fighting because he wanted to protect his people. He was fighting for them and for his country. He did not rely only on his magical or physical abilities. On the contrary, he was very much driven by the fact that the enemy was too strong and powerful. Even knowing absolutely everything about various strategies and glitches, he was far from perfect because he is a human being first and foremost. That's why Jared gathered around him loyal people whom he could trust completely and rely on. As long as he has them, he will have himself. Without them, the Jared that he used to be will disappear. Of course, his personality will remain the same, but he will lose the point of fighting desperately as if it were the last time. As Jared recalled all this, very bright rays appeared around him. Verhad was very surprised to see this in front of him. He had never seen anything like it before. Jared hadn't done it on purpose, but what had just happened had taken him to the level of class 5. At first, the magician didn't believe it, because he had just said a few words, corrected him a little bit, and Jared had already moved to the next stage of magic. But it was the truth. Invisibility appeared at this level and Jared demonstrated it. Verhad had no doubt about it, but it never ceased to amaze him. This guy had gotten fifth grade magic after only a few instruction. Even he himself couldn't have advanced to the next stage so quickly, so quickly. This boy definitely had extraordinary abilities. Barrett had clearly defined boundaries, but the son had surpassed his father. It's not a sin to be a teacher of such a capable and talented student, but maybe later on you'll even feel a little jealous. Verhad stood up and tried to convince himself that Jared could handle everything himself, that he would just have to watch him from a distance. Jared asked him timidly why he was leaving so quickly, hoping for at least a few more tips from the ninth grade wizard. But Verhad replied that they had already reached the desired goal. He had already given a lot of advice. It was worth an honor to know. One could not ask for too much. It was even impolite. Verhad concluded by saying that they would see each other again someday, if fate so desired, and Jared offered to see him off. But the man assured him that he shouldn't, but Jared insisted. He was also curious about Verhad's plans for the future, but the magician did not want to reveal all his cards to him now and tell him about his future intentions. Jared just wanted to know where he was going, so Verhad decided to tell him. He was going to visit the eastern continent, and the man kept walking forward with Jared following him. January 1st, 1415 came on the Nars calendar. A new year had begun on the mainland. The man died in his past body of Shin Tapun and was reborn in the not-so-great body of King Jared of the Curve. And from that moment on, exactly one year passed, not the easiest but very productive and definitely more interesting than in his past life, Time flew by very quickly. Jared decided to celebrate this small anniversary and have a drink. He reached for the rapier potion, the experience potion they had obtained from the tomb of Mahat III, and drank it all in one go. But if you pour plain water into the empty bottle of this potion, then every year, on January 1st, this water will turn into a potion. So the year started off very nicely, with leveling up, and all the characteristics that Jared would gain after that he was going to put into mania. 
There was always room for improvement, so he had to invest endlessly. You could level up in just one sip. It was incredible, and it was also very tasty and sweet. Jared's scores increased significantly, rising to 63. But just as he thought, his level was still too low. Because of DeLuca's bracelet's ability, he had been putting off leveling up. But it seemed like now was the time to do it. He decided that as soon as he finished his work in the kingdom, he would need to take his students with him and go through the dungeons. Julian actively and deeply studied the management of mysterious objects, and after that he received an epiphany, and Jared, as his mentor, received a reward of ten points, which he could distribute as he wished. Months ago, there was a feature in the Paradise System. When you increased your class level, you could get a certain reward for it. Depending on this, you could choose several rewards. However, Jared had long ago decided what kind of reward he wanted to choose as soon as he reached Class 5. He made this decision at the moment when he was thinking about how he could get the most profitable reward, and his decision was to improve the learning project. That is, it had to be passed on from teacher to student. He was going to be taking care of them anyway, so he was well worthy of reaping the rewards. At the moment, he had four students, Hayes, Isabel, Lena, and Mia. All of them had good abilities and were quick to learn new things, which pleased him. Julian managed to master not only management standards, but also higher skills. He was very grateful to his sensei. He was able to learn a lot from him. He could not help but think of Jared as his mentor. Aki diligently repeated after him. Although he thought that such contact would be more like some kind of slavery, but he agreed he was pleased to work with Jared. Lakis, on the other hand, had overcome the obstacle called age, so he was also developing successfully and confidently. He was taking his cue from Jared and the king was really inspiring him. Now Jared watched his students develop and it seemed to him that everything was going very well. This time the boy believed in it again. However, there was a but again. Chloe also offered him to sign a contract. It was not just like that. There was a reason for this decision. It would be a small oath between the two of them. Chloe said that she would be able to pass on special fighting skills and knowledge to him. He had previously thought that a cold wall had grown between them, with no feelings, so he didn't think it would work out with her here. But Jared didn't know how to explain it to her gently so that she wouldn't get offended and kill him on the spot after such a rejection. She could tell by the look on his face, but... She wanted to hear his final answer. She asked him directly if he could make her stronger and help her develop her potential even better because Chloe realized that although she was already a strong warrior, she was capable of doing much more. Jared replied that he would help her and be ready to answer any question she had honestly. That's what you call being a true mentor. But when he looked over at Chloe who had picked up a sword, Jared was already afraid. He moved back to stand next to the tree and stared at her fearfully. And while Jared could barely hold the piece of paper in his hands, she calmly signed it, cutting her finger. The thing is, she had been taught since childhood that important contracts had to be signed not with ordinary ink, but with her own blood. Jared couldn't move for a while from the shock. It was something out of the ordinary for him and he should have been warned about it in advance. He exhaled when it was over, and Chloe asked him to teach her everything her mentor Ella didn't know, to give her the knowledge and experience that would make her stronger. Jared hesitated, not knowing what to say to her. It seems that this contract was indeed one of the most important in her life. Of course, she hadn't mentioned it before, not knowing if he would accept, but Chloe had wanted Jared to be her mentor for a long time. When it was over and they had broken up, Jared had gone on to do his own thing, and it was hard to process all of this, and he had a lot of other unfinished business to attend to. He was sitting at his desk with piles of books next to him, using magic to make his work easier. Paradise had a certain ability that very few artisans have the ability to use. If you disassemble several artifacts, you can combine them to create a single but new one. It was a higher level craft, but there were some restrictions on the number of artifacts you could use and the body parts you could apply it to. That's why the craft of recycling emerged completely naturally. And recycling was not a craft that any user of the game could try. 
If the system has a weakness, then of course it is worth taking full advantage of it. In this world, it is believed that if a craftsman takes artifacts too lightly, he invites the wrath of the gods. But the point is that if you don't know how to work with small details, you can end up without useful artifacts. In simple terms, this meant that there were no interesting innovations in this craft at the moment. Jared was not afraid of losing a few artifacts that he had specially prepared for this experiment. He used the special tools of the blacksmith Barra, so the process itself was not too difficult. Finally, he stood up from the table and stretched, because his back had started to hurt a lot during all the time Jared had been bent over doing something. Suddenly, a plaque appeared in front of his eyes, informing him that his student Lacus had achieved mastery in the art of swordplay, so he, as his mentor, had received ten characterization points, which he could distribute as he wished. Lacus was indeed very persistent, especially after being revitalized by all the obstacles regarding his age, he developed and diligently learned new things. Jared took up his work again, even though it was already difficult, but he could not sit idly by. Before doing so, he took another look at the loyalty rate of his subjects, which was at a high level, as always. He drew a lot of inspiration from them, which made him happy and gave him new strength to move forward. He was surrounded by a lot of good people who were doing their best and constantly developing themselves, so he wanted to achieve the same great results. He promised himself that someday he would definitely become the main character in this big world. The guy sat at his desk for several more long hours, but in the end he finished his hard work. The fusion process was complete and Jared could invest 3,000 magic points and finish the whole process. Once the core fusion was ready, he could get a new artifact with a different name and level. Now he had enough magic points, so without waiting, Jared channeled them all to finish the job. Finally, he held the item he had been working on for so long. It was Bara's ring, which was a master of the art of splitting into microparticles. Now, a new opportunity had opened up. He could split the cores of artifacts that were at the seventh level and higher in the classification school and the special ability was that when it came to fusing the artifact cores, he could gain an additional skill with a 10% chance. This was great news, because he got two new crafting-related abilities, and now he realized that he hadn't spent two months pumping this thing for nothing. And now all the artifacts they had gotten from Mahat III's mogul could also be refined by him. While Jared was thinking and making plans and strategies, it was time for morning training. He started practicing before the sun came up. Hayes came over to tell him that Chloe had shown up for the training session they had agreed to in the morning. Jared replied that he would be down in a few minutes, so he asked Hayes to tell her to wait for him on the training ground. He'd been concentrating so hard on his craft that he'd forgotten about the workout he'd discussed with Chloe, so he decided to hurry. And when he got out of his chair and looked out the window, Jared saw her watching him, and it was a little scary. But Chloe wasn't angry. She was just watching him calmly. When they started their first training session together, it was already nighttime, but no one was asleep at Cinder's house. Eziel was sitting in his room by candlelight, reading another letter Jared had sent him. He knew exactly what the king needed from him, and he picked up the piece of paper and held it up to the fire. Meanwhile, Chloe and Jared trained tirelessly, her new mentor giving her advice and guidance, and Chloe putting in all her effort. As they flew into the air together, he threw a fireball at her, which she had to dodge or deflect with an attack. One of the spheres fell to the ground and Chloe landed nearby, her hand over her face. Jared told her to dodge all the spheres that would come at her, because he wasn't going to play with her. This was serious. She jumped into the air and promised that she wouldn't give in either if she got the chance. He was also ready to fight and defend himself to the very end. As Chloe had thought, he was very experienced, and all his movements were almost perfect, so she knew exactly what attacks she would have to defend against. This process captivated her so much that Chloe was ready to resist him 24 hours a day. But while she was thinking, Jared was already behind her and tapping her shoulder. He noticed that she was thinking about something and asked her what it was. 
She was looking at him so intently and for so long that he was worried, but Chloe must have been thinking about something of her own. The elf looked away, not knowing how to explain to him what was going on in her head. So Jared suggested that they take a break and get their minds off the training. He felt that Chloe was not in any shape to compete today, so he stopped and picked up some water. But Jared assured her that she shouldn't apologize for anything because it wasn't her fault, but it was also just a training session, because if she behaved like that in a real fight, the enemy would definitely not stop. They would have just slit her throat, rushed in from behind, and that would have been her last fight. Last week, she also asked to train at full strength, but the result was not particularly successful because Chloe set her hair on fire. But that was not important to her, because she would buy new clothes and her hair would grow back later. So it was better to take a break and watch your actions more carefully next time, because you could get severe burns. While Jared was calmly drinking the chilled water, Lacus approached the gate, calling out to the Lord and waving for him to come over to talk. Jared closed the water container and told Chloe to take a break from her studies while he went to talk to Lacus. Chloe was really tired, but not just from the workout itself. Something was tormenting her inside, she was thinking. She thought again as she sat down on a bench near the training ground. She remembered a conversation with Ella, her mentor, when the two of them had talked about how Jared was acting strangely and could seemingly see the future. Ella had hinted that she was imagining things and didn't believe that Jared could really think ahead. Even then, she was hurt by the words, but they still bothered her, especially since Chloe couldn't figure out what she was feeling. Jared had already come out to see Lacus, and he apologized for disturbing him so early and asked him if he had interrupted their date. Jared folded his arms across his chest and grumbled that it wasn't a date, it was just a workout. But Jared was angrier and more serious, so he asked to get down to the business at hand. As the smile fell from his face, Lacus noticed that Jared had changed the subject too quickly and was acting rather abruptly. But he got to the point. The man had come to tell him that the civil war in Cinders had accelerated and become more violent. Although not long ago, it had been nothing more than small quarrels and arguments between people. However, now it was gaining momentum and turning into a very serious conflict. And after the division of the state into the northern and southern regions, an all-out feud between the second and third princes began. All the events were happening exactly as Jared had predicted earlier. Jared then asked how the military was training and if everything was going well. Lacus replied that the army was doing well, as the army had been training hard for the past six months, and the new recruits were gaining experience very quickly and performing well in training. Elder Olson and the special unit are doing an excellent job of training the soldiers and supporting the overall training. Lacus stopped talking for a moment and reached for his sword, which he always carried with him. This weapon had been created by Jared, and he had given it to Lacus a long time ago. His eyes lit up, and he asked with excitement if Lacus liked the sword and was comfortable with it. He told him that this sword was almost the best he had ever had, because it could easily break very strong swords. Jared had been a little worried about the quality of this sword, because it was a test version but apparently such worries were in vain. Then Jared smiled and said that this sword would be a kind of payment for Lacus's efforts. Lacus thanked him again and waved the sword in different directions, ready to wipe out any enemy that came near him with this beautiful sword. It was a very reliable weapon. The other soldiers were also practicing, and Lacus looked at them and hesitated a bit again, saying that he had to inform the Lord of one more thing. He wanted to talk about the Aggressio Guard, so Jared created a sound barrier around the two of them to keep the conversation out of earshot. After that, the guy said that Lacus could continue his story, because now the security and confidentiality of the conversation was ensured. It was through listening that they were able to achieve excellent results, learning a lot of valuable information. And by reviewing the footage they shot on the outskirts of the territory, they were able to record attempts to transfer classified information. After the raid was carried out, all the participants were caught and interrogated, which confirmed that they were members of the Umbra sect. Jared had expected this outcome, but they still needed confirmation and got it. 
They finally managed to catch the sect members and intervene to stop everything and prevent another disaster. The destruction of this dark sect was the perfect reason to end this damn war. With the exception of the official church of the Sanders Kingdom, Radius, the kingdom's top priority is the destruction of sects that dare to use dark magic. In other words, the destruction of all people who are practitioners of the faith called Umbra, all of whom have no right to protection from the kingdom. It also meant that a similar church was located on neutral territory, so the kingdom could not defend these lands, which was why Crivia had a chance to take this territory for herself. Lachis stood next to Jared, who was just staring at one point and keeping silent. The man already thought what had happened, but he apologized, saying that he was just thinking. The Lord asked him what was happening with the other side, and Lachis told him that there were only three main territories now. They were Acra, Mudlin, and Letica, which were located between Crivia and the Kingdom of Cinders. Jared realized that all these events were happening too fast, so the time had come for Umbra to start making global decisions and taking action. He should have thought about this church a little sooner. Jared now kicked himself for it. Lachis asked a little excitedly what they should do next and what decisions would be made. Coral, for starters, gave orders to make sure that the video recording was completely secure and that no prying eyes would find out about it. After that, it would be necessary to concentrate all our forces and invasion on the three territories that Lachis had mentioned, and it was for this moment that Jared was preparing the army of Crivia. The Agressio soldiers would also be involved in this difficult war, and it was a wise decision. Right now was the best time to start, so he needed to get going. Jared had asked Lachis to take care of the video. He trusted him and was sure that the material would not be distributed too soon. The reason for this war was clear, concise, and grandiose. Jared turned to Chloe, who was still sitting on the bench, and told her that he was done with training for the day. She didn't say anything because she thought that, when he returned, they would continue. Jared assumed that he had kept her waiting too long while he talked to Lachis about all the details. For the next three months, a major war was fought, and Crivia declared war on the neighboring kingdoms, Acra, Mudlin, and Letica. And as a result of this battle, the soldiers of Crivia won in all three cases. Acra, Letica, and Mudlin were annexed to the territory of Crivia without any dispute. They surrendered as soon as the enemies came to their lands. The armies of Agressio's guard and Olson's troops quickly achieved good results in this struggle and were able to conquer the territories. But the main reason for the enemy's fear was that the commander-in-chief of the army of Crivia was Jared. This year he turned 26 years old and was too young to have level 5 magic, so no one expected him to do well. Then all the residents learned that Prince Fethelin was a practitioner of dark magic and was on the side of Umbra, and Prince Jess supported him in this. After this development, both of them were no longer respected. The citizens gave them double looks and despised them. But Eziel felt pain for his brother, even though he had made a big mistake in his life. Suddenly, Princess Mera came up to him, and his sister asked him excitedly what had happened and what he was thinking about. Aziel immediately turned to her, because he did not even hear the girl enter the room, but he calmly replied that he was thinking about a scenario where Lord Jared could lose this war. In fact, it seemed to him that he himself was worried about it more than Jared. But Myra said that these were all vain worries, because if you look at the indicators, then Crivia and his army won a huge number of victories in battles, and Jared showed a video with real evidence of the communion of the Umbra sect, which was the key to his victory. Eziel agreed because everything really became much easier with the video evidence that Crivia showed the world. The accused party simply could not justify it, so the neighboring territories, despite their good relations, did not want to oppose joining Crivia. In the end, the Kingdom of Cinders was the state that followed the Church of Radius in everything and despised anyone who went against this path. So all of this was a strong warning to the two brothers who decided to go down the wrong path, which ultimately destroyed them. Soon Ezekiel was alone in his room and sat down in his chair reading the documents. During these months he had been very anxious and always thinking about the events to come. 
Very soon he would have to step into his father's shoes and take the throne of the king, because all the older children in the royal family could no longer do so. He knew it was inevitable, but the throne still scared him. The heart of the man who started it all was too cunning. Jared was also disliked in the fourth territory of Fosagid, but some people were still afraid of the army, because they knew what success the troops had achieved before. The soldiers brought the warriors of these lands to their knees this time, but they held out to the last and did not want to admit defeat. One of them threatened that even if Jared killed him, hundreds of other followers of the church would find him and take revenge, keeping the curve in their sights. But in a moment the boy was gone from this world, and Jared once again praised Lachis for his skills and made sure that the sword was indeed doing its job perfectly. Suddenly. A warrior came running to them, barely breathing as he tried to report the news that a report on the state of their fortress had arrived as quickly as possible. All the soldiers had already opened the gates and raised the white banners. They had never contacted Umbra before, and they were asking to be rescued. Jared ordered to take away their weapons and throw them in jail, and later they would deal with these people according to the law. Lachis was covered in blood, but he was very grateful to Jared, they had finally taken over the fourth territory. The Lord was truly invincible. No one could stop him and the army of Krivia. The man knelt before him and bowed his head, and Jared praised him for his fine work, seeing how hard he had tried. But Lachis assured him that from the moment Lord Jared entrusted him with the very position he was in now, every moment of his life was filled with happiness and joy. He could fight his enemies shoulder to shoulder with his king, and for him, as a warrior, this was the meaning of life and the opportunity to breathe to the fullest. Jared then suggested that they enjoy this wonderful feeling of fierce enthusiasm, and that they now had a great opportunity to fight cinders, because they were now in the middle of a civil war. Lachis agreed and said that Jared could fully entrust him with the army that would be on the front lines, he bowed again, calling Jared his king. He himself was amazed at what he heard, for he could not remember ever hearing such a thing from his subjects. It was as if many castles had been under such a treatment and had fallen to the ground at once. The best arena, which was illuminated by the light from the clear heavens, their battles to annex other kingdoms to Krivia continued. Three months had passed since the start of the next war. Jared sat in his office and carefully studied the map of the neighboring kingdoms that bordered Krivia. During these months, the territory of his kingdom had increased by as much as five times, and further unification of the territories was impossible. Jared had maximized his territory. Now, if they decide to conquer the next lands, these territories will no longer be attached to Krivia, but will simply become new kingdoms, which made Jared a little sad. Later on, a small sign appeared, which informed Jared that he received a new title of Great Feudal Lord, and because of this, his attractiveness increased by 100. Thanks to this title, all his territories were under the blessing of God, and for the next two years the risk of natural disasters such as flood, drought, storm, and similar things decreased to 90%. He was happy to have received a new title and to have invented magical devices when he completed work on the camera. And if all this was over, then it was time to move on. But no matter how calm he was, Hayes, who flew into the room like the wind, broke the tranquility. He looked at her and told her to calm down and then speak, because he did not understand what the rush was about. She exhaled and looked him in the eye. She had something to say. Hayes was coming here to tell him that she had finally managed to use her divine power, that the six months of suffering had paid off. Jared knew that she practiced every day, several times, but he didn't really believe that anything could come of it, especially not so quickly. But Hayes had proven that she could do more. He was extremely happy for her. It was the best thing Jared had heard in a long time. Their happiness was overwhelming. There is a huge difference between healers who have divine power and those who do not. An average healer at the beginning levels can only restore 10 points of health. But if the healer has a special divine power, he can restore up to two times more. And this is only at the initial level. Then the difference became greater with each subsequent step. 
Hayes noticed that it was all thanks to the artifact that Jared had given her once, that cursed bracelet. When she put it on, she instantly started to feel extremely sick. Her condition worsened every second, but she also had a ring that covered the entire effect of the bracelet. So when she wore them together, she could train without interruption and not feel worse. She was very impressed with how Jared came up with this idea, and he laughed awkwardly and said that it was a special Eastern way of training. The fact that Hayes had moved on to the next stage meant that she could handle the intermediate levels of Divine Three. This would no longer be a problem, which was very important. So Jared decided to test her abilities right away by picking up a dagger. At first, Hayes was scared, because even though she already knew her abilities and was confident in them, the situation looked very scary and she didn't want to hurt him. There are many other ways to test new skills without hurting him. Hayes looked at his arm, because Jared was wearing a short sleeve shirt. His burn from the fight from before was clearly visible, and she wanted to heal Jared. Every time she saw that big burn, she felt very painful and that's why she trained so much, relentlessly and diligently. Jared was pleasantly surprised to hear her say that, because he didn't think that all that effort was mostly about him. But he wanted Hayes to make him experience it as soon as possible, even though it sounded scary. There was a scream from the room, and Jared meant nothing more than the feeling of being healed. That was all. Hayes sat down next to him and told him to give her his hand. She began the procedure, but Fatalin was not happy about Jared coming here and giving away so much information about himself. He was now with Capri, who had come to his cry and asked what was wrong. Besides, his brother Ian and his father had gotten so sick because someone had poisoned them, and Jess was almost knocked out during the Civil War. He was one step away from death. Eziel had no interest in the throne at all, and with Mera still a minor, Fethelene was confident that his personal victory was only a matter of time. Success was within his grasp, but slipped away from him when Jared released a video behind his back, and Fatalin was angry that Eziel was in league with Jared. Everything was on the verge of a major disaster, from being fine and not boding well for anything, to being worse because of this horrible recording system that Jared had invented. Capri stood silently next to Fathalan, not saying a word until the Prince of Cinders called over an old man who had served in the Krivi. The boy began to express his complaints and reproached the old man for not knowing anything about the recording devices. It was impossible that they had been able to invent and install these devices in just the last year. The old man tried to justify himself and prove that he really hadn't heard anything about these devices before, but Fallon ordered him to shut his mouth and hit him hard. The old man was lying in a pool of his own blood, and Capri was breathless at the sight, not knowing what to say. When Fatalin turned to him, he timidly answered something, and the prince loudly ordered him to take away the old man's corpse. After that, they had to gather their troops to finish off Aziel and try to put this terrible situation in the right direction. A few hours later, they were on their way to Ezekiel, assembling the soldiers, Capri and Fethelene riding in the lead, with the army following. Though Capri had no desire to start a war with Aziel, he could not refuse the prince's order, but he tried to persuade Fethelene to change his mind and not do something that would lead them all to their deaths. Capri knew that Eziel could not have set it up himself, but the prince ordered him to shut up. But Capri didn't leave the subject. He reminded them that it was Jared who had created this device, which meant that Eziel was most likely working for him. Eziel's military forces were nothing compared to Phthalin's, and they could have dealt with him any time they wanted. Phthalin was fed up with this long talk and ordered them to get to the point. Capri wanted to say that they needed to focus all their energies on Jared, not Aziel, because he was the one behind all this. But Phthalin stood his ground and was sure that Jared was not interested in meddling in the affairs of their kingdom. Capri realized that there was no way to convince the prince now, because his sober mind had completely left his head from such intense anger, and all his efforts would not have made the situation better. This was not at all what he had sent in his intelligence report to Prince Eziel. It was all just a game, and they were only now realizing it. The curve was so much higher than all of them. 
Phthalene wanted to get to his brother as soon as possible, so they immediately set off for the capital. They had to destroy their enemies before they could prepare for their arrival. They all shouted in a chorus that they would soon destroy the traitor of the kingdom, Eziel. But at one point, Phthalene shouted loudly for them all to stop, but it would have been no use. They arrived at a very strange place and what they saw made them stop. One by one, people in the town learned that Prince Jess and Phthalene were using black magic. But none of them wanted to believe it. It was hard to accept that their leaders had betrayed the entire kingdom. The second and third princes contacted the Dark Church. They had been acting like such great heroes all this time, but in reality, they were following the laws of the Umbra sect. While the people were discussing all these nuances with fear and hatred for the princes, they heard the sound of hooves. It was Eziel and his army. He stopped his horses in front of the people and confidently announced that he would capture and block all entrances to the capital. Prince Jess and Prince Phthalen, as the main traitors to their state and disgrace to the royal family, would be killed as soon as they were seen. As soon as the people saw him, they begged him to save them from the dark magic of the older princes. But he said that they should not be afraid. They would protect their people and soon the citizens of Cinders would be able to continue living their peaceful lives. Everyone began to shout out the names of Mera and Eziel. The two of them were now Cinders' only hope. Capri cleared his throat and tried to see something in the cloud of dust. Now he had to find Phthalen. As he made his way through the unknown terrain to the prince he hadn't found yet, Capri came across a warrior who immediately raised his sword and asked who he was, and the man only said that Capri would have to fight him. And if Lacus wins and Capri fails, he will never see Prince Phthalin alive again. It seems that Prince Cinders had stepped right into the landmines that Jared had placed here earlier, and Lord Curve was watching from above with satisfaction as his plan worked. It all happened because Phtalin was too angry and frustrated and it played a bad joke on him. Jared used the power of the spiritual eye. In a few seconds, he found Phtalin sitting in the dust trying to cough. The prince looked around and saw that all his troops he had recruited were dead, during which time Jared learned that his enemy was at level 77. Without waiting for the prince to realize the horror of the situation, Jared went down to him and Phtalin looked around. Phthalin became even more angry as soon as he saw Jared standing next to him. He was ready to tear him to pieces. He was pissed off. He dared to meddle in the affairs of another kingdom. It was so mean. Phthalin promised him that Jared would not come out of this battle today with his head on his shoulders. Jared thought about it. He was certainly no fortune teller or prophet, but he thought that today was not the day for him to die. But there was news for Phthalin, too. Jared said with a smile that from today on, Phtalin had no reason to be so angry because he would no longer have any business with the kingdom of Cinders. Since it so happened that he met Jared first, the prince decided to deal with him first and then finish with his younger brother. Jared was happy to hear such words. It was not a game of chance because he knew he would win. But still he was very interested in competing with this opponent, so the boy prepared to attack. Jared was annoying Phtalin with every word he spoke, and the prince was already eager to kill him and smile at the sight of his spilled blood. So he instantly rushed at him, sword in hand. Jared had his own advantages in magic, which he always actively used, and this case was no exception. So Phtalin had to resist the still existing magical power. He skillfully defeated the first sphere, but he felt that Jared was not an easy opponent and that victory would not be easy. The next time, the Prince of Cinders used a special technique with his sword that could dispel magic. He was very good with swords and dark magic, so after defending himself, Thalin began to attack. But all Jared noticed at this point was his robe, which was torn by Phthalin, and Jared was upset. But after a moment, he laughed and asked if it would be better to call Thalin not just a prince, but Umbra's dog. Just as Jared had thought, the prince was upset, even though he was already feeling very upset. And now it was Jared's turn to attack, so he flew Phtalin away. As he remained on the ground, the prince fired dark fire toward Jared, but Jared managed to create a small shield in front of him in time to stop the attack. 
However, Fethalin was sure that Jared's magic was no match for his sword technique, which was excellent at blocking magic. The boy knew what he was talking about, namely armor that was resistant to magic, even though her sword techniques were also good. Perhaps if Jared hadn't been wearing DeLuca's bracelet, his enemy's abilities could have caused him some trouble, but for now, everything was going well. As soon as Jared took off his shield, the Prince of Cinders was almost right next to his face. Though it was unexpected, the blonde man managed to dodge the sword and jump aside. Jared realized that this was not going according to the scenario he had envisioned in his head, because all he could do now was dodge, and Fethalin was only a fourth-level mage, so the guy should have had some advantages, he thought. But Jared had a way to move on. He didn't get confused and created a shield again, starting to distract the enemy and try to get him emotional again, so he would get an advantage over him. Phthalin was not giving in for now and only repeated that his special sword technique specialized in blocking magical energy, but Jared kept using the same traps to fight him. But the young magician did not listen to him and continued to follow his own plan, and then he used a fire blast that blinded the enemy and threw him back several meters. Phthalin opened his eyes only later and saw the fire varieties wrapped around his arms. Undaunted, he again used the secret technique of his sword, the swift sword. However, it did him no good, for the demon Jared had created immediately regenerated and was ready to attack again. Phthalin screamed as the fire demons attacked him again from different directions. He realized that his magic was powerful, but Jared was still too strong. The prince didn't give up and started swinging his sword to the side to get the fire devils to leave him alone. Jared used a power projectile while he tried to deal with the demons. Phthalin screamed as he looked on, already realizing that his chances of winning were diminishing with each enemy strike. Suddenly everything started sparkling and for a moment the prince was blinded and could not see anything around him. After the next blow, Jared shot fire arrows at him, which appeared one by one from his hands. Phthalin stood in front of him, no longer having any strength to run away or defend himself, and the flames were already closing in on him. After the arrows filled almost all the space around him, he began to worry, because there was no way to get out of here. Meanwhile, while Phthalin was trying to do something to survive, Jared took to the air. He didn't stop and kept casting more and more spells against his opponent. Eventually, Phthalin could not withstand the pressure and fell to the ground, barely breathing. His sword was nearby, but he could not take it in his hands. He couldn't believe he had lost. His self-confidence instantly faded as soon as the first drops of blood began to fall to the ground. Jared stepped closer to him, and Phthalin managed to fend off his arrows, but then Jared used the moment when the enemy opened up and then launched a power projectile at him. This all happened because Phthalin was paying too much attention to things that were not worth it and the time he was spending. It was like when he left the Radius Church and decided to go to Umbra. He was bleeding, his whole face was red. Phthalin just couldn't believe that he had lost and was now on his knees without strength. He looked up and asked loudly where Count Capri was. It was his last hope for victory. But Jared said he would not come here. Phtalin clenched his fists. The prince did not want to accept that everything he had worked for so long would just disappear. Jared replied that this would not have happened if he had not chosen the easy way out, defending himself with the power of the Umbra sect. Phtalin was supposed to make the Cinder's kingdom the most powerful and majestic. He was supposed to continue the work of his parents, but he made a mistake when he thought that the Umbra doctrine would be much better than the doctrine in the Radius Church. Jared was not interested in hearing all this, so he shut him up and that was the end of their fight. After that he pushed him, coming closer. But very unexpectedly, he saw a valuable artifact in Fatalin's possession, a Red Clues medallion. Lord Crivia took the artifact in his hands and carefully examined it from all sides, trying to remember the person to whom this jewelry had previously belonged. He finally remembered, in the game Paradise, Klaus was the head of the Umbra sect. This man was a complete psychopath who dreamed of reaching the boundaries of magic. He had a real talent for lying, crime, and leading new people to the wrong path. Klaus was someone who was willing to sacrifice his own blood and body 
if he thought it was necessary. Using the spiritual eye, Jared realized that he was unable to scan the medallion, but if it mentioned Klaus, then the purpose of the artifact was clear to him, as it was used to control Prince Fathalin's subconscious. Capri was still struggling with Lacus. He was not one of those who liked to fight, but now he had no other way out of here, so he took up arms and began to defend himself. Lacus was ready to defend his king to the last, and he would not allow anyone to take a step to get to him and do him harm, Curry thought, not understanding how Lacus could withstand the attack of his special red moon sword, which was mostly the blow he managed to win with. But while Capri was thinking and distracted, another blow flew into his back, this time from Jared. Capri fell down in front of Lacus and didn't move, and he died quickly from the attack. Jared smiled, holding Phthalene on his shoulder, who was out of it, and apologized to Lacus for being a little late. When the warriors who had survived Jared's mines ran to the battlefield, they saw that there was no one left to save, for both Lord Capri and even Prince Phthalene were dead. But they did not want to retreat so easily, and before they left, they decided to show what their mighty army could do. But as soon as they decided to advance, Agresio's army blocked their way and stopped them, not allowing them to get any closer to the king. They were followed by Olsen's group, which was ordered by the king to sweep away all those who adhere to the dark faith. After some time, this battle was over. Prince Stalin's army was surrounded on all sides, and after the victory, their weapons were taken away and they were sent to prison, which is how Phtalin's army completely collapsed. Despite the fact that Prince Phthalene somehow managed to escape from the death penalty, he spent the rest of his life in prison. And after the news became known, Prince Jess left the kingdom and was never seen again. Only rumors circulated that he had escaped and hid in the same place as the Umbra sex lager. And Ezio, who had listened to all of Jared's advice, appeared at the coronation and became the new ruler of Cinders, inheriting the throne of Deckard the Ninth. When he was crowned, Jared came to Cinders. When he entered the hall, he bowed to Ezekiel, getting down on one knee. He was pleased that Elijah had listened to his advice and made the right choice. The new king had been waiting for Jared's visit and was glad to see Jared in the castle. His great contribution to the end of the Civil War and the fact that Jared supported him was incredibly valuable to him but Jared himself did not think he had done anything very great. But Ezeel still wanted to repay him in kind for his work. Ezeel wanted to make Jared a vassal of the kingdom. He asked if the boy would agree to that. Jared just made a judgment about right and wrong and then decided to offer help, but he had no intention of becoming a vassal to Cinders. Everyone else standing around started waving their hands and hoping that Ezeel would come to his senses, because Jared was still too young to be appointed as a vassal. But he quickly told them to shut up, for Jared had great potential, despite his young age. From now on, the lands that Jared owned were declared a principality, and he became a prince. They would not be bound by obligations to cinders. That is, in other words, Israel would not demand anything from his lands. But disagreement will be taken as a challenge to the king, so there will be no further discussion of this topic. And in addition to all this, Ezeel will give all the lands of Miseria to Prince Jared for helping to prevent the fall of the Kingdom of Cinders. The people of this state would never forget his kindness, and they wanted to take this moment to thank him for it all. Despite the fact that he had previously thought that he would never be able to get out of this role as lord of the very small state of Krivia, Jared managed to achieve more. In a strange and unexpected way, the future began to look very bright and promising. After all the talks, they said goodbye and Jared and his men left the castle, and soon they were outside the forest in cinders. Lacus still couldn't get used to his new armor. He was embarrassed because Judith's armor was a valuable artifact and he considered it too expensive a gift. Jared smiled with satisfaction and turned to him, saying that he had simply stolen them from Lord Capri, and Lacus stopped dead in his tracks, but Jared assured him that the winner of a battle is entitled to everything. The Red Moon Sword seemed very strong and reliable, and Lachis could feel the notes of magic in this piece of weaponry. As Jared walked further into the forest and looked around, a man called out to him, stopping in his tracks. 
He had been very curious about something for a long time, and Jared turned to him and agreed to answer all the questions he had. The thing was, Lacus had never felt such unity among the soldiers before. Every soldier respected his lord and was ready to give his life for Jared's. Each of them wanted even greater achievements led by their lord, and maybe some of them were even ready to worship the god who was above them. But the god that Lacus was ready to worship was now standing right in front of him. He knelt down in front of Jared. Jared was very surprised by this confession, and Lacus cried as he looked him straight in the eye. Lycus's loyalty and respect increased dramatically. It went up to 360, and then his loyalty to Jared increased to 800, and he achieved the third awakening. These words touched Jared's heart. He was touched and hugged him. Lacus couldn't stop crying, and being hugged by Jared made him even more touched. In the castle, the king's chamber, a bright light was on, and Mara entered the room. After Aziel's coronation, she did not know what to call him, so when she came to him, she addressed him as the king. But Aziel said that there was no need for such a formal address. He was still her older brother first and foremost, so he told her to call him that. As she came closer, Aziel noticed that she had been wanting to tell him something since she had met Jared. The girl nodded her head in agreement, and then Aziel invited her to sit at the table and drink tea while they talked. Her attention was drawn to the super-fast development of the kingdom of Krivia, agriculture, seals, commerce, dungeons, and many more things like that. It led to the fact that to rebuild cinders after all the wars and battles, they would need the help of Jared's kingdom again. What others could not do in ten years or more, Jared could do in less than a year. But Myra had seen before that Jared did not want to enter into a close relationship with the Kingdom of Cinders, no matter how hard they tried. Then Myra put her teacup back down and said that she had been thinking about helping her kingdom for a long time. Aziel didn't really understand what she was getting at, but Myra interrupted and said that she had been thinking about improving the ties between Cinders and Krivia. They needed to improve their position and make a political marriage. Eventually, they invited Jared back to their castle and started talking about it from afar. Aziel said that he himself had almost been tempted by the devil and had miraculously not taken all the titles and rewards after the battle to himself, but he knew that Jared would then turn his back on cinders for sure. Aziel was behaving rather strangely and could not decide to get to the heart of the matter. He knew that even if their kingdoms were to become enemies— he should repay Jared for everything he had done for them. Aziel thanked him once again for all his work. Mara said that, thanks to his intervention, their kingdom was now flourishing and returning to a peaceful life. She also expressed her gratitude to Jared and added that she would do everything to rid cinders of Umbra's traces and dark enchantments. Mara and Aziel realized that it would have been better to move on to the main topic for which they had called Jared here, but no one could decide to do so, because Jared's answer and reaction were unpredictable. But he smiled and assured them that they should not worry and that he would listen to their requests. Aziel exhaled and Jared looked at him, waiting for him to continue. Then Aziel asked how Jared felt about becoming his younger sister's husband. The new prince was shocked by the offer, to say the least. They both wanted to establish a friendly relationship with Jared and had long admired his actions. Mara was strong in her decisions, especially those that affected the lives of her people. However, Jared apologized and put his cup on the table. He could not accept the offer. And even if he had accepted, the northern part of the Cinder's kingdom was very weakened and in a very precarious state. And Jared understood what was so troubling to them. Despite everything, he was always ready to help them in any way he could to rid the country of all the consequences that Umbra had brought. Jared didn't want to be tied down by a political and forced marriage, and it was his late father's will. Of course, his father had never said anything like that in his life, but Jared believed that his father would understand his decision. Then Aziel realized that Jared was willing to build a strategic relationship with them, but he refused to do anything more, and since this was a directive from the previous ruler of Krivia, there was nothing he could do. Jared didn't think he was good enough for this marriage, 
He was sure that Princess Mara was just a beautiful person, and in his opinion, he was not worthy of such an honor. Mahira immediately denied his words and said that she had never thought of anything like that. Jared had decided for himself, however, that he did not want to enter into a political marriage, but he assured them that if they did not turn their backs on him despite his refusal of the proposal, the future they so dreaded would never come. However, if the cinders turned their swords against him, Jared was prepared to use the full force of his army against them. Mera and Eziel understood his agreement and did not continue to insist on it, as such talk would have led nowhere. Later on, Jared and Lachis left the castle. It was raining very hard outside, it was dark, and Lachis offered to use the teleporter to get home. But Jared said he wanted to walk, so he let Lucky go and let him go back first, and he went walking through the streets. It seems that the season of such heavy rains has just begun, so future days will be similar to this one. Every year in the northern part of the Nars continent around July, the season of such heavy rains and thunderstorms began, and last year it had no effect on the lands of the north, but this year it caused severe flooding in the river areas. Thanks to Jared's title of Great Feudal Lord, the Krivia lands should be fine for the next two years, but the problem was that they were not the only ones bordering the river. Suddenly, Jared heard a voice from behind him warning him that this was a river called the Optatio, and he shouldn't go near it. Last year, there was a very bad flood here, and the little boy was afraid of such stories and assumed that an epidemic might start, but the older man walking next to him assured him that King Eziel would protect them from anything. Jared realized that if the rains increased this year, it would affect even more areas, and if this forecast was true, the neighboring kingdoms would be in great danger. Jared was distracted from his thoughts by the rain, which was getting heavier by the minute, so he decided to hide from it first. Jared didn't use teleportation magic. Instead, he just sat down in a cafe where there were many other people who had also taken shelter from the heavy rain. There were two men sitting next to him, and he could hear their conversation because the table was right next to him. They were talking about the man who had helped get rid of that devil Fethalin, Viscount Jared, who had recently become a prince. They mentioned that just a few months ago, Jared was an ugly fat man from the village, and then so suddenly he became a very successful man. Then the waiter came up to him and asked if Jared was ready to order, and he immediately said he wanted a glass of beer. As he was waiting for his drink, the door to the small cafe opened and someone entered, cursing loudly at the terrible weather. But when he went inside, he saw that there was not a single free seat in the cafe and that there was nowhere to sit. However, he decided to look around to find at least something to sit on. Then he noticed that there was one person sitting at a table and there was still room next to him, so he decided to go over and ask if he could sit down. When the stranger approached him, he adjusted his hood and looked at him. And as soon as Jared caught sight of this young man, he froze in his tracks. He had the blessing of the deity Lunaticus, and scanning for special skills was impossible. The boy apologized for disturbing him, but explained the situation, that there was no place to sit and asked if he could take a seat next to Jared and rest. The blonde remembered that Lunaticus was one of the gods of paradise, and if this guy had a blessing from this god, he was definitely the main character, but Jared had no idea who he was. As the silence went on for a long time, the guy asked again if Jared was okay with it, and there was no sign of hostility or negativity from him. Jared said that he could sit next to him, but first they should introduce themselves to each other, and then the boy introduced himself as Keikel. The new prince took off the hood of his cloak and said his name, telling him to sit next to him. Kikel's hair stood on end when he saw Jared's face. Of course he knew him, but then the blonde asked him to be a little quieter. Kikel never thought he would meet someone so famous right here, and when the waiter came over, the guy ordered a beer. Then Keikel decided to introduce himself more formally, since he was in front of such a respected person. The young man was from a family in Charlotte County, but in fact, he was kicked out of his home because his background was not the best. And Jared remembered his father, Bachman Charlotte, who owned a lot of land in the South. If the boy meant the man Jared was thinking of, 
He knew that he owned land and most of the jobs in the territories, and he had many children, so the fact that Jared had never heard of Kyle was not surprising. After thinking about it, Jared asked why Kekel decided to leave the South and come to the territories. When the beer was brought to him, Kekel paid for himself and his new friend. He decided to give the rest as a tip, which the waiter was very happy about because his salary left much to be desired. Jared assured him that such a gesture was not necessary, but he would gratefully drink with him if Keikel decided to treat him. In addition, the guy added that Jared looked very young and that he would have turned 26 this year. But it was hard to believe because the Prince of Crivia looked very young. This made Keikel feel very uncomfortable. His cheeks turned red and he tried to smooth over the topic. Then he admitted that he was even a little jealous of Jared because he could own such a large territory. It seemed very attractive, and Jared himself noticed that this guy was too insecure for a person who had the blessing of the deity Lunaticus. This young man could really become the main character if he worked on his self-esteem, which is clearly low, and he was even curious to see what the path of someone with the blessing would be like. Jared decided to lighten the mood and asked where Kakel was going to go next, to which the young man replied that he wanted to join the Arachne mercenaries. He had heard that the mercenaries were gathering a group to attack a ruined underground cave, and the dungeon was the best place to make a lot of money. The Arachne mercenaries were a talented group of people who gathered to raid the most difficult dungeons. Others even laughed that if you got injured during a raid with their company, they would just throw you out. But despite all the horrible rumors about them, they were called the best mercenaries. The crumbling underground cave is a place that looks like an ordinary cave in the north of the kingdom. As far as Jared remembered, it was one of the three most hated dungeons in paradise. All of these names were familiar to him, but he couldn't recall any clear details at first. But after a little thought, Jared realized that the crumbling underground cave and the demon army's haven in Miseria were dungeons he definitely wanted to visit someday, and he had dreamed of visiting many caves. He lifted his beer mug with a smile and a smile of satisfaction as he looked at Kyle. Jared said he would pray for the mission to be successful and for Kyle to return here, and Kyle promised that he would pray for the welfare of Jared's land. Kikul stood up from his chair. He was very happy to have met such a man. He had always dreamed of just sitting and having a drink with him, so Kikul was happy that his dream had finally come true. He was leaving. He had a lot of things to prepare, and he was going to cross the river, which was not an easy task, so there was no time for more talk. Finally, Jared invited him to come to Krivi Rai if he had the opportunity. He wanted to thank him for this time and treat him to a glass of delicious Krivi Ri beer. Kekel thanked him. He traveled a lot, so he said that he would try to stop by his land someday. After that, they said goodbye and Keikel went outside. This encounter will definitely remain in Jared's memory for a long time, yet he decided to take a walk and not go home right away, but to come here. However, as soon as the young man left the cafe, Jared began to have a very bad headache, so unbearable that he grabbed it and clenched his teeth. He did not know where the pain came from. There was no explanation. He glanced around at the people sitting there, trying to figure out where this unbearable and sudden headache had come from. Jared began to breathe nervously and couldn't calm down. He tried to find the source of this energy that was doing this to him. And finally he found it. His eyes fell on a girl with black hair. She was the Red Queen, around whom many people were hanging around, she was also gifted and had the blessing of the demon deity Jerezus. Other than that, Jared couldn't scan anything. But the fact that he found another deity's blessing in this place surprised him greatly. He thought he must have found the secret protagonist. Jared realized that this main character who was growing further was unusual. It seemed to him that this girl had used an instant debuff or some kind of curse on him. An ordinary person would have collapsed from such pain but he was able to keep his feet on the ground because of Grace's ring. The girl was holding a glass of alcohol and finally turned her attention to Jared. Jared was drinking his beer so fast that it was almost spilling out, and he was very annoyed that no deity had offered to help him, 
Even though he was doing just fine on his own as he made his way, he would have been glad to have some of the higher beings contact him. Suddenly, Jared stopped when he saw that the Red Queen was about to leave the place. Now was the time, so she stood up and made her way to the exit of the room. These men were either the Red Queen's attendants or subjects. They did not seem to have any special characteristics, only sword skills that they had practiced for years. Now Jared wondered who the Red Queen and Kakel were. He believed that this meeting had not happened for nothing. He picked up the mug of beer, which was almost gone, and looked at the girl who was already at the door. She was also interested in Jared's figure, but she made no sign of it, and neither was he. She decided that they would definitely meet again someday, but later. Jared later left the cafe as well. He found a place with goblins where he started to level up by killing them. This year started off somehow too boring. Last year there was a huge influx, so Jared hoped that this time he would only increase his momentum, but it seemed like there were fewer monsters. The Devil's Sign reminded him of the escape that took place on the 1st of July. That was the day when he first decided to use the Spatial Force Bug against the monsters that had come to take over his territory. Back then, he had the opportunity to use a bug that developers will never fix and should be used as often as possible. But Jared began to worry that there were fewer monsters, and perhaps their leader was afraid of something and acting more cautiously. But whatever the case, he would not know the answer to this, at least not now, so he left these thoughts behind. It was better to get on with balancing his data to celebrate his passage to level 70, so Jared sat down on a large rock that was lying around. His eyes were shining with joy. His level had risen because of the extra points he'd gained from his students' hard work and his frequent defense lessons with Isabel. He even began to doubt whether it was real because it seemed too good to be true. Not everyone had magic defense and Paradise had different ranks, ranging from beginner and the weakest to professional, the strongest. He was probably already at a level where he could afford to ignore magic that was at level 3 or lower. Although his physical defense was a bit weak, he could use an artifact or something similar in times like this. Suddenly, while Jared was staring at the table and thinking about what to do next, he heard a growl coming from the monster he thought he had already killed. He couldn't stand up anymore, but he found the strength to speak and very quietly the monster said that he had to take revenge on Agrat. Jared didn't even care that the ogre was still alive. He was interested in the name he had heard. The name was familiar to Jared. Agrat was closely associated with the dark faith of the Keiko Church. Umbra wasn't the only dark church, so Jared had realized before that he would have to face the dark forces sooner or later, and probably more than once. However, Jared didn't think that this monster would be chanting his name, so he wondered if there might be a connection between all of this. And he found himself with a new challenge. Jared decided that this was something he needed to take care of, and it wasn't just about Umbra and Kako. Later, when Jared returned to the castle in Krivia, he immediately began to deal with the dark churches. Here was his small factory where he assembled his mines, Ranella's cure, higher-level magic potions, and kept his disinfectant devices. The last stage of Magic Stone's production and the final stage of recording devices took place here. Jared called Isabel over to his room after another training session, and what she saw impressed her greatly. She noticed that Jared was always jumping in over his head, no matter what he was doing. He looked at everything he was working on and asked Isabel how her training was going. The girl replied that she had mastered the third level spells and was now at the stage of mastering the fourth, which was not quite easy, because with each stage the magic became more and more difficult. So Jared reassured her and told her not to push herself too hard, because even the third level of spells is enough, and she can easily earn a living and have a good income with it. But this statement irritated Isabel very much. She did not learn all these difficult spells to earn money with them. She had been haunted by something called the rock from her past life, and she lowered her voice at this. Then Jared came up to her and asked why she hadn't told him about it before. He was touched by the topic and began to worry. Sixty-five years ago, when she was in the body of a demon, they wanted to burn her. Isabel did not bother anyone and did not use her power to harm anyone, but the people of the kingdom still wanted to destroy her. 
She could not do anything. Her hands and feet were tied and her eyes were blindfolded. And as soon as the fire started, she screamed. The happiness of the people that day knew no bounds. They rejoiced that they would finally get rid of the demon and their kingdom of Transylvania would live a good life again. Isabel didn't want Jared to know about it. It was painful for her to mention it, and there was no thought of stirring up interest in her in this way. Jared didn't like to hear this. Isabel is very talented and strong in magic. She is mostly cheerful, but maybe due to frequent spell training, she's becoming more and more gloomy. This made him feel guilty, but he decided that he would try to cheer her up a little. After some thought, he happily asked her if she had any questions about controlling magic. Isabel replied that she couldn't use it casually, but if she concentrated all her attention, she could do it and manage to hold out longer. Jared used his spiritual eye again to look at her characteristics. Jared was silent for a minute and said that he would be going on another raid soon and was looking for a team. They need to focus on the same level as the tomb of Mahat III, which interested Isabel greatly. She asked where the place they were going to visit was. Jared named the dungeon. He had spoken of the demon army vault before, and Isabel had heard of it before. Her mood immediately lifted. Isabel promised that she would train harder and get ready for the raid. She had heard the name so often that it was ingrained in her mind and she was eager to be there. She immediately flew out of the room, explaining that she needed to study. Her mood was not very good, but after this conversation it became much better. Jared said goodbye and smiled. He was glad that he had managed to improve Isabel's health. Now it was time for him to get back to his work, which he had already accumulated a lot of. He walked over to the shelves where he had many different jars of potions. Suddenly, a thought flashed through his mind and he stopped in his tracks. Then he immediately ran to the recording device. Taking the device in his hands, he joyfully exclaimed that he had an idea. His territory was less than 2% cultivated, and he wanted to improve or compensate for this in some way. So he thought of playing the movie with a display device, a military visualizer to be used for cultural purposes. He already liked the idea of it very much, but he still needed to make it a reality. He wanted speeches that would win the hearts of the audience and evoke emotions from the depths of their souls. And given the number of viewers he could gather, the price for creating the product would be high, with some even asking for 500 gold pieces a month. Others wanted the highest possible position, at least to be in a position no lower than chief administrator, and there were some people who did not support this idea at all and called it too ridiculous to implement. The speaker also wanted a high salary because no one can compare to his speeches, and it is not an easy job. Then Jared sighed and realized that no one would help him in this matter. They all wanted only money and nothing else. But he had reached the last candidate, so he had no choice but to meet with him. Later, Jared went to Arkanis's pub, which was in the heart of Krivi Rai. There he saw Aki, and he asked for the attention of all the customers of his pub, saying that he had invited a great speaker, Valdez Hanspeter, to speak today. Everyone began to give him a standing ovation and clap their hands, and Jared sat at one of the tables and listened intently. Aki himself was standing on the stage behind Valdez, waiting for him to speak, watching the audience's reaction. Suddenly he saw Jared standing in front of him, which surprised him, and he stepped closer to him. Now Aki was not even listening to what Valdez was saying. He was too excited that Jared had decided to come here. But the speaker did not stop his speech, which was about the vast territories of Krivia that were constantly being improved and expanded. Valdez suggested that he address this topic because it was relevant and remains important to every citizen of Krivia. Valdez said every word loudly, filling it with emotion. Jared looked at Aki without saying a word and continued to listen to Valdez, who was actively gesturing. Later, when the speech was over, people started discussing what he had said. They really liked what he had said. The speaker suggested expanding the power by sea rather than land, and now it seemed more worthwhile to deal with the real estate of the Curia. Jared was also touched by this speech. He listened carefully to everything the man said, but the young man was more skeptical than the others. He had felt the strange energy that Valdez radiated. Although it was not surprising, 
Jared expected him to have the magic that could win the hearts of the audience. In Paradise, he was known as a propagandist representing an army of demons, a criminal with a criminal record who had deceived countless people. Many people did fall under the influence of his magic and sided with the Demon King, and they lined up to get Valdez's autograph. He immediately began to talk about how the allied holy forces were corrupt demons, and unlike Lena, who in paradise sided with evil, Valdez had decided to join and become a propagandist for the demon army, and that was why Jared did not want to meet him. When Jared was about to talk to Valdez, even though he didn't want to, he was stopped by Aki, who quickly ran up to him and asked what exactly brought Jared here. The blonde turned around and said he was here to see someone. Aki quickly realized that it was Valdez, but the boy didn't understand why Jared needed him. However, he wasn't going to ask too many questions and gladly offered to show Jared to a special guest, since Valdez was the speaker at their pub and had his own private VIP room. When the guy was about to show Jared where to go, he stopped him. Jared asked if Aki remembered the island he had recently talked about, an island called Tatar. Of course, Aki remembered everything. Dark elves lived on this island, and Jared had also told him that this place was very good for maintaining friendly relations with the Red Goblins. Jared nodded his head, saying that everything was correct and the next business expansion should be the Dark Elves of Tatar Island. Then the Lord suggested asking Ibanibu to act as an intermediary so he could definitely find a place for Aki. Aki's happiness knew no bounds. He was very grateful to Jared for such a wonderful opportunity because it would be a very good experience in the growth of his sphere. When the younger man had calmed down a bit, he still led Jared to Valdez's room. Jared wasn't too friendly to him and got straight to the point. Valdez replied that Jared was the only beautiful person in the entire room, so it would have been impossible not to notice him, and the man also thanked the Lord for listening to his speech. Aki interrupted the beginning of their conversation and offered Jared a tea made from Caracas leaves. He accepted and thanked him. When Aki left, Valdez apologized to Jared and said that at first he did not want to use the privileges he had, but there was no other way. Jared used his spiritual eye to tell him that Valdez didn't need to apologize, especially since he had given Arquane the freedom to do whatever he wanted. And now, here was the talent Jared had been trying to find, a man who was a professional in his field. However, Valdez still seemed too suspicious to him. Jared knew that he could not take on all the tasks that would be associated with the territory, and the truth was that there was no one else who could replace Valdez. Jared had been very concerned about the way reading had been going at Paradise since he got there, but he still wanted to believe that it was possible, as with Lena, that Valdez would change his future. He turned to Valdez, about to ask him a question. Jared asked him if he would like to serve him as the Minister of Public Affairs of the Great Curve. Of course, not only would he be his speaker, but Jared wanted to entrust him with the development and promotion of the cultural industry. Valdez was very surprised to hear this from the Lord. The rulers that Valdez Huntspeeder served made him talk about good deeds that he had nothing to do with, because he had never done them. So they tried to hide all the troubles that reigned in their territories. They were miserable people who misled others. They were all greedy despots who cared and worried only about their own interests and nothing else. People who participated in terrible things without any doubt or remorse. But Jared was not like that. He was the kind of ruler who was concerned first and foremost about the good of his land and the people who lived there. A man like him was definitely trustworthy. Valdez was ready to agree, but on one condition. The man did not want to be responsible for advertising a leader who would turn out to be a worthless despot, because the rule of propaganda is that unity must be created with a single purpose that both sides serve. Jared again remarked that Valtz could speak very well, but he assured him that there was no lie in his words, only the truth, and only on this condition was he willing to sign an agreement with Jared. Valdez asked him to promise him that he would be a good leader for him, but before that, Jared had to ask him about his desired salary, but he only laughed in response to this question. Valdez was not greedy and the highest reward for him was to elevate the person he would serve to the highest place in the world. 
He was honest and liked to be treated the same way, and such a great value cannot be exchanged for a few coins. These were Valdez's real and true feelings, which were not heard in the Paradise game itself. He was the creator of kings. In Paradise, he was the only one who spat blood and constantly shouted at his spectators from the rostrum, which was probably why he wanted to raise the demon king, whom he had served for so long. Jared then promised him that he would become the kind of leader he wanted to see in front of him, and if he ever lost motivation, Valdez could leave him at any time without any explanation. The man thanked him when he heard these words, and in turn promised to fulfill all the wishes of his ruler. Jared knew the man's past history, and he would not have trusted him in the game, but here he had some hope that he could get on the right track. At that moment, Aki came into the room and brought Jared some tea with kombucha leaves. He was really surprised by what he saw in front of him. It was strange to see how Jared quickly hit it off with Valdez, and for a moment the boy stopped. But he was glad that another talent had found its place next to the Lord, and now it would not be lost among the streets of the city. Valdez assured us that he was already familiar with the concept of the film and that the development of the film industry would be a new stage in the improvement of Crivieri. Unlike a play, there was nothing more enjoyable than enjoying a good video from afar. Valdez suggested starting with the prosperous life of the Crivian army, as well as the military prosperity that no other kingdom could boast of. And then he suggested that the first minutes of the film should be devoted to Jared's achievements. The guy thought about it. It was supposed to be a promotional movie. Valdez immediately assured him that he was not going to use the film for propaganda purposes and that it was probably better for them to start with an easily accessible movie and then promote it in every way possible. In addition, several of his friends were discussing the development of new cultural content with each other, and Jared was pleased to hear that these people could help them with the film. After they decided on the beginning, Valdez paused for a moment and finished his tea. He had another idea that he wanted to bring to life. He had been thinking about implementing it for a long time, but no one wanted to take responsibility for it. Jared gladly said he would listen to him so Valdez could start talking. His idea was to have the Lord write his autobiography, to describe all his thoughts and beliefs about the development of his territories in a competent and interesting way and Jared listened to him carefully. And he really liked the idea, so he got ready to start right away. Valdez explained how to put everything on paper and that the first step was to write an introduction to his autobiography, and Jared started to create. They stayed up all night, sharing stories that could not be shared with other people, even those with whom they had spent their entire lives. Valdez was a talented and pleasant person to be around. At this point, Jared had gained another good friend to talk to, Aubryn and Avila were also impressed with Valdez's skills. He was the perfect speaker for their neighborhood and could be trusted. Thanks to Valdez, they did not have any disruptions during the appointment process. He was accepted quite easily and then took over as Minister of Public Affairs, after which he immediately began working on two projects. First, he had to make a high-quality and engaging promotional film, and the second part of the job was to publish Jared's autobiography. This project progressed very easily like a boat sailing on calm waters. But Jared still had some work to do, namely another raid on the dungeon he had been dying to visit. So early on the morning of July 5th, he opened the map of the Demon Army Vault. However, looking at it, the guy realized that this task was harder than he thought, even more difficult than the last raid to the tomb. Chloe came into his office very quietly and also looked at the map, standing a little behind Jared and confirming that it really wouldn't be that easy. Jared was so frightened by the unexpected visit that he jumped away from her to the other side of the room. He started to panic, saying that she scared him a lot. But what he was even more interested in was why she didn't knock on the door before entering. Chloe calmly listened to all of his spontaneous questions and then briefly said that the door to the office was open. Jared laughed awkwardly and was already grinning as he looked at evil and realized how ridiculous he looked right now. He decided to postpone the briefing until later because it was better to see it for himself right now. 
The demon hideout is a kind of underground tomb that was created by the followers of the demons, and it was a little darker and more eerie than the tomb of Mahat the Third they had been in. Chloe remained silent, not saying anything, just looking at him quietly as Jared ran around the room, not wanting the dark atmosphere he was trying to maintain with his stories to go down the drain. So he went on to say that in the beginning this tomb was not a dungeon at all, but something like a repository for the fallen. But later they began to build numerous altars and perform sacrificial rituals there. After such terrible events, people began to call this place a dungeon. Magnus made himself very comfortable there, and now this dungeon has become the place where scary monsters regularly come out. Chloe had also heard about this dungeon, and she remembered that in those caves, monsters were famous for their strength. It was true to a certain extent, but in fact, they could be killed with a slight swing of the sword, which would cut them in half, but they still had good strength when attacked. And the most important fact was that they were very afraid of death. Chloe thought that since they were monsters filled with evil energy, white magic might work well against them. But Jared immediately assured her that she should never use white magic against them, it was strictly forbidden. Then the girl became curious about this rule and wanted to know why it was forbidden. He told her everything, and then added that she should not worry, because he had a way to deal with monsters, and she should think about how to use her powers to the fullest. That was all she had to say, but Jared asked if she had anything else to add. Chloe didn't say anything, but she turned away from him, and Jared noticed that her face was red. He didn't understand why she was so suddenly confused because a minute ago she was fine. She was starting to feel shy, and maybe it was because the excitement in her subconscious was triggering feelings for someone. And Jared even had an idea who it might be. There were a couple of good-looking guys in the Agressio Guard, so maybe she had a crush on one of them. While thinking about all this, Jared noticed Chloe's shoes, and he noticed that he had never seen a Tranquilis artifact like that before. But Jared remembered that Tranquillus was Chloe's brother. As he pondered this and Chloe stood silently, Hayes came into the room and told him that Jared's training was about to begin. They walked to the east side of the mansion where Jared began to explain to his team how to operate in the dungeon. He explained the plan in detail. There were six people on his team, Hayes, Isabel, Lacus, all of whom were decent and strong, Mia, Lena, and Chloe, were also going to participate in the raid, and Jared was sure that all the people who had gathered here were capable of proving themselves in the fight against the demons. After telling them everything, Jared asked if anyone had any questions, and if so, they should ask them now, because once they entered the dungeon, there would be no time to answer them. Then Isabel raised her hand up and called to him. She remembered the time when 40 hunters who were at a very high level of magic could not deal with these monsters so she was not sure that a team of seven people could do it. Jared excitedly exclaimed that they were changing tactics this time, because it was never a good idea to go down the path that others had already taken. Leaving all doubts behind, they set off for the Demon Army hideout, and by evening the team was in place near the mountainous region, which was outside of Krivia. This was their last stop before the heavy raid began so they had to rest and gain strength, and then the company lit a fire to keep warm. After some time, when everyone had eaten, they set up a small camp, pitched their tents, and went to sleep. However, not everyone went to bed. Yvray stood outside, watching to make sure that no monsters came. Later, Lena came up to him. She couldn't sleep, so she decided to go for a walk in the fresh air. Together with Jared, she walked next to their tents. They talked, and her mentor praised her for her skills, which had improved significantly. Lega really spent a lot of time on training. He recalled that when he first met her and rescued her from the underground mine, she was like a little chicken. Since then, more than a year had passed and she had really grown up during this period. Lena thanked him, saying that he was a very good teacher and Jared asked her if she was happy with herself. She replied that she wasn't quite yet because she had room to grow and wouldn't stop there, but she also recognized that she had gotten much better at using her powers, and she really wanted him to teach her from a different perspective, not just as a little kid, but as a real warrior. Jared stopped in the middle of the path they were walking on and praised Lena. 
he was very pleased that she had been able to exceed his expectations. He patted her on the head. Jared was really proud to have such talented and strong students. But Lena was proud to have such a smart man as the king of Krivia. She admired him, as did many of the people of the area, because since an ordinary boy had replaced the indifferent king, everything had started to rise. Everyone praised him for his actions and kindness. He cared about his people and their safety and comfort. But the fact that Lena started to emphasize this was a little strange to him, because such things had already become commonplace. Nevertheless, Jared decided to change the subject, saying that in this raid they had to try very hard to make sure that all the mass came back alive and gained experience. She, like a true warrior, was ready to do anything for the team and the successful completion of the mission. At this point, Lena's loyalty increased significantly. She raised by 50, and her desire was very sincere and unrelenting. Jared looked at her, admiring how the child had begun to transform into a strong warrior. In the morning, Lena returned to her tent and managed to fall asleep, and soon they had to go to the dungeon, so they folded their tents and moved forward. In a few hours, the team was there, and the very beginning was not particularly encouraging, because at the very entrance to the cave, there was a very strange and unpleasant smell. Lachis was also confused by this, but they all moved on, cautiously stepping further. In a few steps, they came across a big surprise, but an unpleasant one. They came across a huge pile of skeletons, skulls, and bones lying in the middle of the cave, which stopped them for a moment. Jared walked closer to the bones and cast a cleansing magic. It should help to reduce the horrible smell. Hayes stood next to him and offered to use her white magic to help, but Jared objected again, just like Chloe had earlier. He also repeated this at the meeting before the raid. If you use white magic when attacking, the damage to the monsters is twice as big, but their attack then becomes twice as strong and thus you can only go into the red. Therefore, it was better to forget about white magic and not use it at all, and there was nothing to worry about. Jared assured them that they would compete in the same conditions. While they were clearing the way to move on, a light wind began to blow from the depths of the caves. Isabel was surprised and turned with confusion to the source of this wind. It turned out to be Mia. She was using the magic wind. The girl wanted to help in this way because then the bad smell would go away and they could continue to fight. Jared was more and more impressed by his students. Mia was still at level 1, but she was able to use wind magic, which becomes available only to level 2 mages. He was proud of her. In that case, now we can go further. The presence of the hunters could be felt on the first floor, so there was not a single monster around. They were all full of energy and desire to win, so they did not hesitate to go inside. Jared once again explained their plan of action as they walked through the dark corridors of the cave. Lena was to help defend their rear, and Jared gave the order that no one should go ahead of him until he said otherwise. Lena felt a great responsibility. It was her first raid, and not an easy one either, so she wanted to show her strength. The company continued to move forward, when suddenly Jared came across some jewelry among all these stones and piles of bones. He picked it up, looking at the ring. It was an artifact, a ring of luck, enchanted with the curse of flair. Jared knew about it that when the artifact was not near its owner, it would begin to consume its new owner. The ring would kill the person inside who touched or wore it, and thus that person would die within the next 60 seconds. But he also remembered that in order to prevent this curse, the ring had to be worn by four different people within one minute. Hayes noticed that Jared was very nervous. He tried to resist the curse, but the effect of this artifact was very powerful. The Ring of Luck was not at all what it seemed at first. It was created by the developers of Paradise, but it was hard to believe that it actually fell into his hands. Now it was clear why there were so many corpses lying at the entrance to the dungeon. Jared was only getting worse and Hayes was already getting nervous. And since the ring's curse had been activated, the object that was to be sacrificed would be deleted from the system. But he had one more thing to save him. The artifact of St. Grace, which made him immune to the curse. 
and the same thing happened the day he met the Red Queen. And now, the cursed jewelry has been transformed back into a ring with Flair's blessing and light energy. Now it was truly a ring of good fortune. Jared silently thanked all those hunters who had died here, giving their lives for this artifact. This development was a very good start. He would do everything he could to protect this dungeon, and the deaths of these people were not in vain. After such an experience, they moved on. The team was still on the first floor, where they entered the fifth stone room, which is where Jared started looking for the secret entrance. Lakis felt proud to be here. He looked around. Usually, other hunters died on the way to this stone room, but they managed to get here and it was very easy to get in. Hayes was also excited about this, and they could all be proud of themselves for taking the first step toward completing the task. After a while, a flock of red demons appeared in the room, telling Jared what he should do to move forward. These little demons had the ability to explode, and Jared had specially called them all here. These monsters quickly flocked to the place like bees to sweet honey. Then these demons exploded in front of the team, hitting each other. They all exploded. Hayes stood and admired Jared, and she was impressed that he fought 20 demons at once and was able to defeat them easily. Chloe was also amazed by the sight. She knew that Jared was a good magician, but these monsters were also at a high level. Isabel had heard that this was possible, but she was still surprised because it was the first time she had seen it with her own eyes. Meanwhile, Lena looked around the area and approached the others, asking what exactly Jared was going to find here. But before she could get an answer, Jared shouted excitedly that he had found what he was looking for here. He put his hand on some tiles in the stone wall and called everyone to look. As soon as he pressed lightly on the wall, it immediately shattered into hundreds of small stones that fell on them, and a strong gust of wind came up with it. But soon it was over and they were looking at a passage that would allow them to enter the deep caverns of the dungeon. The road that led directly from room 5 of the first floor to room 8, which was located on the fourth floor. The creators of Paradise created the shortest paths, but at some point they stopped building them and only barely noticeable paths remained. And since the road here is only through a small and narrow tunnel and it was completely unnecessary, they left everything as it was, not seeing any prospects for creating something more. And besides, using this shortcut, Jared came up with an idea but such machinations would not have worked if he had not met with other Paradise users. Jared was also very worried about the Eastern Continent, which Bearhard had recently mentioned, even though it wasn't something he should be worried about at the moment, but it was too hard to put it out of his mind. As he was so absorbed in his thoughts, he didn't even notice that the road in front of them was no longer there, only Hayes and Lena noticed. He immediately turned to them and loudly announced that from now on they would have to dig their own way out. He then picked up the mines he had created, but these were modified. Unlike the usual mines that explode when stepped on, these were like a time bomb, designed to explode after a set time. Before placing them, Jared emphasized that they had to be very careful as they walked through the tunnels leading to Room 6. If this mine went off, the red demons or other evil spirits would react and be able to get here from the other side. After this warning, he scattered several mines on the ground, moving a little further away from them. Not a second later, they all exploded together, blinding everyone around them. Immediately after several explosions, the team heard the sounds of demons approaching, and they were doing so very quickly. Although Jared had warned them, Mia was having a lot of fun. She only saw it as a game so she began to use her magic to throw the little creatures away from her, laughing out loud. The demons kept flying on, right towards her. They were angry that someone had invaded their territory. Lena intervened in this situation. She stood in front of these red monsters and put up a shield. In this way, they hit it and fell in front of her feet without hurting anyone. There were more and more monsters, and several of them were almost reaching Isabel, but she noticed and reacted quickly. Before she knew it, she had already used her spell against the red demons and some of them were neutralized again. There were a lot of them, so Chloe said she'd take care of the ones that were coming from the front. Hayes offered to help her from the rear since she had healing magic. It might come in handy sooner or later. 
Everything was going great. They were easily dealing with the guards of this place. Jared was once again enthusiastically watching his team. There was an organized teamwork here, prepared with the right skill levels for the game, and step by step they were advancing. After the battle with the small red demons, the group of hunters easily and quickly passed the room eight of the fourth floor, and before entering, they stopped to stare at the door. Lakis remembered Jared telling them about Boss Flair's room at the meeting, and it was hard to realize that they were standing in this place now. A lot of hunters who were considered experienced died from Flair's attacks. This room is full of traps, and it is very difficult to avoid casualties. At this point in the story, Hayes was already feeling quite uncomfortable. There was even a joke about taking a picture of a person who is about to die while he is still alive. At first glance, this monster seemed very powerful and strong, especially for a team of seven. But strength was all he had. He had no ingenuity or cunning. The Flare is a wizard-like monster that can use dark magic, which means it would be difficult to attack given its defense and ability to cast magic. But Jared had a plan that would put them in a winning position. They would just skip it, taking the shortest route. It wouldn't be necessary to follow the sequence of attacks and go by all the rules. Just because they wouldn't kill this giant didn't mean they couldn't move on to the next room. Jared headed that way with a gleeful smile. Hayes watched him as enthusiastically as ever. There was nothing the Lord didn't know. He himself was closely watching every attack of his students. And although it was Hayes's first attack in the dungeon, she was doing well. Jared was glad that she had not suffered any moral injuries. They moved forward and Lacus caught up with the boy. He had heard that there were eight rooms on each of the four floors and he wondered if the eighth room was the only one they could use to get to the next floor. He had the right idea. There must be a door in this room that would open the way to room one of the fifth floor. Jared started looking for the hidden button again to open the door. Lacus was afraid that a bunch of red demons would come out of there again. But when the gate started to open, Jared told him to calm down. There was nothing to worry about. As soon as they entered the room, they saw a large crystal in the middle of the room, which was emitting divine energy. So there was no way the demons could be in this place, and they did not even approach it. This room was here as a shelter where one could feel completely safe and rest. However, there were no traces of a shelter or camp here, so we can conclude that they were the first to break through to the fifth floor. It was very strange to see a place in the dungeon that had not been moved by anyone. This opportunity was granted by the Celestials themselves. From the fifth floor, every monster they caught sight of would be a very valuable prey. The goal was to destroy all the monsters here and leave none in the underworld. They were all very eager to fight, but Jared stopped them a bit, saying that before entering, they should remember that increased strength and fast movement are a necessity in the dungeon. But Flair, who was making a lot of noise and commotion, was to be ignored. Now the team was definitely ready to step into the fifth floor of the eerie dungeon. As soon as they entered, the company was attacked by black demons. Lena and Chloe stood next to each other, and their confidence suddenly evaporated. On the other hand, they were attacked by white demons, all moving very fast and very many of them. But Mia was having a lot of fun. She wanted to show everything she had learned over the months, because she had been practicing every day and was able to quickly defend herself against the monster. But Lacus rushed at these creatures with his sword. He told her to back away. These demons were immune to magic. It didn't matter how strong the spells she used. It would be useless. Isabel was very calm and Jared shouted somewhere behind her that he was taking on the red demons, so it was best not to approach them. Lacus and Lena agreed that he would take on the white monsters approaching from the right, and Lena would take care of those flying from the left, and they tried to bring the red demons up to Jared. Chloe was neutralizing the white demons with their own blood coming out of their mouths, and she took a position behind them to make it easier to kill them. Mia stood behind her to throw away any demons that would approach her. Hayes stood nearby and used her divine healing power on the black demons that surrounded her. Now it was up to them to execute everything according to the plan, each of them doing their best and using their abilities to the fullest. 
Lachis was exceeding himself in all expectations. He was the one person Jared could safely rely on and trust. But they couldn't be happy and stand still for long, as the monsters were growing in number, attacking the entire team in waves. Jared ran away from them and then blew up several of the demons. Several of these red creatures were already lying on the ground, nothing left of them but crushed lava. In the fight against them, you need to keep your finger on the pulse, because if the explosion hits the body even a little, the bones can melt. However, this time Jared was lucky and received the title of Red Demon Killer. Thanks to this title, his damage increased by 25%. After that, signs appeared that said he had achieved the titles of Professional Assassin and Guest of the Underworld, for which he also received a bonus. He laughed a little. The whole system could soon explode from these messages. There were too many of them. The fight with the demons came to an end, and the company spent another two days in the dungeon, during which time they were all exhausted, but they made it to room seven of the fifth floor. It really wasn't easy at all, of course. There were warnings about it, but it turned out to be even harder than they had imagined. Jared was full of enthusiasm and was not that tired himself, but he suggested that they rest in this room and gain strength before moving on to the next one. There was no one following them anyway, so they could relax and take their time. As soon as they heard such gentle words for their ears, they immediately fell asleep, despite the fact that there was no bed or at least no comfortable conditions for this. Jared had a privilege here because he always carried the gorgeous artifact with him, which made him not need sleep. The guy didn't feel tired and now had free time while the team was resting. He sat down a little further away from the others so as not to wake them up and took a small bag from his ring, which fell to the ground. During their time in the underworld, they had collected a lot of magic crystals, so now it was time to prepare for the final battle. These crystals were very expensive and valuable. One of them was worth 1,000 gold pieces, which was enough to make a fortune. In Jared's past life, when he was still in Korea, this crystal would have been worth 1 billion won. However, here he was no longer interested in money. Jared took the magic tool Bullet, which looked like a small knife. This artifact was created from the rare mineral stellate. It allows its owner to create magic crystals anywhere and anytime. He began to carve some symbols on the crystals, and although Jared was destroying something that was so expensive, he felt at ease because Paradise had thousands of such crystals. He was just used to them and perceived them as an ordinary stone. However, if he was a salesman from his past life, he would have already fallen down here and lost consciousness. But here, in his new body, he wanted to end his life with dignity, and there was still a long way to go. From the very beginning, as soon as he moved into the game, his main goal was to become the main character no matter what, and he was confidently moving towards the goal. Jared went up and put some crystals with symbols in the stone wall. In a few hours, he woke up the whole team. It was time to move on, but before entering the next room, he used these magic crystals to create a field with buffs. Now it was just a matter of deciding who would go first, and Chloe took that responsibility. She stepped away from the others and Jared showed her where to stand so she stood in the indicated place. It didn't take long for something to start happening. You have to wait a little longer and only then you can feel the effect. Jared created a magic circle, standing in which strength, speed, and health would increase, and Chloe confirmed that the effect of the buffs was indeed felt here. Everyone else happily exclaimed that they also wanted to try it and do it as soon as possible. Of course, Jared was very pleased that his team was so confident, but he wanted to hurry up and get a good rest before the last battle. As soon as the attack on the boss begins, demons will start appearing from all corners of the cave. Their numbers will grow by the minute. Five of them should split into three paths and take care of all the demons while the other two deal with the final boss. Lena took on the left side, and Mia was to help her with that. Chloe was on the middle part, and Lacus was on the right, so the three of them were divided. Lacus assured that Jared could rely on him, and he would do his job to the best of his ability. Jared told Isabel to help the four of them fight the demons, and Hayes's head was already starting to swell. She started to make a fuss about not having a role, and Hayes was worried about it. 
and she thought he would ask her to wait off the battlefield and rest. But he calmly told her that the two of them would take on the boss, something they had talked about during the meeting, and Hayes calmed down a bit. That was the key to victory, working together as a team. So the five of them stayed in the room, and Jared and Hayes went on to meet with the big boss, Gapagius. He did look a bit intimidating, and for a minute they stood there looking at the giant. Hayes tried to be very quiet so as not to attract the attention of this monster, but Jared told her that she shouldn't do that. Gapagis is in a deep sleep and won't wake up until Flair attacks. Hayes was a little worried. It was her first experience and everything was happening too fast, but Jared used a level 2 spell, releasing shiny dust. They would be able to wake him up as soon as they touched one of the lasers that the magic dust had detected. So Hayes had to go through all those lasers using her unique flexibility. But she wasn't too happy about doing it herself. It was too scary to act so drastically right now. Jared was uncomfortable with the fact that if he was now at level 6 magic, they would have been able to move together with the help of a multi-teleport. It was a pity that this way was the best option for them now. Hayes gathered herself. Now was not the time to panic. She tied her hair up so that it would not get in the way when passing these traps. After that, the girl took off her robe and was ready to start. They would be there very soon. Lena wanted to say something, but her tongue was tied as she watched Hayes walk fearlessly toward the lasers. The others were also standing there, marveling at this, trying to keep their voices down so as not to distract her. Hayes was very flexible as she walked between all the lasers, everyone else watching in amazement at her skillful work. She moved forward quite quickly, but sometimes her own panic let her down. Her mind was full of the fact that if she made a mistake somewhere, she would touch a laser and that would be the end of it. Lena started shouting something at her, which distracted Hayes from the task a bit, but also got her thoughts going. Not so fast, but very carefully, Hayes walked under the laser beams and with each step brought her team closer to the goal. When she was almost there, everyone held their breath. She was almost at the throne of Gapajas, just a little more to go and she was doing better and better. But just as she was on the final straight, she was distracted by a strange sound that almost led to a fatal mistake. Jared was already near the monster. Noticing that Hayes was about to touch the laser, he immediately told her about it and everything went back to normal. The sound that surprised her was a rubber band in her hair. It broke and flew off her head, but Hayes caught it before it touched the beams. Jared was already very scared, but when Hayes got out of the situation, he exhaled calmly. In a few seconds, she was standing next to Jared. Hayes had done her job well, and now they both needed to join forces and launch an attack on Gapaji's. There used to be a saying, the slower you go, the farther you'll go, which means that even one small drop can cause a disaster by creating a crack in the mountain. This proverb was the key to their victory over Gapajis, and Jared asked Hayes how long the average divine healing lasts. If the girl used it without resting, it would take 30 seconds. This was a very good result. She had definitely advanced in her abilities, just a few months ago, she would not have lasted more than 10 seconds. It was all thanks to the method that Jared had advised her, and he had decided that it would be better to use a sound-absorbing spell. And after this conversation, they were finally going to start the last battle, and first they would have to climb on top of Gapajus' head. Jared flew upwards, being at the head of the great monster in seconds, and called Hayes to him. She came closer and was very surprised that there was such a strange device on this throne. Soon she was at his side, and soon her magic and healing skills would come into play. Jared felt that Gapajas would definitely wake up when they attacked him together, but for now, he was sleeping peacefully. That's why the two of them were the perfect combination, because attacking and healing are the keys to winning this boss battle. Jared already knew everything about this monster because he had spent his past life studying paradise, and Hayes didn't really know what he was getting at. While the two of them were at ease, the rest of the team was already suffering from demon attacks. Jared had said that they would start appearing as soon as someone touched the throne, but there was really no end in sight for these creatures. All the damage was distributed evenly after they used buffs and pumped up their strength and health. Chloe killed the demons one by one, 
even though there were many of them, but she easily dealt with them all. Everyone else was not far behind and confidently slaughtered the Montras, keeping them from reaching the throne where Hayes and Jared were. And even if they did get some small wounds during the fight, they healed in no time from the buff spheres, which made the task very easy. Since they were in an area where the magic stones did not stop working, their combat attack doubled, but you still had to be careful. They had a very difficult mission. If these demons broke through this defense, they could hit the signal lines and wake up Gapajis, so they needed to continue to protect Hayes and Jared. They were risking their lives now. But no matter how hard they tried, the influx of demons was huge, and they did miss one. The little guys started moving quickly towards the laser alarm. Chloe's attacks on the Earth demons were not working at all, so Lena suggested attacking them with magic. The two of them used spells, but Jared came to the rescue with a spatial door spell and a fireball. This saved them from failure, but it was too early to stop. The fight had just begun. Jared and Hayes smiled and waved at them from across the room. Now Jared and Hayes started to act on their plan, but this strategy was really crazy in Hayes' opinion. But there was no better option, apparently, because fighting Gapajas directly was not easy. But Hayes was sticking with this option. She really wanted to fight the monster, but this demon was unusual. Its attacks were different from most. Jared was shaking when he heard that Hayes wanted to fight this giant one-on-one. -on -one. The thing is, if you want to attack the demon hideout in the best and most profitable way, the number of people they had on their team would not be able to do anything. First, you need at least 30 hunters who are at B rank. You should prepare for the fact that Gapajis may wake up early. Then it won't end with him calling all the other monsters from the first floor of the dungeon into this room. In addition, the force field surrounding the room would instantly disappear, allowing the mad monster from Flair's staff to rush forward to protect his master. Jared realized that he needed to end this right now, that he could take advantage of the first attack. This trick was quite simple in itself, because in order to wake up this giant Gapajis, only two conditions are needed. The first was to touch the signal line in front of the monster's throne, and the second was to strike Gapajis three or more times. However, the problem was that the basic attack that Jared used took about five points. But if they could add a skill that would restore 2.5 points per second, it would be possible to adjust the strength of the blows for less than three points. He warned Hayes that if they went any further, they would see the part connected to the brain, so they couldn't stop now. She nodded, asking if she was doing well now, and Jared praised her again and told her to synchronize their breathing and keep going. Hayes was thrilled that they had made it this far, because even if a whole pack of hunters had come here, they wouldn't have been able to take down Gapajis, but it was so cool that they were now killing this monster, albeit slowly. And that was the advantage of this trick, so all that was needed now was to finish off this monster and take all the rewards. Gapajis had a perfect recovery, which is why he was always in a state of sleep. But recently, he started to feel a very strange sensation. The feeling was getting a bit annoying, but it seemed as if it was still just a pleasant dream and nothing more. However, on top of that, he was also experiencing a headache that was unbearable to the point of being unbearable. He still blamed it on the dream, but it couldn't go on for long. Jared and Hayes were about to finish their work, and he suggested that they finish the monster right now and deliver the final blow before it woke up. However, when they joined forces, Gapajis screamed very loudly, a mixture of screaming and animal growling, and he was tormented by a feeling of fierce pain in his head. The monster raised his hand. Now he was no longer in a state of deep sleep. But it was all over for him, because before he could strike, Hayes and Jared quickly finished him off with magic. The two of them clapped their hands, laughing with joy. The mission was successful. It was a very sad death for the king of these demons. The two of them had just crushed his skull. The others who were fighting the demons had already noticed that the main boss had been destroyed, and the small creatures in the form of demons of various kinds began to fly chaotically from side to side, not knowing where to go. As always, Lacus admired his lord. He could do anything and Jared had gained a lot of experience thanks to this victory. And yet they succeeded, 
Despite the complexity of this mission and the danger of the raid, they worked together like a real team. In addition, Jared received another good bonus, a special and special ability called Ultimate Amplification. Now he had the power of Gapajis in his arsenal. It was hard to believe that such a powerful energy and amplification of attacking magic was now in his hands. In the game Paradise, the first user who attacked Gapajis noticed that it was possible to get a unique bonus given by the spirit of Gapajis himself. As an advantage, mages get the ability of transcendent attack. This is the type of magic that dares to exceed all limits and establish boundaries. It is known for enhancing and increasing existing fire magic, evoking the transcendent power that is inherent in magic itself. It can be amplified ten times more than the maximum value. But even with all these advantages, there was still one problem. For each subsequent exceeding of the magic, it increases 1,000, then 2,000, 3,000 times, and so on. That is, to put it in other words, an A-rank magic missile with a double overrun would take 2,000 mana points from the wizard. He thought about it. Jared's magic had about 6,000, so in theory he should be able to use at least one fireball with double the amount. While he was thinking about all this, Hayes approached him. She was scared, but she said quietly that someone was following her. Jared turned around, looking around, and another artifact of the Gapaji's wing caught his eye. It was a pair of boots, and Jared ran to the others, saying that they needed to be tried on immediately. Mia put them on, and they moved as fast as when Jared had used acceleration magic on them. It was like speeding shoes, perhaps a small reward for each of them for such a long and difficult journey, which they had very much deserved. Jared smiled. It was a nice gift for their efforts. The fighting spirit of Gapajus had fully settled in his left hand, and now Jared could safely use transcendental magic whenever he wanted to. He decided not to hesitate and try out his new abilities, so he tried to use a fireball with double amplification. Everything around him was filled with bright flames that enveloped everything in its path. It was indeed a unique and very beautiful sight, and the whole team was fascinated by what was happening before their eyes. Jared was very pleased that this was the powerful magic that was now under his control. Everything went perfectly. There was a happy ending for everyone, as they had planned at the beginning. Everyone returned with a baggage of unforgettable impressions and experiences. It was another successfully completed task. Now they were all going back safely, and there was even a shortcut that could be used to get back faster. Those hunters who decided to attack this dungeon after them could also use this passage to save their time and energy. But as soon as they came out of this passage, Jared happily announced that they would block this passage right now so that no one else could use it. There was to be no free space. None of them would get any advantage for it. Then Hayes thought that it could be an easy way into the dungeon for someone who didn't belong here at all, so they all decided to help block the passage. After the tunnel was no longer visible, they headed home. They hadn't been in Krivia for about four days, and after such a raid they wanted to have a good and quiet rest. He remembered his first experience with this magic, when in the dungeon Jared had used a fire sphere with double the power. Then he had only been able to double the power, but with the help of Modus's prayer he could now use the same magic, but with triple the power. Now he will have to use the staff more often, as the amount of mana required for use will increase each time. Long ago, during a fight with the mage criminals at the beginning of his stay here, he had gotten this staff, and now it was useful to him. Jared had saved Aki on that very day, and now it seemed like a long time ago, even though it had only been a year. He sighed, leaning back against the back of the couch, and as soon as he did, a cat jumped on his shoulder. But after a couple of seconds, the guy jumped away from the couch, screaming in fright that there was a cat. The animal carelessly came closer to him and continued to meow. It was the same cat that had been trying to get into the mansion several times and was hanging around the grounds. The maid was about to tell Jared about it, but he had just gone to the dungeon. When the heavy, rainy season began, this little guy came here looking for shelter, and Jared noticed that the cat liked this place. He thought it would be nice to have a pet, and Hayes would love it. 
Jared decided that now was the time to try out the reward he had received in the dungeon, but the cat was not very happy because Jared had gotten this strange thing called the pure spirit of Gapajis, which is the pure energy left over after they destroyed the monster, and the animal that is possessed by this spirit will have special energy and special communication abilities. Jared went up to the cat and tried to put the spirit into it. The cat perked up its ears, starting to meow again, and a sign appeared in front of Jared that five people who are close to the target can impose buffs, debuffs, magic, and curses on the subject. Now the cat had unlimited potential. After such machinations, the cat began to speak, calling Jared simply, Man. The cat meowed at the same time, saying that it needed a nickname and would be very pleased to be called Cat. The maid was shocked by this sight, but apparently the cat could speak through this spirit of Gapajas, and this cat was also quite good at human speech. Jared came closer to the cat, looking at it carefully, and then a familiar name came to mind. From that moment on, this little cat would be called Terry. The cat didn't understand anything because he had no idea what Terry meant and looked with his big eyes directly at Jared. But in a moment he stopped caring, because the girl began to pet him and the cat was happy. It was raining heavily on the streets of Krivi Rai and the weather was gloomy. It was the best time for the strangers to reach their target. This well was their last landmark. Klaus gave the order to dump the luggage right there. Several men holding a bloody sack threw it into the well, obeying their master's order. They had tied stones to the corpses they had cut into small pieces, so that the sack would sink very far under the water, right to the bottom of the well. Klaus then asked what the results of the latest tests were, and the answer was positive, because the test with the young subjects went perfectly. This was a perfect opportunity to spread the disease. Anyone who drank the water would become a carrier of all waterborne diseases within 24 hours. This was exactly what Klaus had hoped for. The plan was executed, the global results were awaited, and he returned to his dark chambers in peace. In a few hours, the kingdoms of Banuso, Cinders, and Malus will begin to suffer from the disease, and then they will react to this infernal water that the sect has kindly given them. At the same time, everything was calm in the territory of Krivia, and the mansion with the cat that could talk became even more cozy. Jared always found something to do, and now he was interested in the artifact given to Fatalin, which was definitely not for nothing. This jewelry had some terrible options, and the best thing to do was to keep it away from the people. Now this artifact would never see the light of day again. Jared stood next to the window, outside which it continued to rain steadily. Their mansion was well constructed and equipped with measuring devices, so none of this should be a problem. It was a cloudy morning, but at this time someone started knocking on his office. He opened the door and saw Valdez standing there. He apologized for disturbing him so early, but Jared was glad to see him. He had an important conversation to have with the Lord. Valdez had mentioned it before. The thing is that, according to Radius's laws, no natural disasters are expected in Krivia this year. Jared said that this was true. Valdez could forget about it as a sacred injunction, but still, Krivia was really safe this year. That was all Jared could say because he didn't have the energy to explain the system and the Grand Lord's title to him, it would be a bad idea. Valdez didn't really want to know what Jared meant by those words. He had come here to pitch the idea of making a video of the Lord saying prayers for the safety and well-being of the country's citizens. He had already discussed this possibility with the temple itself. They had enough spiritual stones of light, so they could start the presentation at dawn without any problems, so they could start right away since they were already together. Jared was still surprised by Valdez's abilities. He quickly came up with new and improved ideas, but he shouldn't have expected anything else from such a person. Jared agreed to it. He liked what Valdez had to offer, so he was ready to start right away. One of the main qualities a leader must have is to work with the strengths of his or her diligent employees. Jared agreed to the shoot not only for publicity purposes, but also to support Valdez, who is loyal to the kingdom. The priest in the temple was shocked to see everything around him. 
It was so strange that in other areas there were floods and the spread of all possible diseases, but they were fine. People sincerely believed that it was Jared's prayers that helped, that it was because of them that they could now feel at peace and continue to live happily. All the people wanted to see the video with their own eyes. They sat quietly so as not to miss a single second of the movie called Prayer to God. The people praised this video. It was beautiful. The citizens of Krivia were very moved by this video. The hearts of the people were filled with loyalty, and Jared had accomplished another task of winning the attention of hearts. And as the loyalty of all citizens increased dramatically, it reached up to 1,000, which is why the Golden Age began in the territory. And with the beginning of the Golden Age within a month, the total production capacity increases by 100%. Other lands and kingdoms outside of Krivia had already begun to sink underwater. People were getting sick, dying. Famine was starting to set in due to the destruction of farms. Fields were flooded with water and nothing remained of them. Infectious diseases were spreading across the land, and ordinary people's homes were flooded due to heavy rains. Therefore, it was quite logical that all the residents of Krivia who had not suffered from natural disasters and diseases had such an attitude towards Jared. They felt that the clear sky above their heads was thanks to Jared and his prayers. The horrors in other areas did not stop, but after a week the Lord decided to go down to his underground laboratory where he had unfinished business. Jared brought Isabel here again. This time she was in a good mood. Perhaps the raid helped her to relax, but when she entered, she was very surprised. Looking at everything that stood in front of her, the girl noticed that something new had appeared here since last week. Jared picked up a potion that had been prepared by the master in anticipation of the terrible rainy season. According to this formula, it has ten different kinds of herbs mixed in it. It is a general medicine and should be added to the oni, which has been purified with manna beforehand. It was amazing, more than ten kinds of herbs. Isabel had been surprised by Renella's treatments, but here the potion was even stronger. It was certainly something new, but that wasn't the real reason Jared had called her here. Jared was going to cast a spell on this potion, a technique she had heard of before, but she hadn't understood why he would do it to his own potion. The reason was that the effect of the potion was extremely strong, it could be too dangerous and even fatal for the body, and it was necessary to weaken the effect of the medicine first to see if it was suitable for treating the disease. Isabel then asked if it would be possible to get another sore after using the potion, and in general it was true, but Jared assured her that she should not worry. Before she drank the potion, Jared asked her how the ring she was wearing was working. It was a purification artifact that could destroy negative emotions, and she had taken it from the demon's hideout. She could feel the effect of it. A lot of negative emotions and dark feelings were gone. It was as if hatred and a crazy need for something disappeared, which meant that the ring was fulfilling its function. She felt much better before, as soon as Isabel saw him, her emotions would explode and she would get angry. She still liked Jared even though she was sure it would fade away with time. He had no desire to start a relationship. He had enough on his plate and no interest, and he wasn't as soft and white and fluffy as she'd imagined. Despite the artifact she was wearing, Isabel seemed to snap. She started screaming that he had no right to pry into her emotions. He shouldn't care whether she liked him or not. She was the expert, and she could handle it herself. Jared was startled to silence, looking at her. Now she had completed her emotional monologue. She wasn't as pleased as she had been at the beginning, but she asked if Jared had thought about how he was going to use all these potions. There were at least a thousand of them. No, but he had a plan, as always. He had it all mapped out and knew what was going where. Isabel looked at him in silence and waited for him to speak. This silence was broken by Hayes who was looking everywhere for Jared to tell her something, and when he was nowhere to be found, she decided to go down to the dungeon and knocked. She barged in without waiting for an answer from him. It was urgent news. There were big problems in Krivia, because the ambassadors of the kingdoms of Bonus and Malus arrived at the same time. Jared and Isabel had to postpone testing the cure for a while, which, 
to receive the guests, so the Lord and the representatives of the other kingdoms entered the VIP room. The two also did not expect to come here at the same time. The ambassador of the Malice Kingdom was a young boy who looked very tired. As the representative of the Bonuso Kingdom, he was also very tired after a long journey. As they entered the room, they could not start a conversation for some time. They looked at each other, not knowing where to start. One of them looked at the room and it seemed too big for him to call it just a living room. If someone had told them that this place was some part of a royal or imperial palace, they would have believed it. As they admired the design of the room, Jared entered and greeted the guests. He had never dealt with both kingdoms at once before, so he was surprised and asked what was going on. At first they couldn't get started because they were arguing about who would speak first because they both wanted to be first. So Jared decided to take control and suggested that the representative of the Bonuso kingdom should speak first because they had a lot of time and discussion about all the problems. So the guy spoke first and he said that this year's rainy season had caused the Optatio River to overflow its banks, and there was much more water than in previous years, and all three kingdoms were suffering from a large influx of water. And if we compare this case with the previous year, the amount of precipitation more than doubled and massive floods began to appear not only near the Optatio River itself, but throughout the kingdom. They were not fully prepared for such a natural disaster. People there know that floods are possible this season, but no one thought it would go this far. The ambassador from Malice also decided to join the conversation, adding that this level of water is causing more and more casualties with each passing day. They were doing everything they could to recover and save lives, but that was not the only problem. There was also an epidemic that was spreading through the flooded areas. Three days ago, he held an official letter from the mercenary corps of Arcanus, stating that the Lord had recently created a certain remedy that could cure infectious diseases. Jared didn't say anything. He was frightened by Aki's speed. He had leaked all the information about the potion that hadn't even been tested yet. But since they already knew about all this, they had to make fresh decisions, so the conversation promised to be short. They were not asking for saviors, but for a cure that would save people's lives. And the kingdom of Malice wanted the same thing. The price didn't matter to either of them. They just needed to get everything that was there, and both kingdoms were willing to give Jared any amount of gold coins for it. Jared agreed without any further ado and said that they would get everything ready now. The promised amount of drugs would be transferred to the border between the states, and depending on the severity of the symptoms, the potion could be distributed to five people, but the effectiveness of the medicine would not be reduced at all. They stood up and thanked for such help, because now Creevy Re was the only salvation. But this conversation was suddenly interrupted by Hayes, who quickly burst into the room. She had come to tell him that the ambassador from Cinders had also arrived in the kingdom, and it was Princess Mayra herself. Jared was surprised that it was a princess and not a servant of the kingdom, so, it could only mean that the situation in Cinders was extremely difficult and they needed help urgently. She sat down next to Jared and he offered her tea, but she refused it. Myra could not afford to drink such tea when hundreds of innocent people were dying and suffering on her land. But Jared convinced her that it was not only for pleasure. This tea gives people who try it a lot of strength and energy. Jared noticed that Matsra was not the same as he had seen her in her home kingdom of Cinders, but was tense and excited about the events. She thought she had prepared as well as she could, but the epidemic was moving so fast that no one had time to prevent the suffering. Then Jared asked her to fill him in on the details of what was happening in the kingdom of Cinders. Mayra bowed her head. Floods and pandemics were their constant friends, so they continued to prepare for more serious disasters, they had enough medicine, and at first it seemed that the kingdom would cope. But there was a problem. All the people who suffered from the water spill were moved to other, safer areas, and they also isolated other citizens who were considered infected. But nevertheless, the infection rate was still growing. They could not prevent the pandemic from breaking out, but they planned to stop it from spreading. It was an unusual kind of spread. Something was wrong. 
At the same time, the epidemic appeared in other areas that were not affected by the water at all. And there was also something wrong with the well that people used as their main source of drinking water. Corpses were found there, which were likely the source of the infection and the beginning of a major pandemic. Jared had expected this, but he never thought they would go this far with their plans. He assumed that the Umbra Church and its followers were responsible for all these troubles. Unlike the Lynx, the priest under the veil, that is, Klaus, was famous for continuing to terrorize the world and destroy all life without remorse. When Jared got involved in the civil war of the Kingdom of Cinders and completely ruined all of Umbra's plans, it became clear that the sect would try to take revenge on him by any means necessary. Jared confidently told Mara that it was the Umbra sect's fault, as there were not many organizations around that were capable of such global decisions. And since it was the Umbra, they already had enough information about Sindres thanks to Phthalin and Jess, but Jared had a solution. First, he told the princess that they had a cure for this epidemic, a magic potion that could destroy all waterborne diseases. Mara seemed to come alive when she heard this. She had heard that Jared had saved Renella from the pandemic last year, and here was another rescue. In the end, Jared's lifelong study of herbal medicine began to bear fruit, which proved to be very helpful. Mara asked him to sell the potion to their kingdom. She was ready to pay a very large sum for the hard work, but there was no time at all. People were dying every second. Jared decided to give her 70% of all the stocks, as the production of the medicine was still in progress, and additional deliveries would be made from time to time, and she was surprised by this figure. She had heard that Jared had previously sold to the ambassadors who had come to the kingdom before her, and she couldn't believe that those two had bought only 30%. But Jared had suggested that they simply weren't going to use the potion on absolutely everyone, which meant that only the upper class of the population, that is, the aristocrats and nobility, would be saved, and Mara was angry to hear that people could dispose of the lives of others in this way. But there were many more unusual and two-faced people in this world, and Mara was too naive to think that everything was pure and fair. She knew this, but she was uncomfortable that Jared was willing to give away so much of the medicine that was now a necessity for everyone. But he assured her that he would give her the elixir right away, and that in the future it would be better to check all the wells in the affected areas very carefully and that an ambassador should be sent to transport the medicine. Mara thanked him sincerely on behalf of her people, herself and her brother, and now it was time to transfer the money. After the girl left the mansion and returned to the kingdom with good news, he began to actively pursue the production of new medicines. Jared devoted all his free time to this, but now selling elixirs was not the best way to make money. If you pronounce it manually, you can get five times more product than when it is created automatically. So switching to manual production was the best solution. It was easy for Jared to focus on his work around the clock. He didn't need to eat or sleep. However, there was still one problem. Isabel was supposed to help him make the medicine, but she didn't have the artifact that Jared wore. So she often got tired and fell asleep. And now she was having a nightmare, screaming in her sleep for her mom to save her dad. They didn't deserve to go through this, Isabel cried without opening her eyes. Jared came to her excitedly, putting his hand on her shoulder. The girl did not wake up and her clothes were stained with tears, but Jared tried to wake her up. It wasn't easy. The nightmare had pulled her deep into its grip and wouldn't let go. And maybe what he was about to do was even the obvious solution to the problem. But it was the only way he could keep her warm. So Jared wrapped a warm and soft blanket around her and stood beside her, holding her close. After that, Isabel's nightmares stopped and after a while she woke up. She looked around, asking Jared what he was doing, and he said a little awkwardly that he thought she was cold, so he covered her with a blanket. But it was not enough, so he decided to hug her. When she woke up, she immediately started screaming and calling him a miserable creature for talking to her while she was sleeping and allowing himself to do so. He took Isabel's words calmly and simply thanked her for working so hard and apologized for her getting tired of him. 
She also became quiet, saying that everything was fine and probably just fell asleep without realizing it. And since she was awake, they should concentrate on making the medicine. Their hard work could save thousands of lives, so they should concentrate on that. She snorted, saying that she was a professional and would do her job well. So they continued to make the potion. One should always seize an opportunity when it came along. There was no time to waste and no chance to use it. Aki was so fascinated that they had received so many orders for the potion from Krivia. Everything was sold out except for the stocks that were left for emergencies. Even the dark elves from the land of the Tatars and the red goblins had ordered the potions. Jared praised Aki for his work. It seems that the budget of Krivia has increased five times thanks to him, but he just laughed, saying that it was his job, which he was happy to do. He did expect a lot from Jared, but the Lord had once again exceeded his expectations and created so many potions in a month. Aki stared at his lab in awe, marveling at every corner of it. The reason Jared had been doing all of this all month was because he had the Dark Soul Stone. A creator must be at maximum level to use this stone at maximum level. Now he didn't have to ask Isabel for help and she could do her training. But Aki still wanted to add one more thing. Before he left, he suggested raising the price of the medicine, because the demand for it had increased dramatically. Jared said that from now on, Aki was responsible for this. In other parts of the kingdoms, it continued to rain, and people lined up to get medicines for themselves and their loved ones to treat infectious diseases. Some believed that the only way to survive was to go to Krivia, but others assured them that they had to wait a little longer. The queues were unbelievable, with people standing in the heavy rain for hours to get their hands on the medicine. Jared was sitting in his office again when Isabel came to see him. He said, sitting in his chair, that she could come in. She looked a little sad and came to him with a request. It was unexpected, but Jared gladly agreed to listen to her. Jared had promised her earlier that he would give her 9% of his income for the potion, but she said that it was not a necessity for her. But he didn't understand why she objected. It was just payment for her hard work, and Jared hadn't asked for free services, so it was fair. She understood that very well, and that's why she was going to ask for something in return for the money. Jared stood up from his chair, suggesting that they discuss it in more detail. She firmly stated that she wanted to create a wizarding guild, a guild where all the wizards of the continent could gather. Jared supported this idea because wizards had very different mechanisms, and a guild would help develop their abilities even further. Wizards specialized in debate and were useful not only for raids but also for war, but there was a risk that they could become completely uncontrollable if not monitored. Isabel said that she would, first of all, pay attention to the behavior of these people, and if it was bad, she would not let them into the guild. This meant that wizards who could not control themselves would not be able to join the guild, so her task was to find disciplined wizards. Isabel wanted to gather all the wizards who had scattered across the continent after the murder in Transylvania. She was very eager to help the kingdom, and this was a great way to strengthen the army. And she wasn't kidding. The idea had come to her when she got her new body. Jared didn't even know what to say. It was an unexpected statement, but a very good one. Now Isabel was ready to forget about the past. She believed that she would be able to control all the wizards, and she promised that it would not affect him. Jared thought that Isabel was sad and lonely. He remembered all the wizards who used to be around him, but she assured him that this desire was only because she wanted to help the country. Jared said that he was ready to fully support her idea, but that she would have to be responsible for running the guild. He was worried about the possibility of mages touching forbidden dark magic or turning to the dark side and contacting the Church of Umbra. Jared asked if Isabel had a plan for such a scenario. Isabel replied, just as clearly and firmly, that she would destroy anyone who tried to connect their lives with the dark church. He didn't have to worry about it. Isabel hated them more than she hated Jared. Then they decided to go ahead with the plan to open a guild. Soon the news that Isabel was going to start a guild spread to all the other countries. The other countries did not know the true potential of their mages, especially since their numbers had been greatly reduced after the massacre, but Jared had been paying a lot of attention to the mages from Paradise. If trained properly, 
it can offer many advantages in war. A lot of time passed, and it was August the 19th, and on that day, what they had been talking about for so long began. A lot of people gathered in the streets. It seemed as if the whole country had to evacuate. It was very suspicious. Jared had expected a certain number of refugees, but not this many. There were three times as many people as he had thought. If you looked at their clothes, you could tell that they were fleeing from bonus and malice. Jared didn't understand what was going on in those two countries and why they were allowing this to happen to civilians. The two kings were just out of their minds. Jared was so angry with them, but now something had to be done immediately. Jared turned to Terry, telling him to have the cat detect dark magic in the crowd. He didn't have to say who, just how many, and the cat agreed, but he had to give Jared a treat when they got back. Lakis approached Jared and asked if the plan they had discussed earlier was still on. For starters, they were going to call the area Sinar and declare it a refugee area. They had managed to get all this land to Krivia, but there were not enough resources and forces for development on that land. But for Sinare, they would allocate all the necessary resources that the refugees would need. Lakis asked in surprise if he understood correctly that Jared was selling the potion for this very purpose. Lerad remained silent. This was not the time for such questions. There was something much more important. If the population of Krivia grew to such proportions, they would have to worry about how to live and where to get their money. But there was no dungeon to work in or anything like that. It's not profitable for commercial parties and for resource extraction. And that's why the other masters left the land, leaving it untouched. And the only piece he could use here is to create a shrine for the pilgrims. No one in the congregation of Radius Church could refuse to visit such a place, so Jared decided he would create his own shrine. Meanwhile, Terry the Cat went for a walk among the people to determine how many of them were followers of the Dark Faith. And suddenly, Terry came across something very strange. As the kitten approached a large stone, he noticed several people in black robes discussing something very suspiciously. It was Klaus, and he had been watching the whole situation closely, but he hadn't expected so many people to come to Krivia to seek shelter, and he was even more surprised that Jared had made such a quick decision and decided to give them shelter. Suddenly, the cat's eyes began to glow red and he suspected that something was wrong with this group and scanned them with his eyes. The doctors were actively setting up various tents, bringing people food and water, blankets and rugs to give them at least a chance to keep warm. Jared walked into one of these tents where Lakis, Hayes, Ayla, and Obrin were sitting and he thanked them all for their participation in the Sonari Neighborhood Holy Land Project. Jared had specifically called them all here to stabilize internal affairs as quickly as possible in the face of the large influx of refugees. First, he emphasized that Lakis's role here would be the most important. Jared had given him the order to take over the entire formation, and there were only two things to pay attention to. The two key words were carrot and stick, like a cipher. The carrot meant helping the victims who were trying their best to adapt to this land and start a new life here, and the stick meant punishing all those who dared to commit crimes in such confusing and difficult times. Lakis listened to him with restraint and took his every word seriously. He felt that he now had a very big responsibility. After that, Jared added that he would even let him decide everything according to his own will and vision, because it was unacceptable to commit violence and persecute people in a new land pretending to be a refugee. Lakis nodded, saying that he had everything memorized, and Jared still had to distribute roles and orders to everyone else. Hayes and Obrin had to deal with the refugees through official aid policies. First, a full loan to build houses in the Sonari district with a long-term repayment period of 20 years. Secondly, Exports of manufactured goods obtained as a result of the cultivation of this land, for which you could get a 100% tax exemption for the next four years and 50% for two years. And the last thing Jared wanted to talk about was that if someone participates in the construction work of a large-scale project for the Sonari territories, these people will be treated not as a contractor, but as an employee. 
This was the end of the matter, and these were the three main points of the policy. As the number of people at the borders increased, guards from the Agresio Guard kept order and sometimes came across suspicious people. They stopped a guy who was very nervous as he passed by and found a small bag on his belt. Robbery is a serious violation of the rules, and Lord Jared had ordered that such people who were capable of such an act be punished. Such criminals had to be prepared for terrible consequences. The control in these territories was immediately introduced very seriously, so as not to let anyone who wanted to go against the law through, the guy said very quietly that he was very sorry that this had happened. And there was no end to the refugees from the kingdom of Bonus and Malice. Now the situation was such that the population of a small area had doubled. Jared wondered what would happen if these migrants settled here and continued to stay on his land, which would be a plus for him because in this case, there would be enough strength to make the neighboring kingdoms feel threatened by their competitors. But he was also tormented by the thought that he could lose, and that would be the end of all his achievements, and there was a very high probability that hell would break loose on earth. However, Jared knew that sooner or later the kingdoms of Malus and Bonus would regret what they had done and feel the full force of the army of Krivia, he stood away from the crowd, where only Terry could find him. He finished the search. The cat came here because he noticed suspicious actions of one guy whom the others were watching very closely. Jared looked around and looked at the cat, asking what happened next. Terry told him that the guy had gone over the mountain and headed for his hiding place. And the cat also told Jared the words he had heard from Klaus's mouth, and the Lord began to guess who he was talking about. The four-legged friend confirmed that it was exactly who Jared had described, and after that, Theory received a tasty treat and said that this strange guy had fled from here with his subjects. Jared was not amused by this information. He was sure that Klaus would go deeper into the camp that was set up here. But in the end, he just recognized the situation and slipped out from under their hands while they were actively watching him. But Terry jumped closer to him and asked if he could take Jared to the guy's hiding place. Jared was impressed by these words, despite the fact that the cat himself spoke very calmly and evenly. During the Battle of Armageddon, the name Klaus was very powerful. It was unrivaled. Hearing this name, people were terrified and coldness went down their spines. The Wailing Wall, that is, Lena, who was very strong, still seemed like an amateur in front of Klaus, but there was something that made Jared happy. Perhaps the great mage and leader of the Umbra sect was even weaker now, because there were still nine years before the events of the game, and maybe right now was the chance that needed to be used. In addition, Jared had recently been studying transcendental magic, which gave him a boost of confidence. All of his thoughts and affirmations were that they would seek out the demon's hideout as soon as possible and do their best. So with the cat on his shoulder, they set out on the mission together. It wasn't too far from where they were staying, but the sight of this hideout was a little overwhelming to Jared. But it was their hideout, and it was going to be hell for the average person who got inside. Jared got ready to go in on the count of three. Terry didn't seem to care, unlike the boy, who didn't care at all. At first, Jared began to call out the numbers quietly, but then he shouted the last one very loudly and burst inside, holding his staff at the ready. A light shone in front of him, and Jared took in all the details while Terry jumped off his shoulder and stood back, looking around calmly. There was something there that caught the boy's attention, and he looked to the side. There was no one here. All he could see was the camera. Of course, it wouldn't be that easy to face a powerful mage right away. Jared realized that he had a stalker of sorts and that he would be watching his every move to the last. Jared returned to his land quite quickly. Everyone was working hard to provide the refugees with the necessities. Many had already been given medicine for the infection and were waiting for the results, or at least statements from patients who said they felt better. Jared was very polite and gentle with everyone who came here from neighboring countries, which surprised people because they hadn't heard that from their rulers. But now something else was much more important. The Lord asked how the patient who had recently taken the potion was feeling. 
She did indeed feel her strength returning to her body, but it was an extremely heavy load on her body, weakened by the disease, and she was dizzy so much that she felt as if she was going to faint. Jared suspected that this might be due to a lack of potion tolerance, so he asked Hayes to use healing magic at a low level, the two of them having to mix their powers so that Hayes could conserve her mana because they still had a long way to go. The woman was almost falling, losing her last strength. Then the two came to their senses and instead of discussing, they started to act. Fortunately, Jared could use healing magic 365 days a year. Later they finished the session, but that was not all. Two people came to pick up Jared. They had been looking for him for a long time and they wanted to ask permission to work in the quarantine department. Marie and Maroon were very eager to help. The guy had general medicine skills, and the girl had the abilities of a healer and psychologist. They wanted to repay Jared's kindness in some way. The Lord remembered them. They were people he had recently healed, but they already looked as if they were completely healthy and full of energy. Jared was able to read their abilities with his spiritual eye, and these two were good candidates to help, because these skills are not often found especially since they could use a few pairs of hands right now. Marie and Maroon were brother and sister, and Jared knew that they still lacked something to become his seniors, but their abilities were more than enough to run the control tower in the field. He agreed, looking at the way they were eager to work, but he said that they shouldn't try to get in over their heads. This was the quarantine department, and their help should be within its limits for now. The Lord told them that whenever they went in or out of the ward, they would have to go through a magic circle to be disinfected. They were very happy that they would no longer be idle and promised that they would do everything possible for the patient's recovery. Marie, who has psychological skills, also said that she would support people so that they would not feel too lonely. Jared was undoubtedly pleased that these people were so motivated and it made him feel better. Together with Hayes, they decided to go for a walk to unwind after work. The girl's divine power turned out to be a necessity for the treatment of patients. Her abilities were irreplaceable. If not for her, the treatment would have been delayed three or more times. Hayes felt happy when she saw that she was saving the lives of these people. She was surprised by this power herself. It all developed very quickly and she realized for the first time that her power was a blessing for other people. Jared was pleased to see her grow. She improved and became stronger every day. She managed to overcome all obstacles and Hayes moved on with dignity. These compliments almost made her want to try even harder. Just 19 months ago, Hayes was an ordinary person working as a maid but now she has developed her healing abilities so well that she is a highly sought-after healer. The only thing that bothered him about the situation was that Hayes hadn't yet reached her first awakening, but all the time and effort she had spent on perfecting herself shouldn't be justified by her first awakening. Even her tenth wouldn't be enough. He stood there for a long time, just looking at her or somewhere else, his mind racing with different thoughts, not sure if his heart had the defense mechanism he knew it had. Jared took a step back, blushing slightly. He quietly started a conversation, saying that when he first got here, he didn't even have time to rest, but he kept thinking about how to show Hayes his appreciation for such a hard job. He started to say strange things that he didn't understand, but his mind was in chaos. Maybe it was all just a self-deception and what he was doing would not be enough. At the moment when Jared lowered his head, Hayes interrupted him and said that she had no idea what he was talking about now, but she believed that all his actions were right and would only lead Krivia to a better life, and his heart was beautiful to her. Then he stepped cautiously closer to Hayes, wanting to thank her from the bottom of his heart. There weren't any words Jared could say right now. There were so many thoughts running through his head that he didn't know which was right. But in any case, now he just wanted to say thank you. He kissed her lightly and lightly and said, thank you, softly. Hayes couldn't move now, couldn't speak either. What had just happened was a shock. And even more surprising was when, one by one, the signs with notifications began to appear. The first one saying that Hayes had received the 
kiss of the prince on a white horse, the defense mechanism that had been holding back all her inner desires and abilities was completely destroyed. Loyalty increased three times in a row, reaching its maximum, and after that, Hayes entered three stages of awakening at once. Jared was a little scared for the first time he had no idea what was going on, even though he knew the game inside and out. He had never heard of this title or the third awakening before. But in reality, he was lonely. Because of his crazy passion for the game and his long hours, he hadn't met anyone. So it was lucky that at least here he could kiss someone. Hayes suddenly started to fall over. For some reason, she was very sleepy. The third stage of awakening was something incredible, but he still didn't understand how it could happen after just one single kiss. He took Hayes to the room where Marie was and asked her to take care of her. Hayes hardly needed treatment. She just needed to rest and recuperate because her body was not expecting this and was instantly exhausted. Jared would have loved to stay by Hayes's side right now, but he needed to find something as soon as possible to turn the Sonari neighborhood into a world-class location for Radius Church. His target was the Platinum Holy Grail of Radius, one of the five holy relics of the church. It was hidden far in the north on the island of Tatar, which is the home of the Dark Elves. He had a very long way to go and had to cover the distance as fast as possible. It was his first trip across the sea, but there were no other ways to get there, only by crossing the sea. Now that Sonari's neighborhood has been cleaned up, they need to find the last piece of the puzzle. When they do this trick with the artifact, they will be able to give Sonari a divine blessing. The territory of the Dark Elves should not be an obstacle to this, so he confidently moved to the north. In the lands of Krivia, they continued to help people and many were getting better, but there were many who still needed more attention and treatment. In the Temple of Krivia, Two people stood in the middle of the dark hall, discussing something with each other, standing next to the only lights there. St. Luna noticed that the high priest of Krivia, Neode, had been very disturbed all day, and she asked if he was all right. She could tell that something was bothering him, but Neode replied that everything was fine. It was just that what Jared had said the other day was very strange, and no matter how much he thought about it, it was still bothering him. Two days ago, before the Lord left for the Dark Elves, he came to Neo to tell him something. Jared asked him to be quiet, saying that he had just received information that the Platinum Holy Grail of Radius was somewhere in the Sonari area. Jared wondered if Neode would be able to officially recognize the Sonar district as a holy place if he could find the item. The Grail was one of the artifacts that had been lost in the distant past. Due to wars, looting, and frequent robberies, and Jared finally decided that he had to find this relic. It was two days ago, and if he could actually find the relic, it would be a great blessing to their church. There was no arguing with that, it was the truth. But even though the power of the church was being used, Neo did not believe that Jared would succeed in bringing the grail here, because even the two saints could not do it. Yes, Jared was certainly a successful lord, wizard, and duke, and he still needed someone's help. But after the artifact is found, this place will become a holy cathedral, and the surrounding area will become a shrine. And in that case, the ruler himself can come here and put a sword to his neck, but the holy land will not move to another place. Once the valuable and long-lost artifact was found, the church would unanimously recognize it as a holy site. And Neod hoped that Jared would follow through. He wanted to see the holy grail with his own eyes. Luna was equally excited. It would be a great event if they managed to find such an important thing, and she would be able to see with her own eyes the relic she had dreamed of all her life. Though Neode hoped for the Lord's success, he assessed the situation as a whole and realized that it was unlikely. But Jared had gone there with such confidence that he had to prepare for his return. First, they should pull up all the archives containing the Platinum Grail and check them first. Jared kept moving forward across the sea, but crossing such a huge body of water at dawn and in the heavy rain was really scary and difficult. The only source of light was the moon, and below was pitch black, the black depths of the sea. 
but he had a good reason to keep moving forward because if the Holy Grail is still there, then unanimously Sonari will become a holy area. That's how much the Radius Church wants to get the holy artifacts. They had no holy relics to rely on, and that is the main reason why Radius was attacked by the Dark Church. The Church of Umbra and Kako has the Black Shroud of Umbra and a beautiful relic called the Skull of Kako. There was no rush to begin with, so the search for the next artifact was significantly delayed. But since Jared had decided to check out the Sonare area for a holy place, the artifact trick was the best option because time was now running out. Jared mentally turned to St. Radius. He hoped that he and these desires to transform the land would be understood. As the sun began to rise and the rain subsided, he found himself on Tatar Island. He took his first step into the land of the Dark Elves, having traveled so far across the sea. This place also brought a lot of trouble, back during the Battle of Armageddon. The Dark Elves teamed up with the Demon Army to attack the humans. The Demon Army is still considered the most powerful force and race, so it was not surprising that everyone perceives them that way. However, Jared, in his previous life, had researched the history of the Dark Elves and the one who published it did not think the same way as others. About four years later, the Dark Elves begin a full-fledged human trafficking operation after they let the decades-old law of the territorial sea slip. And thanks to this, the territories with which Krivia traded were able to obtain magical devices and weapons. The only problem was the greed of the stupid kings. Instead of paying a lump sum to buy the devices, they thought it would be much better to conquer the Dark Elves and take their knowledge. Jared remembered that this was precisely the reason why this race had given up theirs, as they no longer trusted humans, and why the elves sided with the Dark Army at the Battle of Armageddon. Anyway, Jared's intuition told him that he had already come to the place where the Holy Grail might be hidden. He put his palm to the trunk of the tree, feeling a very powerful energy from it, and the relic had to be right under it. He took a small shovel in his hand and started digging, it didn't take too long, he found it almost immediately. Now the boy held in his hand something that others had dreamed of at least seeing, something that was considered lost many years ago. Now all that remained was to check the Grail's parameters and name. But Jared heard a strange rustling behind him, something moving in the bushes. It scared him, and he gripped the artifact tighter, looking around. And when Jared looked up, he noticed that on top of it was the Tatra Nexus, the weapon that the Dark Elves used in the Battle of Armageddon, the ultimate in magical engineering. The transcendent body of Tatra Nexus was called Thanix, and then Jared hid. He didn't want to be caught by the locals. The truth is that Tanix are very frightening, regardless of a person's physical capabilities. The moment you put on a tonic, you can get more mobility and quick adaptation to various factors. But it was strange to see such a thing in front of him and Jared noticed that the creature was holding a test pistol. If he was in a game, he would have needed a pilot to maximize his combat capabilities, but there was no one there now. This made Jared feel even more nervous. Jared had a new idea. He wanted to take Tanix and do some research of his own. This was a chance to take his army to the next level, so he didn't think about it for long. As soon as Jared came out of his hiding place, he used mirror magic. At that very moment, this robot was right above his head. The object had only one goal in mind, to kill the target in front of it. Jared decided to turn back to disappear from the eyes of this creature. He hid behind a tree and watched it from there. However, he couldn't stay there for long because Tatra next noticed him and snuck after him. And only then did Jared start to run away. For a while, he just dodged him and tried to confuse him by circling over the treetops and climbing higher into the sky. Later, Jared finally came down to the ground and quickly ran into the forest, with Tatra next keeping pace and running right behind him. The boy saw that this object was about to catch up with him. The speed of this iron was higher than the usual human speed. Then Jared started running again, and the robot kept shouting only one word, KILL! When the blonde man hid behind a mahogany tree, Tetra Nex was almost immediately there, and that was the moment. Jared held up the hand on which he wore the Ring of Space and commanded Tanix to enter it. He couldn't see much around him, but it worked and Jared was almost there. 
He had almost no trouble getting Thanix out, and then he decided to hide the cup to be safe. The sign popped up again, with information about a new object that was now in the ring. The Thanex added the effect of maneuvers to the user up to five times. It could also be used to disrupt up to seven bombs that were created by condensing magical energy at a time. It could also give you better health, and it gave you the opportunity to protect your vulnerabilities with magic stones. Jared reread it all even though he remembered all the functions of this magical find. The Tanex was the creation of a very famous dark elf, Sabio, and he would probably be very angry if he found out that his creation had disappeared. Now Jared had it all, the sacred cup, and as a bonus Tanex, his goal was 200% accomplished. He had neither the desire nor the time to face the dark elves, so it was time to get out of here. But things weren't as great as he thought, he was being spotted. And this girl wasn't going to let Jared off easy. He was going to be an interesting opponent. Jared saw the terrifying creation of Tetranex and was not afraid to fight it alone. And he was able to take it for himself. He was definitely no ordinary person. Especially considering that he was able to reach their lands, which are accessible only through the Dark Sea. She couldn't see what he had dug up, but she assumed it was some kind of treasure. But that wasn't what mattered to her, so she decided to just forget about it. She wondered how Jared would do as a pilot. She pulled out a small remote control and began to press some buttons. After the screen came up, she entered a number and from that moment on, all the user's patterns and information would be transmitted in real time. This was enough for her. There hadn't been anyone worthy among the Dark Elves for a long time, so maybe there would be someone among the humans. Besides, it was a level 5 mage and she hadn't seen anything like it with her own eyes for a long time, so it was definitely going to be an interesting study. Jared had been flying for quite some time, so he decided that it would be safe to check all the notifications in this area. After Jared said that, he opened them in front of him but did not stop moving forward. In one moment, his divine power had increased by as much as 1,000 units, which would certainly help against the Knights of the Dark Orders, and it would also make it easier to fight evil monsters. So, from now on, he needed to continue pumping up his divine power. The use of this energy was very simple. If the enemy has the characteristic of evil, then in magic attacks and sword attacks, the damage will increase by a percentage equal to the number of divine energy. For example, if you use 100 units, it will be equal to 100% which means that the damage will increase by two times. If you use 900 units, the total damage will be increased by 10 times. Jared was indeed leveling up his abilities very quickly, even managed to get Tanex, so he hoped that he would be able to withstand level 7 mana. If you think about the next target, you can go to the kingdoms of Bonus and Malice without any three of them. Everything could be left to the Wanderers, and it was better to think about everything else later. The boy sped up and flew for a moment along the sea under the sun, which was only slightly covered by clouds in the sky. Luna saw what he was holding and quickly ran to the high priest Nyad. The man was still working on his papers when Luna ran into his office, breathless, unable to believe that Jared had done it. Luna caught her breath after running in quickly, but the news was worth it. Jared had found the sacred goblet of their order something to be proud of. Without realizing it, he asked if it was true, because it was beyond common sense that after all these years, when this grail had been called a lost artifact and never hoped to see with their own eyes, they now had it. Luna almost cried with happiness when she heard the news from Jared. Neod almost passed out on the spot, unable to believe that it had really happened. Jared did not even rest. He immediately gathered all those who served at the church near Lake Margarita, it was hard to believe that they were seeing such a valuable thing in their hands. People believed without a doubt that Jared was the one sent by Radius, because there was no other way to find this cup, this divine blessing. Right now, they were all staring at the Holy Grail, not taking their eyes off it, and it was something incredible. Jared didn't want to be called a messenger from a higher power or anything like that. He just wanted it confirmed that he had found the cup, and that was all, even though they had said that the grail was deep underwater and couldn't be found there. 
Jared had taken it out to make sure it was real, but he didn't see any problem in putting it back. Neod wanted to believe that Jared was the only one who knew about this place, and he couldn't let anyone else know where the cup was, not even Neod himself. Jared understood perfectly well what the high priest of Krivia wanted to convey with these words. Neod also added that during the night they had received a message from the Church of Radius in Transylvania that from now on, Lake Margarita and the lands around it were to be recognized as holy, that the grail was the perfect sacred object, and no one was to doubt its authenticity. This is the object from which the light of the radius itself comes. Now everything was complete. The high priest recognized this object as sacred. The man very carefully took the thing in his hands. A very powerful and light energy was coming from the cup. Everyone who served at the church was delighted and very happy to hear that Neod recognized the cup. Radius presented his gratitude to the ruler of Krivia, and the others began to shout Jared's praise and admiration. Neod also could hardly hold back his tears, feeling a strong surge of happiness. He thanked the Lord once again and wished him that the blessing would continue to stay with him and accompany him wherever he went. In fact, Jared could feel the blessing flowing throughout his body just by saying that, and at that moment he felt a certain peace, and his divine power immediately increased. Although it could not be raised by points, it increased by as much as fifty points. The head must personally come to this place to confirm the validity of the proclamation of these places as holy. Now Jared had to prepare properly for his visit. Neod hoped for his Lord, and he was also very grateful because this was a very important find for the church. Jared could be relied on to make Sanari a holy place, and he would get it done no matter what it took, because after that, the divine energy would have no end. And there was one more thing he wanted to check immediately. Since Sanari was now a holy place, Jared was curious to see how the status had changed. He almost fainted when the window of the holy site appeared before him. Of course, this window was different from the others only in that it included the sacred faith, but the name Holy Sight Window sounded so special that his heart involuntarily began to beat faster. The beginning had been laid. There was still a lot to be done on this land, and the characteristics were all very low, so it would take a long time and hard work, but there was a silver lining because the gods were showing interest in this place. In fact, there were many gods who were watching this world with interest. And the fact that he had died of extreme overwork in his previous life and was miraculously able to start over must have had something to do with the influence of a god. However, he would never have been able to find out which of the four categories did this and gave him a new life. There were four groups in total, the lowest, middle, highest, and most powerful. The first sacred land of the strongest order in Nars, the Order of Radius, if developed, this project will bring a lot of money in the future, so Jared thought about organizing an even larger project. They say that a crisis gives you new opportunities, so he got them. Of course, compared to the crisis, the opportunity he got was much bigger, but there was something else, and this something was keeping him awake at night. He had a new enemy, and not just anyone, but Klaus himself, a powerful magician who would never give up. Soon it was completely dark and Jared entered one of the tents in Sanar. It was the middle of the night and it was just the two of them, so it was a strange atmosphere. Ella was holding a glass of the red wine she loved so much and congratulated Jared on finding the sacred goblet. Perhaps the most joyous news she had heard, Ella was the head of training for the Agressio Civil Guard. And indeed, it may feel like something new to her, because her faith is much stronger than any other. For her, the radius is both the beginning and the end of her life, and the main reason why she hates the Dark Lord Order so much. Jared reached for his empty glass to drink some wine as well. This was the one meeting with the Lord that was so hard to see in person, so there was no way she was going to miss this opportunity to have a drink with him. Jared asked Ella how she was going to develop her relationship with Chloe in the future, and then took a sip of his drink. She wondered if this was a topic that was not the most pleasant for her. September was about to start, there were only four days of summer left, and the official end date of the contract would be the first day of autumn. They had already finished talking about mutual agreements. 
and when the contract comes to an end, they will all go their separate ways. Chloe was a great student. Ella finished all the wine that was left in her glass. She used to think that if you told Chloe one thing, she would understand a few more points, even a little greedy. A student from the Grey Elves is something special, and she was really very talented, embracing on the way and striving for more every day. Jared was only interested in one thing. He didn't see the point in letting go of such a capable student, but Ella replied that she had taught Chloe everything she could teach herself. And there was one more very important thing. Chloe had an even better mentor than she did. Jared was a little embarrassed. It was awkward to ask about such things, but he asked if she was talking about him now, and Ella calmly confirmed it. After Chloe started studying with Jared personally, her abilities began to develop at a tremendous rate, so much so that Ella was even ashamed that she had taught her so few techniques in the entire year. Ella loved money, but being a warrior was much more important to her, so she decided to let Chloe go, and now the elf is free to choose her own path. Jared's chest tightened. Ella cared about her student very much. She was a great mentor, so he decided it would be better to close the topic. However, Ella liked that Jared was so calm about such things. The past should stay in the past and not interfere with the present. In fact, Jared hadn't asked her here tonight to talk about Chloe. He pulled out another bottle of alcohol. There was something that needed to be discussed in confidence. Ellie thought it was strange that he said that usually Jared would talk to someone else, and the fact that he wanted to talk to her about something secret now struck her. Jared immediately got to the point. He knew that soon they would be attacked by the Umbra Order. He couldn't even guess what the exact scale would be, but he was nine out of ten sure that something would definitely happen. This is Klaus. He is specifically waiting for a moment of happiness and joy to sneakily ruin everything, so one could only expect that he would not miss the moment when Sanark became a sacred land. Ella understood what he was getting at. He needed her experience in fighting the Dark Orders, which had already been accumulated over the years of fighting, and Jared confirmed that a crisis could come to the lands of Sanark, but thanks to this chance they could defeat the followers of the Dark Forces. Another glass was empty and she asked what Jared knew about Klaus. Jared knew enough about him. Clouseau was the second in command of the Umbra sect, a man with gray hair and a bandage that helped conceal his identity. It was strange to hear him say such things, something that could only be learned by penetrating the heart of the Umbra. Jared immediately thought of a way to justify this moment and said that he had simply had a great interest in the Dark Orders since childhood, and that was why he knew such facts. But this answer did not dampen Ella's interest. But in any case, she was willing to do what she could. Jared smiled as he began to tell her that Umbra had a very large army, but not enough money, so he suggested using the Golden Stones as a trap to lure Klaus and his men here. And as always, Jared guaranteed a good salary for the work done. Ella's eyes lit up the moment she saw a large bag filled with gold coins in front of her. Ella was ready to get started and asked Jared if he was free tonight. The question stumped him, and he was embarrassed and unable to answer, his face and eyes showing that he was in a state of shock. So Ella added that she would like to discuss the tactics and strategy of her actions, because an operation of such a large scale needs to be analyzed to the smallest detail. If some point is not worked out, then only one problem will happen later. Jared laughed slightly, pretending that everything was fine and agreed to talk to her. Two days had passed since then, and more and more deliveries were being made in Sonare. Jared continued to make the potion and sell it to the neighboring kingdoms. There were also a lot of pure magic stones in Sinar, which helped Jared a lot in his defense. A lot of provisions and gold bars and coins were brought into the territory. And today, it was time to go into battle. Ella was ready to make sure that the next shipment of food would reach them in one piece. The Agressio guards cheered her on with loud shouts, but her facial wound still hurt from time to time. Jared had managed to do this during their training, so she must have underestimated his abilities. But in that case, and with those capabilities, Klaus would be hard to get to. He was definitely even stronger than Jared. Then it definitely wasn't the level 1 missiles that Ella had initially thought. 
If they were just magic missiles, there wouldn't have been more than five of them, and she counted at least eighty. She smiled. It was a shameful past, but as she said, the past should stay there. So Ella confidently exclaimed that right now they were starting their operation. She gave the order to speed up so that even if someone was hunting them, Ella and Agresio could trap them and kill them. Each of them had to focus on the front line and not look around. The warriors heard her order and prepared to fight. Ella turned her back to them and stood in front of them. These were the last moments before the war against the great wizard began. The Agresio were a special and well-trained unit who were knee-deep in the sea, had excellent weapons of the highest level and perfect armor. Their red flag had the emblem of a black lion, which symbolized power. She was also well fortified, especially since she had a lot of experience in fighting. Now she wondered how Jared would finish the job when she and the army where she was a trainer had led Klaus and his aides to a dead end. The deliveries continued unabated. The carriages traveled to Sennar, and Jared watched them closely, flying high in the air. Now he was using a magic that was only available at level 5, invisibility magic, a good way to hide from prying eyes. As long as he did not attack or change his position, he could maintain this state, although it had to be renewed every minute by using magic. However, he knew that whoever attacked now must know that each of them would be mixed with the mud. To put it more precisely, they want to make them angry on purpose. They have prepared very well, so if the whole plan goes wrong, it will be quite sad and unpleasant. They have spent enough time. There was also a small problem. They had one guy who came here a little early. They expected him to come here a little later. He was a dark demon. He belonged to the Umbra Order, but he was covered from head to toe in a veil, and even Jared didn't know anything about his abilities even though he had spent most of his life behind the paradise. And also, if we take into account the story, he is an extremely cruel killer whom no one could defeat. After the players killed Klaus, then after the update, he became the new boss. And after that, Jared died from overwork, so the information ended at that point. Suddenly, Agresio's warriors informed Jared that a very large force was coming from the right. The soldiers of the Umbra army were approaching them with great speed. There were so many people that it was hard to tell. A large explosion had completely blocked the passage, so they couldn't move any further. Jared gritted his teeth. It was so mean, but he had ideas for such cases, and it seemed that their time had just come. The followers of the Dark Order who had sold their souls to the devil had no future when they faced off against the army of Krivia. He picked up a staff that could increase his mana and swore that he would not leave a single living soul among these scum. At sunset, as Klaus stood in the middle of the broken gorge, he realized that it had all been done on purpose. And most likely someone knew he was coming here, and that's why they had prepared a trap and waited for the mage to fall into it. Jared was a true master. He impressed Klaus with his actions and his brave desire to win, and if Klaus hadn't brought along the meat that was simply thrown forward, it would have been very sad. There had never been anyone so clever here before, so Lord Curve had become interested in the Dark Wizard. However, Jared irritated Klaus very much, and with his antics he could easily get out of any difficult situation. Later, Clouseau was holding a small dagger in his hand. In memory of those 500 dead soldiers whom Agresio had killed in a few strokes, and he wanted to give them a real hell. In the middle of the open paths, where two armies were now fighting, ready to kill each other and tear each other to pieces, Umbra wanted only to kill these creatures. They had to disappear into the true darkness and disappear from the face of the earth forever. Jared was taking this seriously, but why call them filthy creatures when you could simply describe them as enemies. Now was the time to use his new power that he had gained from the last raid. His power had increased by six times, so he used a magic penetrating missile. This confused the warriors from Umbra. In the past, there was no such powerful magic at all, and no one was prepared for such attacks. And all of this was true, because Jared is the only one who has the ability to use this superpower, this unique ability. The magical missiles moved like raindrops, 
so it was very difficult to follow them, and the weapon itself was like a strong gust of wind. In addition, this spell was enhanced by special penetrating arrows. With their help, the arrows could be sent in different directions, light and untraceable. His next move was to use another spell, and he doubled the number of penetrating arrows. The Umbra warriors didn't know where to go. They were dead anyway. Jared would kill them now. And if they came back with nothing, Clus would. But it was better to be burned by Jared's arrows in an instant and not suffer. They fell to their knees without strength, and someone was unconscious or even dead. Klaus offered to seize the lands where such a powerful magician existed. They considered him a traitor and completely crazy because of this. But Jared was happy with the outcome of the battle, because Klaus's huge army hadn't even had time to start a normal war and was already lying here on the ground. Their target, Jared, hadn't been touched at all, but it wasn't the end of the fight against Umbra. The main mage he had to face was standing behind him. Klaus, he had met him and seen with his own eyes this mage who was considered the most powerful dark force in paradise. Now they both stood among dozens of his dead warriors. Jared once again used his advantage, which he had gained at the very beginning of his life inside the game, and scanned Klaus. Now, at level 235, the mage was a brutal killer, terrorist, and propagandist, and a very confident man who saw no obstacles in his life, and if there were, Clouseau easily got rid of them. The dagger that the magician held in his hand had a very strong strike, even critical for opponents, and he wore a ring on his finger that weakened the enemy's buffs and armor. One can only dream of an alliance with someone who possesses this power, but as an enemy, it is almost like throwing yourself into the clutches of death. Clouseau calmly walked a few steps closer to Jared, who had already spent so much time just looking at him. Jared looked down at the staff in his hand, which was increasing the amount of mana he had left untapped. Clouseau approached him again, and then Jared began to slowly back away, which made him want to destroy him even more, because to Clouseau, his enemy trying to move away looked very insignificant in his eyes. All Jared could do was fall to his knees and beg for mercy, but he was already too late. When the boy had gotten far enough away, he kicked up the sand with his foot and aimed it at Klaus. It looked like a joke to the little idiots, but the wizard covered his face from the sand and wanted to show Jared all the sorrow that life has to offer. The wizard stepped back and used his passive skill, the separation technique. Jared knew about it from his past life. It was neither magical nor physical. It was a mixed technique, which was why it was difficult to resist. Of course, the best option was to just kill him right there, but if he couldn't show him that trick, then the ring was definitely his target. Klaus was tired of waiting for Jared to do anything. He was hoping for some fun and adrenaline in this battle, for a victory, but definitely not for his opponent to stare at him for minutes and stand there silently. There were now many Klaus clones around Jared, and he couldn't tell the difference between the real Klaus and the real one. Suddenly, one of the clones lunged at Jared with a dagger and he quickly jumped back, flying into the air. Yet Jared was not as simple a man as it might sometimes seem. He was not confused. He had a plan. And this plan looked brilliant in his head, so he said just one word and teleported, causing Klaus to lose sight of him. Jared was right behind him, and it happened in just a moment. The magician was even more amazed by such actions. The Lord quickly grabbed him by the neck and arm to prevent him from stabbing him and Klaus didn't understand how Jared managed to recognize the real him among all the clones. Jared was squeezing his neck tighter and tighter, cutting off his breathing, and Clouseau's self-confidence and determination evaporated as Jared began to show his abilities. He reminded him of how he had recently pelted him with sand, and there was a shiny dust in that sand, magic like that, which made it possible to tell where the clones were and where the magician himself was. All the moves were thought out in advance. Jared knew that Klaus was just perfect in the distribution technique, and he also knew that this technique had a drawback, a weakness. If the original, creating the copies, did not notice that something had changed, then these changes would not be reflected in the clones. Therefore, completely unnoticed by Klaus, 
Jared was able to find the real one when he simply examined the cloak where the gold dust was located. Having finished his explanation, Jared put his hands on Klaus's shoulders and used penetrating telekinesis. From his hands came bright rays of green that glistened in the sun. There was a big plus here, because thanks to the magical force of gravity, fashion can add considerable momentum to penetrating telekinesis. There was even evidence somewhere that one such strike could produce a momentum of 86, and even if the body of the person being hit by the magic was very trained and hardy, this momentum would be just enough to knock out the enemy. And of course, Jared had also taken the ring before sending Klaus on his merry way. Jared had collected a lot of these artifacts, but he never had too many. And it was good that now he had a debuff to add to his collection, and he was also lucky enough to get the ring much easier than he thought. But while Jared was admiring the jewelry, Klaus had already come to his senses and reached out for the artifact that belonged to him. He returned quickly. In fact, Jared had expected a slightly longer effect from his magic, but apparently Klaus was indeed too strong a magician for such an effect to last long. The wizard was already subject to this magical force of gravity, but he had never felt anything like what Jared had made him feel before. This was the first time it had happened. Jared didn't understand why Klaus was picking on him so much, especially not with a fight, but simply asked where the source of his powers was hidden. Klaus didn't wait for an answer and immediately asked another question, wondering if there was someone in the Radius Church who could create a final covenant and share his powers. But Jared wasn't going to tell him anything about it. Instead, he just called his army completely pathetic and dropped Klaus's hands from his shoulders. The mage was too tired to continue the fight, which hadn't even begun. Jared had offered him one thing. If Klaus managed to defeat him, all of Jared's soldiers would become his army, which should have made the mage fight harder. But then the boy glanced at Klaus's dagger, which he kept on the post. All this time, no one had wanted to see and discover the true and full powers of Clouseau that he had been hiding. In the last few decades, no one had ever seen Clouseau use his magically transformed body. Jared prepared himself that Clouse would soon be attacked. The boy stepped back a little for safety. And then Klaus's body began to gradually transform. His hands grew larger, and Jared watched with horror and some curiosity. In a few more seconds, the magician was completely transformed into a large monster, a rather frightening sight. But Jared could not take his eyes off what was happening in front of him. As soon as the transformation was complete, Klaus was at it again, shouting death wishes at Jared. He ran right at him and continued to growl like a beast. It was good that Jared was a little farther away from Klaus, and he managed to use the spatial portal door that appeared right in front of him. And then, more and more of these doors appeared, spreading them everywhere as Klausy moved closer by the second. For a brief moment, the monster stopped, seeing the doors of the tenth dimension in front of him, as if he began to go even more insane. He was now completely possessed by aggression and evil, most of all, he wanted to defeat the one who had destroyed his army and disrupted his plans. But Jared's desire to win was also very great. He wanted to do everything in his power, to give his best to prevent the plans of the Dark Church of Umbra from becoming a reality on the Nars continent. Gathering all his strength in his fist, Jared loudly shouted a spell to double the world arrow. Everything around him caught fire. He stood among the fire creating a large sphere of flame. Klaus stopped this move. He had already learned that Jared was a strong and difficult opponent, not like the others, but this fireball scared him too much and was a very powerful spell even for a powerful mage. And perhaps this was the first time that this had ever happened, as Clouseau himself had never seen such a thing before, and he was witnessing someone using such a rare technique. In addition, Klaus was constantly watching the spatial doors. He could not understand what was going on here. Since there were so many of them, it was impossible to understand which portal was connected to which one, and this was a disincentive for the magician to fight to the fullest, because all his thoughts were occupied with not getting into these portals. Jared was only a fifth-level mage, at first glance, not even on the level of Klaus. 
the leader of the Umbra sect, and Klaus could only rely on the strength of his altered body. This might be the last battle of the great mage, but he wanted to kill Jared even if he died in the process. The boy could see that the big monster was already closing in on him, so he cast another spell that created even more spatial doors and doubled light arrows. Klaus didn't let this stop him. He was only motivated by the desire to end this battle with a victory, so he kept going. As soon as the magician got close enough to him, and there were only a few meters between them, Jared used teleportation to get behind Klaus, who was about to jump on him. The spatial doors began to merge into a single one, the magic working. She began to pull Klaus towards her, not letting go of him. He could not get out of the spell's grip. His body was covered with scratches, and the opponent's magic was beginning to drain him, but he did not want to submit to Jared's power so easily. But with every second he seemed to lose the ability to move, as if something was holding him back. Besides, he was stuck in place, and now it was impossible to move at all. The magician tried his best to get out, and Jared calmly approached him from behind, using telekinesis to immobilize the monster and take away his ability to move. And to be more precise and more detailed to this description, now Klaus's body was controlled by telekinesis, and he was in Jared's hands, and now this telekinesis made the magician stand still. Without losing this opportunity, Jared approached him, using the magic of light arrows. He shot them straight at Klaus's body, which was barely able to move. It was something incredible and almost impossible, a powerful mage standing in front of Jared, who was only level five, but winning. Clouseau was getting more and more tired as the fight went on. The monster, even if he ran it all through his head a hundred times and assumed that Jared could be a level six mage, still couldn't believe such power. It was too much for such magic. Jared's magical abilities were on a completely different level compared to the time when the guy was killing Klaus's followers. Most likely his level was about two times higher than before, and it seemed that Jared's mana had no limits at all. After making these assumptions, the transformed Clouseau looked Jared up and down, holding the staff of Mudidas, the Ring of Deluca on one finger and the Ring of Absolute Weakening on the other. Then Jared approached the mage from behind, using the Ring of Total Weakening. With this artifact, one could completely destroy one's enemy if one used the opportunity correctly. Klaus still couldn't move, but now not only was magic an obstacle, he was very impressed that Jared had learned the capabilities of this ring. Now the great wizard's body began to deform again, and Jared stepped away from him, completing the spell. Klaus tried his best to fix everything and defend himself. He wanted to use a defensive stance, but he was unable to complete the spell. Jared felt victory was already in his hands. Clouseau looked so pitiful and worthless and seemed to have completely lost his mind, afraid to play and die. Then Jared decided to end the fight by picking up a knife. The wizard could only move his eyes now, and he saw that Jared was holding a stellade. It was a magical tool of Master Bullet, a thing made of stellade, a material stronger than the soul stone, and it could even cut the stone, engrave a mark on it, or a magic circle. It could also be used to inflict a fatal wound that would leave the opponent bleeding to death. Jared added a few words after he stabbed him. He said that if Klusk's body had been transformed as before, this knife would not have been able to hurt him too badly, and it would definitely not have been fatal. But since Jared had used total destruction, the mage was now completely defenseless against him. Jared had already walked away, but suddenly remembered something else when he turned to Klaus. He sat down next to him, saying that he would take his dagger for himself. Klaus was still bleeding, holding on with his last strength, and even breathing was difficult because of the wound. Jared took the mage's weapon and stabbed him in the back. He did it to make sure that he was finished and that Klaus would never again interfere with the peaceful life of the Nars continent. The mage screamed out loud in great pain. Many innocent people died or suffered from the actions of Klaus, who was greedy and cruel, committed evil at every opportunity and abused others, so he could hardly ever repent for his actions. Klaus's body transformed back to its normal form. The magician fell to the ground. He still had no strength to start and continue the fight, 
But Jared's speech even made him laugh a little, and he was amused that someone like Jared was still a common lord of a small territory of the kingdom of Crivia. Finally, he added that if he had known at the beginning that Jared would be such a powerful mage and that Klaus would not be able to defeat him, he would not have tried to fight him. Jared also wouldn't have started all this if he was sure that Clouseau was too strong an opponent. Surprisingly, Clouseau was the only one who fully knew the full capabilities of these rings. He tried to say something else, but Jared spoke first. He said sternly that Clouseau's body would be decapitated and then sent all over the land so that people could express all their anger. Klaus laughed again. He didn't understand what it would do for these insignificant little people to take out their anger and rage on a corpse. Even if they did, it wouldn't bring back those who had already died at Klaus's hands. They died because they were weak and not good enough for Clouseau. The magician started laughing again. He was losing the feeling in his limbs. Jared agreed that they would not get anything out of it by hating on his corpse. It would not help. Suddenly, Jared walked over to Klaus again and sat down next to his body. The magician didn't understand what was happening. Jared put his hand to his heart, using the magic of total healing. Clouseau mockingly asked why Jared would save him after saying that. But Jared reassured him, saying that he would die anyway. But it wouldn't happen until he let it. He wanted to make Clouseau feel insane and unbearable pain. But still, the mage would continue to live to go through the hell he had created for decades for other people. Clouseau fell silent as he looked at Jared who was healing him. And since Klaus was now okay, Jared could do it again until the pain subsided. This went on for many times. Jared would abuse him again and again and then heal him and make him feel the pain again. And even if Klaus wanted to die, he could not do so without Jared's personal permission, and that was the way hell was for Klaus. The wizard begged Jared to kill him and not torture him anymore. So Jared took pity. This suffering would not be enough to pay for all the deaths of innocent people. The guy took a recording device and told Klaus to repent of all his sins before him so that all people could see it. Klaus didn't want to do it. He killed those who deserved it and he deserved it because he was a weakling who didn't deserve such happiness as life. Jared took the magician's already powerless body, telling him to say his last words. All Klaus said was that even if he died, the Umbra sect would still exist and would definitely avenge the murder. But that only made Jared feel better and more satisfied, because he hated people like these sectarians to his very bones. He wanted to put an end to all those who sided with evil with Clouseau and followed the dark faith of the Umbra Church. Clouseau laughed again, this time in agony, as he said that he would be waiting for Jared in the other world, in hell, where they would meet. Jared's only reply was that he had no desire to follow Clouse to hell. He didn't think he deserved it. When the boy put Clouse's dagger to his throat, the magician cursed him. He hated this bastard who started protecting weak people. At this moment, signs appeared in front of Jared's face, the bark notifying him that he had reached level 100, but the boy decided to postpone checking the status window for now. First, he had to get Klaus's body out of here. Jared exhaled a calm breath, realizing that everything was over and that his main and most powerful enemy was already dead. It was time to return to the real battlefield now. Ella and the knights had become mere spectators at some point, and Jared didn't need any help, even if he was fighting alone, in front of Agresio and their coach. When the fire came, they stepped back a bit. But after that, the soldiers began to overwhelm their lord. There were top-level mages and those who were considered invincible, but their lord was the best of them all, and the fact that Klaus the king of evil and chaos, himself died at his hands would be a real sensation. Jared said it was all right. Now Klaus was dead and no longer causing trouble across the continent. The other supporters of the Umbra sect were extremely angry, excited, but now very helpless. They could not believe their eyes as they watched their leader die. Ella herself could hardly believe that such a magician had been killed in front of her eyes and she was glad that it had ended that way because she hated everyone who represented the dark forces. Jared flew up into the sky, shouting that none of the representatives of the dark church of Umbra would escape his eyes. 
they would all be punished for all the evil they had done. They will all be punished for the crimes they have committed against innocent people. And that punishment must be death, for nothing short of death can redeem the lives of the dead. So, without wasting any time, Jared used his magic again to put an end to the terrorists. Jared's movements and magic made it impossible to even touch him, as he was in the midst of daggers being thrown in all directions as if he were in a dance. The lives of Umbra's followers came to an end in a split second when he used magic against them. Jared killed 1,000 people and was promoted to the rank of executioner, after which he was awarded the new title of Devil's Game, and his spiritual eye level was increased to 100. Without waiting, Jared used the new spell along with the triple spiritual eye. He had never expected to get his hands on the Devil's Game, such a powerful force. This is an artifact that is produced after killing 1,000 people at once. It means that 10,000 people killed would be equal to 8 stars, 100,000 would be 9 stars, 1 million would be 10 stars, and he was showing that this was the score. Behind Jared stood Ella and the Agressio soldiers. She was very surprised to see him. She quickly approached him, asking how he had managed to defeat Klaus and the entire army of this powerful magician. He smiled, saying that it was simply the skills and experience he had gained. The only answer was between himself, who had gained the spell of space. There was too much difference between what had happened here. The Church of Radius would definitely have been very grateful to Jared after he killed Klaus and all of his minions. Jared had destroyed someone who had been ruining everyone's lives and killing innocents for so many years, and he had kept the people of the mainland in fear. Jared thanked Ellie for the praise. Being Klaus's executioner was something special for him because he had always been the main enemy of the Radius Church. It was a great honor that he was the one who ended the suffering of the people and freed them from the grip of fear that enveloped the entire Nars continent. Later, they returned, taking Klaus's corpse with them. And now the events were taking place near an antique shop. Someone entered the dark room, which was slightly covered with cobwebs, wearing a black cloak with a hood. A girl sitting in the middle of the room said that it was okay to call her by her first name now because this was a personal meeting. The dark hood hid someone's face and the figure quietly spoke Linkisa's name. The black mantis had called her by her first name so many times and Linkisa wanted to know her real name, not to use this nickname all the time. But black mantis was the only name the man had ever been called. Linkisa smiled as she said that it was only a nickname. She was still trying to find out what this mysterious man's real name was, and maybe it would be better to even choose something else. If it was an order, Mantis would agree, but if it was just advice, he would object. This person hadn't changed, but Linkisa had been calling her Ward Mantis for so many years that she was used to it. But that wasn't what she wanted to talk about. Linkisa wanted to talk about the fact that Klaus was already dead. The Black Mantis knew about it. The information had already been passed on and they had all the latest news. And they also knew that it was that same bastard Jared who was behind it all again. And besides the fact that this small kingdom lord had taken all of Klaus's artifacts, Jared had also displayed the mage's corpse on all the streets of the cities. Linkisa held up her hand saying that she had ordered all of Jared's movements to be reported to her. Otherwise, not knowing about his idiotic plans could have ended badly. The Black Mantis then asked about the Oath of Allegiance, to which Linkisa replied that she had received it when the Klaus sect surrendered. In any case, they weren't happy with him either, so there was no other way out. Umbra had lost a key face in their sect, and that would definitely affect their pay, an outcome that was very ironic. But that was life, after all. The church was also a place where people ruled, and the girl also wanted to talk about the position of deputy. The black mantis immediately replied that he would rather refuse such an honor. The head asked if the mantis was really planning to become a deputy in the future. However, the mysterious person said that he did not like such positions, especially since everyone is now busy trying to destroy the dark church and there was trust in the current deputy who was already known to everyone. Mantis pulled off his hood and showed his face, saying that he wasn't going to act like Klaus and go crazy over Jared. 
So the best option was to finish all of his and focus all of his attention on Jared to find out all the information about him. From the day he was born to the day he died, he needed to know everything. And there was another topic of conversation, namely that the Church of Radius had recognized Sonare as holy ground, and now the area would receive more attention than usual, so it was time to lay low. Still, it was a good thing they hadn't needed Klaus's help in the first place, and now they hadn't lost too much. However, Lenkisa did not want to lose another strong person, so she advised Mantis not to overdo it, even though she did not know what the life of her ward was worth. Lenkisa exhaled, saying that sometimes she wondered if God really existed. Too many people had died just because of the name Dark Church. Mantis, as always, calmly replied that it all depends on whether she believes in it or not, but whatever it is, or wherever other deities other people believe in, the god Mantis believes in is right in front of her eyes. Lenkisa smiled and took this as an attempt at flirtation. However, this thought was too stereotypical. It was not in this man's style to praise people for nothing. Ending the conversation, the Black Mantis said not to look for her until he could complete his investigation. As for Jared, it would take quite some time. Linkus was sometimes annoyed by such coldness, and there was no need to pretend to be such a hard-working person in front of her. She would also be fighting in the dungeon tomorrow, and the head of the church was talking about the cave of the Spider Queen Morgina. She was going to meet the Red Queen there, and they planned to attack the dungeon together. The Mantis was worried about this security. This Spider Queen and her wards are very dangerous people. But Lenkisa proudly stated that this was not the first time she had contacted her, so there was no need to worry. Lenkisa was the head of the Umbra Church, which meant that she was the one who held everything together, so she shouldn't be so safe. The whining and unnecessary words were getting to her, and she yelled at her to go where she was going and leave her alone. Once the red-haired girl was alone in the room, she breathed a sigh of relief. Her hatred for Jared grew, even his simple name irritated Linkisa, but she knew that she would kill him one day, no matter what the cost. Later, as the summer ended and September 1st arrived, Jared was at the main mansion in Krivia. He had been so busy delivering and reading the new First Awakening alerts that he hadn't had time for anything else. The notifications kept coming, but the one that caught his eye the most was the one in the golden frame. Jared had once again received the new title of First Crisis Survivor, and he was drawn to it primarily because he knew that the system in Paradise only gives out this title when a player has an important change. He also received a part of the map of Tristis Island as a reward. Jared took the paper in his hands, looking at all the markings there, and at the same time he tried to remember what kind of island it was. This island was not very far from the lands of Krivia. It was located to the west of the continent of Nars, and there was a large continental dungeon called the Great Labyrinth of Nars. However, what he had just been given was a map that could destroy part of this labyrinth, a place that attracted absolutely every player in paradise. Seeing this place seemed to be a real challenge and simply impossible to pass by. The Great Labyrinth of Nars is a very notorious dungeon with many deaths. First of all, it is a structure that goes down underground to suit its creator's tastes, and Jared liked their prisons very much. At the underground entrance was a measuring door that changed color every minute. This meant that the labyrinth that a person entered a minute ago and the labyrinth that he would enter the next minute were completely different places. The starting point of the dungeon was connected to a spatial door and it also changed its color. The problem was that it was impossible to match the type and color of the door, and even when preparing for an attack in accordance with the type A maze, you could end up in a type Z maze due to simple bad luck. If yesterday the light door was type A, today it might be a dark measured door. However, now he had the solution to this labyrinth, the initial instructions, the correlation between the date, the color of the portal, and the type of labyrinth, all of which was classified information. The Great Labyrinth of Nars belongs to absolutely all people on the continent and should not be subject to any concerted force or country, 
the forces and countries that violate this law and occupy the great labyrinth of NARS will be expelled by joint forces from the entire continent of NARS. They will be considered as mean, greedy, and evil criminals, so anyone could judge him and not sacrifice their honor. This was very important information that no one else had access to, but Jared realized that he couldn't attack the maze right now, so it was better to wait for the right time. Besides, he remembered that Chloe should have come to see him by now, but she wasn't here yet. She was standing right outside the door, very nervous, and that's why she couldn't get in. Suddenly, Hayes approached Chloe, who was already on edge, and started asking her questions about when she would return. Chloe became even more nervous, saying that she had just come here, and Hayes exclaimed that she should go to the Lord immediately, not hang around here. She smiled and said that Chloe had been waiting for Jared for a long time, and she wanted to take her out, but Chloe stopped her. She was worried that Jared might order her to leave the mansion. Chloe's feelings were surprising to Hayes, but then she continued to talk and said that she would like to learn some more things from Jared. Hayes listened to her and told her that she didn't need to worry. She should just tell Jared what she was telling her now. She shouldn't keep these worries and feelings inside. Hayes advised her to be honest and tell the truth. After wishing Chloe good luck and courage, Hayes quickly ran down the hall to her room. She had to practice to continue to improve her skills. The elf was left alone. She tried to calm down and soon entered Jared's office, starting to talk. Jared asked her how her training was going, and if she had practiced deception and disguise, Chloe answered quietly enough that she practiced every day. Then he decided to move on to the topic that was on her mind, because Jared could see that she still had some questions. Jared continued to talk, and Chloe, as always, answered briefly, often with just one word, yes. This made him jokingly consider calling her a yes-yes bot, and she laughed, saying that she would then answer the opposite to his last question. They soon put these jokes aside and got down to the topic that had brought Jared to see her today. He could really use her skills in the future. The mansion needed talented people with great potential like her. Of course, he knew she was a gray elf and could return to her clan's lands at any time. But even though he knew that, Jared was proposing. Chloe left her hometown to gain new experiences in the human world, and from now on, everything that happens inside and outside the mansion will greatly expand her knowledge. The Great Labyrinth of Nars was the dungeon that Jared wanted to clear before he died, and Chloe would be a great help in this endeavor. That night he talked about this situation with Ella, and it seemed that Chloe would accept his offer after all. She thought about it, but she was very insecure. Chloe had never thought about it, so she thought it wouldn't work out and she wanted to leave tomorrow. Jared froze in his tracks. Hearing her confess this, it sounded very strange. In fact, based on what he had heard yesterday, Hayes, Isabel, and Lena were planning to attack the Nightmare Forest. He was beginning to think that she was raising the price just to keep herself alive. Then Jared exhaled, smiled, and told Chloe that she was worrying too much about the situation. The elf was indeed the right character for him, so she could stay here as long as he needed. Jared wanted her to help him with the mansion and in the battles. Despite the fact that Chloe was indeed a strong warrior, she did not believe in her own strength, so the fact that she was needed here was very impressive to her. She looked down, not knowing what to say or do. Chloe was worrying too much and imagining non-existent scenarios, sometimes shaking from such experiences, so Jared tried to somehow convince her that she was really needed here. There was no one around who specialized in murder and disguise as well as Chloe. And that wasn't all. Jared was trying hard to convince her to stay. She looked up at him again, waiting to see what Jared would say this time. In addition to his own advice, he was going to find someone who could be a better teacher for her. Jared promised to look into the matter and do so within a year. He wasn't lying. Jared really wanted to give his students everything he could to improve her level. The guy promised that this person would teach evil even more than Ella herself. He already had a candidate for this role for Mito, now 70 years old and someone who had spent his entire life following the path of the assassin to achieve his goal. Unfortunately, Formido was not present in 1424 at the Battle of Armageddon. 
The man died of illness when he was 79. In any case, he suggested that Zlaya should stay and not worry about anything. Such a choice would soon give her irreplaceable experience. One could think of it as a queen's class. Chloe wasn't sure about queen, however, because she had two older brothers and would most likely be crowned the eldest in the family. However, Jared immediately cut off such assumptions. He stopped for a moment, but he had already started talking, so it was impossible to change the subject. He said that these people would die in the end. They would be killed. Chloe jumped out of her seat when she heard Jared say that. It sounded too much, and maybe he was wrong, but there was no point in hiding the truth either. He couldn't tell her all the details, though, so he decided to just close the subject gently. So he suggested that she stay here for one year, and after that period, Jared would give her a choice and not have to convince her of anything. Still, Chloe agreed. These words that she was needed here kept her from refusing the offer. Jared was very happy to hear that the elf was staying. He was too emotional, but he couldn't help it. So he exclaimed that he had to try, to which Chloe again replied in a calm tone that she would do whatever was required of her. He picked up a paper from a drawer and Jared said that it would be a good idea for them to go into mining in Keldia. The metal was stronger than steel, and it might be worthwhile for the Krivia to increase its production in Keldia. But before all that, Jared had to do some more calculations. Down to the smallest detail, if he wanted to compete with the kingdoms of Bonus and Malice, ice-free ports were essential to expanding his territory in the future. The sea was connected to the Strait of Magnum and the territories of Krivia by the mate rotor, and it froze over around midwinter. It will be a surprise. You can get the best prize using your special knowledge, not just some tricks and bugs. Even at this moment, Jared was replenishing his resolve as he remembered the main characters he had met by chance in the pub. They were already strong, but they were still gaining strength. Their abilities would develop, and all this under the protection of the gods themselves. For some people, hard times can be the best opportunity, but Jared didn't think so. He thought about what most people wanted. They certainly didn't want to be heroes in a time of need, and they didn't want to be heroes when there were no saints around. Valdez listened to him enthusiastically and wrote everything down on a piece of paper. He wanted the Lord to keep going and continue to express all the thoughts that would later be written down. People should not be victims of war because of their rulers who did not share something among themselves. Of course, as leaders, they could have instructed them to increase their labor force and power. Valdez continued to write down, every word of it captivating and agreeing with all of Jared's statements. But at some point, Jared stopped him. Valdez kept saying that everything Jared said was amazing. He thought he was just flying at him, but he denied it. Valdez sincerely believed that the Lord was right, and he was not a man of much use to talk. Jared wasn't really convinced, but he didn't bring it up again. He just added that all these phrases were not copied from somewhere. They were just his thoughts. Valdez could feel it. He saw Jared as his leader, seeing with his own eyes how he ran the country. The man was very enthusiastic and hard to stop. Jared smiled. Now it really seemed to him that all these words were sincere. After a while, Valdez stopped praising him so much, remembering something he said that he had recently heard some news, namely that the rainy season had begun in the southern part of the Nars continent and that the herbs were flying like crazy. This was very good news. The profits were increasing much faster, but Valdez was interested in another thing. He was certainly not an expert in military affairs and was completely incompetent in these matters. However, he wanted to report some information that he had secretly received through his personal system, information about the kingdoms of Bonus and Malice. Jared was ready to listen. He could not miss the opportunity to learn something else about his competitors. Valdez handed Jared some papers that were tied together with a rope. He added that they were news about the army and navy personnel who managed the coastal cities, ports, and general territory. Jared began to look at the sheets he had received, not wanting to ask about the source of the information, because the focus of the material was on the stories of naval generals who were treated as foreigners by the two kingdoms and had no respect for them. 
All of this was true, but maintaining a fleet was too expensive when compared to its profits. This must have looked very funny in the eyes of these two foolish rulers. And now their loyalty was as tenuous as a sandcastle on the verge of collapsing completely. Jared knew exactly what Valdez was trying to tell him. What the fleet needed right now was opportunity and a reason. If the curve could give them the kind of affirmation they needed to abdicate and elect a new leader, these people would move on to a stronger, more robust ship without any second guessing. Suddenly, the door to Jared's office opened. No one knocked at all, but he immediately started shouting loudly that everything was ready, and after proofreading they would ask celebrities to read it and leave recommendations. At this point, the guy stopped because he saw that he was not standing in front of Jared alone. But then he changed the subject again and said that he had found the one they had been hunting for so long. Atero was the blacksmith that Jared had told him to find, and he was now right there in the Plenus mine, and his joy was hard to contain. Jared was surprised, asking if they had checked everything well and if there was any mistake, because there could be another person with that name. But the boy only got more angry because he thought that Jared didn't believe him anymore. He had come all this way himself, so it was all true. Aki looked quite convincing, although Jared still had some doubts about it, but the boy insisted that it was true. Acero was one of the few blacksmiths who knew how to handle this material properly. He was like a fish in water in this area. He was even called the father of metallurgy. Now Jared had to meet with him himself and arrange a job. He and Aki took off when it was deep into the night and the sky was full of bright stars. It was the first time Aki had ever flown and he loved it, even thinking that the thing Jared had should be called an artifact, and he wondered how the Lord had managed to get something like that. Jared didn't go into details and simply replied that he had picked it up by chance and it was now useful. Anyway, it was very strange. Now Aki is high in the sky and now looking at the same place as Jared. But Jared said to leave the romance out of it. He had no choice but to fly like that, because Aki doesn't have that kind of ability. The guy laughed, and they continued to move towards the dungeon where Achero was. Jared still had a hunch that this dungeon would ask for money to get in, and Aki confirmed it. From the doorman to the supervisor, there was not a single clean person there, and then they said that if you give them money, they will be able to manipulate the production cards of the managers. This place was rotten from the inside. They all used the money to buy new positions and were only interested in that. The king's greed simply had no limits. All of these countries were very close to the territories of Crivia, and Jared already knew that both the kingdoms of Arthenia and Falfur had a very high level of corruption. There were many nuances that could be discussed for a long time, but now it was better to hurry to the Plenus mine. So Jared picked up the pace and they quickly moved across the sky to the dungeon. The journey there was long and because of that, Aki started to feel sleepy, and that was fine, but the snoring was too loud and it was disturbing Jared. So he decided that now was the time to test Tanex's abilities, but when he put the helmet back on his head, he realized something was different. He had noticed this but he did not know that all the data on his movements and other activities were being collected and monitored by an elf from Tatar Island. She was excited to see Jared go on his next mission and actually already knew many of his plans. In any case, he would be happy to get at least some information that would provide feedback to the transcendental body, and if the system was used correctly, it might become even more interested and perhaps even come after him. Suddenly, Jared felt that Aki was about to fall out of his arms, so he decided to hold him tighter. The boy didn't say anything, and it seemed as if he couldn't hear Jared at all. It also seemed that Aki had become much heavier, and Jared thought that it was his own fault and that he had overstretched his assistant. So in the future, it would be better to include a training course for him. It was quite difficult, but they did see the plenum mine on the horizon after a while. At the center, among countless people, was a talented man whose abilities had not yet fully blossomed. And among the many workers going about their business was Achero himself, the father of metallurgy, a fine and talented blacksmith. Three years after the Battle of Armageddon, while he was exploring for ore, Achero found Keldia. From that moment on, 
weapons made of Chaldea were distributed to all the holy alliances, giving them a significant advantage over the demon king's army, which was armed only with iron weapons. With his intervention, it was twelve years ahead of past history if his math was correct. Subsequently, Jared lowered Aki to the ground as he himself stood with his feet on the ground next to Plenum. The younger man didn't immediately realize what was happening around him. He looked around in a daze as Jared woke him up and let him go. Jared was a little cranky right now, perhaps because he was excited about the next task. He snorted that Aki should lose some weight, because it was not easy to carry him so much, and he was overweight as Jared noticed. The boy almost fainted when he heard such a compliment in his direction. It hit him hard, but Jared stopped him in a flash and told him to get ready, because in a few steps they would be in the dungeon. Now it was time to feed these people with coins, and they decided to start with the private citizens. Achero was working hard at the time. The work was exhausting, but he loved it. Buku, a supervisor, came to his workplace and obviously did not treat him well. Buku came with a complaint against him, saying that he had previously ordered him never to use iron in his work, and he was angry with Acero because he was spending the kingdom's wealth so easily. As soon as he saw this man, Acero broke out in a cold sweat, and he knew that when he showed up, there was no good news to be had. Sometimes Buku could actually do it, and it happened this time. Buku had already warned him so many times about all the prohibitions, so he justified the beatings with that. Acero was just a worker, and the boss was annoyed by such disobedience. And because people like Acero ignored orders from above, all the other candidates were just waiting for the moment to take Buku's place. This morning, Acero will set an example for all his colleagues. Buku has already prepared to hit him as hard as he can to punish the worker. And the next moment, the blacksmith was hit hard, screaming loudly when the whip touched him, and then it happened again and again. The wounds on Acero's body began to bleed, and he tried to crawl away from Buku so that the whip would not hurt him so much. Then the blacksmith replied, barely audibly, that he was not using iron without permission, using impurities from other blacksmiths. He was just conducting experiments after hours. Buka was even more annoyed. Acero not only ignored his orders, but also dared to be rude. The warden angrily said that today was the last day of Acero's life. He was furious and did not care that such an experienced blacksmith as this would die. It could all be easily disguised as an accident and no one would suspect anything. Acero crawled backward defenselessly, covering himself with his hands. A moment later, Buku lunged at the blacksmith with an axe lying next to him, and all Acero could do was scream. However, this time, Acero was lucky and escaped his death. Jared was standing behind Buku, grabbing his arm, and he screamed, getting even angrier, because who was this guy to touch him with his hands? Jared looked into his angry eyes in silence, and Buku thought that Jared was some new kid, which made him even more annoyed. Then Jared finally spoke. He said he was related to Achero, so he just wanted to talk to him, so he asked Buku to step aside and not interrupt the conversation. There was a silent moment in the blacksmith's large room as Buku tried to figure out what was going on. But when he came to his senses, the warden revealed that he didn't care who Jared was to Achero. They were all on his territory now, and Buku was the one who made the rules. Even if his own mother or father came here, they wouldn't be able to do whatever they wanted just because he was their son. Jared himself reacted quite calmly to such loud words. He just threw a bag of gold coins at Buku's feet and said it was a small gift to let him talk to Achero. Buku decided to ignore Jared's request to open the bag, thinking it was all a setup, so he approached the bag cautiously. Very carefully, the warden opened it and what he saw drove him crazy. There was so much gold that could equal his salary and for three years. Jared then added that he had several more just like it. But if Buku was against talking to Achero, then he would have to do with this one. The man took the bag in his hands, asking Jared who he was, but in a more gentle way, as if the money had dispelled all the negativity. Aki rudely replied that it was none of his business, but if he listened to Jared, he would get the three bags the man was holding. Buku calmly stood up and asked what he should do. 
The Lord walked up to Buku and seriously told him to write a report stating that Achero was fired from the Plenus mine, and it had to be under the seal of the chief commander, so Buku would get another nine years of his salary. Of course, the man could not resist such an offer and promised that he would quickly organize everything. While Buku went to take care of these matters, Jared treated a Sero, watching in amazement as all his recent wounds healed in just a moment. Then Atsero looked away and said that he didn't have any mages in his family. Jared said quietly that it was just part of the plan to get him out of here. When Jared looked down at Asero's hands, he realized that this overseer had already abused him and treated him very cruelly. But this behavior by the elders was not uncommon in the Plenus minds. Jared scanned Asero, finding that he was currently at level 25. He had special skills in metallurgy, valued his family and peace, was interested in new research, and had achieved the skill of basic weaponry over the course of his work due to strong core values. He did not expect to read such indicators, but he found himself thinking that all future greats are very different from those who came before. Jared approached Mr. Acero, but he felt uncomfortable with the formal treatment. It was too much for him. At first glance, Jared already resembled a man from a noble family, but he still treated a simple man like this with respect. Jared realized that not many people would recognize him yet because he was not that popular, although that might be for the best. Jared assured him that he had no problem being polite to ordinary workers. He was used to being that way with people. The guy wanted to get straight to the point, so he started talking. Jared wanted Acero to leave this mine and move to a new place with his new family. Acero was not prepared for this development, even though he had already heard what Jared had ordered the supervisor, Buka. Jared had already asked Buka to write a letter of resignation for the blacksmith, so that shouldn't have been a problem. And the Lord then removed his hood and introduced himself as the ruler of the vast territory of Krivia. And with all sincerity, Jared wished to invite Achero to his domain. The usual artisan thought such words were too strange, being asked by a feudal lord of a larger domain. But why? Acero was just an ordinary blacksmith who could be found anywhere near a mine. However, Jared did not give up, and to look more confident, he decided to make three promises to Acero. The Lord assured him that he would make sure to create the best forge with the highest quality equipment. He could not promise that it would be the best forge on the entire continent of Nars, but he guaranteed that it would be the best place in the northern part of the continent. Acero was already shocked by this, but it was only the first promise. Jared moved on to the next one while the man was recovering from the shock. If Acero needed it, Jared would provide him with any magical equipment, and if it was something he could make himself, he would make it himself. Jared might agree that he didn't have the right look for it, but no one would take away his title of wizard, and he was confident when it came to fine grain parts made from magic stones. Acero, by virtue of his work, knew that fine grain parts were not an easy thing to make, and Jared's words were impressive. But now it was time to tell him about the third promise. The Lord of Krivia would certainly provide him with a good place for Mr. Acero and his family to stay which was probably the one that impressed him the most. The simple hired hand tried to wrap his head around what he had heard, but it all seemed too beautiful for the working environment. Jared was not suggesting that he create everything out of thin air, but rather that he should think of it as a form of investment for himself, because he would have the opportunity to do research and manufacture different types of metals, both of which were Acero's favorite activities. Although Jared couldn't tell us exactly what a Cero would be working with, he could guarantee that it would be much stronger than steel. The amount of inventory that Curvature had was more than enough to make anything on a large scale, and Jared pulled out a sword that was one example of what a Cero would be able to make. A Cero could barely hold it in his hands out of surprise, but asked to do a little test for himself. Jared gave the go-ahead and moved away with Aki, giving the blacksmith more space. The man walked over to the weapon his friends had given him in honor of his ten years in the field. Then he swung with all his might to test the power of the sword Jared had given him. It was amazing, but 
he managed to break the powerful sword given by his friends with it, and it just broke into two pieces. Jared and Aki stood there satisfied, and for Achero, as a blacksmith, a man who burns with the desire to create better and better weapons, it was a real find, more valuable than gold. Most of all, Acero was interested in where Jared had managed to get such a strong metal. It was a revolution. You can only imagine what would happen if you made weapons on this scale out of this metal. All the Lord could add was that now they have as much of it as iron. Here the power was on a completely different level. Achero was overjoyed. He even felt a certain responsibility holding this sword in his hands. Jared said he would be generous if Acero needed support. Whatever it was, he tried his best to persuade him to come with him. This was the man Jared needed. The man didn't hesitate, but he was surprised by the two perfect conditions. And after looking at the sword again, he finally made up his mind. Atero began to bow to Jared, saying that he was happy to accept his offer. Even though he lacked strength, if his abilities were needed for the Lord, he was ready to help and follow him wherever he went. Jared smiled and looked at Acero. It was still a little strange for him to have people react like that when they talked to him. Later, Buku burst into the office, exclaiming happily that he had finished the paperwork. Of course, he didn't understand why Jared and Aki were interested in someone like Acero, but the main goal was money, and he would get that easily only if he let the blacksmith go. The warden was ready to let them all go with a smile on his face, wishing them all the best. But Jared still had one more request for him, saying that he would give him another bag of gold if Buku agreed to fulfill it. Because of his excessive love of money, Buku agreed, asking what exactly the Lord wanted. The request was very simple. Jared just had to hit Buku once. That was all he needed. The Lord laughed, thinking that life had been good to Jared's face, and he was stressed out to ask such a thing. But Buku agreed. He was very resilient to blows. So he told Jared to show his best, and he would try to take it with dignity. Jared smiled, and his magic appeared in his hands, which had been enhanced several times with the new abilities. When Buku was ready, Jared punched him in the face with all his might, which was probably not exactly what the man had expected. He was thrown back with such force that he quickly flew somewhere far away from Jared. Along with magic, the protagonist of his favorite game used transcendental reinforcement, which further enhanced his punching power. He wanted to show that violence is not the answer, and this punch was a retaliation for all the abuse that innocent workers endured. Jared threw another bag of gold coins in his face, but warned him that Buku should never dare to attack innocent people again. After the work was completed, Jared turned to Ashero and Aki, saying it was time to leave for Krivia. The three of them started walking to the exit of the mine. On the way, Jared asked Aki if he had done everything he was supposed to do. Aki said that he had already collected all the information about Buka, and since he had already sent it to the authorities, all these statements and allegations would be submitted to the court. Achero went to get ready to go to his future home, so Jared decided to wait for him at the plenum bathhouse, which was a nice place to relax, and there was no one there, and Jared assumed it was because of the high entrance fee. Aki also entered the bathhouse, and Jared was surprised, saying that he had to wash before entering. It was rude to just walk into a place like that. Aki blushed and told Jared to rest here alone, but he wanted to see this bathhouse first, because he had never dreamed that he would be able to get to these hot springs. In Jared's opinion, it was just an ordinary bathhouse, so he reiterated that Aki should take a shower and then come back to him. Aki did not know how to answer Jared. He lowered his head, blushing even more. Jared was surprised by this reaction. There was nothing unusual about the royal's body. The younger man tried to speak again, but he couldn't get anything out. He felt embarrassed looking at his naked body. The Lord interrupted Aki again and said he would go first if the younger man was so embarrassed. The boy just nodded his head quietly in agreement and looked away from Jared, his cheeks still red. Later the blonde was in the water, finally able to relax. This hot water allowed him to forget about all his troubles for a moment. If they built such a luxurious Yuanyu next to the Forest of Nightmares or Mahat's tomb, 
it would definitely bring in a lot of money. Crivy Re needs to expand the industrial district significantly now, not only to sell alcohol, but also for people to enjoy nightlife and cultural life. Even though Jared spoke out loud, there was no response from Aki, so the Lord took a small towel off his eyes to at least see if he was not alone. The kid was sitting next to him, but for some reason he didn't go into the water, and Aki just put his feet down slightly, trying not to look at Jared at all. Arkeen started to say that he couldn't stand the hot water, so he didn't go in, but then Jared asked why he had to wrap himself in towels. He could just put his legs down, and then Aki came up with a new excuse so that Jared wouldn't touch him so much. Then the blonde man reassured him and told him that he could take the towels off. There was nothing to be ashamed of. However, realizing that Aki would not agree to this, Jared assured him that he would close his eyes while he was also in the bathhouse. Aki was more comfortable with this option, but his body was so tired that he was about to fall asleep in the water. Later, when the stars were shining brightly in the sky, they both went to bed to gain strength before leaving. Aki wrapped himself in a blanket and fell asleep in his bed in no time. Jared was starting to worry a little about him. He suspected something was bothering Aki. He was acting strange lately. Whenever they attended a formal meeting, the younger man would talk to him informally, but his reaction would change immediately when they were alone or when it came to tactile contact. Jared could not understand what was going on in his head. He was completely unaware of his feelings. Aki's shyness was meaningful, but Jared couldn't be sure exactly what the younger man was feeling. It was all just confusing and hard to concentrate. Soon, morning came to the kingdom of Faufer, and the sun rose high in the sky, illuminating all the dark corners. Achero, his wife and two children were ready to leave, and they took several sacks with everything they needed, but the blacksmith still didn't know how to thank the Lord for his kindness. Jared was saddened that all the things they had brought with them fit in the small bags. He tried to broach the subject, asking if that was all they wanted to take with them. But Atsero assured him that it was okay. They travel very often. So the less stuff they take when they leave, the better. Atsero replied a little embarrassed, still feeling uncomfortable in front of Jared because he realized that he had nothing to return the favor. Jared then turned to Aki, who was standing behind him, and asked him if he knew where the Zumar mansion was. Of course, Aki knew the place and the Lord had given him orders to prepare everything so that the Achero family would be comfortable living there. Aki also had to make sure that they would have the best possible furnishings in the house, everything they needed. Aki understood the order, and then Jared turned his attention back to the blacksmith. But then Aki interrupted him, asking Jared why he wasn't coming with them. The guy was going to use a large teleportation circle, so it wouldn't take long to get there. But Jared said that he had some unfinished business to attend to right now. He promised to come back as soon as he was done. Aki was surprised by Jared's sudden departure, as he hadn't said anything about any urgent business until then. Later on, Jared left them, leaving the matters concerning the Achero family to Aki. The Lord himself was already in the place where he had to fulfill his task. As soon as he reached the premises, the guard stopped him saying that he had to pay for the entrance first. Jared gave him a gold coin, which should have been more than enough. Jared thanked him for the work he does here every day and continued on. But the knight in armor stopped him again at the door. Before letting Jared in, he needed to search him. Those were the rules. Jared grinned broadly, thinking that he was very tired by now. Having been standing here for a long time, he figured he would have an orgy nearby. Using a few simple tricks, he managed to get inside without any obstacles, avoiding a search, and the guard apologized for not recognizing him as a local merchant. He calmly entered, and another guy tried to follow him, who was stopped by the guard at the entrance and got in trouble for trying to get in without paying a cent. And here, you could see the whole truth of the Falfer kingdom. Corruption reigned at every step. They all needed only money. It seemed that people here were not interested in anything else. It was a place where any questions or problems could be solved with coins, an underground temple that was destroying itself from within. And it was the dungeon that Jared had been planning to conquer even before he met Asero, but to get in you had to wait in line, which was quite long. 
So Jared decided to get around it all in a different way. He approached one of the guards and handed him a piece of bread, saying that if he was hungry, it would be a good peroxide. The guard took it in his hands, wondering what Jared had to say, and inside it the guard noticed a gold coin. He almost shouted in surprise. The knight immediately realized that Jared was a nobleman and ordered all the people to disperse and let him pass. In his mind, Jared knew that if he did not change this country, the absurdly corrupt structure would never fall. In the end, he wanted to bring change to this kingdom, to bring it with his own hands. Everyone around Jared started shouting after him that he could only meet death on this path. The survival rates for courses A and B were too different. But he knew that, and that's why he was going there. To outsiders, the fact that he was going to course B meant only that Jared was looking for a place of death because no one had ever made it out alive. He looked around and thanked everyone for their concern and excitement, but said that he would be fine. It was another tragedy. They lost another good hunter, which is not too many here anyway. The ruined underground mosque hid two paths. These two courses led in different directions, and most people tend to choose course A because it is easier. It was much safer, and since everyone shared knowledge about this path, there was an idea of how to go through it. The way B was the exact opposite. It was known only for being extremely dangerous. All the stories of people who entered it ended in disaster. At least 15 people were needed to create a squad to go through the way B. But Jared came here as a genie. He was confident in himself, in his abilities and capabilities. One of the reasons he came here was to beat the boss and take all the rewards for himself. And he also needed to upgrade his bracelet, which he had won in the battle with DeLuca. In the present tense, it had 810 out of 1,000 nightmares. So Jared decided to try to increase his stats while he was here. He didn't know when he would have to face someone or something more challenging. The continent of Nars was very large and there were a lot of different monsters, some weak ones that anyone could fight and some that you just couldn't survive. Jared was haunted by various thoughts, but there was no fear that he would not be able to, and eventually he found himself standing in front of the entrance to the infamous B course, which has taken hundreds of lives outside its doors. He braced himself, and his skin crawled with goosebumps, realizing what was about to happen behind that entrance. And since he needed to have the Tanex with him to complete the course, he needed to get it right away so he wouldn't waste any time there. Sabio would probably be very happy if he saw his creation here, helping him through such a difficult path. Jared shouted the word equip to be in the suit and calmly enter inside. Its magical power was 100%, its condition was perfect, and there were no malfunctions at the moment, Jared felt protected in the Tanex. A creation like this is hard to defeat even for strong monsters. He thought that this must be how a superhero from a movie who saves everyone must feel. But he didn't want to waste any time. As long as he was in a good mood and in perfect condition, it was better to deal with everything as soon as possible. When the aisle opened for Jared on Wednesday, he moved quickly through the dark door. The elf watching him was very surprised to see this strange stranger enter the decaying underground temple, which was one of the most dangerous places on Nars. She thought Jared might be taking advantage of the dungeon to get what he wanted, but she couldn't believe her eyes when she saw the techniques Jared used to get past all the monsters in the dungeon unnoticed. The boy flew high above the heads of the goblins who couldn't reach him even if they wanted to. He flew right under the ceiling so that the monsters could not grab him. Apparently, Sabio did not expect his creation to be used in this way. It was a really interesting technique. Jared was sure that he would get out of here alive and could confidently say that he was much more suitable for the role of the best pilot of the Tetra Nexus than Sabio himself. The elf couldn't believe what she was seeing on the screen. Jared felt like a fish out of water in this suit. Suddenly, Jared stood right in front of the screen through which Sabio was watching him, and he confidently told him to watch him closely, and he would prove that he had mastered the Tetra Nexus perfectly. If only the elf had known something like this was going to happen, he would have used the communication stone to talk to Jared. But now he just watched him, 
No need to be proud of someone he had barely studied and certainly no reason to worry about him. Meanwhile, Jared was flying farther and farther away, passing all the monsters below, getting closer to his goal. He probably wouldn't have had as much fun if he hadn't had the ability to fly, because it's not easy to deal with such a crowd of goblins. Jared was just lucky to have the advantage here, so he calmly continued on his way to get home quickly. Later, the hall with a bunch of monsters ended and Jared flew out the door and landed. He was proud of himself. Looking up, the boy waved at Sabio and smiled with satisfaction as he finished his work. It was simply impossible. Sabio couldn't and wouldn't believe what he was seeing. Jared had gone through all eight rooms so easily, and not a single monster had noticed his presence. But the guy spent no more than two hours on this dangerous journey, while others spend several days and cannot go out to take a breath, which is why they die on the spot. Now Jared was standing right in front of the Room of the Fallen. He wanted to go inside to finally show that he was the first and most likely the only one who could make it this far. He had been studying this dungeon for hours on the way here, and now he was in the boss's room. But when the blonde walked in, there was no Uocha, so Jared looked around the area but found no one. When he looked hard in the distance, he could see what he was looking for. But the rulers of the dungeon Jared had come to were still awake and sleeping soundly. Valari was a powerful creature, a fire lizard, and no one here had ever come to a fight with it. Valara was lying next to him. He was already an ice lizard, but he was sleeping just as peacefully next to the other. Perhaps it was for the best. And now was the time to take from these two what Jared had come for. He had quietly crept up on them to take advantage of the moment when they could not attack him, and until the lizards woke up, he could hit them as much as he wanted. In his past life, he also went to this dungeon and was drawn to Path B, where he successfully passed the test and was able to defeat the two monsters. He often recalled those moments when he played Paradise and it was not his reality. Even then, it was clear that a lot of experienced specialists worked here to maintain this huge system, this world. As a result, there were a lot of different ways that could lead the player to victory in an easier way. And because of this, it became more common for several messages about changes and fixes to appear on the same day. This was because Paradise was not perfect. It was a game that was trying to be a better version of itself. However, the point at which Jared was reborn was on the main story ten years ago, which meant that at that point most of the Yuan had not yet been disqualified. He was saying that he wasn't going to compete with Valari and Valaro in a fair fight, but since there was still the possibility of using bugs, it made no sense for Jared to miss this chance. Soon he found the same place, the safe zone he remembered from the game. Of course, it was hard to know the exact number of people who had been sacrificed to find this one spot that could be used as a decoy. All the other areas were to be traps into which the player would lure them. The plan was good, and it was only a matter of executing it without deviation. However, something went wrong. When Jared approached one of these places, he realized it was fake. All of them were fake. And the only good thing was that Jared hadn't had time to attack them from here yet, because that would have ended badly. The two lizard brothers would have eaten him in a heartbeat, tearing his body to pieces. All they would have needed to use was an unexpected jump. He would either die from being squeezed by their terrifyingly strong paws or be eaten alive. And while these monsters would enjoy the taste of fresh human flesh, Jared would slowly die of excruciating pain. He would die if he let himself be caught. These were the words that other people used to describe this place and the dungeon boss himself, and they were true. However, it was comforting to know that at least these walls would not collapse due to fire or freezing and would stand firm. Still, he had already come here with the intention of winning and proving that this was not a deadly path that could not be overcome, so he was curious to see what would happen. A new artifact had recently appeared on his finger. The Ring of St. Ifnos, which was classified as a five-star ring, its function being that the user could use double the divine power for magical attacks by spending double the amount of mana. Now Jared could apply the perfect technique to win, using attacks that were enhanced by divine power. Curiosity was getting the better of him, and Jared couldn't wait to begin the key task, 
so after creating the magic ring, he decided to act. Once he was in a safe area, he used the magic projectile and with a bolt of lightning it flew straight at the two lizards that were still sleeping soundly. As soon as Jared managed to hit the monsters, one of them woke up and screamed, its eyes glowing, as the giant lizard was immediately angry at the intruder. Valaro also roared with all his might when the magical lightning touched his snake body. The ice monster was more enthusiastic and was the first to charge at Jared. The boy was standing right in front of the giant, but he remained calm because he was in an area that they could not touch. What happened was as expected. Valaro was unable to get through the barrier of the safe zone and attack the criminal who had so stealthily snuck up on them. But these monsters had another problem that they shared. Valaro closed his eyes when he realized that he could not get to his prey through the magical shield of the safe zone. Suddenly, the ice lizard opened its eyes again. They were still glowing yellow and glistening in the dark. The monster kept screaming and eating through the shield to get inside. Because their eyesight was degrading and they could see almost nothing now, players trying to sneak through this way had an advantage in the last stage. In order to reveal where and who they were, these foot and mouth disease creatures used their other abilities, which took a lot of time when attacking. It was to further muffle all these senses which were working properly that he cast his spell. As soon as Valaro regained consciousness, he immediately ran toward Jared to try to attack his opponent again. Jared did not leave the safe zone, where he was completely isolated from the large creatures, and soon they rushed at each other and began to fight among themselves. This was exactly what the boy expected when he used fallen magic to attract attention, and because they could not see at all, they could not decide who they were attacking. This gave Jared even more confidence. Everything was going as he had planned in the beginning. Valaro and Valari continued to hit each other and hurt themselves for some time, but after a while they came to their senses. They both looked at Jared, who was standing nearby, and the lizards had determined where the real target was. Together, the monsters decided to use their elements against him, Valari using his flame breath, directing it directly at the boy. Valaro, in turn, added his ice breath, and the two opposing elements merged to destroy their common enemy. They aimed at the place where Jared was standing, but they did not expect a backlash, because it was a protected spot. The large stone on which Jared was standing burst into flames, and waves of fire spread throughout the home of the two lizards. They were blind, so they could only feel the pain and hear the loud explosion, the waves of which were coming at them with instant speed. The fire lizard could still hold on to its paws, but it was very badly injured and Valaro had almost lost consciousness after Jared's attack. After a moment, the ice monster was able to recover. He was badly injured, but it only added more anger and rage to the guy. Jared smiled. He was completely able to get them to focus all their attention on him. It didn't matter if the two of them attacked again, because he was sure that he would get out of here alive and in one piece. Valaro tried to strike Jared again, but he only moved away from the barrier, deeper into the distance, and exclaimed gleefully that they would never get him here. Valari let out a fire from his mouth, which stopped suddenly when the monster once again realized that it would do him no good. But the two lizard brothers didn't give up and started attacking again together, two elements rushing towards Jared. He noticed that this monster's skill was already improved. This lizard spell did not directly hit the safe zone, but the ability to fly was necessary for Jared to avoid the improved fire and frost skills. It gets pretty dangerous if you miss the time to upgrade this skill, and there's a reason this trick took a while to discover. Well, the two of them had attacked, and now it was Jared's turn to strike back at the lizards that had been hunting him so relentlessly in the underworld. The boy repeated the same spell that had awakened the lizards in the beginning. The magic projectile quickly hit the monsters. However, now the power of this spell was improved and took much more health than before. Jared even enjoyed hitting them. These monsters had so much meat and space to enjoy it, so he didn't think about stopping. Now was the time when the target was too big to miss, so he hit it all the time. Here, during the battle, he could even get into the gap between them to annoy them even more. The attacks of both brothers would only hit each other, and the probability of their energy hitting him was very small. 
Jared used a magic polishing spell that allowed for wide areas on both sides. The intelligence of these foot-and-mouth disease was not particularly high, so they then foolishly turned to each other and stopped the attack. It was very important here that Jared already knew about their poor eyesight as soon as he entered this dungeon, so he was able to prepare and build a certain tactic, which he followed when he met the monsters. He also remembered from Paradise that these creatures were able to use divine energy, which was used by hunters to locate themselves. The battle continued at this pace for another 30 minutes. The walls stained with the blood of the lizards, which had spilled all over the floor of their home. As expected, the participation of the Tanex created by Sabio was the best option and greatly increased the stability of the attacks. Jared, along with this wonderful elf creation, could safely cast flight spells and still receive the benefits that the suit provided during a fight. And the fact that the Tanex didn't need to be removed for this was good news, since he knew how to use the Transcendental Connection. Now Valari's mana level was almost at zero. When Jared pro-canned the creature with Spiritual Eye, the battle had drained the foot-and-mouth disease insanely. Valaro's situation was slightly better, but he still had only 00201 mana points out of 10,000. The Ice Demon suddenly stirred. He raised his head and as quickly as he could began to try to climb the wall to get to a safe area. But no matter how hard the monster tried, he could not get to the right place because the stone wall began to crumble under his weight. Within a few seconds, Valaro fell straight to the ground, belly up, and that was probably the end of the two monsters. Jared was pleased with the work he had done, but the ice pestilence exhaled angrily, looking at the boy. If he had only the strength to get up and use his power to the fullest, he would definitely do so and avenge himself and his brother. But the monster could do little else. It turned over and stood on its paws, beginning to approach its target again. Together with Valari, the lizards tried to attack Jared again, but he again reacted calmly and easily, even though he was no longer in a safe place. But he was here to finally end it all. He wanted this dungeon to not sow fear among ordinary people and hunters. So when he had played with the helpless lizards, he decided to finally put an end to their existence. In any case, he could easily repair the suit with just a few magic stones if anything happened to it. When Jared cast another spell, the magic ball was ready to be launched, and Jared concentrated all his magical energy into it to make it a fatal attack against the foot-and-mouth disease. The concentration of his mana reached 13,466 units, which gave him the freedom to use super-powerful magic several times. Jared channeled all the energy he had left into a final blow that destroyed the brothers and their dungeon completely. Using another of Tanex's special abilities, Jared orbited his targets and prepared to fire. In a few seconds, he opened fire like a sniper's bullet, the collected energy flying directly at the monsters. Due to their poor eyesight and exhausted state, the lizards could not understand or perceive much, so this attack came as a surprise to them, one they were not prepared for. After the magic had blown away what was left of them, Jared saw a familiar blue sign in front of his eyes, informing him that Valaro and Valari had been finally destroyed in their own home. The boy stood among the two bodies of what seemed to be powerful foot-and-mouth disease, but in fact they were very helpless and weak. The main thing was to choose the right attack strategy, Song of Fire and Ice. This is the new title Jared received for being able to defeat these two monsters. He used to think that such a title could only be obtained after conquering the tenth floor of the Great Nars Labyrinth, but it turns out that these foot and mouth disease were as strong as those he would have met in the underground corridors of the labyrinth. When it came to fire and ice, humans had only weak enough defenses to dodge these elements simultaneously. The system also notified Jared that he had raised both elemental skills at once. It was really cool, and he didn't get tired during this mission. In a short period of time, the bodies of the lizards turned into mountains of colored ash, and soon only the so-called prizes remained. The hall was better than Jared had expected. Everything was at least five stars, and it was very rare to find such a thing at one time. He was happy, but decided to hide it all for now, 
as it was not a good idea to look at such a surprise here. Jared decided that he would look at it all a little later, when he returned to the others and could please his friends with good gifts. There should be enough for everyone. Sabio just couldn't believe his eyes when he saw how Jared had dealt with the foot and mouth disease. The guy was just crazy, because the elf didn't know how else to do it. Of course, Sabio already knew that Jared was an extraordinary person, but what had just happened in front of him exceeded all expectations. What was most striking and puzzling was that Jared knew exactly where the safe zone in the dungeon was, and he was just playing with two bosses that no one else could even reach. On top of that, the total damage to his body was only 2% of his health, which he lost. And these were the results in the battle with the famous and powerful monsters of the fallen dungeon, Valari and Valaro. It was only now that Sabio began to really worry about it all. At times, he even felt like he was watching a great pilot with a godsend. Sabio made a promise to himself that one day he would meet Jared in person, but for now he would continue to watch him closely and study his tactics. The boy flew for a few more hours and soon found himself in his mansion. As soon as he arrived, he immediately called several of his wards who immediately came to his office. Aki, Julian, Mary, and Valdez stood in front of Jared all of whom had dressed very nicely before coming. Jared was a little shocked at what they were all wearing, but he put it down to the fact that he hadn't explained to them why he had called them in so urgently. He was especially surprised by the way Aki looked, wearing a hat and a tailored suit. But when the blonde man commented, the younger man said that such clothes were a trend among the courtiers. Jared looked at Aki again, who was standing in front of him in a skirt. Indeed, he looked perfect and complete, wearing earrings and eyeliner. When Jared started to say something to him, Aki involuntarily said that Jared's tastes were too old-fashioned to understand him, although at first he had intended to keep such thoughts only in his head. Aki didn't want to talk about fashion with Jared, who obviously didn't understand it and didn't care much for style. But he changed the subject because Achero asked him to tell the Lord that he was very grateful for the new life he had provided for him and his family. Mary added that Achero's wife also wanted to thank the Lord for his actions and had personally invited them to dinner. This was really good news and Jared was very happy to hear the news. Then Julian spoke up. He came forward and asked Jared why he had called them all over tonight so urgently, which made the boy worry. For some reason, Julian thought that Jared wanted to fire one of them. But the Lord said that he had no plans to do that at all. He had hired them to work for a long time, not to fire them, which reassured Julian at least a little. But he was still waiting for Jared to tell him why he had called them all here, because right now everyone here was worried about it and expecting more bad news than good. Jared looked over at Aki, Mary, and Valdez, who were also shifting from one foot to the other in their anxiety. Jared decided not to give them any more food for thought and motioned for Julian to come closer, who seemed to panic even more. Julian tried to smile, but there were a lot of emotions inside him that did not let him rest. And everything turned out to be not as scary as he expected. Jared simply held out his hand with a pendant, saying that it was a gift, and asked him to accept it. After a moment, Julian pushed his hair forward and hooked the jewelry around his neck. It was strange, but immediately afterwards he had a refreshing and inspiring feeling of freedom that made him dare to do all the things he had avoided before. This pendant was supposed to give its owner just such an effect, so Jared told Julian to wear this artifact whenever he performed his tasks. It would sting him with inspiration for future accomplishments. When Arkeens came up to Jared, he handed him the Diary of Fortune, a gift that surprised the younger man even more. It was the famous trader Fortuna, and Aki had wanted to get it all his life and read the man's notes, but he could not find a single copy wherever he looked. Perhaps for Aki, who was so passionate about trading, this was the best gift he could have received. He owned the original and promised to keep it as the apple of his eye. After Aki returned to his seat and kept his eyes on Fortune's diary, Jared called Valdez, who gave him a thing that at first glance resembled an ordinary cuckoo. And he was right. This artifact was called the Cuckoo of Truth. You didn't need to play it. 
to use its powers, it was enough to keep it with you. The idea behind it was that the more truth Valdez told, the better his people skills would become, which would help him in negotiations. Now, Mary came up to Jared. He had purposely left her last because now everyone but Mary had to leave Jared's office. He suggested that they try to use their artifacts alone. The three thanked him and walked out the door, and Valdez added that he would always tell the truth as long as he had the cuckoo's cage with him. Now Mary was left alone with Jared, and he waited until the door closed on the other side. Jared started the conversation, though he didn't look very confident at the moment. But she was distracted by Mia, who started screaming outside the door and calling for her mom because Uncle Lacus was already looking for her all over the mansion. Mia burst into the room and loudly announced that her boyfriend was looking for her mom, and Mary only managed to say that she was not alone here, and Jared didn't need to know. Jared laughed awkwardly, feeling out of place in this conversation. He had put a puzzle together in his head when Mia called Lacus Mary's boyfriend. Mary hadn't been looking to get into a relationship with anyone before. She thought she just didn't need to. And since Lacus had canceled all his training, he hadn't been able to meet new people. As for Mary herself, while she was pregnant with Mia, her husband died of a serious and terminal illness. Although she had rejected Lacus several times, at some point she decided to open her heart to him. He did not insist on anything and took his time until Mary was willing to accept his proposals, but Lacus tried hard to get Mary's attention and finally succeeded. Later, as the three of them sat in Jared's office with the family, Mary apologized for her child's directness. She felt that what Mia had said was really unnecessary for the Lord's ears and that the situation should not have affected him at all. However, Jared tried to assure her otherwise and told her not to worry about him when it came to her personal life and happiness. Mary understood that. People often said that nothing could get in the way of two people in love, but she wanted to make sure that Jared didn't care. Jared laughed as long as it didn't affect the kingdom. He wasn't going to forbid his people anything. It was just their business. Then Jared found it funny himself that he wasn't even interested in his personal life, but he was worried about making those who lived with him comfortable, especially he didn't want to be the one to get in the way of lovers. Mary also smiled, but she was still embarrassed by what Mia had said, so she apologized again. The little girl sat next to her mother and asked Jared if her mother had done something wrong. She was already getting ready to scold her. This made the Lord laugh even more. The blonde man broke into a smile. Jared put the tea down by addressing Mary by her first name, but then corrected himself by calling her head chef. He just wanted to say once again that he would be only too happy to have her share with him her fond memories of the man she loved and as long as she disciplined herself to do her job even better, he swore on his own title of Lord that he would continue to support his charges. She apologized again and then thanked him for his understanding. But he also wanted to tell Mia something else, namely that if her mother and her boyfriend had a fight, she should run quickly to report it to him. Mary's daughter smiled and said that she would tell him everything, even without her mother knowing. They just laughed at Mia's comment. Jared had forgotten that he was supposed to give Mary a gift in the form of a special artifact, so when he remembered, he immediately handed her the ladle. Like all the other artifacts that the Lord gave to his wards, this ladle was unusual. It had previously belonged to St. Ifnos. In addition, the object had healing magic. He hoped that Mary would continue to work with it so that the other mentees and Jared could enjoy the meals she prepared under her guidance. She made a promise that she would but she also felt warm and energized just holding the ladle in her hands. Jared then drew attention to her important position in this place. He emphasized that sooner or later there would come a time when her abilities would become essential and indispensable, and he told her to be prepared for that time to come very soon, so she had better be ready. Mary nodded and then patted her daughter on the head, and she promised to do everything in her power when the kingdom needed it. Jared realized even then that if they could make and sell her concoctions in large quantities, it would bring them a lot of income and help, whether they were on the battlefield or not. Unlike the conventional potions they had always used, Mary could create a recipe and prepare food that could increase the healing and restorative powers of those who ate it. 
Later, Jared and Mia walked out of the mansion and he led her by the hand and asked her if she was doing well in her training. She happily replied that besides spending time with her mom and eating, she was practicing hard and working on her magic. Then he remembered the next question. He wanted to know if Mia still practiced only wind magic, and the girl's answer was yes. In her opinion, elements such as ice and fire were very boring, so she did not pay attention to them. Now her dream was to become the best at using wind magic so that, in the future, she could meet the wind elemental face to face. Even after trying different types of magic, Mia had settled on just one, wind magic. Her current level was 65. Her characteristics were very good, especially considering that she was still a child. But Jared saw great potential in her and knew that she was already capable of great things. The most impressive thing was that the girl was able to reach rank 5 in the wind song in just a year and a half. Then Jared realized that all these trainings gave her incredible results. She was talented and spent a lot of time on improvement and it paid off. But according to his calculations, such progress would have taken at least three years, even in paradise. Mia couldn't hold out for long because of her rather low mana levels. But if you looked at the child's magical abilities alone, she was unbeatable. Jared looked at her with a very serious expression on his face which confused her a little. He suggested that she go on a trip to the Animos Plateau by next spring. Hearing the name made her light up. Mia had heard that cool and refreshing breezes roamed there, and there were many beautiful flowers in the field. Jared stopped, adding that there he would teach her how to maximize the effectiveness of the wind power. Mia was so excited that she couldn't wait for the moment they would go on the trip. But now, it was only September on the calendar and spring was still six months away. So she suggested January, the girl's birthday, so she suggested going then and that convinced Jared to agree. After the walk with Mia, Jared went back to his work. He studied in detail everything that was in the open sources about the Dimio's magic unit and their fleet. He thought about what Isabel had said, to recruit a personal army that would consist of strong mages, just like Agressio's guard, which included unrivaled swordsmen. After that, you can create a fleet that is large enough to defend against attacks from the river. Since the Kingdom of Cinders protected them from the south like a solid barrier, it shouldn't have been a problem for Crivia to take advantage of the kingdoms of Bonus and Malice. Jared began to mark something on his map on his desk. In 1416, the Kingdom of Bonus would be Crivia's first target. Jared stuck his pen into the map and left the office. That night, he met with several vassals to discuss everything in detail. The Lord also gave them some artifacts that would support their existing abilities. After that, he visited the Acero family. He prepared for the implementation of his plan for four months and then, on the continent of Nars, Jared celebrated another new year inside the game. He decided to celebrate this holiday just like last time. He took the rapier potion and sat down in a chair. After waking up, Jared was already experiencing the third new year here. Just like then, he drank it and his level instantly improved. He was lucky that he could see his own stats. Jared was very happy with the fact that he could literally improve his skills endlessly. Jared was looking at himself in the mirror when someone entered his office. Ella was standing in the doorway, all armored, leading the Agressio army, and they were already preparing to move out. When everyone was in place and the parade began, Jared wanted to thank all of his followers from all corners of the curve. It was only because they supported him that he could dream of a happy future for this state. The Agressio guard had updated their flag, and instead of a lion, it now had an emblem of flowers. The flag of the upstart Dimios mages was exactly the same but the flowers were on a red background. Jared made a loud announcement that he would provide them all with the necessary and powerful weapons, and in return, they were to bring pride to their families. Jared also asked to be allowed to use the chassis and make an oath. The children applauded loudly and made a noise in the courtyard as Jared began to speak. The time will soon come when their power will be channeled into a new and much needed direction. Until that day, they must train to perfect their abilities to the maximum and then show their capabilities on the battlefield. 
He urged everyone to refrain from doing anything that would ruin Crivy Reek and told them to keep their heads held high. With that, his speech almost came to an end, and the wards supported their lord and promised to bring glory to their lord's name. The magicians of Dimio shouted his name loudly. These two units were assembled for a reason. They included the people who could lead Crivia to victory. Agressio repeated the same thing. Jared had already been convinced of them for a long time. He knew what these people were capable of. After a few minutes, Jared could exhale and sit down to rest. He took a bottle of water and sat down in a chair. Although the kingdom had gathered the mages of Dimios, unlike Ella and Olsen, who were the only ones capable of leading the Agressio, they lacked a leader. Jared would have to look for such a person in the near future. Opening the water, he took a few sips. At the same moment, Isabel approached him, and he wished her a happy new year, after which Jared gave her a bottle of water to drink. She took it, but did not drink it, thinking that Jared had put something strange in it. She started to tell him about her assumptions that he might have put some kind of potion in it that would make her tell only the truth or something, so Jared suggested that he could drink some in front of her to make sure it was just pure water. But she winked at him and said it was all a joke and she would tell him the whole truth without any serum, and then Isabel took a few sips of water. She had been in a very good mood lately, no breakdowns or anything like that. Isabel thought it was all thanks to the guild she had formed. She was really enjoying making new friends in the place she used to live. Even though these people are no longer the people who lived in her neighborhood, they are the children or even grandchildren of these people. Jared was surprised by her eagerness to tell him about her past. Apparently, Isabel did not remember what she had told him before. The less he knew, the better it was true. But still, it was good that now Isabel was no longer trying to hide her past and was talking about it so easily. After she told him, Jared asked about the name of the shaman's guild, Diraj, wondering why she had chosen it. Anyone could have read his name, just backwards. But then Isabel told him that she had actually taken the name from the ancient word Diraj, which meant honor. Isabel laughed when Jared thought she would use his name, only backwards for the guild's name. However, without explaining the truth that Isabel had put into the name, all the members of the guild thought the same as Jared, but they were grateful that thanks to the Lord they could settle in better conditions and start a new life. Jared was pleased to hear this, but Isabel continued to speak, saying that she had recently developed a new goal, namely that all people should always remember the name Diraj. Isabel would succeed. The main thing now is to lay the right foundation for the further development of the guard. While Jared and Isabel were talking, Lacus approached them, seemingly waiting to tell the Lord something. He greeted her and then the girl went to rest, leaving them both alone. Jared gave her a look and immediately looked at Lacus, calling him the lover of Chief Mary. He smiled, laughing slightly. Lacus said a little more quietly that Jared should have stopped with his jokes. It had been four months since then, but he was still amused. If the Lord was enjoying himself, that was certainly very funny but Lacus hadn't come here for another round of such unfunny jokes. He handed Jared an envelope he had recently received, with the name Sabio on the front. Lacus suspected that Jared knew the name. When he opened the envelope, he saw a secret document sent to them by the Arcane Guild, so the letter was sent to the Lord immediately. He read everything carefully, but the first few lines were enough to realize that the time had come. Jared had been using Tanex for more than four months now, and Sabio was eager to meet such a person in person in the port of Mate. The elf said he was ready to wait for him until the Count died. There were many things Sabio would like to ask him, so he asked him to come to the destination as soon as he had free time. Jared felt that this letter was too arrogant, and he clutched the paper in his hands, bending the edges. The Lord knew that Sabio valued his knowledge of magical skills, but he never thought that the elf would send such a letter of order. Despite his words, Jared agreed to the meeting and was soon in port mate with Lachis. Lachis asked Jared if it was okay if they didn't bring at least a few more soldiers for protection. Jared assured him that it was okay. Sabio was not an elf he had a bad relationship with. Jared could see how worried Lachis was, so he let him go for a walk and visit some local people who worked near the beaches. But even before he left, 
Lacus said it would probably be difficult to get the attention of the Admiral of the Northeastern Navy of the Bonus Kingdom and win him over. He wasn't the kind of man who could be easily lured by a small pile of money. He was a soldier from birth, but that didn't mean that hope was completely gone. Jared suggested finding some reason for the Admiral to betray his country. Apparently, in this case, it was impossible to avoid bloodshed, and if so, it would be sure to demonstrate the great difference in power between the two kingdoms. Lachis added that over the past two years, they have been able to gather information that the budget of both kingdoms for their navy has hit rock bottom. And with the current strength of the Krivia, the army should be capable of conquering the coastal cities of the Kingdom of Bonus and Malus. Jared thought about it and looked at Lachis silently. He said that for now, they needed to wait a bit. The Lord wanted to make sure that the state would be able to control a constant source of Keldia to provide the troops with the necessary weapons. Lachis and the rest of the military were watching very closely to make sure that Atero remained safe, and after a short conversation, Lachis left to fulfill Jared's request. The Lord was left alone in the middle of the fleet with only a short time to go before Sabio arrived. Then he thought that it would be good to appear before the elf in Tanix to show the creation to his master. Sabio, like Chloe, was the being who held the keys to the future. And if the research data he's been collecting all this time is handed over to the Dark Church, then there really won't be a future for humans. Hundreds of soldiers with technology similar to that of the Tanix will face defenseless people on the battlefield, and then the real carnage will begin. And even if Sabio dies, his research data will resurface, proving that his death was in vain. Jared was flying high in the sky, and below his feet he saw Sabio coming to meet him. He had finally found him. Sabio was wearing a dark robe and moving forward, but Jared was ahead of him. He turned his head and looked at him and smiled.